Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's Bad Apologetics. I think it's been about four months since the last Bad Apologetics episode. Um, so I think before we get into the episode itself, maybe just to do a bit of a catch up on the series and James and I and what we're up to. So um, I had planned to set up an independent Bad Apologetics uh, channel for this episode to be the first to to, to go live on that channel. but um, I had some issues with that, with getting uh, verified and stuff prior to being able to stream. So that will be set up hopefully in time for the next episode. And then we'll be um, up re-uploading the kind of backlog of Bad Apologetics episodes over there. Um, so that comment is pinned in the chat if you want to go and subscribe to that channel, um, which is where the Bad Apologetics content will be um, moving to. And then James and I both have like control over that channel and we can upload like short clips and things like that. Um, to that. So that's a bit of housekeeping about Bad Apologetics. And then what have James and I been up to? Do you want to just talk about what you've been doing over the past few months? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm, as I think people know, I'm working on a PhD. I'm, I guess, like 40% of the way through now, hopefully. Uh, so just a lot of my time is spent trying to keep up to date with everything there, but it's going pretty well. Um, if you're interested in what I research, you can um, uh, check out my podcast, the Science of Everything podcast, the most recent episode. I talk a bit more about what I do for my research. Um, and in terms of my YouTube channel, so I uh, try to upload when I get the time. Uh, I think many viewers would be familiar that I have started to upload an audiobook with commentary of my book, Unreasonable Faith. I've done the first two kind of sections of that. And uh, I'll be doing another section maybe in a couple of weeks. Um, obviously, we had. Um, this uh, bad apologetics coming up. So I haven't done one in a few weeks, but um, that, that will be finished as I, I think initially said, it will take a few months to get through, but I plan on doing the whole book there. So um, check that out if you're interested in, um, I, I'm reading through most of the book, uh, just skipping a few sections here and there and providing some extra commentary. So that's provides another way for people to get a bit more background in um, uh, yeah, some of my arguments. And um, final thing that I'm working on, which I've also mentioned before is my next book which will be a defensive uh, version of um, philosophical naturalism. Um, that will not be ready for uh, several years yet, um, but I, I probably will start talking a bit more about what I'm looking at there maybe next year. Um, I've been working a lot on trying to get my head around different arguments and, and sort out how different ideas connect to each other. So I, I hope to put a bit more content about that um, online uh, in the sort of medium future. So that's what I've been doing. Hand over to Nathan. Yeah, I mean, I wish I could tell a story about what I've been doing that sounded nearly as productive. <laughs> Having <laughs> arguments on Twitter, I think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, I, I I, mean, I fin finished my master's in philosophy now, but I feel a bit kind of, um, I mean, I, I felt feel like I needed to do that, but I, I do feel a bit disillusioned with philosophy <laughs> at the minute. And so um, I'm looking to go back into a software job. So I'm just kind of um mostly doing like leak code questions and interviews and things at the moment um because i want to get a job that's like relatively okay i don't want to just like kind of take anything and then be super unhappy um so yeah that's that's pretty much it for me um other than you know like various mental health crises and trying to learn to be a person that stays on top of uh <laughs> stays on top of their like washing and stuff at the right times um and learning about the downfall of the soviet union as well recently which has been quite fun uh lots of very interesting cool topic stuff about uh gorbachev and yeltsin and uh the economics experiments that were run by the u.s and stuff like that with the uh, shock therapy so so that's pretty yeah that's pretty much um all there is from my point of view um so maybe if we just move into the actual content of today's bad apologetics episode which is uh, Richard Swinburne's short book, Is There a God? So according to Swinburne himself, this work is sort of the first thing that anyone should read who's trying to familiarize themselves with his work. So it is um, somewhat apologetic in nature, but it's supposed to be a more sort of um, philosophical, you, you know, like it, it, it's supposed to fall more under the kind of like... Um, attempt to do Christian philosophy than maybe like something like Frank Chorek, right, which is like a purely apologetic type work. 
Um, and Swinburne himself is, of course, I think, holds like the chair of Christian philosophy at Oxford University, which is, you know, like a, a, a permanent chair for some philosopher to hold studying, who, who's uh, uh, someone who studies Christian philosophy. Um, and so, yeah, th this book is supposed to kind of make a, a robust case for, for theism, which is then supposed to be a prelude for he's got like a second book that's supposed to be an introduction to his work, Was Jesus God? Um, which we can do at some point, which is then supposed to make the case specifically for Jesus and uh, Christianity. So this book, um, I, I suppose my fir first comment would be I, I was somewhat sort of um, optimistic about it at the start, just because the general project that he seems to be outlining to do is the right sort of thing that I think that Christians should be doing um, to make the case for Christianity being true, right? So he's basically borrowing some of the the standards that he sees being used in um, theory building in the sciences or in philosophy from philosophy of science and saying, how can we kind of use these alongside all of the various data points that are out there um, to kind of compare theories like atheism versus theism? And I think that that's the right sort of thing that theists and atheists alike should be aiming to do in these discussions. Um, I did, I do end up being kind of disappointed, right? And, and and this could be because maybe the book is just so short that Swinburne doesn't have enough time to actually include all of the kind of details that would satisfy someone like me. But it, it just does feel um, a little bit like you get kind of short change, right? It's like, here, here's ideally, here, here's what it should be doing. I'm like, yeah, that's great. Let's do that. And then the actual argument itself seems to like leave a lot lacking, which I think we'll we'll get into in terms of just leaving out so many data points. The data points that are included are very labored. And then there are lots of kind of there, there are a fair few quite contentious assumptions as well that are doing a lot of work in uh, Swinburne's argument. Right. And uh, I think we're, we'll talk about those points as we go through it chapter by chapter. So I won't say more about that now. But those are my, my initial impressions that I'm kind of like Swinburne's project is like a good a good thing i think i think it's the best way of talking about um theism versus atheism but i am not convinced by the actual like meat he puts on the bones then of his project yeah i think that's a good um a good summary nathan so i quite like i think it might be the first chapter or, or the second one but um when he talk when swinburne talks about the method that he's going to pursue which is essentially uh, the method that Oppie outlines or Oppie advocates for and that I advocate for as well, which is a uh, exercise in theory comparison. So you, you try to set out your data and then you set up your competing theories and you try to evaluate those theories on their explanatory merits and that you should um, proportion your sort of belief in accordance with the uh, explanatory merits of, of the compete, uh, the competing theories. Um, I think that's essentially correct. Um, the issue with the book is that I think he does a very bad job of actually doing that. Um, I think that there's most of the book is uh, one good thing about the book is that it's quite easy to read. It's, it's written quite clearly. Um, but um, often Swinburne doesn't make his arguments very well because he just sort of asserts things without defending them or without even acknowledging that they're controversial, which is one of the things that I find most infuriating about reading uh, pieces that I, well, even that I agree with, to be honest, but especially when one disagrees is when things are just asserted without any acknowledgement that they could be controversial or that they need defense. And Swinburne does that throughout the book. Um, and I don't think it's a sufficient defense to say that it's a short book because you can still acknowledge those things. And there's certainly fat that I would trim from various sections that you could use to, uh, to, to at least mention that. But I think that there's sort of, um, there's there's two main things that that sort of or two main uh, approaches or uh, types of argument that Swinburne makes in this book. One is to basically just ignore anything that naturalists would have to say, or people with other worldviews. But I'll focus on naturalism because that's where I uh, come come to the point, and that's what he sort of focuses on as well as the contrary to to Christianity uh, or theism, I suppose. Um, he just sort of ignores what they have to say and says, "Well, they can't explain this," and so, but here's my explanation. But he he doesn't it really ever attempts to engage in a, even a, like a moderate way or, or in a um, uh, sort of steel man way with, with what a naturalist would actually say about these sort of things. So that's one, but uh, that's one tact he uses basically just to make it easier to refute naturalism by presenting it in an extremely weak way. 
the other tactic he uses is essentially to um, explain everything in virtue of um, the reasons that God has to bring about things. So basically, whenever Swinburne wants to say why something exists, he says, well, that thing is good, and, so, and so for, therefore God has reason to bring it about. And that might seem extreme, but he does this like for almost everything <laughs> throughout the book. He, he um, uses this to explain the existence of not just like humans, but the existence of a physical universe, the existence of a complicated universe, the existence of laws of nature, um, the existence of, of evil, he thinks it also is, is good. Like, so that, that's basically his other, his other tack. Um, so naturalism is bad because he never really develops it or tries to take it seriously, I think. And, and theism works as an explanation because anything that God ends up, anything that he wants to try to explain, he'll say that, that that's a good or enables a good to happen and therefore God has reason to do it. What he doesn't do, which I think is the way you should do this, is to present the phenomena that you're trying to explain and then compare you know, a couple of leading explanations and then try to deduce what the most expected outcomes would be under those explanations relative to the data that you're looking at. So what type of universe would we expect under theism? Like just, just taking the bare definition of theism that, that Swinburne works, works with, what type of universe would we expect under naturalism, for example? But Swinburne never does that. Um, what he always does is that he takes the starting point is what we observe and then g gives a just so story for why this might make sense under theism. But it's one thing to give a just so story and another thing to say, is that what we'd actually most expect under theism? Because I think that in essentially all of the cases, although you can give a just so story, that it sort of, kind of sounds vaguely convincing, it's, it, 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 that's not the same as establishing that this is actually highly expected under theism. Um, and I think that that's really the fundamental flaw with his arguments is that he doesn't actually establish or even try to establish that what he's trying to explain is expected under theism. He just gives some reasons for thinking that it's like, more expected than it kind of could be, but, but never attempts to show that it's more likely than other things that could be, right? Um, and I'll, I'll show many examples of that, I think, over the course of the book. But I think that's his fundamental failure. He doesn't apply the, he doesn't apply this, the, the methodology properly, which is that you, you, you take the phenomena and then compare explanations and see how well those, you would expect that phenomena under the explanations. Um, instead, he never really talks about what naturalism would have as an explanation, and then he doesn't attempt to ex to sort of um, describe what would be expected under theism, but just says, "Well, you can you can understand why that we would observe what we do given theism because blah blah blah," which is not the same as saying, "Is this what you would maximally expect or most likely expect under theism?" Uh, so I think that he he just misapplies the criteria. Which is why the book was quite frustrating because most of it consists of claims which are just not defended, um, or comparisons between naturalism and, and theism, which are unfair because he doesn't really attempt to give any um, give any meat on the bones for a naturalist position. Anyway, so I really don't like this book, although I would kind of recommend it because it's very easy to read and does cover a number of issues in a fairly concise way. Um, yeah, so that's my intro. I, th I think that's one of the most consistently frustrating tropes um about apologetic style arguments when um you just get kind of presented with well materialism just can't explain this data point right <laughs> and but then it's like well is that what any any naturalist or physicalist or materialist would actually say themselves and usually it just isn't the case and there's lots of there's lots of those examples and we find those very frustrating yeah swim swimmen just doesn't Refer to, I mean, this book is about 25 years old, so obviously the very latest uh, thinking in some of these is not going to be present. But these issues are very yeah. old, and 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 so I know I'm not expecting because there aren't like uh, a lot of citations in this book. It is a bit more introductory, but it is also sufficiently advanced or or um, specialized that you you could expect some moderate amount of engagement with some of the major ideas when he's talking about like free will or uh, laws of nature, uh, for example, a problem of evil, but there's just no engagement at all with with what any naturalists have said about this or, or atheists or whoever, which is to me extremely frustrating. It's like, what, who is even he arguing against? The stated goal of the book is to persuade people that God exists, right? But I think that the, the book is spectacularly ineffective at doing that. I think it's only going to be convincing to people who already believe that God exists or at least are kind of like wanting to believe or something. Because other people are just not going to accept when Swinburne just comes out with all of these things. He says, oh, this is true. This is true. This is true. Like, what? I think anyway. it was sort of meant to be, It's so it's meant to be like a popular summary of Swinburne's Christian philosophical work, I think, at the time that he wrote it. But I think it was supposed to be a sort of response to Mackey with like the miracle of theism as well. Um, 
as far as I'm aware, like building is reading that actually. Yeah. So I, I, I think that that's supposed to be like a picture of atheism or whatever that, that he's responding to. But yeah, I, I agree that there just isn't, it, it just isn't like a very strong version. It's like materialism's just like, yeah, just can't explain it. it, it it's not going to be very good as a response to Mackie because Mackie is a moral anti-realist, right? Actually an error theorist. And right. Swinburne, it's his, <laughs> everything that he tries to explain God as doing, he, he explains God as having reasons to do it in virtue of it being good. But but he, but Swinburne never attempts to ex, explain or ground these sources of value right which i think is an issue for him but and, and mackie's not going to accept any of these appeals to value because he doesn't think there's any such thing as good in any um meaningful way right so i don't know that that's going to work as a response to mackie i i can see that though because having read like the first chapter of mackie mackie is interesting because he um unlike some other uh some other thinkers like uh who, who was i reading recently um oh yeah like kai nielsen for example he's one of the older atheist uh, figures from like the 70s and 80s um mackie doesn't seem to have an issue with like the notion of god being incoherent like he's not a kind of a positivist in like a post -pos um, logical positivist or, or leaning in that direction um which i i'm actually a bit critical of him because in his, in his first chapter mackie's saying like yeah we can understand what it means for there to be like an all-powerful being who's like immaterial I'm like well I, i'm not sure about that i think the notion is quite dodgy but so the point is that the 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 kind of conception of god that mackie gives in his like first chapter is quite similar to what swinburne says i think in swinburne's first chapter about like a minimal conception of god like extrapolating from properties that humans have and, and talking about god as like a a person with like heaps of power or something like that so i can kind of see how they're on the same page in that respect but i don't see how swinburne's work here is going to be uh, effective against mackie because yeah uh, swinburne is relying so much on his um on his theory of value which mackie would completely reject and swinburne never defends it in this book so i don't know how exactly how you want to do this um because it could be it just for so the audience know like the the presentation in this one because we're not responding to videos or anything could be fairly sort of dry because we're gonna i think just going to be basically presenting text on the screen and commentating on the text as we go through the book um we've done that before yeah we've we've done that before with like Loke's book and stuff but just so people know in it it's there's not going to be like um i didn't have like an audiobook version or anything to play so it's just going to be us talking basically um so let me share the screen and hopefully someone asked about Mackie's book. So uh, the book that I was, that we were referring to here is the miracle of theism, which I'm partway through. Um, this is, it's an older book. I think it's from the 80, yeah, 1981, at least this version, if people are interested. I think it was the first published in the seventies, maybe late seventies, but maybe. Um, hopefully that's big enough for people to see as well. Um, so, uh, yeah. Swinburne's book 96, if that's of relevance. This one is, but I don't, I don't know if that was when, maybe I'll see on the page in a second if it, um, if we get to the publishing page, 96 there, six, I'm guessing, and then, then. Told you it was I guess these things are usually in manuscripts and so on um, for a while before. That's probably a bit too big. So yeah, the the contents. Um, the first chapter on on God is basically definitions, where he he's introducing theism and what he means by things. Second chapter, how he explains things, is about um, his his kind of model of theory comparison right so so that's the thing that james was saying well we're probably going to agree with some things but maybe have some questions about some things uh the simplicity of god is basically about how swinburne thinks that hit that theism wins out against atheism so so simplicity the idea of simplicity does a lot of work for him and so that not chapter... divine simplicity critically swinburne is not arguing yes. for that but he does think god is simple but not in that way <laughs> not in that yeah way. It, but basically, it's to say that that various things about these data points on on atheism are just going to be brute, whereas given theism, um, they're not brute. They can be explained in terms of types of sort of agentic causation that he introduces, which is then supposed to provide a kind of like simpler explanation, right? Than than just just postulating that it just is that way. And we'll we'll talk about some of that. Um, how the existence of God explains the world world in its order. I suppose there are various data points in Swinburne tries to kind of like that, that. Well, both of these chapters, 
uh, 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 like that. There are just various data points in Swinburne tries to kind of talk about why God would have reasons to bring about those states of affairs. Yeah, so I I didn't see a strong distinction between those two chapters uh, personally. And in them, he talks about uh, essentially that your standard kind of cosmological, teleological arguments, uh, a bit about evolution, like the origin of humans. Oh, and he also talks about the... Um, the, the human mind i guess five yeah. was a bit more about the human mind and, and an argument for substance dualism i suppose uh maybe he could have titled that a bit differently but yeah so basically in this book which is one of the reasons why it's a fairly good introduction um swinburne makes at least variations he doesn't always use the terms but he makes variations of a cosmological argument a fine-tuning argument a moral argument and he appeals to miracle arguments though he doesn't go into details about like the specifics but he talks about miracles obviously um sort of preempting chapter seven there. Oh, and he gives a defense of, uh, gives a theodicy as well. So he kind of touches on the major arguments. The one that he doesn't talk about is a moral argument. Um, and that's because, well, I think it, the reason is because Swinburne has a different view about the relationship between God and morality to say Craig. So Swinburne couldn't run a Craig type moral argument. He could run a different form of moral argument, but he doesn't in this book. Um, but he, the point is he discusses many of the other major issues, which is one of the reasons why this is a useful intro, I think. Yeah. Um, and so the, the why God allows evil obviously is responding to, you know, what's supposed to be the the most, the strongest um, piece of evidence against theism, um, the existence of evil. And then as, J as James just said, miracles and religious experience. But I, I think the reason that's in a separate chapter is because um, miracles and religious experience have sort of been been considered to be these separate sort of arguments specifically for theism. So I think he, I think he's sort of put them in a separate chapter there um and then the so what i think is just inviting people to to continue to explore the question and talk uh, and talk about why this is important so so obviously coming from his christian bent right he he, he kind of wants to persuade people um that theism is true and i suppose to, be, to become religious and I, and in that epilogue he kind of talks a little bit about how we sort of have to make a decision and again I, th I think there are some kind of questionable things there in how Swinburne is conceiving um you know like the motivating factors for someone exploring these questions right that might not be agreed to by someone who isn't a theist or or uh, and is maybe looking at least in my view a bit more um objectively or dispassionately at, at the evidence they might they might come to some different conclusions about so what um for all of this so we'll I think, talk about I think it would be good to clarify. I mean, he does sort of, um, I think we can skip the intro, but um, uh, Swinburne sort of says this, but just that, so that we're clear. Um, Swinburne in this book is arguing for the existence of a traditional kind of theistic God. He's not arguing for the truth of Christianity. He mentions Christian doctrines or some particulars a few times, but they're not, they're not really that relevant to the core argument. As Nathan mentioned, he has a separate book where he talks about that. Um, so that's one thing. Um, that I wanted to highlight at the outset, just so that people understand what he is arguing for. Although I think that it is clear, as particularly in the miracles argument, that he's thinking about it in a very uh, Christian way, which is maybe not surprising, but he's not directly arguing for that in this book. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, th I think this sort of um, short paragraph is a good overview of what he's trying to do. So I'll just yeah. read, the basic structure of my argument is this, scientists, historians, and detectives observe data and proceed thence to some theory about what best explains the occurrence of these data. We can analyze the criteria which they use in reaching a conclusion that a certain theory is better supported by the data than a different theory. That is, is more likely on the basis of those data to be true. Using those same criteria, we find that the view that there is a God explains everything we observe, not just some narrow range of data. Um, and then you've put that this last clause is sort of a bit of a red flag, right, in terms of theories and explanation. Do you want to talk about that point? Or? Yes. So I think that the, I, I think as I sort of you can see the comment there, I think his method is sound. But when I when read the last sentence there, God explains everything we observe. He's even italicized everything. As you say, that is a red flag for me, because if a hypothesis, well, the way that I think one can uh, articulate it slightly more carefully, if a hypothesis is able to equally equally explain all possible outcomes, then it has no explanatory power. Um, that is not quite what Swinburne says. He's saying that it can explain everything we observe. Now, it's still possible that um, God, it, the existence of God is like maximally consistent with what we observe, but would be inconsistent with other things that we don't observe. Um, 
one of my complaints is that Swinburne never really addresses this point. He just gives a story as to why God would want to create the type of world we uh, we live in and never really asks the question, well, well, what other things might he have reason to create or how likely would other states of affairs be under under the theist? But even so, um, it's just suspicious uh, as a general rule, I think, when someone claims that they have one explanation for everything um, as to how plausible that really is, um, especially when it's God, <laughs> like a, a supernatural agent. So I, I just, yeah, that's a red flag for me. Um, and I think that the fundamental issue from my point of view is that Swinburne doesn't have one explanation for everything he buries many different explanations under the label God. What he actually has is a different explanation for each phenomenon, which appeals to different types of good. So what he says is that God has reason to create this in virtue of the good that it brings about. But then he postulates many different types of good for explaining different things. And that's actually not one thing. That's that's a, because according to him, goodness exists independently of God. Um, I don't think Swinburne realizes how much his uh, explanations are actually contingent on him postulating different types of good with or goodness without explaining why we should think that that's the case. There's other things as well. But um, so the point is that Swinburne says that God explains everything, which is sus. But actually, if you dig under the um, dig behind the wall here, um, look behind the curtain, perhaps is a better way to say it. And think about what he actually says here in this book. God is not what is uh, what provides the bedrock of his explanations. It's actually it's actually value, different types of goodness that provide the the bedrock, right? Because what he wants to say is that God had reason to act in a certain way in virtue of bringing about a certain type of goodness. And then he just postulates all sorts of different types of goodness um, that allow that give reasons for God to do this and this and this and this. Um, so it actually, it's not one thing that explains everything. It's different types of uh, different types of goodness. We'll, we'll see that as we go. Yeah, and I, th I think obviously we both we both agree that the overarching um, method here is sort of the correct one. But I, I think that in terms of that last clause, right, there's there's a sense in which any sort of theory of everything in the sense that we're having a discussion about atheism or theism is supposed to explain every data point that there is, right? So, so there's sort of that sense of explains everything that we observe, but then any theory that's kind of on the table should in that sense explain everything that we observe, right? And it, any kind of theory that sort of doesn't sh sort of almost shouldn't be on the table um but then there is this sort of other concern the thing that you said which is going to be this this kind of red red flag about um uh, uh, about kind of post diction or or kind of ad hoc explanation right where uh, and this is this is a problem that i think swinburne kind of hand waves around where he just says what well, he he, he, he says later on, you know, that there's just this logical relationship between hypothesis and evidence, and that's all we're concerned about. But there's actually a very tricky sort of debate in amongst in philosophy of science, in um, statistics and so on, about, you know, prediction versus post-diction and kind of retrofitting um, explanations to data when we're already aware of what it is that we have to explain. Um, and, and this discussion is also a big part of um, kind of distinct, d distinguishing or demarcating like genuine science from pseudoscience as well, right? Where where oftentimes a hallmark of, of pseudosciences can be that they engage in this kind of post-diction, right? And then whatever happens to be the case is in fact explained by the theory. And there's, there's never any way of actually um, falsifying it or finding out that you're wrong if it is in fact wrong. And, and, and these are kind of like, Big, big big concerns and contentious issues that are talked about in all of these fields and Swinburne just kind of doesn't doesn't talk about uh, about any of that and I, I think that the, this this clause is a red flag for for that way potentially leading us into that way of thinking right and and um the specifics of that will become clearer a bit later on okay so at the start then this first chapter on God um, my topic is the claim that there is a God understood in the way that Western religion, Christianity, Judaism, and Islam has generally understood the, cla the claim. Um, I call that theism. So, I mean, obviously, this is a very specific um, conception of God, which is perfectly fine, right? Because he says that that's what he's doing. But already we we have like, we've specified, you know, you know, we've ruled out some sort of things, I suppose, in, in what theism could be, maybe more kind of Eastern conceptions or, you know, things like 
pandeism or cosmopsychism or whatever the hell else you know other people are thinking about nowadays in in philosophy of religion trying to be less um less kind of western bias centered i suppose it's also interesting to note i think we'll, we'll get to this in a moment but swinburne has some very non-orthodox views about god so That's swinburne right. is I, you might know more about the precise terms than me, Nathan, but he, he doesn't believe that God knows the future. So I don't know if that makes him an open theist or whether that's slightly yeah, different. Yeah, he is. Yeah, he is. He, okay. Yeah. yeah, so that's one thing. Um, Swinburne also doesn't appear to believe in divine aseity or aseity. Um, he doesn't mention that directly in this book. For, for many comments he makes, I don't, th I don't see how he could believe in that. Um, and also, now there was another major thing that I wanted to mention as well, but I forgot what it was. Um, oh, yeah, that's right. Uh, Swinburne doesn't believe that God... Um, uh nope it went uh, he, he believes that god exists oh it's out, outside it's of about, time yeah 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 I, he believes that god exists outside of time I, I realize i'm confusing with what craig says craig thinks that god came into came into time with creation but i think swinburne thinks right. he exists outside of time is that it or or it's the other way well i think craig it, says that god uh, it'll say is, later actually i've just forgot we can just get to it when it but yeah the point i just craig says god is atemporal few... and omnitemporal i think is craig yes yes craig. that's right and he has like two modes of being or something anyway we'll get to it but i just wanted to highlight that swinburne has some rather non-orthodox views about god which are actually critical to his to his arguments actually which i just think is interesting um so theism claims that god is a personal being uh, that is in some sense in some sense a person and you know i wh whenever i'm reading sort of these works the these sort of works where we're talking about highly speculative metaphysics i think the sort of the in some sense um sort of indicates you know that that we're we're getting into some kind of highly speculative it, it can do a lot of work right to convince us like oh in some sense right <laughs> but i think that when we're talking about something where we're supposed to be establishing what it is we pro we probably sort of shouldn't give a free sense now now swimburne a, a, a free a free pass to this sort of in some sense language now swimburne does in the next sentence try to kind of elaborate in that by a person i mean an individual with basic powers to act intentionally purposes and beliefs but then it's like, are any of these things, you know, less contentious or better, better established, you know, ba le like basic powers, for example, are, ju are just almost going to be, be assumed. Well, he, here. he defines that here, right? Although he says basic action, but I assume he means the same thing there. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe we could just outline what he means by that and then, um, and, and then, then talk come back to this. Criticisms of it. Yeah. yeah. So a basic action is one which a person does intentionally just like that and not by doing any other intentional action. So that, so the idea here is, you know, I, I move my finger and according to Swinburne, that's a basic action. And <laughs> the idea, I, I, I shouldn't laugh because that's like poison, well poisoning, right? But the idea is that I just do it. it like the, there's various recordings of Swinburne saying this, you know, I just do move my finger. Um, there's not some kind of further story. And, and this kind of comes into to Swinburne's view here of this kind of like agentic causation, right? Where it's like, well, agents just do perform basic actions and then there isn't some kind of there isn't some sort of like deeper causal story to be told other than the agent causing that action to come about right so so he, he contrasts it against a non-basic action which is done by virtue of other other things happening so he talks about going from oxford to london here um so that that's done by virtue of um going to the station getting on the train and so on like you don't you don't just do going to Oxford, though. In some sense, I guess you'd have to say that there are various basic actions involved in that. You know, like his choosing to go there rather than somewhere else, or um, his choosing to move his legs to walk there, or whatever. Um, so, an initial problem I think with this, from my my point of view, is is again that that just seems like very brute, right? It's like, what, what, well, why do these things happen? Or they just do. <laughs> um, it, it's not really revealing anything. It, it, it's just very suspicious on the face of it to me. To, to uh, And I suppose Swinburne would argue the other way. He'd say, well, it just seems to him like there are these basic actions. Like I just am moving my hands. I just am doing things. But it, it on the face of it, for me, this is like a very, a very suspicious notion. Yeah, so uh, he, Swinburne does actually say by basic power, I mean a power to perform a basic action. So, so 
that is what he's talking about here. This is actually really important here. That's why I say <laughs> this is important um, because remember he is saying that, uh, so he's defining God as, can you just scroll up a little bit so we get the top of yeah, that, sure. that um, page? Yeah. He's defining God as a person and a person is defined as an individual with, they need to have three things. So basic powers or the capabilities of performing basic actions, purposes and beliefs. So that's the sense in, in which he wants to say that God is a person. Um, and he would say that humans have these three things and God has them. And so that's the sense in which we're both people. Obviously, God differs in other ways. But, uh, for example, persons don't have to have bodies, according to Swinburne. Um, so uh, let's think about those three different things. So let's start with beliefs, right? Um, obviously, well, if you're skeptical about folk psychology, you might be skeptical about belief talk. But most people would be fine, including most philosophers, to say that humans have beliefs, right? That's some kind of cognitive state that maybe represents the world or reflects our dispositions to act in a certain way or whatever, right? Um, but think about God. Right? Does God have beliefs? Now, I suppose it's going to depend on how you want to, or could God have beliefs? Maybe it's a better way to phrase it. Now, I suppose it's going to depend on how you want to deploy belief language, right? But remember, God is supposed to be omniscient. Does a, a God who is omniscient or an omniscient being have any need for belief? Now, I'm skeptical about that, right? Because the whole point of, of the concept of a belief is that it has it, it's some sort of mental construct or, or entity or right. whatever, which is differentiated from reality, right? Because beliefs yes. aren't always true, right? That's sort of the point. But God doesn't have that, right? God doesn't yeah, have God any distinction. God just has direct access is, to the state. Yeah, he just has di direct <laughs> access to everything that is. I mean, Swimmer doesn't believe that he um, knows the future. Maybe that maybe God could have beliefs about the future. I'm not sure, but certainly about other things, God wouldn't have beliefs. He would just have direct access to the the fact of the matter. So I'm not sure it really makes much sense to talk about beliefs. Like, think about this: how could God? How could God? Uh, how could God form a belief? All of the ways that humans form beliefs seem unavailable to him, right? I mean, God doesn't like talk to people and and learn from them, or he doesn't have perception. Like, he doesn't form beliefs on the basis of his percepts. He doesn't need to remember things because like, it's not like he can forget something. It's just all is present to him. And the concept of, of failure things... seems quite important to human belief as well. That yeah. So can... how, yeah. And justification. So how beliefs are justified, how they formed and the possibility of them being true or false. None of these things seem relevant to God. Right. Um, so I suppose you might say, yeah, well it's beliefs, but they work very differently for God. I think that's the best you could get. Right. You could just say that it's the a belief, a, a divine belief is just his way of knowing something, right? But my my criticism there, which I've made before, is that if you're going to use this language of folk psychology and appeal and apply it to God, that the the terms have to have pretty similar um, usage. Maybe not exactly the same because we we can't extend definitions, but it has to be sufficiently similar to warrant the use of the same term. And I don't think it is sufficiently similar. It seems that it's almost entirely different <laughs> to beliefs in the sense that humans have them. And so I, I think that it's really dubious that God does have anything like beliefs, right? Um, and unsurprisingly, I'm going to say similar things about the other two, right? So purposes is interesting because um, the way Swinburne talks about purposes, it seems to be, well, as we'll see later, I don't actually see how Swinburne can defend the claim that God has free will. In fact, I think that Swinburne's notion of free will is extremely confusing um, or extremely confused. But we'll get to that later. But well, I think I think it, uh, uh, importantly for Swinburne, he's saying once things are created, then God has obligations to act in certain ways towards them. But I think I think what he has is he's going to have a lot of issue with is why God would in fact freely create in the first place anyway if he's self sufficient and so on, right? Because why 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 does God have purposes? to do anything at that point other than just kind of contemplate himself and his own glory is very bizarre. Yes, well, Swinburne says that the purposes that God has, pretty much everywhere he says that God's purposes arise from his um, re the reasons that he has to bring about a, a valuable or a good state, right? And again, Swinburne thinks there are many types of value, so that's how he gets God to do lots of things. There's an issue there with how it is that there can be things that are valuable outside of God. That's not a traditional notion uh, for, for theists. But even putting that aside, um, the issue here is that Swinburne, later he says that, I just think this is so bizarre. He says that someone who was, who was purely like perfectly rational would always do the best thing, the, the thing that they had most reasons to do, right? And since God presumably is, is perfectly rational, now this is me extrapolating, Swinburne doesn't say this, but it seems that God would always have only one option available. He would always just choose the thing that he has most reasons to do, unless there was a tie, I suppose. Um, but if that's the case, then God doesn't have any 
there's no sense in which God could have done otherwise because he, he could and would only ever do the thing that has, he has most resources to do. So what I want to say here is that the notion of purpose is a bit suspicious here because it doesn't seem that God has purposes in the way that humans do, where we have some kind of goal or objective that we strive to achieve or that we, we um, take actions to, uh, to affect. God simply always does what he has the most reason to achieve and can never fail in achieving his object either. So is purpose the right way to describe this? I'm, I'm not convinced. Um, it seems to be very different to uh, the nature of Jesus. And I think I'll articulate there a bit more when we get to him talking about free will, because I think that his conception of free will is just utterly bizarre. And basic powers, now coming to, coming back to this one again, this one is a bit of a um, different because uh, basic powers is not a part of folk psychology. He, it's effectively Swinburne's made up this term as far as I know, right, uh, in terms of a basic action. Now, I'm very suspicious of this notion of a basic action, as I put in the comment there. I don't know where this notion comes from. This is an example of what Swinburne does repeatedly throughout this book, where he just sort of makes a distinction or makes a point or, or asserts something and then kind of says, well, here's, here's how you can make sense of that without really explaining why you should accept this at all. Like, it's one thing to say, look, a basic action is something that you just do intentionally and directly, like raising your arm. Okay, I can kind of get that idea, but that's not sufficient to establish that it's a meaningful or useful distinction just because you can kind of say something vaguely about it. Like I could I could say that a splorge action is one that I take with my left toe involved. But why would we care about a splorge action? Or like does that meaningfully distinguish it from actions that have other toes involved? Or like what what does it mean for your toe to be involved in the action? You see what I mean? Like just because there's a distinction maybe to that you can kind of vaguely articulate doesn't mean that it's useful for anything. And, and this is not a nitpick because he's using the notion of a basic action to ground the understanding of what a, what a, what a person is. So it needs to do some work here. So we need to make sure that it's a valid, like robust kind of distinction or concept. And I contend that there's no meaningful distinction that I'm aware of in like psychology or neuroscience between a basic action and a non-basic action. Maybe you can draw some extremes, right? But like I give the example in the, the comment that I make about walking, like when we walk, we are not conscious of all of the stages of walking and i don't even mean individual muscles i mean like swinging one leg putting a foot down and so forth we don't think about that at all we just walk right or likewise in talking um but but you you can do those things as basic actions like if i want to swing my leg i i could but so it, what is the basic action here is it like swinging the leg or is it walking or is it like walking at a certain speed or like what is the basic action it, it's unclear because i think the reason it's unclear is because swinburne defines basic action as one that you make intentionally and directly, like not 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 a consequence of something else, but just a direct intentional action. And by placing intention or like conscious awareness at the crux of the definition, um, he ends up in trouble because there isn't a sharp distinction of things that we're consciously aware of and not. We can be consciously aware of certain things, but then they can recede into our subconscious and, and we sort of perform them. The brain does them all, right? But certain, like for example, when I'm breathing, normally I'm not aware of that, but you can become aware of it. And often that may change your breathing. I can like force it or I can just be aware of it while I'm doing it and, and have a sort of intention of I'm breathing. You've like. just ruined our listener's experience. <laughs> yeah, <I> just, <laughs> likewise with walking, like you can walk while thinking about it and kind of like intentionally walk in a certain way, but you can also just walk, right? And not not really think about it. Um, or I can, I maybe it's even higher. Like I don't even think about walking. I'm just thinking about getting there or like, I don't know, rushing to something. I'm not even thinking about myself moving. So what I'm saying is I don't think that there's this real meaningful distinction between something that's an intentional action or a non-intentional action. Uh, maybe there is in specific instances, but not like at a, level, at a level of like powers that you have. Because you see here, what, what he wants to do is he wants to define God's power, uh, basic powers in terms of the basic actions that he can take. We'll see that in a moment. But I don't think that this distinction really makes a whole lot of sense uh, because the, the notion of intention here is, is so critical. And I just don't think there's a real distinction. It's more of a spectrum and it's contextual about how intentional a particular action is. Um, and so you know, uh, this is, of course, I'm appealing to humans here. Maybe it's, I guess it's different to God, right? Because God, whatever he does, he just does kind of directly, I guess. Like all of his powers are basic powers, as far as I understand it, uh, according to how Swinburne says. So, of course, you can always just say, look, that stuff just doesn't apply to God, right? That's that messiness and whatever. That's just humans. But that comes back to my criticism. If you can't predicate the, if these things can only be predicated of humans, but then their meaning changes almost entirely when applied to God, does it make any sense to predicate them of God? And does it make sense then to call God a person? If, if by basic power, you mean something very different, if by purpose, you mean something very different to a human purpose. And if by belief, you mean something very different to a human belief, then by person, you must mean something very different than a human person. And so why use the word person? I think that the issue with person here is that it's appealing to a sort of a, a, a tendency that we have to anthropomorphize 
which I think you can give psychological and evolutionary arguments that support that. Um, but it's actually it's actually sort of befuddling us into thinking that we've got more of an understanding about what we're thinking about than we do. Because when you unpack these things, these like the, these three aspects here, I don't really think they work when attributed to God without massively changing them. Yeah, I agree. I, I think that we we have to be very careful with a sort of like bias in human thinking, right, about teleological personal explanations. So the appeal, so so we should be more suspicious about the appeal to to person than than less in the first place. Just knowing, you know, the the information we do about um, what what psychology has to say and uh, um and the kind of evolutionary psychology about that, but um on the basic powers thing as well. So I think I think one thing for Swinburne there is that um, the principle of credulity, which is kind of similar to phenomenal conservatism, is going to be doing a lot for him there. So he's just going to say, well, it just kind of seems to me that it's that way, right? But I, I don't think that when it comes to the way that things seem, that we can actually read these kind of highly controversial um, metaphysical theses about, you know, because, and and there's always that clause that gets ignored of absent any defeaters as well. And there are potentially, you know, some some kind of defeaters, right, to the seeming there which might come in the form of like causal closure of the physical, for example. Now, Swinburne can obviously reject things like that and, you know, provide reasons to do so and have, you know, like a co coherent system and stuff. But I think that if he's going to do that, he should at least make it clear. And then, and then I think he should, he should make it clear that, that he's going to have to bite that bullet. Um, and that's going to be a kind of mark against adopting his theory. Um, but then also that's going kind of beyond the seeming, right? <laughs> because it's like, so, so you know, do, does the seeming also include the content of like re re rejecting all of this physics and stuff, which is going to have to include, um, which, which includes like a whole a whole bunch of extra content, in my view. And then the other thing is going to be about um, the analogy, the, the the kind of analogous sense of of basic power. Is so so in the case of of us just wiggling our finger or something. Suppose we grant Swinburne, yeah, that is a basic action, right? But then in the case of God, God's basic actions are just incredibly different to us. So in the same way that God's beliefs and purposes are different, God's basic powers are things like, you know, creating matter ex nihilo or sustaining a law of nature, right? And that's not something that I or any any person that I know, um, I mean, that sounds kind of question begging, right? Because I'm saying I don't know God. So, I mean, maybe that's good. But at least... I, no, the but I would say it's question begging to use the, the other term way in the same right. way when it's not yeah. been established that that you can. And remember that God's in, well, maybe not remember, we haven't quite got to that. God's basic powers are supposed to be unlimited. I mean, th there are certain restrictions, right? But but there's an un there's an infinite number of things that he has basic powers to do. That's definitely not true for humans. So in, in the case that we definitely agree to, right, of, of, of you and I being persons, um, we don't have anything like these sort of basic powers, right? And, it's, and it seems to me that it's yet to be established that you could it, again there's just something very suspicious about introducing this term basic power right and then it becomes this free grab bag of anything can be done basically like that that is to be a step like yeah okay maybe moving a body wiggling a finger thinking a new thought or something maybe those sorts of things could be basic powers if i'm just gonna give a lot of kind of credence to, to my seeming but like creating stuff out of nothing um creating things with like causal dispositions and so on like why why think that that is a legitimate um, basic power that a, a mind can just do, right? Like that's very, very, very weird in the in the first place. Um, so, yes, so exactly. In the case of God, it's it, it's very um, different to, to in the case of persons. Uh, okay. So yeah, God. This this was what you were just saying. Then God's basic powers are supposed to be infinite. He can bring about as a basic action any event he chooses, and he does not need bones or muscles to operate in certain ways in order to do so. Uh, that's just sort of. I mean, I suppose so he's I think defining we should take this as part of the definition of of yeah. what God would be. Yeah, but notice defined... that this is completely different to how basic powers work for humans, which always need a mediating, and Swinburne agrees with this, they need a mediating mechanism to bring about those basic actions. Whereas he just says, well, God doesn't need that. So that's a that's a big difference, right? So, but we're supposed to still use the same word. And again, I'm going to harp on this because it, it matters, right? You, I don't think you can get away with just taking a word that we have some familiarity with, and then applying it in a, such a different way in a, a very different context, and then still saying that well, it's kind of the same though. I, I, basically, I think that God, if God exists, he can't be a person. He's going to be something very different to a person. Maybe he has certain things analogous, which is a different view of God, right? Which is that there's certain analogies you can make, but that's different to, that's not Swinburne's view. Swinburne's view is that God is a person. 
Uh, and I, th- I think that the problem is basically that because because God can be kind of used as a noun, right? You can you can create these sentences that sound like they have the correct form to people, but we're actually we we give them a free pass where perhaps we shouldn't. So you can sort of say, like, I can construct a sentence like, you know, my desk, my desk knows all true facts or something. Or I could say, like, you know, my desk is moving a teapot between Earth and Mars. I get like I, get, I can make those sentences and they sound like right sentences. My computer is in a bad mood today because it's been playing up. That's the sort of thing we would say, right? And you can kind of understand the meaning of that. That doesn't mean it, it has like a mind, or right? Yeah. But but I'm, I'm saying like we might we might give those things a free pass, and if the, if it's a word like God, where we we're kind of like unsure what to actually put in the content of what it can and can and can't do, you know, we might think that there's this whole discourse taking place, which is perfectly perfectly legitimate. But um, that but but actually, what we're talking about is is completely different from the ordinary way that we would use any of the things that we're predicating of that noun, right? So like like knowing, believing, or or performing certain actions. And I don't, again, we should we shouldn't just give things a free pass because they have the correct sort of like grammatical form, right? Um, of like you know, noun v- is verbing or something like that. <laughs> um, instead, because that's the thing that's supposed to be established that this this noun is in fact doing any of this verbing and just kind of like baking it into these sentences and things when it's highly different to to the ways that we're actually familiar with is should be very suspicious to people. Um. Okay, God is supposed to be omniscient. That is, He knows everything. I mean, again, I'm so, I'm sort of okay with accepting that. Though you have, this is what you you were saying before about um, how God's beliefs are like ours. You know, they're very kind of different, like justification or direct access to things. Yeah, well, I say that if knowledge is justified true belief or something like justified true belief, then I don't know that God can have knowledge because I don't know how his beliefs could be justified. He's supposed to, I mean, I suppose you could invent a new form of justification that applies only to God, right? I'm not exactly sure what that would look like, but it's it's not going to be, it's not going to be any type of justification that is used to, to justify human knowledge, whether it's internal or external. So again, you sense of knows that's different. Yeah, so well, that's like, the thing. My table knows. <laughs> <laughs> again, you, you can maybe come up with something, but that, my point is that it's going to be very different to human type knowledge. And so whenever we use these words, we're not really using them in the same way. And I don't think it's a small difference. I think it's a, these are major differences about how we're using these predicates. And I think that all, that all of that mitigates against using the notion of person, which also, because uh, the thing is, I think what, what use of person does is that it tries to get us into a mode where we think we have a familiarity with the type of thing we're talking about. And it, it makes it cognitively easier to process the arguments and to make them seem plausible, especially when he starts appealing to intentions. But I want to push back against this and say, no, we don't have familiarity with the type of being God would be if there was a God. He would be utterly different and alien to anything we could understand. And therefore, we we shouldn't just readily accept or feel comfortable with these type of um, appeals to um, everyday cognitive terms or or purposes or whatever. Um, Because they they can't be anything like that they would apply in terms of... um, in terms of with actual people yeah i'm, I'm trying to think of human, a, good, a good example a, a good example where expanding um like a, the de- the definition of knows right from from people to maybe something else is sort of justified so in the case in the case of like people talking about my computer knows the time or something um people have expanded i suppose the the use of knows from from people to something that's fairly different a computer to say a computer knows the time and that's kind of motivated by the way that we we do in fact use computers to kind of like offload some some cognition i suppose to its sort of managing clock cycles whatever and and presenting it some digits us with some digits that represent the time so we use that you know we use nose in that case for the computer even though it's different to people and and it's kind of it it, it's motivated by by what we're in fact doing. Now, when I think about now, imagine this other case where I just say like um, I don't know the green aliens know the time or something, right? It's like okay, well maybe if I'm if I'm creating a piece of fiction or something where I've specified some more about you, you know m- maybe then talking about the way that the aliens know or something might make sense. But if I'm actually trying to convince you that there are green aliens and they know the time, and it's just purely bit like what? Why would you? Why would you think that they're the kind of thing that can know in this way, that it's appropriate to speak of them, to talk of them knowing in this way and that it's in fact true? And I think that that's sort of, 
what's going on here when we talk about God knowing, right? It's just, it's just so different to anything that we're familiar with. Um, and just a, a note there, I actually discussed this sort of issue about use of psychological terms with uh, in describing current day artificial intelligence in um, my recent podcast episode where I talk about this, because this is an ongoing issue with respect to how we talk about like current AIs or whether that do they know things, do they understand things? When is it appropriate to predicate that? So this isn't just an issue with respect to God. It, it comes up elsewhere as well. But I think it's, it's actually going to be much more of an issue with respect to God, because God is much more different to us, I, I would argue, than current AI systems are, are to us. Um, the AI systems are limited and, and and embodied and actually kind of interact with the world in some similar ways, like by reading text, for example. None of those things are true of God. So I, I think if, if we're concerned about the applicability of these terms with respect to, say, animals or current machines, much more so should we be concerned about the applicability of these terms with respect to an omniscient, omnipotent, disembodied mind. Um so yeah, th this thing about God being perfectly free in that um, oh, this desires so never weird. exert causal so influence weird. on him. So, it, so I suppose the idea is that someone could have desires that sort of like force them to do a certain thing, whereas God isn't like that. I don't think it's supposed to be deterministic that, that desires force you, but they like impinge on you or something. He talks more about this later when he goes over this in the chapter on free will and the, the mind so maybe we can come back to this but sure. this is i just find this utterly bizarre his notion of a perfectly free is a being that has no desires that affect them and later he says that such a being will always act in accordance with what they have most reason to do but the thing is if you and it's clear that um actually i don't know if he mentions this by name but it's clear that Swinburne is talking about freedom in terms of libertarian agency and that's normally understood as could have done otherwise like kind of factually or if all of the facts were the same, you could still choose one or the other. So both options are sort of radically open to you. Um, so there is a possible world that is identical in every way, except that you made the different choice, at least like up to that point in time, it's identical, except that you make the different choice. Now, the issue here is that it seems, this is what I mentioned before, it seems by Swinburne's notion, um, God in the same circumstance will always choose the same thing because he will always choose what he has most reason to do, unless I suppose there's a precise yes. tie, but absent that, um, then, um, God will only ever choose the one thing. And therefore there is no possible world that is identically the same up to that point, except that God chooses a different thing. And so it actually would seem to follow that God doesn't have free will in those cases. He would only have the ability to choose if there's like, yeah. either if he's acting for no reason at all, which I'm not sure, which Swinburne normally doesn't say he wants to say God acts for reasons or if he has equally compelling reasons both ways and then he just kind of uh, flips a coin um, but this is a really bizarre notion of freedom that that reasons like that that, that having um what, what does he say here desires is it uh, yeah um desires desires yeah I was just checking the word yeah having desires makes you unfree whereas often freedom is is understood in terms of choosing in accordance with your desires not in the absence of desire. I just right. don't, I've never met this notion of free will where well, it's like having your, desires it's like, makes you less free. <laughs> like, well, it's as though I think I think this is because of how Swinburne is thinking about um, you know, freedom as like this kind of like causal mechanism or something, right? Like in the in that libertarian way. Where yeah. it's like, well, freedom is just choosing for a basic action. So if there are these desires that are exerting causal influence on what you choose, then you're not free to just do whatever. But then it's it's like, well, that, that as you say, that's just not how I think about freedom at all, because I think about freedom in terms of, uh, I mean, in, this, in the more compatibilist way, which is as long as I'm choosing what I, in fact, want to do, then I'm free, right? Rather than it just being this sort of first, this like metaphysical notion of freedom, like uh, this yeah. first causey. Well, the, the first cause that. thing is, is problematic, because I, I think that Swinburne is touching on a real issue here, is that how is it that... You know, imagine a situation where you can choose between, you know, what, the right thing to do and the wrong thing to do. Never mind how we specify that. Let's just imagine it's a simple scenario, right? And let, let's say that we, we gradually kind of ramp up the difficulty of choosing the right choice. Like we make it more and more costly. It's more painful, more difficult, social costs, whatever. Like, and you can imagine that, well, as we do that, as we kind of like make tempt people more, 
fewer and fewer people choose the correct option, right? Uh, because they're, they're more easily tempted. It's harder to overcome. Now, this is a very, I think, ni- uh, intuitive idea. And it's an idea that I think theists would accept. In fact, Swinburne talks about this later on when he talks about overcoming evil and temptation and stuff like that. Now, the problem here is that people are supposed to be fr- radically free, like have libertarian agency in all of these situations. So why is it that changing the causal setup of the situation changes, like systematically changes what people d- do? Like, like in, in the one case, maybe 50-50 choose the good thing, but then it's like only 40% and then 30% and 20%. How, how is this causal effect, which is reliable and reproducible, made on people's choice if it's, if it's not causally determined? Because a libertarian choice is supposed to be non-causally right. determined. But yet yeah. you can, you can um, reliably, uh, by manipulating the, the situation, have a, a causal effect on the outcome. And that seems inconsistent with the whole notion of libertarian choice. And so I think that that's, I mean, I don't know exactly if that's how he's thinking about it, but that seems to be why you would want to say that actually uh, desires and other like circumstances kind of like take away your freedom because they kind of bias you to one direction. Um, and that gets around this issue. But then the problem is, what is it to choose freely? It, it, yes, normally, yeah. the idea is we have is to choose freely is to choose what I want, or at least in some sense of what I want. Maybe I have to think about what I really want. And I, I have to weigh up like different wants. But but under this, it's like, no, no, no. To choose freely is to not have any wants or desires. <laughs> You're maximally free when you don't want anything. So instead of freedom being choosing what you want, it's to not want anything. And then you're maximally free. So this idea of choosing on the basis of what you want completely goes out the window uh, under this conception of, of desires as like constraining freedom, <laughs> which is a yeah. really weird notion of freedom, I think. And I think it's worth bearing in mind that as we engage in theory comparison, right, that so so given a given some sort of like naturalist competing hypothesis they just have this one type of connection between desires and what freedom means to explain and embed in their theory right whereas swinburne has these like this notions of perfect freedom and mm. the uh, and the way that it's connected to desires and then the way that desires do impinge on freedom and what freedom means what what it really means to be libertarianly free, all of which he has to kind of explain and describe the kind of different causal mechanisms between in the case of God and in the case of people, all embedded in his theory, which is all extra complexity and stuff built into the theory. It's all extra content that just is, isn't is there in the case of like a kind of naturalist theory. Yeah, so, so remember in the next chapter, the, uh, theism. Swinburne's going to talk about how uh, theism is a very simple explanation. So al- already we've got quite a lot of complexity built in about things that he, ne- not just things that have to be true of God, but also like things that have to be true in general, like the notion of freedom, for example, the notion of this perfect freedom. And, and remember the attributes of personhood that we talked about, things that have to kind of work the way that he says they are. Um, the more of that that he adds, the more complex his, his postulate becomes. And he doesn't seem to recognize this, uh, but we will come to that later. So here he's talking about how God can't do things that are logically impossible. Um, I have an issue with this because it, it, this is this. Uh, I'm I don't know a great deal about this, but th- it, articulating exactly what God can and cannot do is is disputed in the literature, which is sort of unsurprising because it, it turns out to be quite hard to give a precise definition that rules out everything you want and rules in the things you want. And in particular, if you want to say that God is kind of bound by the laws of logic then you have to ask the question about, well, what is the metaphysical status of the laws of logic? Why is God bound by them? I mean, there are non-classical logics where you can have true contradictions and things like that. Like, why is there like one true logic that somehow is is binding on God? It's a little bit strange to me. Um, I, yeah. I, I think the best way to make sense of this would be to s- say somehow that these are part of his nature. But then you could ask, well, couldn't his nature be different? Or like, wh- why is it in this way? So, I'm not, I don't have a firm exact answer there, but I, I do think that this is a bit sus. Uh, thoughts on this, yeah. Nathan? Well, it's it's just that I, I think that the reason that this gets in is because we have a very hard time understanding what we're talking about when we talk about logically impossible things or, mm-hmm. you know, like it's like, oh, imagine a square circle or something and we just don't know what the hell we're thinking about. But I think that lots of these notions that are being introduced, like being, you know, perfectly free or being able to perform a basic action where you just will a world into existence or whatever, like these sort of things are, are things that I sort of just don't honestly understand at all what I'm even supposed to be conceiving because when I'm conceiving um I, I'm conceiving something that isn't spatial so I don't know what I'm thinking of what I'm representing in my mind in the first place that isn't in time bringing about time which is a temp but I can only imagine that temporal so that's something that I just can't conceive right in the same way that I can't conceive of like a square circle or something and I I, I just want to say that like 
God being able to perform logically impossible things just seems just as weird as many of the other things that we're being convinced of. And the que- and the question is, you know, why why is this the one that gets ruled out and others aren't? And I think it, the reason that it gets ruled out, right, is because if you if you rule it in, then it just introduces too much weirdness. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And, and that's I what, don't think that's actually yeah. a very principled reason for doing it other than wanting to avoid these problems. Well, I mean, it depends how you want to try to ground it. Right? I suppose I should be a little more careful there, but, but that, that exactly. does pose an issue. Like it's, it's easy enough just to say, oh, well, God can't do logically contradictory things, but like, well, but why not though? Is it just because you, that's kind of inconvenient? Uh, yeah, so, exactly. um, that's what I'm saying. I, I like, yeah. I can see myself doing this myself, right. If I, if I were to become a theist, but I'm saying if, as I, as I take off these, like the spectacles of bias, I can't actually see good. I, I can see that I could convince myself that I was doing it for good principled reasons, that, but I actually think that it's it's just an exercise in bias, really, because it makes it very convenient, right, to rule certain rule in what I need and rule out what I don't want. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, even just looking at the chat now, I, I realized that people interpret this statement so differently about what logical impossibility is, right? So. And this is partly the issue, right? That I was that I was highlighting. There's different forms of logic, and there's different things that you might want to exclude. So, so certain types of statements are just nonsense, right? Um, so, a, a simple example would be if I just if I just uttered a string of nonsense syllables, like the twobble blibbed the hapsled. Can God do that? Like you didn't even say anything. There's no meaning in that sentence, right? So presumably God can't do something that like it, it, that doesn't even have a meaning. Like that's not uh, coherent. And maybe a square circle is such a thing that it's incoherent, right? But that's a little bit different, at least in my mind, it's a little bit different from a logical impossibility. Um, a logical impossibility would, would involve some kind of sequence of statements, which, which entailed a contradiction, um, according to yeah, like classical yeah. logic or whatever. Um, and, and that's a bit different from a, 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 an incoherent statement because incoherent statements aren't logically contradictory. They just don't mean anything. Um, and, um, and so then there's examples like, well, could God create a stone that was so heavy that he, even he couldn't lift it, right? So you could, one question is, is that a coherent notion? And maybe you would say, yes, maybe no. It seems coherent to me, but, you know, it's pretty so good some to people, think about. But there's the, no the contradiction way that people there, say it, it seems to me. The, so the way that people say that that isn't is by just like break, you know, breaking down the terms in different ways. So saying like, yeah, yeah, of course, well, a, an object so heavy that he who can lift all things cannot lift it or something. And then they're like, well, yeah, that's just a meaningless. Yeah. Like, but the, yeah. yeah th- so the point I want to make there is it's going to depend on how you um, basically on how you uh, precisify the claim, like what interpretation you give to it. Um, but but that's why I'm saying it's, it's kind of a bit open, right? <laughs> Well, maybe we'll see. I mean, I, I do actually wear different beanies sometimes, so uh, it, it is it is possible. But yeah, I mean, even God's powers are limited, right? And uh, so I, I guess what I want to say is that pe- the notion that there may be limits to God's powers in itself is not that much of a problem. In fact, it's more the opposite. The idea that there are no limits is an issue for me, as we'll, get, we'll see. Yeah. But it's, it's more in appealing to logic, uh, particularly the way that we think of that as being... Because why would we think that this thing that kind of humans have kind of developed or whatever um, yeah. is is what constrains God? Unless you think it has external existence to God, but that in itself provides uh, uh, invites issues, I think. If so you what, think what, there's something that is is even more sort of fundamental than God and pr- provides constraints on God. What 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 I want to say, I guess, is is that this this sort of move, right, seems very much to me like saying, well, humans are limited in this way, so we're, we're just going to draw a boundary around God, what... You, you know what god can and can't do in this way um but that just seems to me to be sort of the same as in the case of basic actions or something saying well look humans basic actions are like all mediated through material things and so there can't be you know god, god can't do these um basic actions that aren't mediated via some kind of like substance material substance or something it seems like a very similar move to make to to make that kind of argument right and reject other things and so there seems to be like internal tension between postulating this in the theory and not um you you know but not but not in the case of these like other things like basic actions or beliefs or purposes that are different yeah anyway i mean i don't think that's that's a long way down the list of issues that i have with the book but i I do think that there's there's uh concerns there so this Um, is the open theism bit uh, no one yeah, yeah. God can know today without the possibility of mistake. Uh, what well, I will I choose, choose tomorrow. tomorrow. And other theists, I think, have taken issue with with Swinburne saying this. Um, with, with, with Swinburne's open theism, I I don't know. Maybe it's important for his problem of e- for for his theodicy, um, but it doesn't seem to do that much work elsewhere in in his kind of theory. I guess. Uh, yeah, I, I think. 
this is very interesting because I think that there cannot be counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. And in other words, I think that Molinism is is an incoherent view. Um, so Molinism is the view that God knows not just what um, not just what will happen, but He knows what would happen, including what uh, free creatures would choose in any possible situation. Now, I think that that's an incoherent notion because I don't think there can be a fact of a matter about what a libertarian agent would do in a given case. Because the whole point of a libertarian agent is that they are free to choose one, or you know, they're free to choose A or B. Um, Obviously, there's discussion to be had there, which we didn't, didn't go into here. The point is, though, that it, it's possible that Swinburne is motivated by considerations like that, because later he does talk about the importance of like, uh, you know, he's got a whole chapter on substance dualism and, and libertarian freedom. So he may be motivated, motivated by those sorts of concerns. Um, and he does talk a lot about the goodness that's brought into being by the ability to choose. So I'm, I'm not, I think you're right. It, this point is not directly like he doesn't directly rely on this. But he does directly rely on the notion of freedom a lot, and so maybe he thinks that this is necessary. yeah. This I mean, is plenty, of, plenty. By the way, are happy to say that God can know um, what we will choose, but not what we yeah. would choose. And and I think that that can make sense depending on your theory of time. Like if you think the future in some sense already exists, then God could like a block universe. God could see that um, without requiring there to be a fact of a matter about what you would do in alternative circumstances, because this is just like what will actually happen. So there's like, there's, diff there's the three different views effectively. There's God doesn't know the future. There's God knows the future, but not counterfactuals about what you would choose in a different situation that doesn't actually happen. And then there's God knows all of those things, which is Molinism. That's what Craig believes. So I think most the, well, there's a lot of theists are kind of in the middle. They think God knows the future, but not counterfactuals of creaturely freedom. Um, uh, Molinism is like an extreme that God has extra knowledge um, uh, called middle knowledge. And then, and then Swinburne's view would be at the other extreme where God doesn't even have knowledge of the future. Scientia media is the <laughs> Craig on the, on the whiteboard. <laughs> um, or, or what was this? Oh yeah. All this, do, all this does of course assume that human beings have some limited free will in the sense that no cause, whether brain states or God determines fully how they will choose. Now, th this is all just to say that that you know, this is one example of something highly contentious that that Swinburne is is building into his theory. So, if you're going to accept what he says, you have to like accept this and a number of other things that are just going to be, you know, like like maybe we shouldn't be as confident in them as we would be required to be for them to do the work that they do. In, I mean, like, look, I, I, I can accept that there's ro some room for, like, rational disagreement, right, about, about questions like libertarian free will. But I think anyone who's, like, confident enough in, in something like this, that it does all this explanatory work that it's going to do for Swinburne, it just, I, I can't see how I get there myself, right, in good faith. Yeah, sorry, can you just scroll up to the bottom of page six? I just noticed that, that yeah, he says sure. more about paid, uh, sorry, about free will here that I wanted to mention. We, we kind of uh, said this, yeah, bottom, this bottom. Oh, bottom, sorry. Direct page, bottom of that, yeah. Uh, so our desires include those produced by our body, so food, drink, sex, and so forth. Um, we are, it seems to us, free to some extent to fight against our desires and do some action other than which we are natural, other than the one which we are naturally inclined to do, but it requires effort. Um, so this this fits into what he says below, which which seems to be that for him freedom involves kind of going against what you're what you desire to do not doing very what christian you desire. <laughs> yeah which i mean there's different ways of understanding desires of course but i i just i think that this is a bit odd and again we will come back to this but yeah. yes um i think for, yeah. for, for the moment the point is that it's just another ex well a couple more examples of him just sort of asserting things without really defending them well he says that it seems yeah. to me that we are free like this so that's kind of <laughs> the argument yeah. that we can. whereas freedom to me seems to be doing what you do desire to do right it's like if i really want to do something um and i do it that's because i'm free right it's it's if i'm impinged from doing what i desire to do that i'm not free like if someone holds a gun the to my head libertarian or... agency just doesn't make sense to me so it doesn't seem to me that we have that type of freedom of course it really depends on who you ask anyway let's keep going i can i can, I can understand the notion of conflicting desires right yeah yeah um, but 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 to say that it's like you know, like say I really wanted to do um, bad apologetics today, but I used my free will to choose not to. Like, why would I? It doesn't make sense. Like, why would I be doing that? Like, why would I have made that choice? And why is that freedom? Isn't free? Wouldn't I be free if I did the other thing? It's like I've got like two minds or something. Like I'm kind of schizophrenic, and I'm, I, I don't know. Um, okay. 
Uh, hence, I prefer the understanding of God being eternal. So this is what you were talking about with relation to time as his being everlasting rather than as his being timeless. Um, he exists at each moment of an ending time. Right. So that that's kind of like Craig's note. So Craig's notion of omni temporality. Yeah. Um, right. But so, so I guess Swinburne would answer the question is there ever like a state of God sans the universe? No, in that case. Yeah. So if you just sort of uh, jump back a bit to the previous paragraph, he, uh, so I can, uh, not, not quite bit, that far. Oh, a bit before. Well, oh, okay. Sorry. No, no, no. Yeah. Just, uh, I, I cannot see that anything can be meant by saying that God knows the events oh, of 1995, unless it, unless it means that he exists in 1995 and knows in 1995 what is happening then. And then yeah. he cannot know in the same act of knowledge. We scroll down a bit. Uh, sorry. Yeah. Then he cannot know. It, it's hard to read when I cannot. The same act of knowledge as they happen. So the events of 587 BC. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, yeah. 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 In the same act of knowledge, the events of 587 BC in these different years. So, so what he's saying is that in order to know what's happening at a given time, yeah. God, God has, has to, to exist there. at that time. And so that's yeah. the sense in which he's saying that God is omnitemporal. Or I'm borrowing Craig's term when I say omnitemporal there. Yeah, sorry. sorry. He, he says I think that eternal. that's, yeah. Uh, sorry, sorry. He says um, everlasting, sorry, <laughs> rather than being timeless, which is this sort of idea that God's outside of time looking at all moments or something. Being eternal as he's being everlasting. Yeah, I'm just thinking about that. I'm not sure because he definitely says that God doesn't know the future. But does Notice he, think he says that the unending exists? time as well? That's sort of interesting. At, yeah, he exists at each moment of unending time. I don't know that the fact that it's unending is important there, but um, God is eternal in sense that he exists at each moment of past time exists now. Yeah, that's not what he thinks. Simultaneously, I cannot make much sense of this suggestion. Hence, I prefer to understand God as eternal as his being everlasting rather than his being timeless. Yeah, I think timeless is more like, you know, like the classical theist view that God's sort of like. Yeah, I, not, I understand. So yeah. he's just said it in a slightly odd way. So he's saying that he doesn't think that God is, is outside of time. He thinks that God is in time. Mm. But what I'm not sure about what he thinks is the 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 status of like the past versus the present and the future oh yeah 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 i see i don't know um, if he thinks that it's like growing block or if it's he's a presentist maybe he just so, hasn't really thought about this yeah i mean i'm le i'm less confident about what um he thinks about the past but i'm quite certain that he's not committed to the future existing right so i think yeah. he's either going to have to be growing block or presentist but yeah i don't right. know that he commits himself either way in anything that he said. Yeah, fair enough. I just, someone also mentioned, uh, Trevor from chat mentions, what about biblical prophecy? How does that fit with God not knowing the the future? I don't know what Open Theus say about this. If I were to c concoct an explanation, I would say, well, God doesn't know the future, but he may have good guesses because he is pretty yeah, intelligent. Right. So maybe that's, he he offers some sort of good guesses, which can And sometimes true. they fail, <laughs> right? Which is why we also have a good distribution of fulfilled well, and yeah, fulfilled prophecies. Right, there you go. <laughs> Swimmer doesn't address that in this book, though, but that is an interesting yeah. point. Um, okay, so God can make differences to the world and learn about it. Sorry, we, we being... should just, so God is, so just to introduce, so he was talking about God being um, eternal or whatever. Now he's saying God is bodiless, so he, he doesn't have a body, and yeah. then he goes into this. Which again, again is just, I, well, it depends, it depends on your view, but at least in, in my mind, you know, I find it very difficult to understand anything any thing existing that is sort of like bodiless right and that gets into and that can get into like quite weird questions when we talk about like reduction and what entities exist and so forth but it just it just is 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 very weird to me to be like there's something that's just purely mental and isn't like spatially extended embodied or anything and any, well, like I just well he thinks that god is sort of spatially extended L let's read through this and clarify that because again he has he doesn't think that god is outside of time and outside of space he thinks that god exists throughout time well throughout <sighs> well <laughs> that's, i suppose that's sort so, of true yeah. let me read what he says here <laughs> god can make differences to the world and learn about it without being thus dependent uh he means dependent on like a physical form like a body so he will have no body he does not depend on matter to affect and learn about the world 
uh, he moves the stars as we move our arms, just like that, as a basic action. This is why the notion of basic action is important. Um, it follows, too, from his omnipotence that God is omnipresent, present everywhere, in the sense that he can make a difference to things everywhere and know what is happening everywhere just like that without needing arms or sense organs to do so. But although he's present everywhere, he's not spatially extended, he does not take up a volume, um, nor does he have spatial parts. All of him is present everywhere in the sense in which he is present at a place. It's not that a part of him is in one place, a part of him in another place. So the argument seems to be that God has a basic has basic powers of action at any point in space, um, and he can just God's sort of do anything there from. That's the whenever thing he wants to. Right? The, well, this, yeah, God's this... distinct from the universe, but he is equally present everywhere in the universe. I just now, don't I don't know, know how it means. follows. <laughs> I don't know how it follows that he doesn't have a body, right? Because all, all that would be to say is that there could be some sort of spatially distributed body that God has, like a quantum field that's distributed throughout the universe, right? I, what, what, I mean, it doesn't have to be that literally. But oh, don't say I'm that, making... James. You'll give IP ideas. <laughs> <laughs> no, but the point I'm making is that I don't see how you get to – he can't have a body from this. He could just have a spatially extended body. He yeah. Seemed, uh, he well, says, because so he, he will have that. no body. <laughs> Because well, precisely because he can make a difference yeah. anywhere without. Um, well, it's it's like start with your conclusion and then space. tell a story about how you're making sense of things um, given that conclusion, right? I, th I think it's because given given Christian theology, it's like God has to. Well, given Swinburne's particular conception of of, of Christian theology, God, it, yeah, God God is supposed to be uh, Th bodyless. This just doesn't follow. For a person to have a body is for there to be a chunk of matter through which. They they can make a difference to the physical world and acquire beliefs about it. Yeah. Okay. So being omnipotent, God can make difference to the to, to the world and learn about it without being dependent on a body. But that just doesn't follow. If God necessarily has a body that that itself has unlimited powers, then that would just be yeah. the way He interacted with the world through this mm -hmm. unlimited mm -hmm. body. It, it, I just I don't see how it follows that He can't have a body. It's just, it's just like a different... that it follows from a matter, but it doesn't. So on Swinburne's view, just in the sense that we have a body, right? In the set, because Swinburne believes we have souls, <laughs> which kind of God. <laughs> Swinburne no. believes we have souls which interact with with a spatial body in a particular place, and that's what it is yes, for yes. a person to have a body. Well, it's like God's basically like that, but just for every single point throughout the universe, and there are kind of different, uh, slightly different rules, I suppose, which govern the psychophysical relationship between god mind and, and our mind but it, but he seems to be embodied just in that set in the same sort of way um but yeah, i, I suppose also... oh, yeah go you go well i was just gonna say i just really don't actually know what this means myself <laughs> like i i honestly just don't understand well, it's really a negative claim it's right it's it's not yeah. a positive claim about what god is it just says he interacts with the world without having a body, but doesn't say how. Or but what it's it is. something so utterly distinct, dissimilar from anything that I'm familiar with that I can't yeah. really conceptualize what it would mean. Um, well, and that I might just what be Swinburne a would say is that we are intimately familiar with what this is because that's what we are. We are a disembodied soul. The problem is that souls have to interact with the body. So I don't think that that's. But I'm not work. present at every point, everywhere at once. You know, like I'm not. I'm not like in my fingertips. Yes, that's also true. And, and God to, doesn't like, have a body that He interacts with, so it has and to be I can't just to modify the cells and stuff. Like I, I have, you know, my the way that I'm limited and stuff. It's just very dissimilar from what's being described. Yeah, it's not clear that we should really grant much of any credence to this because it's such an extrapolation. And as I said, it doesn't follow from what he said that God can't have a body. Also, I want to point out, it doesn't follow from what he says here that God will have to be omnipresent. He says it follows from his omnipotence that God is omnipresent in the sense that he can make a difference to things everywhere and know what is happening everywhere just like that without needing any particular like mechanisms. But the assumption here seems to be that the only way that you can... Um, that you can make a difference to something at a given point in space is to exist at that point. So he's assuming that there can't be action at a distance. Why? Why, why can't you interact with a point in space with, without being physically present at that space? Where does that assumption come from? This is what I'm this sort of this might seem a bit nitpicky here, but we see this throughout the book. He just sort of asserts things, sometimes directly and sometimes he kind of hides it like this, which are critical for his argument, but he just doesn't defend. Like he I think that it's clear that this is that this. Uh, attempt to show why God has to be omnipresent depends on the idea that you have to be physically present at a location to have a causal uh, effect there. But that is nowhere defended. I would say that we actually have good reason to think that's not true of the physical world. But even forget the physical world. I mean, God's not physical anyway. So why does he have to be physically present somewhere to make a causal effect there? Yeah. And I, I guess that this is because Swinburne's kind of try again due to orthodoxy wants to have that god's omnipresent as well right <laughs> it's like well what's what what's motivating 
these postulates in the first place like where, where yeah, it's, it's the cart before the horse that we know why he's saying this it's not because you you deduct that because as we've seen the deductions yes. don't make sense there are gaps you start with your doesn't. conclusion and then... yeah exactly and this is a consistent problem in my view with the book yeah um which is which is in a, in a sense it's sort of fair enough because he's like i'm offering a definition here of what my worldview is but I think I think it just does raise all of these questions about well, how did you actually get there? And you know, do you think this for like biased reasons? Should independent enquirers who are trying to be as objective as possible be convinced of any of this, or does it look more like kind of retrofitted, you know, just so explanations that are very ad hoc? Yeah, well, it would be fair enough if he was if he was just postulating this, but he's not. He's attempting to present it as if he's deduced it from something else, which means that it's not a separate postulate. But I, as I've argued, he hasn't he hasn't adequately deduced it from something, because there's I, a gap in his argument. So in fact, it is a new postulate. So he's he, he makes his hypothesis appear less complex or less ad hoc than it truly is. Do, do you want to talk about this section for a second? Because I'm just going to go nip to the toilet because I'm uh, early in the morning ablutions for me. Um. <laughs> Um, yeah, so just the next couple of pages, um, God is talking about how, sorry, God, geez, I'm confusing Swinburne and God now. Oh dear. Sw Swinburne is talking about how God uh, sustains the, uh, so creates everything and he sustains their existence. Um, he causes things to have the properties that they have. So this is a fairly standard theist idea here. It's not clear why these things need God to sustain them, but Swinburne just kind of says that he does. Um so what have we got here? Um, ah, yes. Now this is the notion of kind of uh, different ways that God can act in the world. So God normally, quoting here, God normally brings about ordinary historical events by these non-basic routes. That is by setting up a causal process that leads something to happen. Uh, that is by making other objects bring about those events. But he could bring about any event by a basic action. And sometimes, the theist claims, he does produce effects in a basic way. He occasionally intervenes in the natural world to produce effects directly, for example, curing someone of cancer. End quote. So I say this is arbitrary because it is arbitrary, right? What Swinburne is saying is that there's two ways that God can bring about his, his desires. He can do it kind of indirectly by setting up the natural world and the initial conditions and laws and whatever in a certain way to bring about a certain effect. That's an indirect way or a non-basic route. Alternatively, according to Swinburne, God can just actualize it directly by intervening or just, just producing that effect through his basic actions. So there's two ways that God can do anything. So a couple of questions here. Why should we think that there are two distinct ways of doing it? Uh, I mean, it seems unnecessary, right? Why not just go with one? Why not just say that uh, this being has the power? I mean, I guess you could say he's defining it by definition, but if we're, if we're to, to postulate as he will do later, a, a sufficient explanation for the causes, how about we just postulate a cause that's necessary to bring about the existence of the universe, but that doesn't necessarily have the power to then um, directly act within that universe once created. You see, that's a simpler postulate because it only has the powers necessary to like, you know, bang the big bang and create the laws, but I not know. then also intervene within them. You're not taking into account the resurrection of Jesus as a data point. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, he actually would say that later on, right? But, but putting that to the side for the moment. Um, so, so Swinburne's going to say that God sustains all the laws of nature so he can kind of like, I guess, unsustain them and then change them when he wants. But I, I think that this notion of sustaining is highly suspect. I don't really know what principle it appeals to because normally it, it's not thought in philosophy, at least as far as I'm aware, that a, an existing object needs something else to sustain it. I, I well, guess what, what well, Theus would say is, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, this, this is, I don't know how familiar you are with the stuff that Joe Schmidt's been going on about over the, like a year ago about existential inertia, but this is oh, like, um, no, yeah, not very. this is, so, so, um, at some point later when Swinburne talks about this, we can go and look at Joe's blog post. So you think you understand existential inertia, but this is like one of the big things underpinning a lot of theistic proofs. I think particularly like Aristotelian Thomistic type proofs, right? The idea that things need to be sustained to have their kind of natures or causal dispositions, whatever, continue in existence. And um, I think Joe has been questioning like, well, why think that, right? Like, isn't it just as plausible to think that things, once they exist with certain natures, just continue to exist as they do? That just without... seems to be, I mean, I'm no expert in metaphysics, but that seems to be the, I mean, this, this issue of like, why do things have the same, why don't things just sort of disappear out of existence? It just doesn't seem to rise very much in in like con contemporary analytical discussions. So I, I just, I don't know what issue this is supposed to be resolving that the need for this sustaining, but I guess you could just say, well, they do because they're all dependent on God. 
that just seems to ad hoc to me. But, but anyway, the, the, the point is that I, I think that if we're going to start postulating like why, uh, who is it or what is it that created the universe and the laws of physics, which we'll get to it later, um, it's simpler to just postulate a being that only has the powers necessary to explain the effects. And that would be, okay, they can create laws and they can make a universe, but they do not then also have the power to intervene within that. Um, and so I think that it is kind of ad hoc and, and a bit arbitrary to say that there's a being that has both of those powers. It's, it's more than is necessary to account for the effects here. Unless, of course, you, you then want to defend miracles, in which case this is why you need the, uh, the basic route as well. Um, or if zero or infinity are more simple. We'll, we'll get to that. We will, we will get to that. Yeah. So that would be, yeah. But the other thing I want to say, apart from the, uh, sorry, before we move on there, yeah. um, apart from the fact that it's a bit ad hoc, I think, to postulate both of them, it's also the, um, the, um, the question is, well, how does he choose to do it one way or the other way? It seems that whenever God actualizes an effect, you could question, well, why did he do it this way instead of that way? This seems to me is going to be true for every single thing that God does. And this is going to build in a huge amount of ad hocness in your theory, because the physicalist is not going to say something like this. They're not going to say that there's like two distinct ways that the same physical uh, events could occur. It's like, well, the, the necessary sort of physical conditions are present and then the effect is, is produced, right? It's not that there's some other separate way that could have also produced it. So I, I think that this is a big problem because it introduces this ad hocness into the world, into your worldview. Every single thing that exists could have existed in two different ways and God chose one way to bring it about. Why? What's the explanation for why he chose that? And this is a problem that Swinburne just never addresses. He just doesn't think that, it seems that Swinburne agrees with Craig and doesn't think that free choices of agents, or at least of God, require any explanation. And that is a just massive epistemological slash metaphysical free lunch, if you believe that. Because you can just explain anything in terms of the action of a free agent, and then it, it, it doesn't need explaining anymore. Poof, it's gone. Right, yeah. Um... Uh, per so this is important, sorry. Um, perfectly good. So now we're introducing a new property of God. So if you just scroll up to the bottom of the previous page. So God is, God is supposed to be perfectly good. Um, so that's a new property we're introducing here. Um, uh, yeah, this is, this is what I said before. This is what I said before. Sorry, do you want, you want to read that? I'm just, uh, just saying his being perfectly good follows from his being perfectly free and omniscient, I guess. Yeah, he explains that in the next sentence. Exactly see that. Yeah, a perfectly free person will inevitably do what he believes to be overall the best action. Um, well, best for what, right? Best for satisfying their desires, I would say. No, no, it can't be that because <laughs> desires yeah, don't well, causally impinge on them. It's going to be well, best in some to... kind of uh, axiological sense. like just Yeah, ac good according to Swinburne, I'm saying, but I'm saying yeah, how, yeah. Do, how does my own view contrast with Swinburne's right. there, right? I would, say, I would say best for satisfying their desires rather than best for axiological reasons, whatever. Um, and never do what he believes to be an overall bad action. Um, yeah, and I guess the omniscient, I, I guess it does if you define things in the way that Swinburne has then follow. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, so this is what I said in the comment. I, I would have thought a perfectly free being can do whatever they want. And this is traditionally how God has been understood, right? Um, there's a notion of theological voluntarism, the idea that God can do whatever he wants. Um, and he, he is ultimately free to do anything. Um, and, um, Swinburne, I mean, Swinburne thinks that God is perfectly free, um, but he thinks he can, that in a very different way. It, it, it's the distinction, I think, between what God can do and what he would do, right? So when, when Swimmer doesn't talking... use that distinction. So maybe you could, but Swimmer doesn't appeal to that. But the other thing is that I, I okay, so if you're going to say that God is, um, if God is essentially good by nature, if he is necessarily essentially at perfectly good, I don't think you can say that he could do something bad because that would contravene his necessary nature. So in what in what sense does it say that he could? Like, there's no counterfactual in which he does. That. Yeah. So yeah. I don't think that works. Maybe maybe he can in the sense that he has the power, right? But he just doesn't have the the divine psychology such that he would. Or something. Yeah. yeah. So so I suppose it's going to depend on how you want to flesh out that could, right? But then the issue is, is God free in the same way that humans are free? And then it comes to the question is the predication again. Are we are we um, equivocating when we use the same term to apply to God? Yeah. If we're gonna uh, if we have to understand that differently in the way that a human is free. But anyway, here. Um, that's another point. I just wanted to emphasize here that it seems that what Swinburne is saying is that the idea that God is perfectly good actually is not a separate postulate. It follows from his being free, perfectly free and omniscient. And this is a, just a, such a huge assumption, I think, or, or behind, lies be, lying behind it are huge assumptions. Because what's his argument here? So a perfectly free being is, according to him, um, one who always does what's best. 
that's kind of his definition of being perfectly free. Because remember, he said before, a perfectly free being does not have desires that cause them to like stray from the best thing to do. And of course, another way that you could choose the wrong thing, apart from being like swayed by desires, according to Swinburne, is if you just didn't know what the best thing to do would be. But God has neither of those problems. He's not swayed by his desires or caused to do something else. Also, he knows everything, right? So it, it seems that the argument Swinburne is giving is that's why he always chooses the best thing is because the two things that might stop you, like lack of knowledge or like your desire swaying you, never happen to God. So he always chooses the best possible thing if when there is a best possible thing. And that's the sense in which he's perfectly good. And it's, it seems like a statement like this is going to sort of commit you to some kind of, you know, Panglossian uh, sarcasm or whatever, you know, and, and of course bone cancer in babies is uh well, what we'll get to, to be best and yeah we will get to that because <laughs> he does talk about that yes i just think this is a very strange conception of good and, and of uh, sorry not of good uh, a very strange conception of freedom um and I, I he doesn't really defend that this is what it means to be free is to always act in because remember it, it seems that under this conception of free you don't actually have choices available uh, unless you happen to have the balance that the balance of reasons when reasons are balanced is the only case but in that case it's, you're just kind of doing a toss-up so it's kind of lame freedom in my opinion you, you, he will always yeah. choose the same thing when um, there's one best option, according to Swinburne. So I don't know where the freedom is there. I, I in my view, the as libertarian well, libertarian freedom, by the way, libertarian freedom. In, in in my view, as well, that that notion of best does have to be tethered to some kind of like goals, values, and desires. Like, it well, Swin, that can't work under Swinburne's view, right? I, because... Yeah, I understand it can't under Swinburne. <laughs> I'm just saying, I, yeah. just to, just to contrast, I'm saying sure, that, sure. like, it, it it doesn't really just just to talk about like best sans goals values or desires is just very kind of like odd right like what's best <laughs> like, well i mean i i don't think that personally because i think that yeah. there are like uh facts External about reasons. value that yeah. are that are um that don't depend on desires um i don't i'm not nearly as liberal with that <laughs> as swinburne is <laughs> um i think that those all reduced essentially to human well-being whereas swinburne thinks that that is a source of value but he thinks it's like a zillion others as well um uh but um, yeah, so I, I, the, the, the issue I have is that if you're to ground, yeah, I, I think that there's an issue about the, the, the relationship between freedom and reasons here. Um, cause I, I think that it makes sense to ground freedom in terms of acting in accordance with your reasons, but that's, that's a compatibilist theory of reasons, right? The, uh, the idea of, um, reasons responsive compatibilism. The idea is that you don't have to be libertarian free. You just have to be, you act in a way that's responsive to your reasons, which is what distinguishes a free action from a non-free action. Um, so there's a sense here in which I think that it kind of makes sense to align acting in, the, in accordance with reasons to, to, to freedom. But Swinburne, first of all, he's not a compatibilist. And so he's doing this all outside of like, any causal constraints which means he has to like take desires aside from that whereas i would say well desiring something is one of the reasons you have for acting in a certain way so that fits into the framework of of of, of acting in accordance with your reasons whereas swinburne is the complete opposite he says no no those somehow reduce your freedom so you have to put those away and all of this has to exist outside of the land of like cause and effect um and then he also kind of wants to frame it in a way where um there's like only one thing you can do um to choose the thing that you have most reasons to do. And I'm, I'm not sure that reasons always work that way, that there's always, uh, that, that reasons can always be aggregated in a way that they're, um, that they produce like a singular best outcome. Um, although I'm still thinking about that, but I think that that, that is a questionable premise there, especially when you're talking about God. I, I guess the way, the way I'm thinking about it, right, is that some things being a reason seems to sort of be dependent on the way that you're looking about things, right? So it's kind of like, given um given that i care about human well-being then there are a certain number of kind of like reasons right to act in certain ways but i might not care about human well-being as well and then like you know what what's a reason for me is sort of different and then i think i think sort of similarly for, for in the case of god right where i'm thinking about well I don't, I don't actually know what swinburne's view is about god ex obviously it wouldn't make sense to say god exists before time but god sends like creation logically um you know what 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 are god's like reasons and things at that point what are his goals and i i, I don't really understand then what what constitutes a reason for god other than presumably his own like will and <laughs> um I, I I don't know, like why 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 are there reasons for God to do things on Swinburne's view at that point? Like what 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 is a best action for God, right? And that and that, like I think, given what he says him. elsewhere, you have to understand God's reasons as simply being to actualize 
good things because those are the but only that, things but that that's he after to. yeah but that but swinburne sort of seems to say well like it's like after you've got creation right it makes a whole bunch of sense because he's like well that was well god's got these obligations towards the things that are created to sort of like cultivate them or treat them in certain ways right so once that's done that makes sense but but the thing i'm getting at is like why bring about this state of affairs rather than that is the <laughs> The thing yeah, well, having, maybe we yeah. can maybe we yeah. can table that until he talks about this because he he does talk about sure. this. But yeah, I think this is an issue. Um, but yeah, I guess the the meta point there is kind of confusing as to what Swinburne sees the relationship between like goodness and reason is and freedom, and it really just doesn't explain this sufficiently given this is so core to his argument. And so, so th this is the thing. Like when so to regard um, something as being good is to have a reason for going, you know, for doing that thing. And I like I agree with that. But I guess my question would just be like, why is God regarding some things as good rather than others, right? From God's point of view. And is there like a plausible story to be told there? Um, and I would say not in a lot of the cases of things that Swinburne wants to say are good. It doesn't make sense to consider this kind of definition of God and to think, why would it consider like that state of affairs as good? Like bringing about there being, I don't know, like libertarianly free agents that could choose to murder each other or to... Um, build lego houses or something the thing is here that this this ordering here although it sort of sounds intuitive i i disagree with now this is a contentious point in the uh in uh i guess metaphysics uh, philosophy for sort of reasons i, I would uh, i sorry if we can scroll up a line i i would personally put the order the other way around uh, in other words i believe in what's sometimes called like a values first rather than a reasons first so notice what he says here to regard some aspect of being in london as good is to have a reason for going to london i would i mean in everyday language it doesn't much matter but when we're talking kind of m m like grounding i would say it the other way around i would say that you have a reason to do something in virtue of bringing about some good state of affairs other people would say it the other way they would say that um something is good in virtue of you having reasons to do it. And that's what Swinburne has said here. So reasons are at the ground and value kind of sits on top of that. Now, the problem is that Swinburne later says the opposite of this. He says that God has a reason to do something because it because doing that would bring about a valuable state of affairs, like conscious beings are able to choose and stuff like that. So I don't know if this is sort of significant, but it, it seems a bit contrary to what he says later, where he wants to ground out God's reasons in terms of the values that they bring about. But is, if he is wants he to saying here what you what you said, sorry, is he not saying that um um given like the value that I regard there is for being in London, that it's good, that gives me a reason to be there? Is he not yeah, putting well maybe the... I let me read it again. I, I must regard my being in London as in some way a good thing. Either hang on, I should probably start the, to regard some uh, start at the beginning here. To try to go to London, I must regard my being in London as in some way a good thing. So that's because the value... I enjoy going there, blah blah blah. To regard some aspect of being in London as good is to have a reason. So it's if like, I had no reason, I'm well, reading it as the, the, the value of good providing. If I the had reason. no reason at all for going to London, my going there would not be an intentional action. Uh, not fully. Yeah. Mm. I see what you're saying there. I guess you could read it the other way. To regard some aspect of being in London as good is to. I feel like you could read it both ways, but I, I guess given what he says elsewhere, then I, I think your interpretation does make more sense because that's consistent with what he sort of says elsewhere. That he actually is saying values, uh, uh, ground reasons rather than the other way around. But yeah, that sentence, I don't know. When I read that, I feel like I can interpret it either way. Anyway, but maybe we'll just move on to what he says later uh, down here. Um, um, the bit I've highlighted, let me just read. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, a person free from desires who formed his purposes solely on the basis of rational considerations would inevitably do the action which he believed overall best to do but I, i'm saying like without for me uh, given my view that like and obviously it makes sense given swinburne's views but this this talk of like best sans desires is very strange like best best for what like like you have to have a goal right for something to be better than something else and well, I mean, that's one view, right? But the point is, I think that Swinburne doesn't defend this, right? Which is precisely the, the problem. This is at the foundation of pretty much all of his arguments. But at no point does he try to defend what it means for something to be good or best. I don't think that that's something that you can just not put in a book like this. Um, he's just re appealing to some everyday kind of um, common sense of good and, and, and things like that, which might be okay in some contexts. But I want to contend not in a book about def uh, about defending the existence of God. You, you're going to have to give some articulation of what you, you think it means for something to be good and, and why it works that way. 
So if you do think that for something to be good, it has to fulfill some desire or, or uh, however you want to frame that, um, then this isn't going to make sense, right? Because it seems to say that um, God has a reason to do something, even if he doesn't have any uh, desire to do that. In fact, he's precisely saying here, they have no, uh, where does he say? Uh, uh, what are you looking for? A Sorry, person free from desires. Yeah. And he's talking about God here. Yeah. God has no desires, right? But yet he still has reasons to do things, right? So according to your view, a person free from desires would have no reason to do anything. Free from any desire, hypothetically, I suppose maybe you'd say that's not possible yeah. in practice. But if there could be such a being, then they would have no reason to do anything. Would, would you agree with that? Yeah, that's that's sort of how, how I'm thinking of it. If you, if you have like no desires or like thing, goals that you want to achieve, then like you, how, how do you evaluate anything as like, you know, something that you want to bring about and some, th some things is like better ways of achieving those ends than others. It just doesn't really make sense to me. Well, well obviously, if you have no desires, you, you wouldn't you, you wouldn't say that... So, so instrumental rationality is often defined in terms of um, means-ends analysis, like the best way of achieving your goals. I think clearly yeah. you can't have instrumental rationality and therefore right. you can't have like instrumental reasons without desires. But there are people who think there are other forms of rationality that don't depend yeah, on sure. you having desires. Um, and I believe in that as well. But... Swinburne seems to be appealing to that without really discussing it at all or defending yes, it. Yes, yeah. And yeah, so that, it, that it, is exactly. kind of confusing, especially when I, we're talking about God. We're not even talking about people. This is God here. So the, the space of his reasons, Paul's going to be quite different to ours. So I'm not I'm not saying that he can't do that, but my the, the point is, as, as you say, that he firstly doesn't defend it, right? But then secondly, if we're going into like um, theory comparison, that this is just going to be another thing that yep. um is is at least going to like lower the credence and needs to be like included with all the other things that are kind of like lowering the credence in the overall theory it's another another thing that's embedded in the theory that is is to some degree contentious right even if it gets a high you know a high credence maybe like 0.8 or something it it it's still bringing it down a little bit Yes. And this is also why I mentioned that I don't think if it's true that this is kind of a response to Mackie, it's going to work because Mackie is not going to accept these kind of appeals. Like Mackie's going to say pretty much the same thing as what you said, I think. I think he shares your views about the relationship between like um, reasons and and, and desires. Um, and yeah, that and a lot of, I think, atheists and naturalists are going to agree with you there. And so it's not going to be very effective in the extent that it's not appealing to not really answering that. And even for me, I mean, I do think that there are like desire independent reasons for for acting uh, but i ground them very differently to how swimburne well actually swimburne doesn't really try to ground them right but but the way i'm going to understand them is very different to the way swimburne does and he's going to add as we'll see later way more things into this category of like just intrinsically good than i would be comfortable in doing and and i don't think he really gives any criteria for why you should add things there and i i think you're right for each thing he just sort of puts there then he bears more of a kind of burden in terms of he's made the theory that more complicated yeah yeah, he, um, sorry, he's saying this here. If there are moral truths, truths about what is, I think this is as close as he gets to talking about this, truths about what is morally good and bad, an omniscient person will know what they are. Right. I think that's yeah. that's about as much as he says yeah. about the nature of these truths. Yeah. But again, again you know, it, it, it's not that that's indefensible, but it's like that that's just another thing that's required, right, to to be embedded in, in Swinburne's well, theory. Well, he barely here. discusses it when it's so important. I, I don't think yeah. that's something you can skim over when that's uh, we'll see how important this is later on uh, as we go yeah. throughout the book and uh, sorry i'm trying to pull up where, where are you i've got too many tabs open. Uh, I'm, on I'm trying to align what you're up to with what i'm looking at. i'm on page page 13 right now 13 yeah yeah, yeah just, so going just over to 14 because just under that he says uh if lying is no not that despite the doubts of the occasional hardened skeptic almost <laughs> all of us think almost all the time that there are some acts which are morally good and some which are morally bad and yeah. give some examples who can seriously deny these things the morally good is the overall good to say that it is good for starving is not to say that it's good in all respects but it is good in the in respect that it saves lives of human beings and so forth so basically his argument for the existence of some kind of objective moral truth here is just that who can seriously is quote who can seriously deny them i think that's yeah but then <laughs> that's but then it's the like argument. you know who who can seriously deny that the holocaust God. was bad right? <laughs> well why don't know like, who well can swinburne can later, later on <laughs> Well, yeah, but I mean, yeah, yeah that's I because mean, and, because there'd be less opportunities to soul build without the ho the Holocaust, right? There wouldn't be the kinder transporters, and you know, yes, like, we we will get to that. But yeah, I mean, I think that that's a weak source argument. It's not an argument that I give for moralism, and I don't think moralists should give that as an argument. But it is but it, a common. It, what what I'm saying is like, who can this this happens so often? Um, perhaps more broadly in philosophy, less I think more so in philosophy of religion than anywhere else, and particularly from theists, this kind of who can seriously deny that or 
anyone yeah. who believes the opposite isn't worthy of respect and think like phrases like this. And I just, I, I absolutely detest that. Right. Cause it, this, I, I know I can be uh tribalistic, but it's, I, I'm convinced that my tribalism is like a kind of tip for tat strategy where it's engaging with this sort of rhetoric where I'm like, I came into this wanting to just have um, like an honest discussion about, okay, you might be wrong, but you might be right as well. So let's like, just talk about it. And then you just get all this, who can seriously deny that? And it's like, well, surely everything has to be on the table if we're having a genuine discussion about who's right. And I, I hate yeah, that exactly. kind of language. I, I know it's ridiculous. And I, yeah, it's one of the things that frustrates me a lot, as well as I mentioned with this book, he just asserts things without acknowledging that they're controversial. In fact, by saying who seriously denies these things or whatever it was exactly, he's kind of acknowledging that people do deny it because you don't <laughs> say that when no one actually denies it, right? You only say that when you know people do, but you just want to rhetorically diminish them, yeah. right? Which, And you're just already, you're appealing to people who already agree with you, right, in that case, because you're not actually addressing the people who do deny that, who are going to read yeah, that and, and go, and who by can the way, seriously deny Swinburne that? doesn't <laughs> necessarily have to appeal to them if he doesn't want to, but what he should do is say, for the purposes of this book, I'm just going to assume this, and people who don't agree, uh, maybe you can point them to a footnote in a reference and I, you know, I'll talk about this somewhere else or look at this book. That's fine. You can narrow your scope, but he's not really, Swimmer's not really doing that. He's just dismissing people who disagree with them, and I think that that's really disingenuous and, um, yeah, just... It, sort of counter uh, counteracts the ostensive purpose of the book, which is to convince people to believe in God, right? Well, what if you don't believe in this kind of objective morality or in the way that he says it? Well, just screw you, basically. <laughs> like, that's his answer to that. All right. Well, yeah, not very effective, I think, and not very intellectually honest. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is just saying what I was saying before about why an omniscient and perfectly free being will always do the good thing because they will know the moral truths and nothing will prevent them from acting in accordance with them. So I think we've already talked about that. I just wanted to comment on on um, this sentence here. Some moral truths are clearly moral truths, whether or not there is a God. And the reason I said that's good is, is just because it's at least kind of less abhorrent than the kind of rampant moral gaslighting that seems to take place amongst, you know, like Calvinists or even people like Craig, right? Where yeah, it's exactly. Kind of like, um, it, you know, it, 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 it see, it's obvious, it, it seems clear that like, um, murdering people for fun or committing genocide or whatever is wrong, whether or not a God wants it, like, and, and, and the kind of, like, and who can seriously deny this? Well, yeah. great, man. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the, the, the establishing of the existence of God is clearly held with like less certainty with sort of than, than, than various kind of facts like that. Right. If there are, if there are such facts and. I like that Swinburne seems to be conceding that here, and it does, it it means that there's less abhorrent, weird things that are going to fall out of his theism than other theisms. I agree. Yes, I agree. Um, so one of the most fundamental human obligations, duties, is uh, to please our major benefactors, to do in return for them some small favor which they request in return for the great things they have given us. If theism is true, God is by far our greatest benefactor. Um, yes. And so we owe God a lot. That's why he's talking about this. Yeah. So this is another case where Swinburne just introduces this thing where I'm like, whoa, where did that come from? I don't, I think that you may have a social obligation to, yes. yeah, yeah. you know, kind of do something in favor when they give you a favor, but I don't think that's a moral obligation, at least not by itself. Right. I don't think that you necessarily have any obligation to someone if they give you something good in, in to like pay them back. Like that seems to be, it, it could depend on the situation, basically. Like if they need help, it would be good to help them. But I, I don't think that that like increases your moral obligation with respect to someone else who hasn't helped you, who needs help. So basically I don't really accept this. I'm not saying that you never have moral obligations to like, you know, repay someone a favor or something but as a general point that one of the most fundamental human obligations is to please our major benefactors like what no <laughs> what are you talking about please I don't think we have an obligation benefactor. to please like our parents or yeah. someone who gives us money to help at college or something like no what are you talking about I, where does this come from this seems like a very roman idea where it's like you have the patron and the client and that it was mm. an understood like relationship between them uh, and again, you, you might have social obligations, there, but to elevate them to like a fundamental moral obligation, I'm just not on board with that. Not as a general point, the way that he seems to be. And again, is that important? It is important because that's how he tries to ground us having obligations towards God, because he's our major benefactor. And this is a point that I've made before. I think that it's actually quite consistent to say that human, that God could create humans and be the sustainer and whatever, but but us to have no obligations whatever towards God, uh, because I think that if you do, if you to truly respect human autonomy, that means that you don't have these like. Uh, 
obligations towards God just because he created you. Uh, right. And even if he does good things for you, I, d I don't think that's how autonomy works, right? You may feel a feeling of gratitude towards God and desire to do something good in return. That's fine. But that's different to having an obligation to please your major benefactor just because they did something good for you. Yeah. I don't know what you th thought about that, Nathan, but I thought that was just bizarre and kind of gross, actually. So so I guess I think, it, it again, it's like, it, it's this kind of persistent theme of like starting with the conclusion and working your way back there, right? So so given the, um, Swinburne's particular commitment to Christian theology, um, he's actually an Eastern Orthodox Christian, he has to establish somehow by, if he's doing all this by reason alone, that God is worthy of worship, right? And that and that's clearly what this is about, is, is somehow establishing that God is worthy of worship. And then eventually there's going to be some sort of project to persuade you to participate in you know, religious services, liturgies, and uh, uh, and um, the church life and so on. Now, again, it depends what you mean by, like, if you're talking about obligations in a very ordinary sense, which is what I think you're talking about when you say, like, social obligations, yeah, I, I can sort of agree with you that there might be this kind of, like, quid pro quo thing, but in, like, a, a heavily kind of philosophically, metaphysically laden sense of, of obligation, yeah, I don't, I don't think that there is any such obligation it, it does seem kind of like um you, you said roman but I, I, there's something there's something a bit kind of you know weird and um powery about it you know it just it just doesn't yes seem, that's why i think yeah. it's kind of gross like one of the most fundamental human obligations is he says within limits but i mean i guess it depends on what you mean by this is, is to please our major benefactors to do in return for them a small favor they request when they've when they've given something to us i don't think we have any such general fundamental obligation right now someone in the chat says it's a prima facie obligation I understand that that is what Swinburne is saying, but just calling it a prima facie obligation doesn't mean that it exists, right? That's just a name for what he yeah. is saying. I don't think that there is any such thing. I think Swinburne needs to give an argument for why he thinks there is, but he just sort of asserts that there is. I think it does negate our autonomy because if I give something good to you, uh, to truly respect your autonomy is that I'm giving this to you and there are no strings attached. I don't expect that you have to give me anything back in return, right? That is respecting my autonomy. To have this sort of expectation or obligation that, well, you should do me in the favor and in return for this. I do think that that doesn't fully respect your autonomy. And that's one of the reasons why I don't think we have any such general obligation. You may wish as a form of gratitude to, to give something back and that, that's fine. But that's different from saying that we have a prima facie obligation. I also don't think this is a nitpick as someone has pointed out in the chat because this is precisely how he grounds our obligations to God. I don't think that's a trivial point, how you ground our obligations towards God. I think that's a major point. Um, okay. God clearly cannot make things which are our duty no longer our duty. Uh, he cannot make it right to torture children for fun um okay and it, yeah in, in virtue of what can he not do that and then yeah also, this is an issue right why doesn't god have that power what what constrains him but then it also seems According like that is going to rule out um that is going to actually rule out some, you know specific revealed theologies which include you know like genocides and things like that well yeah i guess swinburne's okay with that which i'm kind of okay with as well right but um no you, well you know, i, I, I I'm saying is that going to actually be in contrast then with Christian theism right later on where Christian theism seems to include, you know, stories of like the binding of Isaac or, or um, in Islam, whatever the other um, Islamic version, Ishmael or whatever. Um, and, and, and various kind of like genocides and, and things like that, which are, which are commanded by God. It's like, if we don't have a duty to, um, if, if if we di if we were supposed at one time to have a duty towards like genociding a certain people group and we no longer do, or or even if you if you just um index that to like the Jews right if if Israel was at one point supposed to have a duty towards genociding Canaanites and then doesn't you know like anymore why mm. why does that duty change does God change it by the later revelation of Christ or whatever or does it stay the same? Well, I guess Winburn would say that they. I mean, God couldn't do that, right? He couldn't change an obligation like that. Yeah. My concern is that I don't know how he can ground that that problem because there's no, uh, as I say in the comment, there doesn't seem that there's a logical problem there. Now, I mean, maybe there is, right? That's why I say if there's some analytic truth about what is good, then maybe you, you could say that that follows from, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that, because I don't know if analytic truth is sufficient. I'd have to think about that a bit more, but it's going to depend on how you ground exactly what it is that God can't do. Um, 
so I, I guess, yeah, I don't know. I don't know that I have more to say about that than I don't know what it is exactly that constrains God from being unable to do that. Like, what is it that grounds these, that these uh, facts about yeah. what is good, independent of God, critically, um, under Swinburne's view? Right. Um, and, th and that's a question. So, so in the next section, which um, you and I have both uh, highlighted, right, where I think, as we both said before, we think that this is a good thing because it's yeah. not going to make you like morally abhorrent, like perhaps some other theists um, are willing to kind of bite some morally abhorrent bullets. But the, the, there's a very good reason or a, a very good um, reason if you're concerned with making your theory um, resistant to, <laughs> to, 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 to um, reasoned considerations um, to do that, right? Which is because there's this question of what grounds those um, moral duties or, or values. And um, it's not clear what that is for Swinburne. Like, is this just going to be kind of like brute, right? That it just yeah, is I don't know. He doesn't really say in this book, at least. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. God, before he creates any other persons, has no obligations, uh, though it's a su supererogatory good act for him to create many other persons, including humans. I guess I just don't know. It's a supererogatory good act for him to create many other persons. What does that mean? Well, he doesn't have an obligation to do it, but it's still good to do it. I'm not sure that this is that important. Um, well, it, it seems important because that that seems to be doing all the work about like why why create at all, right? Um, because well, it, we'll, we'll come to that later, though. Yeah. Okay. Because okay. I don't know that it matters whether God has an obligation to create. I mean, no one's ever said that that, but right, or if it's just super erogatorily good for him to create. But if God is maximally good, he's going to do all his super. Or at least it seems to me he's going to do every super erogatorily good thing that he can do, unless they like conflict with each other. So I think you still get to the same issue, a uh, similar issue there. Um, oh, yeah, I mean, he, he says that here. It is logically impossible to do every possible super erogatory good act. But, I mean, that's not true. It's only impossible. Well, it's strictly true, but you could do a huge number of them. Unless they logically conflict with each other, um, then you can do all of them, right? So hang on. Why is he mentioning that here? Even God cannot do the logically impossible. We already talked about that. Uh, it is good that God, yeah, I mean, this is sort of coming to your point here. It is good that God should create persons, including human persons, but however many he creates, it would be even better if he created more. Given that but human what, life is yeah. in general a good thing, the more of it, the better. So he's saying that it's good for God to create, whether that's super erogatory or not, it's still a good thing. But why is it good that God should create persons? You know, like that, that's the thing that I'm not really understanding. Um, given that that never having persons at all is, is is a live option for god i don't understand why it's better to have persons than just not have persons i don't, I, I just don't understand that uh well he's just i mean refer to the previous page right where he says it's just obvious that it's good yeah that there are persons <laughs> well presuming they're living like happy lives i suppose so so i'm kind of on board i i am bored with him when he's saying like once stuff exists you know you you can tell this story about various like obligations and stuff like i get that but I, but when we're talking about a point of view from which nothing exists i can't see how how that works yeah well here he's talking about the possible the, the issue of the best of all possible worlds because there is no such world um according to him you could always make the world better um, so what does God's perfect goodness amount to? Not that he does all possible good acts. It's not logically possible. Presumably that he feels his obligations does no bad acts and performs very many great acts. Now, I don't think I've said here, I guess this might be a hot take. I think that's a, a super low bar for perfect goodness. <laughs> okay. He does all his obligations. He doesn't do anything bad. And he does, you know, a bunch of goods, like very many good acts. That's just not like, why would you worship being like that? Like, it's just, it seems so weak source to me. Um, I guess he would say that you have an obligation, you know, he talked about obligations that we have to our, our benefactors and whatever, but I, I think it's a bit of a cop out. So if we say that there is no, uh, if there is no maximally good state of affairs, so whatever state of affairs you want to look at, God could always create a better one. Maybe that could be true, right? Um, I mean, it's not logically necessary that that's true. There could be one best, I suppose. It, it, it could be the case that if you try to make it better, you make it worse in some weird way, but whatever. Um, the thing is, I think it follows that there's no maximally great being as well, because it seems to me that a, um, a maximally great... So for any given being that you present to me, a better one would do more good things. Um, and I, I think that's what defines someone's character is what they do, not some sort of intrinsic thing that's somehow like independent of their actions. 
Now, I don't know that this is critical for Swinburne here because he doesn't actually, I don't think he talks about God being the maximally great being, uh, being a maximally great being. That is a standard conception of God, but I don't know that Swinburne talks about it. But I just want to say that, it, in other words, if we think that it's a problem, not a problem, if we think that there is no maximally best possible world, then I think plausibly by the same reasoning, there is no maximally possible greatest being as well. And that's going to be a problem for theists. So I'm not so sure that Swinburne can just as readily say here, can just readily say here that there is no um, maximally great world, maximally greatest world or best possible world. Because then, well, why, why not apply the same reasoning to the maximally great being that God is supposed to be? Although maybe Swinburne doesn't think that he is, so that's how he gets around it. So I'm not sure about that. But I, I think that that's a bit too ready. Uh, sorry, a bit too hasty. But even irrespective of that, I just don't think that this is enough for God I, to say that, well, he does a lot of good stuff. And that is like, I don't know how you can say that's perfect goodness. Like perfect implies that, well, I don't know exactly what perfect implies. I guess there's a lot going on there. But it's almost like, the bar just seems quite low for me. Like, well, he doesn't do bad things and he does like a bunch of good things. Is that perfect goodness? Like perfect goodness just seems yeah. to be a pretty high bar to me. I don't know. I just, I don't find that very satisfying. Yeah. Um, okay. God must choose which to do of the infinitely many good actions, each of which he has a reason to do. So like uh, ourselves yes. in a situation where we have a choice between actions, each of which we have equal reason to do, God must perform a mental toss-up, decide, that is, on which reason to act in a way which is not determined by his nature or or anything else. Uh, we can So there's no reason for which P occurs, right, other than that it does <laughs> or that God chooses it. We can understand such an operation of non-determined rational choice, for we seem sometimes to experience it in ourselves. I think this is really important here. And as I've said, I, I, do, I don't think this works. So what he's going to say here is that God has infinitely many good things that he could do, but he can't do all of them. Now, I'm already a, not kind of on, I'm kind of not on board there because, I mean, he could do any, he could do all of them as long as they're not logically contradicting to each other. And I don't know why they would be, right? I mean, God could create as many copies of the universe as he wanted to, as many different parallel realities. So right. I, I don't know why. And it's not like anyone's saying it, it's good for like, um, you know, to have a universe where there are um, bricks that are all red and all blue all over at the yeah, same time. Exactly, so, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I, so I don't think those cases are going to provide a major constraint. So I'm not really sure about why God is constrained here. But putting that to the side, um, what Swimmer is saying is that God has a reason to do all of these infinitely many good things, but he can't do all of them for whatever reason. And so because God has just as much reason to do any one of them, um, he just sort of has to perform a mental toss-up, that is, decide what reason to act on. Um, and it seems to me that w given what Swinburne has said before, um, God if God has equal reasons, so, so remember he said that a perfectly free being always does the thing that they have the best reason or the most overall reasons to do. And in this case, Swinburne seems to be saying that there isn't one that stands out. They, he kind of has equal, God has equal reasons to bring about this good or that good. In that case, there doesn't seem to be any reason that can favor one over the other. And so it seems to be that God chooses arbitrarily. Now, Swimmer doesn't say it that way, but I don't see how there can be a reason for God to prefer one option to the other. He calls it a mental toss up. I call that an arbitrary choice. Um, yeah. and, and the and the further issue with that, as I say in the comment here, is that God God's being perfectly good now seems to be a super low bar because all he has to do is choose between infinitely many good things and whichever one of them he does, he's good for doing it, right? Yeah. As I, long as he doesn't do a bad thing, he can do whatever of these good things he likes or, or and, and that counts as good. Uh, not only it counts as perfectly good, just seems a very low bar to me. I, I think I would... I would find what Swinburne's saying here more plausible, like like his project, right? I'd find it better motivated, perhaps, if or, or in, in better faith. If if Swinburne said something like, "Yes, my hypothesis does actually commit me to some num like some different number of actualized worlds by God, right, which are not causally connected but contain all these different goods," then I'd say, "Yeah, now now you're like ac you're actually thinking about what follows from your hypothesis and committing yourself to that." Um, but th this move to say, well, he must have just chosen one because we're in one. It would seem kind of dodgy for me to include others or whatever. It, that seems like so super ad hoc, right? Like what? what yeah, it why does. Because doesn't God have a reason to make these other worlds as well? Just as much. He can't, 
he can't make them. But I, why not? Uh, unless there's a logical yeah. impossibility, which he hasn't articulated. I don't see why God hasn't infinitely instantiated every possible infinite world, or sorry, an infinite number of different worlds, as long as they're all good worlds um, yeah. or, or and, something like that. And then it seems like me, because he's he's making that move, I think, for bad reasons, because he's got to, because the conclusion is, right, the conclusion is there is just one one world and everyone agrees to that. So, so that's, I've got to explain it that way. I can't say that there are these unobservable other worlds because that would be too much of a bullet for people to buy if they want to buy my theory. I'm going to invent this kind of, um, th th this mechanism of a mental toss up for decision <laughs> and introduce that to, to, to get whatever I want in, in, in my model. Um, and then, yeah, it's, and then this is weird because he says before this, uh, we, we didn't read it, but he says that God has many different possible worlds that he could create. He says infinitely many, but then he's just sort of then says, well, he's got to choose between them. I just, where does the choice come from? Why, why is God limited? Yes. <laughs> well, this is like a warranty uh, runs out or something on his powers and he just can't make any, I, I don't, I don't get it. So, so in this, within this ad hoc mechanism that he introduces in the model, right? It's even worse because this mechanism is just completely brute. It's like, well, why why does God choose this one rather than any of the others? Well, like all the basic actions, he just does. There's no further fact of the matter. Why why this world obtains rather than that? There's there's no the, there's nothing further than just p, right? Why does p obtain p because p? That's not like a, that. That's just brute. Um, and so that's built into yep. Swinburne's that that, that yeah, amount exactly. of bruteness is built into. This is this is a fundamental problem. He wants to. We'll get to this, but Swinburne wants to say that he has an explanation for like all. It turns out that there isn't an explanation because what is the explanation for why God created this world? There isn't one. <laughs> he just did a mental toss up and created one of like infinitely many possibilities. <laughs> What's the, there's no explanation there. There literally is yeah. no explanation. There can't. You know be when, Cra when Craig's like, um, you know, given given naturalism, it's just random chance that all this beauty exists or whatever. <laughs> and it's like, well, yeah, given given Swinburne's theism, it's just random chance. God just did some mental toss up, and you know, it just happened to be the world that contains hummingbirds and. <laughs> Yeah, that's why I say that the notion that God freely chose in the libertarian sense to create the world and that he had a reason to do so don't seem to be consistent to me, given that God is omnipotent and omniscient. Because if we understand like freely choosing to do something and doing it for a reason, then it seems that, well, God just did the thing that had the most, uh, like the, the most, um, uh, sorry, God chose the action that had the strongest reasons in favor of it, in which case it seems like he's kind of, his actions are determined by his reasons and he's not libertarian free. Um, on the other hand, if he does make a kind of libertarian free choice and could go one way, could go the other way, then there doesn't seem to be a reason why he preferred one action over the other. Um, it, it seems to be just arbitrary. I don't know how you can have both of those things. Um, okay. So, so here, <laughs> this is good. Cause he's saying, so it follows, he loves to do this, like, that we've got an everlastingly omnipotent, omniscient, perfectly free bodiless omniscient creator and sustainer of the universe perfectly good and a source of moral obligation it he follows because he specified it <laughs> he wants to pretend that he's derived most of those from just a few things but as we've seen in order to get each step he has to actually implicitly Specify appeal them. to a bunch of other stuff that he hasn't defended like this these moral facts for example that exist and his notion of freedom right and how that works and the how moral obligation works this print this prima facie duty that we allegedly have that he didn't defend yeah, um, yeah. Ever, so, everlastingly bodiless he look said, at all uh, this uh, stuff that he's packed into this hypothesis and i don't and think remember, he's derived any of it he's just and remember in the like in the everlasting case for example right and, and body and the bodiless case Swinburne just defined what he just said. I prefer to view God as everlasting in this way, and he said God is bodiless, which means, and then specified a definition. It didn't actually follow from um, this characterization of theism that he got that. He just specified yeah. that this. Well, is what he, he assumes he assumed that to to causally interact with a given point in space, you had to be present at that space, which is how he got to being omnipresent. And and he also said that you can't. Uh, yeah, he didn't really say why God couldn't have a body. He just sort of said that. He can't. Because... But we said that probably is a body. And, and he said, and, and the everlasting thing, his phrase was just, I prefer this view of everlasting. Yeah, pretty Twitter. much. Yeah, so there's a lot of the just sort of ad hocness uh, built up here or things that are not very well defended. Creator of the universe. Where did that come from? Um, sustainer well, it hasn't the... yet, actually. He will argue in the next yeah. chapter that it comes. But, I'm saying, but, but 
well, well, yeah. So, so maybe it does follow, but he just hasn't. But, it, but at least it, it's a bit weird to say it follows. God is the creator and sustainer of the universe when that has. I don't know been. what he's saying. It follows from. I think he's saying it follows just from everything that he said <laughs> in this chapter so far. Because it's not very from, clear there. Because it could be like like God could exist, right, and be omnipotent and omniscient, but surely the universe could exist just sans god right like a naturalist thinks and god could just yeah, exist absolutely. as well like, like why I mean, why it, would god be the creator as, unless you think that god is uh perfectly self-sufficient but some of doesn't think that he thinks that there are things that exist outside of it so yeah. god apparently laws of logic in some form and goodness in a variety of forms yeah, are both yeah. types of those things so why not some kind of universe or matter unorganized or something like that right he hasn't unless, i mean yeah, he'll give some arguments about that later but i don't think they're very good and i guess a a source of moral obligation so that so not the source, is, a source. Yeah, which is which is you know a, a good concession, and I guess he's talking there about the the duty to yeah, to, to, to our God. benefactor. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, so then we have <laughs> we have um, some kind of essentialism. Uh, every object has some essential properties and some accidental, i.e., non-essential properties. Um, I mean, this is what a lot of people believe in metaphysics. I guess not everyone, yeah. but. Um, that's everything in metaphysics is controversial, which is why I hate it when Craig says things as if they're just sort of, you know, metaphysicians, metaphysicians know that <laughs> <laughs> it's widely, what are you talking about? He just, anyway, yeah, people, some so, people dispute that there are even such things as properties or objects, or, but you know, we didn't get into that here. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, I, I tend to lean away from the sort of like es essentialist characterization of things and think that a lot of these things are more artifacts of, of our language than they are artifacts of things. Um, so I'm someone who's going to be kind of like skeptical of Swinburne's assertion here and would need a bit more, right? To, so so that's something that, again, is going to make it difficult for me to accept the wholesale theory when this is going to be like a key part of, of understanding um, Swinburne's model, right? Oh, yeah, that's why I say citation needed, bro. Like, <laughs> I just, yeah. where does that come from? Yeah. Like, pl is pl Pluto essentially a planet, or does Pluto's being a planet? Well, I guess that's with... an accidental property, right? I don't, yeah. I don't know. This is I, <laughs> or, how do you? I don't. I don't know. Or a planet as a kind, you know, like uh, constructed dependent upon the funding that NASA has for the amount of bodies in space that they can. Uh, see, study see he <laughs> says that one of the essential properties of of his desk is that it occupies space. Is it? Isn't the essential property of his desk that it serves the function of a desk? Couldn't you ha theoretically have a I don't know, a, a non-spatial desk, if it somehow served that property. Maybe, maybe you'd have to change certain other facts about the world, right? But I, I'm just not... Yeah, I, I understand what you mean. If, if we're to allowed to manipulate things, but... if we're allowed to manipulate things in the way that he's manipulated um, the meaning of, like, beliefs, purposes, <laughs> sure, and yeah, basic yeah. powers, then I think we can manipulate what desk means, what, what it means to... Um, proper you know act as a supporting tool for one's utilities yeah. or something that they can sit in front of to just talk about it analogously in like a spiritual sense for, for a solely world right and that can be like so well, if, if it can prop up like the things that i want to like that if it can support my working space which i think is what a desk is yeah yeah and i think that that would be a desk now in our world it seems that you can't do that without being uh, physically extended but i don't know that that's essential as in like in every possible world it has to have physical yeah it would be maybe that. there are some worlds in which you can do that without being physically like i don't know it just I, I i don't know exactly how he understands essential here because i don't know that he does he say that that's necessary uh, that's yeah I, th I, th it. I think by yeah by 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 essential i think he means he means necessary so so yeah well, I mean, yeah like this sort of stuff is really controversial about how you understand these things but that's partly why i'm very suspicious about these distinctions because i just don't know how far they get us Anyway, we yes. can keep going. I don't want to get this rabbit hole. Yeah, but, it but it, it's time. going to be, I, I mean, it, it's just to say, um, I think both of us can recognize what we're saying there, right, about desks and solely worlds or whatever. Obviously, for especially particularly for someone who's like skeptical of what we're saying, right, that they're, they're going to think, look, you two are being ridiculous. But I think the thing to highlight there is just yeah. the analogy between the, re it's like, well, why is it okay for Swinburne to do that in certain cases, right, when it, wor when it works for him? But then all of a sudden, um, when when it's inconvenient what things essentially mean is just very clear cut and obvious and can just be asserted you know like what what it means to have a belief is essentially justified true belief right and it's just just clear yeah, and, and obvious that's a, if you're understanding essential as meaning a necessary condition or property that's a very strong claim and that's why i say well hang on every possible world a desk has to be yeah well i guess he does say i think he says 
my desk. And so there's an indexical aspect there that we could then talk about as to when is it his <laughs> desk and when is it least of me. But you, you just, yeah, I mean, yeah, precisely yeah. my point is that this is so fuzzy and confusing yeah. that yeah. It, if you're grounding your, if you're grounding the claims that he's going to make in these sorts of distinctions and and concepts, then you know that's actually kind of highly suspect. Like you have to buy into this metaphysics to to then get the conclusion. Yeah. I think. Uh, oh, um, did you want to thank David, by the way? Uh, oh, I didn't Unless see. Unless you sorry, did before, and I missed it. No, I didn't see. It. I didn't actually know. Oh, did you click that right? Um, I did. Thanks, yeah. David. Please Just because I didn't click it, so I didn't. Because <laughs> I'm on the other tab, I uh, haven't really been paying attention to the chat other than um, a no few worries. minutes ago when I told someone to cope. Uh, Wait, we're nitpicking, apparently. Well, I, th I think what the sense I got from those comments, like, I'm like, look, it's fine to be in the chat and disagree with what we're saying, but um, it's like, just don't, you know, it, if you're getting like all frustrated and wound up or something, like, don't, we're just disagreeing with what Swinburne has to say. And there's a way of disagreeing, right, which is clearly like getting irate and stuff like that. It's like, just chill out. Um, there's no need to be like that. Well, especially when most of the comments consist of just saying that we're wrong without actually giving yeah. an argument. <laughs> Anyway, yeah, let, let's keep going here. So uh, it was, what he wants to say is that, sorry, I think there's a point that we've missed here. He wants to say that because God has the certain properties necessarily or essentially, that therefore mm -hmm. he can't cease to have them. And, yes. and that's, uh, I can't have, yeah, sorry, he gets to that a little bit later. Um, as to if God lost any of his powers, he would cease to exist, just as my yeah. desk would cease to exist if it ceased to occupy space. You know, I say worst kind of philosophy here. I don't know. That may seem an extreme. But what I mean by that is that <laughs> think about what he's talking about here. He's talking about his desk, a very ordinary middle sized standard object that we kind of understand pretty well. And and he's analogizing that to the omniscient, omnipotent, uh, perfectly free, uh, you know, multi uh, spatial yeah god of the universe like how can you just make a leap from that to the other thing and and and, and assume and that the what's same accidental and, and what's and essential concepts, yeah are going yeah. to apply that's what i hate it when philosophers do that it drives me nuts you can yeah. use these things as intuition pump or analogy that's fine but then to just say well just as it applies here so too it applies in a completely different case extrapolated to the extreme Hang yeah, on the a minute. maybe we should be a bit so, more cautious so maybe so maybe what um swinburne could do is make some claim that for everything there are for everything that exists there are some essential and some accidental yeah, properties well, that's what right? he said previously yeah. so so he so so maybe maybe we might be on board with him with that but the thing that's contentious right is distinguishing in the case of god what exactly is an essential and what's an accidental property of god well, I, I think it's difficult right, to tell for anything what what's essential for yes. property and how does, but, which but, is but in the ordinary cases but especially for god yeah it's gonna yeah, be much harder was, in the in the ordinary cases where we're, we're so familiar with them it's going to be at least you know that it's going to be more plausible that you can have this is not a type of philosophy that i like but there's going to be a large number of cases that are agreed to such that you can point to all those cases and what they have in common or whatever and say those are the essential features. But in the case of God, where it's so highly contentious and everything is just like a negation, you, you know, every property and description is like a negation of an ordinary case or analogous or whatever. How, how do you distinguish between what the essential and what the accidental things are? And I don't think there's any real principled way to do so other than starting with your By conclusion. stipulation, right? which is what he does yeah. here. He just sort of yeah. And this is another thing that's been stipulated. I think that Swinburne really undersells how much he just sort of stipulates here as well. This is what, and sometimes Craig tries to defend this just based on the length of time that theists have believed it. He's literally <laughs> yeah. says, well, theists have always said this. Like, well, yeah. okay, it's always been ad hoc. What difference does that make? Yeah, How Buddhists, long people have said it? It's ridiculous. Yeah. Ancestor worshippers have always said <laughs> that, yeah. But yeah, um, I, I don't know why you couldn't have a changeable God um, that ceased to have certain properties. I mean, Christians believe that God incarnated now I think that they would still maintain that he is essentially non-spatial, but I don't freaking know how well, that works. <laughs> I mean, there's different models of, of course, there aesthetic is, yeah. union. And <laughs> uh, yeah, but anyway, I guess the point is that if you, you want, you can eat your cake and have it too. But yeah I, yeah, I don't know. I don't know how that works. Okay, God's existence is the only thing uh, whose existence God's action doesn't explain. Um, and it's like, well, why... Why is that? That's right? bold. Yeah. <laughs> well, by stipulation, I think. Yeah. yeah he sustains yeah. everything. So I, I guess that. No, but hang on. That can't be true because God's actions cannot explain moral values, according to him, because he just said that they would exist independently yes, of God. Right. right. Uh, yeah. Is there any qualification he gives here? God is responsible for the existence of everything else besides himself for it being as it is and having the powers and liabilities it does. Okay. So maybe he's just talking about in causal reality. So maybe he'd he say that, there like, are powers and liabilities 
of things to generate obligations or something i don't know now well okay maybe but i think the more likely avenue is that he's, he's talking about causal reality he does talk about powers and liabilities um and if that, if he means causal reality that would include like spirits and things in the material world but it wouldn't include like laws of logic universals um and uh moral values or something like that uh, if if you believe in such things, right? Um, I, I don't, right? But but if you believe that there are things like that that exist but are not part of the causal world, then I guess God doesn't need to explain those. But it would be nice to mention that. Like, I'm just inferring that here. Otherwise, it seems like a clear contradiction. That must be what he means here. And that, notice in, the, in this sentence, you know, God is a necessary being, something which exists under its own steam, not dependent on anything else. Um, so Swinburne is, is basically introducing the idea that a legitimate mode of explanation yeah, is necessity and then what does that mean well that just means he's going to be open to all the objection the parity kind of objections that opie raises right in terms of just postulating necessity of natural things that are i mean i i think opie does try and make a, a, a good case of his theory but i mean you could even say that are just as bad as the theist one right where you just stipulate new natural necessary things that are pretty weird and disanalogous to anything we're familiar with and do the same expl explanatory work as god um, it exists under its own steam. It's not dependent on something else. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Okay. So thus concludeth chapter one. Um, so how do we explain things? Chapter two. So I probably have fewer things to comment on here. Some of it is methodological that we've already talked about. Ah, but we do need to talk about the two different types of explanations. Yes. Here, that yeah. is important. So Swinburne is going to distinguish between um, like personal and impersonal explanations. And this is going to be another very very um contentious i suppose uh, distinction to commit yourself specifically to to this um but then yeah we we have another contentious metaphysical assumption here about substances um like a very a, a very kind of scholastic type uh traditional way of doing metaphysics you might say i must warn warn the reader that i'm using the word substance um not as the name of of things such as oil or sulfur but as the name of individual things i don't think that's very standard at all at least from my exposure i don't know why he uses yeah. that way normally you would you would say object from from my exposure to this literature i don't know yeah. if that's changed or something i guess so it, i i think it depends quite heavily on what you're trying to do and what like your kind of audience is i mean classically for theists who are like thomists and stuff They'd actually appeal to, you know, the old sort of like um, Aristotelian type distinctions between um, quiddities and hexaities, where like a quiddity is like a thing's whatness, right? So what it is to be that thing, and then a hexaity is its thisness. So why is it like this particular <laughs> thing? <laughs> um, <Yes. laughs> and this is the sort of metaphysics, that that's the sort of metaphysics, you know, that um, gets mocked um, in terms of like dormitive virtues and things like that, right? Like, um, uh but yeah, I, so so this is a non-standard sort of um, usage of substance, I think, as the name of individual things, and I guess, I, I, and I guess that this is like the the quiddities or quiddity quiddities of like Thomists um, here. I think it's good that he does warn the reader because otherwise I would have been very confused. Yes. Later on, for example, he talks about substance dualism. The idea being that there is a physical substance and a material substance, no, a physical wow. and, an, and a non-physical substance, and that both are necessary to give rise to a mind, right? And that the mind is in some sense ultimately immaterial, but it does interact with the physical. The way that, that the word substance is being used there is to refer to a type of thing, a type yes. of stuff, yeah, which is not, a different not as in a specific object, because <laughs> then what you would say is that your mind is a substance, yeah. but it's actually a specific object, right? So there's two senses of substance here, and I, I don't know why he then uses that. Yeah, it, it might have been more useful to use a different word for given his purpose. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's just, I, I found that confusing. Okay, so so he says events are caused by substances. Um, so that's, again, <laughs> not a universally held view, but it's a common one. So, all right, we'll so, allow him that. So, I get, you know, like events are taken to basically be, be things happening because of like the causal dispositions of substances, whatever, the causal powers and dispositions. Yeah, so one something. way to explicate an event that some people use is an event is an object um, taking on or losing or changing a property that it has, a right. non-essential property, I guess. Um, and by Swinburne's use, it would be a substance acquiring or losing a property or changing a property. Yeah. 
so yeah like the something changing color or falling off somewhere you know so now so now according to swinburne there are two different ways um in which objects cause events um so inanimate causation which is going to be you know the kind of like physical causation maybe in the sciences whatever and intentional causation which is going to be this sort of what i'm going to refer to as like a, a, a special type of causation reserved for agents basically um, yeah so like like us or got when i when i choose to waggle my finger that's um according to swinburne a distinct type of of, of thing that that can't be reduced to um the other type of causation so I say here, are these fundamentally distinct? Now, obviously, Swinburne thinks that they are. They're sort of metaphysically separate. Um, a materialist isn't going to think that. They're going to think that intentional causation is just a particular Reducible type of too. Yeah. inanimate <laughs> or just causation, right? Um, yeah. And, I mean, Swinburne can have the view that they are distinct. He, I guess he sort of argues for it. But, I mean, certainly at the outset, he just sort of says that we find. This is This is what consistently annoys me. What do you mean we find them? This is not something you just find, right? How we you find the world the way my conclusion is. <laughs> I, I know. It's, no, we don't find it. That's your conclusion, right? It, it, anyway, we'll talk more about why he thinks yeah. that. But I just no, I agree. I, I, and I think so. So typically, I think the way that people will try in philosophy to argue that intentional causation is something distinct from uh, from this inanimate type causation is by firstly establishing that intentional causation is indispensable or something um, to, to various um, types of human inquiry. So maybe like historical explanation or something like that. Like you, you know, you require to postulate the, or, or in order to explain communication, you need to postulate these things called intentions, and then they'll need to do some extra work to show that it kind of, that those intentions can't be reduced to, um, sort of some description of brain states and, and stuff. And that's usually done by committing so, some classic form of intentional fallacy, right? Which will be kind of like, you know, I can know everything about your brain states, but not know what you intend. Well, Swinburne <laughs> makes those arguments. We'll get to that in the chapter on the mind. Yeah. Um, okay. The personal explanation model of explanation is like the inanimate one, oh, unavoidable in our thinking um, about the world. Something, well, again, unavoidable. In, well, I guess you could say our thinking, given that we're like English speakers, right? In do, sort of trained in our way of thinking about the world, which yeah, includes. Yeah, but that's not what, that, I don't think that's what he means if you follow, yeah. just read through yeah. to the highlight. Yeah. Some thinkers have claimed that persons and their purposes really make no difference to what happens. Brain events cause and are caused by other nerve events and bring about bodily movements without persons and purposes making any difference. But no one can think consistently in that way. Yeah, so what, what he's saying there is that it's not just that we... So some people might say, well, we use the notion of intentions and persons as a, maybe a convenient shorthand or as a, 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 a useful tool, right? Yes. But really what's happening is the causal um, uh, the causal forces are, are produced or passed through brain events, which cause other nerve events and so forth, and that leads to bodily movements. Persons and purposes don't make any difference, or you might say that they don't make any difference over and above the causal effects of the brain events and so forth. Um, and so that would be one view that a materialist could take. But he says, no, you you can't actually consistently think like that, um, which I think is just, well, why? Yeah. Like, well, 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 I think it's a common view. What You can't think that way? Yeah. Well, why not? So, so I think his, when he says you can't consistently think that way, I think he's going to he's gonna be saying, well, the person who thinks this way is going to commit themselves to all sorts of personal um explanations right in terms of persons or these various um terms of folk psychology or whatever that might be eliminated by the theory that he's arguing against and then he's going to say so in doing so they're committing themselves to my metaphysics but no they wouldn't say that right they would say yeah. no i'm just using this language which can be eliminated <laughs> and, and what's really going on is this other but that, thing. that's what he says he says that if you adopt this view you would cease to form purposes and try to execute them and then you would never do anything you would never eat talk and so yeah. forth that's absurd someone with these metaphysics yeah, would of course keep doing all of those things they would just yeah. understand them differently they would say exactly. well, yeah these are all caused by some lower level sort of physical processes but that yeah. doesn't why would i stop doing them because i believe that i just he just says that they would do that exactly i think that, what's happening here is that he's assuming some sort of uh swimboat is assuming uh, libertarian free agency, which the materialist probably doesn't believe in. Um, and um, that that's maybe what's driving this here. 
Yeah. But I mean, it just doesn't really explain. To form a purpose to move one's hand involves trying to move the hand. Yeah. If we cease to right. form purposes, nothing would happen. Yeah. I mean, in, in some sense, we can agree with that. But then why does it follow that thinking that your purposes don't make a difference above and beyond the causal underpinning means that you would stop doing that? Well, I guess, I guess actually, it doesn't follow. Well, hang, I, I do think, I do think Swinburne sort of has a point here, right? So, so say eliminativism is correct, right? And so there's no such thing as purposes, but that's just like a, a useful kind of paraphrase. But there isn't like an actual thing called a purpose that happens in the world. Yeah. Yeah. Well, then if a thing called a purpose is um, necessary in order to move my hand, well, then eliminativism is false, right? But the eliminativist just wouldn't say that there is a thing called a purpose in the world. So that so then I guess I guess that would but but then you'd just be question begging right against the eliminativist because on that but, but he's there he's, isn't a thing. he's saying no one can consistently think that yeah, yeah. <laughs> they're that that persons and purposes don't make any difference above and beyond the causal substrate like the physical substrate it, but the only reason he says that they can't think that is because if they did they would stop acting. But it's no part of their view that they would stop acting. They just think that their yes, actions are yeah. physically caused and that exactly. there's no cause above and beyond the physical causes. Like there's no causal difference made by the person's purposes, whether they <laughs> yeah, exist because or not. It seems like Swinburne's saying, because they would believe my metaphysical commitments and theirs at the same time. <laughs> yeah, they would therefore. Uh, it's just, I don't understand it at all. Why, why that um, would, yeah, it's so weird. But, but, but all that being said, even if this was correct, right, it seems to be addressing like a particular type of something like eliminativism which doesn't engage with um, potentially like like different views. I don't know, like maybe a behaviorist type view or even like an, an identity or functionalist type view of what's going on there. This just has nothing to say, right, about how those types of materialists would understand what's going on. So it's only, so even if the argument were sound, right, it would only sort of exclude. Yeah, it, this appears to only be a response to maybe an eliminativist view or some sort of epiphenomenal view. Right. Um, I don't think it, it says anything to an identity theorist who thinks that the, the, the like the nervous just are is, the same thing but, as the purposes. Yeah. Or my view, which would be a a, um, a a grounding reductionist view, which is to say that the, the purposes are grounded and grounded in and reducible to the uh, the say the body uh, the, the, like the nerve events. Um, and in, in that sense, they don't have an existence that's sort of independent of them. Um, and so I I don't. Yeah, I mean, I just right. or yeah, a functionalist it's, view it's, where the purpose yeah, just yeah. is this kind of process or whatever. Function, um, yeah, the, yeah. It's just not clear how any of this relates to this function this that's realized is. by the nerve endings. Um, so, yeah, because it seems like that he's imagining that there are people who think that there are just these, either that there aren't purposes and pur and persons, or that they exist but they don't do anything. Yeah, yeah. And most physicalists don't think either of those things. Yeah, and, and and another thing to note, I think about is is just the difference in how Swinburne's doing his metaphysics, right? So he's again he's willing to commit himself to these like hefty conclusions about the way the world fundamentally is, essentially just based off of like ordinary language and intuition about like persons and purposes and so on, completely disconnected from what like the sciences have to tell us about any of these things and what's going on. Where, and I think that that really is the wrong way of doing philosophy to sort of um, just commit yourself to the way reality is fundamentally and then have to like, you know, ha have to manipulate all of your other views about all of these other domains of human inquiry to fit around those ordinary intuitions. I, th I think that kind of leaves you with these kind of bizarre 17th and 18th century views, which, uh, you know, people try felt philosophers kind of tried to make work and then they just couldn't be modified enough with all the stuff that there is in the sciences about how weird the physical world seems to be um, yeah i should also mention that there are non-reductive physicalists about the mind who think that they are that uh like uh, yes that's true. mental states do make a causal difference but they are true in virtue of physical states so they're not some sort of separate substance i think it is a little bit hard of you to articulate and there's a lot of debate in the literature about how uh, how um stable that view is but it's certainly a view that's defended oh yeah i, th I think i think the the distinction swinburne's trying to establish between personal and inanimate explanation is also available to some like materialists right um but then they're going to have different things to say about the overall but, the, but they're still the going to say that a personal explanation is um is is supervenient upon um, yes immaterial yeah. explanations but they won't say it reduces to it 
Yes, right. I agree. So with the that. fundamental distinction that Swinburne wants to draw, I don't think, is available to any type of physicalist. I think it's only really available to a, a substance yeah. dualist. I was going to say, I think some type of naturalist who might be like property dualist or something. Yes, might maybe say a property dualist something. potentially. Yeah. Yes. Um, I don't know if property dualism counts as a form of naturalism, though. But I suppose that's debatable. It yeah, yeah. It depends on how you. I mean, I would sort of wouldn't say it is, but I think some of them would say that their view is. Yeah. Right. Um, All right, and then we get onto laws of nature, right? Because we're talking about two different types of explanation, and one of those yeah. is like essentially like physical uh, causation and appeals to laws of nature, and then the other one is personal. So talking about the laws of nature one, he says, oh, this is such a big claim here. In discussing laws of nature, what scientists are discussing are the powers and liabilities to act of innumerable particular substances. Um, yeah. So he's taking a powers or dispositions view about laws of nature, which is to, for there to be a law is to say that a certain type of thing has certain causal powers or, or dispositions to act in a certain way. As I say, that's one view. <laughs> there are many other views. Um, and I think that this will become clearer later. I had to think about this a little bit, but Swinburne's entire argument, um, I think this actually comes in the next chapter. Swinburne seems to be taking a fundamentally human view about the laws of nature, although this is not a human view, right? That substances have particular powers but it's human in a different sense in which swinburne seems to human in this sense what i mean is that this idea that there are no necessary connections between distinct essences that's often a way that it's sort of articulated so if i have a thing and another thing if they're different from each other there's no necessary connection between them um and this is often um formulated as a kind of a skeptical view about the notion of, of a, like a necessary causal connection between one thing and another thing. Um, I think Swinburne uses this view to basically explain why God needs to sustain the universe, because otherwise, like, why aren't different bits of the universe just kind of doing their own thing if there's no necessary connection between them? But anyway, it, the point is that it seems to me that that's in tension with the idea that particular substances have causal powers and liabilities, because if you believe that, then you're going to believe, well, it's quite reasonable to believe on the basis of that, that there are going to be commonality of powers and liabilities of things if they are, uh, if they share, if they're like different electrons that are both uh, part of like uh, share the property of being an electron or they're both instantiations of that. I, I sort of tend to interpret this as Swinburne thinking in terms of something like a Hempel's law covering type model, which I think is reflective of philosophy of science sort of around the time he was writing it. Um, and then again, not that I'm massively familiar with philosophy of science in the direction it's gone or particularly fond of these ways of thinking about things. But um, I, I understand that then there's like these argu arguments that have been given against like Hempel's law covering model about the way that it does, it, the idea being that there's like some kind of um, general conditional like disposition or whatever and then some particular instance and you plug it in and then that tells you what you know like expect in terms of these these um i, I thought that i thought of that more as a theory of explanation or scientific explanation yeah. rather than a theory of laws of nature because one theory of laws of nature is the human view which is that there's a there are regularities um that laws of nature describe regularities in nature and that's kind of all there is to it right um but that's not what Swinburne is saying here. He's saying that they, that laws of nature describe the powers, dispositions, liabilities of particular substances. That's a specific view. Um, I kind of agree with that, by the way, but it's certainly not the only view available. Yeah. And he just sort of asserts it as if it's a fact, which, I mean, it's not. Um, laws of nature must be universal. Yeah, so he's just talking a bit about giving examples of this. I don't have a lot to say about that, um, how we reasoned by appealing to laws and so forth. They may be universal or statistical, so that's fine. Uh, justification for explanation. So these are, these are Swinburne's criteria, right? Yeah, for evaluating the explanation effectively. So, so the first one is it leads us to expect with accuracy many and varied events which we observe, and we do not observe any events whose non-occurrence it leads us to expect. Now, this is going to be quite interesting, right? Because expect is quite interesting, because Swinburne's going to talk about expectation as just this kind of logical relation between the hypothesis and the evidence. But we might think of expectation as actually being in terms of like um, 
chronological in time in order to avoid sort of like hindsight but hindsight bias and kind of gerrymandered mm. explanations and so on so that's something i'll talk about a little bit more later um and then many and varied events which we observe and we do not observe any events whose non-occurrence it leads us to expect um yeah maybe just leave that there for now uh, what is proposed is simple and again what simple means is going to be a bit contentious i think um, because there are different ways of counting things there's different ways of thinking about simple like in terms of you know like entities in the world in terms of like your actual description or like theoretical content or something whether that comes with any like baggage in terms of commitments um and so so we'll talk about that it fits well with our background knowledge but this is the, the reason this is contentious is because precisely what is the background knowledge um, that we're bringing in is going to be very important and again contentious because if we exclude things that are inconvenient to the hypothesis that we favor or only include things in our background knowledge which are convenient then we're again engaging in a type of cooking the books right in favor of whichever theory that we're going in for and then uh, fourth we would not otherwise expect to find these events um, for example there is no rival law which leads us to expect these events which satisfies criteria one to three, as well as does our proposed law. I don't know if you want to say anything about those, James, or you're just happy to... Not really. I broadly agree with those. Um, we'll see issues with the way that these are applied a bit later, but I don't have major concerns at the outset. I think So this is him just example. talking about, yeah, some I don't really understand examples. this diagram, by the way. But... Yeah. I guess it's uh, it's sort of showing the simpler one. The I perihelion. Think. Yeah, I, th I think it's, yeah. Yeah, this is an interesting notion of background knowledge. He means knowledge of how things work in neighboring areas. Um, so like related disciplines or something or, or similar questions, which I think is okay, but I, I kind of don't, I think that's too narrow, actually. I think your background knowledge is just any knowledge that is pertinent in any way to the particular question. It may not be in a neighboring area. So, for example, if I'm assessing claims about someone seeing um, a man come back from the dead, the only relevant, like the neighboring area would be like other people claiming something similar. But I don't think that's the only background knowledge that's relevant. Actually, I think there's a whole host of knowledge that's relevant to assessing that claim, like about human memory, about socialization effects, um, about psychological biases, um, about uh, perceptual distortions, about other types of paranormal or claims that people make irrational belief but, um, persistence, the theological beliefs that people had at the time. Those things aren't really like neighboring areas in, in I think, the sense that he means it here and given the example that he provides, which is like a similar type, like sub subject matter. So I don't know why he would make it that narrow. And later on, he appeals to this to exclude appeals to background knowledge in cases where I would want to appeal to it. But um, it seems to me that background knowledge should just be anything that is sort of pertinent to to the question that affects the probabilities. Yeah, and that, and that is the question, like, when when he's talking about neighboring areas here, like, in terms of grand explanation, what does he mean by neighboring areas? Like, theology? Like, what are what Well, other... he gives an example. Theories about a particular gas behaves at low temperature, you take into account what we know about other gases at low temperature. Well, but I want to say, gas. yes, but that's not the only thing. Like there may be other things that you should take into account as well. Like maybe some particular type of quantum interaction is important and you can study that in a very different context. That's not anything really about gases, right? To, to so, take that simple example. So I, I agree with that. And I can see how what he's saying here applies in the case of a gas, but I'm saying in the case of what he's trying to establish um, about like grand explanatory theories, whatever. I mean, what is a neighboring area, right? Is it just, what, what are the fields of study that- Well, actually, he, like what, he wants, what he wants to say <laughs> is that when you're looking at grand theories, that there is no background knowledge because it's all encompassing and therefore you ignore background, which I think is well, ridiculous. He, he says that later. Yeah. And, th and then on the point of cooking the books, right? Um, the stuff you just said about not including important information about, you know, how various facts about cults and cognitive dissonance and so forth can be explain miracle claims um is going to be very important right to the to the kind of philosophical yeah he says this on page 29 actually i think we can skip towards that because he's just giving okay. examples of scientific explanation but on page 29 i've highlighted something which uh, I, I completely disagree with the criterion of background knowledge does not operate when we do not have knowledge of how things work in any neighboring fields of inquiry. So example, if we do not have any measurements of the positions of planets, uh, we cannot take into account the behavior of other planets in assessing a theory about the behavior of Mars. Inevitably, the wider our area of inquiry, the less there will be neighboring fields to take into account. Uh, and at the, at the bottom here, clearly where we are concerned with explaining literally everything, the criterion of background knowledge will be irrelevant. 
Yeah. This seems to be presupposing that you don't <laughs> start with any knowledge at the outset, which is ridiculous. Like, of course, you start with not yeah. background knowledge that you're bringing to the table, and that's going to be relevant in assessing the, explana the, the explanatory merits of a theory. I, I don't mm. understand this at all. It seems a, a desire to just rule out everything that might contradict what he wants to say. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it would seem by his criteria we should ex all of the things I just mentioned about assessing like miracle claims. It seems that none of those would count as a, like a, a neighboring field, given the way that yeah. he seems to define it. But I think it should be clear that those things are pertinent because they affect the relevant plausibility and and scope and things of the different uh, explanatory models. And so obviously those should be brought into consideration. But he would just want to exclude them for some reason. Uh, yeah, this is just him saying, ba basically, simplicity is going to do a lot of work for him because he's going to say yeah. um, when th th there's an infinite number of theories that you can kind of come up with, which all are yeah. um, empirically adequate, consistent with the data. And so simplicity, you know, your criterion of simplicity is going to kind of do that pruning for you, um, which I sort of agree with. Um, the simplicity yeah. of a scientific theory is a matter of it having a few component laws each of which relates few variables by mathematically simple formulae. I mean, I sort of agree with this, but then again, it, I think we've got to be careful because sometimes we can talk about like the simplicity of our description, right? Which is kind of like, I can say God in a single word, or I can come up with a new notation, which kind of obscures a whole lot of complexity that's actually in there. Um, and so we've got, and that doesn't mean it's actually simple just because I can have like one symbol which embeds a whole lot of content, right? Yeah, the number of variables I think is irrelevant, right? And I think it's actually, so there's an example about this, which is, uh, I mean, it's probably been discussed in literature, but I think of it as a, as a universal universe generator. So what it does is it just generates every possible universe given our given the laws of nature as they are it just puts the particles like in a different configuration and it just spits out all of those now mathematically that's actually very simple to describe because you just like iterate over the particles and, and just describe all of the interactions right um i mean it, you, you couldn't actually like it'd be infeasible to generate that but the, the description of it is very simple and so what i could do is i could just explain any state of affairs by saying well it's it got spat out of the universal universe generator and we're just living in that one, like some sort of anthropic argument. Right? Now, I think that's a terrible argument. It's one of the reasons I don't appeal to multiverses, because I don't actually think that specifying a simple procedure for creating all possible alternatives and just saying that, well, we, we're in one of those, it actually really explains anything. Um, that's also one of the reasons why I don't think God is a good explanation, because if he can do anything, but you just say, well, he just sort of did this one. Well, why did he do that one, right? Well, it's just because it's the one that he did. He could have done any of them. <laughs> anyway, so the, the simplicity of the generating process, I don't think is sort of is sufficient there because generating all possible outcomes can actually be quite simple. Like the, the description of the process to generate them can be quite simple. Specifying one particular well, yeah. one may actually require it's a lot more information. Yeah, what you're talking about is the simplicity of the description there, right? Rather than the yes. simplicity of the thing. Yeah, being which is why I think we well. need to distinguish yeah. that. Yeah. Um, or the just yeah, the description of generating a set that contains the thing. But anyway, um, yeah, and, and this point here is what I highlighted. I, I prefer to describe simplicity in this way, is that it, uh, we postulate few new types of objects, few new properties, and few new kinds of properties and things like that. I, I also yes. think talk about processes and mechanisms. The, the fewer new types of things and the less distinctive or, or novel that they are, the better. Yes. I think yeah. that's a better way to phrase it. And I think if we can, if we can, um, it's better to postulate more of the same type of things that we're already committed to than it is to introduce, you know, less. Yeah, new I, types I agree. Of other, things. other, other things being equal, yes. Um, which again is, I think, well, when we're thinking about naturalism, right? We're just going to often we're going to be basically um, including more of the same types of things that we're already committed to in various different configurations and things, right? Rather than entirely new types of things, um, even if there's only one of them or something. Uh, and note that he, he, he is endorsing the view that you should postulate the minimum properties and objects and so forth necessary to account for your data. Right. Yeah. Which I think he violates this when he says that the creator of the universe must be omnipotent. Is you don't need to to postulate that in order to get the effect, which is a universe, or even perfectly free, or per, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's more than is needed. Like, he's going to say that he, that's how God is defined, right? Which he's defined in chapter one. Yes, but that it's. I don't think it's the best explanation because a God that is less powerful accounts for the explains the phenomena just as well, 
at least those phenomena, uh, but is a simpler explanation. It, it seems by his own lights. But he doesn't think about that because he only compares it to naturalism. This is what I say. He doesn't actually address like the spaces of what would, under his lights the best explanation would be. He only compares it to some, I think, very flimsy form of naturalism. But yeah, we'll get to that in the next chapter. I'm going to duck out in a few minutes to have dinner with my family for about 15 minutes. So just keep going without me. I'll be back okay, after that. Cool. We've got no got problem. People over, That's sorry. Right. Um, yeah. I think um, uh, we're probably about the end of this chapter. Or are we um, a little bit more? I think actually. so. I think he's got something to say about the, the zero or infinity stuff as well coming up. Oh, yeah. Um, well, maybe we'll just comment on that and I'll. Yeah, sure. Talk. So what, what, um, hang on, what page are we on here? Yeah, so explanatory power. Oh, yeah, so this fine. is the explanation versus prediction thing. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you had you had some comments on this. Well, just to say that this is this is incredibly contentious. So that there's there's some good um okay, so so there's lots of different ways that this is discussed. So this is this is called like the problem of old evidence in in like Bayesianism or in uh, statistics literature, but it's also quite prevalent in um in like the philosophy of science literature as well. So I thought I'd just kind of quickly go through an SEP um, article, which covers it fairly well, uh, if I can find the correct thing. Prediction versus accommodation, right? So in early philosophical literature, a prediction was considered uh, to be an empirical consequence of a theory that had not yet been verified at the time the theory was constructed. So, so that's just to say that the kind of the time that you come up with your hypothesis, whether it's like before or after you make the observation or gather the evidence was um, considered to be important, right? For whether something uh, is a prediction or not. Um, the view that predictions are superior to accommodations when accommodations are ones that are made after hypotheses constructed after the fact to accommodate the evidence and the assessment of scientific theories is known as predictivism. Commonly, however, predictivism is understood more precisely as entailing that evidence confirms theory more strongly when predicated than when accommodated. Um, much ink has when, been when predicted than when accommodated. Uh, yeah, when predicted than when accommodated. Much ink has been spilled modifying the concept of prediction and explaining why predictivism is or is not true. Um, so I think this is all, all kind of really interesting. One, one, one interesting thing is yeah. um, how... In Karl, in Karl Popper's work on sort of, which, which obviously is, is relatively kind of old now, and a lot a lot of stuff's been built on that. I think people like Massimo Pigliucci and so on do a lot of stuff in this area. Um, but but how basically the kind of accommodation view is is viewed as a kind of hallmark of, of pseudoscience, right? So Popper had become convinced that certain popular theories of his day, including, for example, Marx's theory of history and Freudian psychoanalysis, were pseudosciences. Popper deemed them uh, deemed the problems of distinguishing scientific from pseudoscientific theories of the demarcation problem. His solution to the de to demarcation, as is well known, uh, was to identify the quality of falsifiability or testability as the mark of scientific theory. The pseudosciences were marked, Popper claimed, by their vast explanatory power. So that's that kind of red flag that you pointed out at the start. Yeah, exactly. Um, they, they could explain not only all the relevant actual phenomena the world presented, they could explain any conceive, conceivable phenomena that might fall within their domain. This was because the explanations offered by the pseudosciences were sufficiently malleable that they could always be adjusted ex post facto to explain anything. Thus, the pseudosciences never ran the risk of being inconsistent with the data. By contrast, a genuine scientific theory made specific predictions about what should be observed and thus ran the risk of falsification. Popper emphasized that what established the scientific character of relativity theory was that it stuck its neck out in a way that pseudosciences never did. Um, I'm not going to go through all of this because it can, it, you know, it gets quite technical and there's various disagreements. I'm not saying that one should fall heavily on the side of predictivism uh, or, or not. And there's obviously further debates that I had amongst um, statisticians and so on. But that's just to say this is another very contentious... Um, yet another. <laughs> uh, yeah, yet another very contentious claim that Swinburne, where Swinburne's just coming down firmly on one side of this, he relies upon one particular contentious view in order for his argument to go through, and he just doesn't make the case right. He just kind of he he, he just kind of asserts that it is the case that it's this way, and doesn't actually offer an argument as to why. Um, 
Yeah, he's yeah. not really honest to open and clear about all of the things he's assuming. Some of them he says that he's sort of taking this, like the moral values thing, even though we, we sort of didn't think that he did that in a very fair way. Others he just kind of slips behind without even really being clear that he's assuming that. Um, and and I think that, I mean, even, even relatively philosophically sophisticated people like Nathan and myself can miss some of these things sometimes we're not reading it carefully. Um, and, and, and the more, more casual reader probably isn't going to realize like who's particularly if they're relatively more, um, on board with his general project, how many things he's sort of assuming here in order to reach his conclusion. Again, it's not a problem to assume things, but it's an issue about transparency and, and honestly, and kind of actually arguing, trying to argue for things, at least a little bit, acknowledging alternatives. Um, and so when he like reaches his conclusion, it's like, well, he claims to have like given really good evidence that reasons for thinking that God exists. Right. Uh, but the issue is how many, how many assumptions about really controversial uh, debated points have we had to make to get there? Um, and then how much has he actually said in favor of those in many cases, not much, because he often doesn't even acknowledge he's making them. And I think that that just really weakens uh, what, what the book's doing. If it was more upfront about the assumptions it made and tried to uh, give a bit of a more honest defense of them relative to alternatives, I think it would be a much stronger book. But he throughout, uh, I mean, we've already pointed out a bunch and there are more to come. He just does not do this. And that really weakens the, uh, the, the value of the book, in my opinion. So, so here is Wes Wimber, just he says, uh, the support given by observations to theory concerns a logical relation between observations and theory and is independent of when the observations are made. So that's, that's just an assertion, right? It isn't, it isn't kind of justified in any way. And the alternative opinion isn't, um, isn't argued against, importantly. Now, the, the, obviously, the concern of the predictivist seems to be ruling out kind of pseudoscience, and there were various kind of hallmarks of pseudoscience that were included, like explains anything, or, you know, if, if you permit these ad hoc modifications, then you can just never basically argue against any of these theories, because they're just always going to turn out to be true for those who advocate for them. And I think we have to ask ourselves when we look at some of Swinburne's explanations for like evil or God's basic actions and things like some things we've already talked about, but things that we're going to go on to talk about, about why theism is a good explanation of anything, whether or not it seems to be that there are the, these um, very ad hoc sort of inclusions being made to the theory. So, so one hallmark of like ad hocness, right, is that for every phenomena that's purported to be explained by a theory, there's going to be like... A, a unique kind of cause between that hypothesis and the thing being explained. So suppose, you know, I, I'm trying to explain um, A, B, C, and D or something with some theory T, and then I explain A's in terms of T by um, some special A cause, B's in terms of uh, T by some special B cause, C's in terms of T by some special C cause. Now there's not like, it, it, it's not like T is really doing any explanation there. It's literally... Uh, um, it, it, it's bloated because in each individual case that I'm supposed to explain something, I've postulated something new and unique, right, in order to get that specific explanation. And it seems like in, in Swinburne's case, that's what's happening with, as James was saying, like the goodness, right? There's there's unique kinds of goodness. There's unique causal powers of God in the case of every single thing that he's supposed to cause. And there's unique desires and dispositions for God in the case of every... So it's not like there's just one thing, right? There's a unique, different, independent postulate now that's introduced for every thing that God is supposed to allegedly explain. So Swinburne's going to say, um, now, of course, there's this issue of pseudoscience. Theories can always be constructed to fit observations. Um, but what cannot, cannot always be constructed are simple theories, which yield many observations. But the problem here is that in terms of simplicity, Swinburne just means, well, God's just like one word, right? But actually, there's a ton of complexity in the theory that he's introduced in terms of all of these kind of implausible um, things like basic actions that are not really very well understood and work in all these different kind of ways. Um, and like God's psychology and reasons and uh, beliefs and stuff, which is all very different to the cases we are familiar with and, uh, and makes the theory very complex, in fact. Yep. There's so much that he postulates here. I, I guess we can go over it at the end with the, when we list all the things that he has to, has to add here. Um, so by best explanation, I mean an explanation which satisfies our four yep. criteria. I think that's that's correct. That's the yeah. I think the right approach. I agree with that. Um, he also says criteria. that it applies to scientific and to personal explanations. Yeah. Um, possibly, as a naturalist, I guess... well, as a naturalist, I think you would you would agree with that, right? If you think that na uh, well, personal explanations are a subset of physical. Although... Well, yes, sort of, but I I, I think there's like epistemic limitations, right? Because I don't think historians can like look at laws about brains and figure out, you know, based on like the relevant 
um, psychophysical laws or something, what the best historical explanation is or something. So they have like unique historical ways of explaining things which appeal to criteria which like chunk information in terms of the kind of words that historians use, if that makes sense. Um, I mean, he doesn't really talk about exactly because he talks about personal explanations and scientific explanations. He doesn't talk about other types of explanations, such as legal explanations, mathematical explanations, historical explanations, um, or even social sciences, uh, political explanations. So I don't know exactly what he would say about those. Now, I, I think that the, all of those types of, well, mathematical are a little trickier, but most of those types of explanations can be unified under the, the same uh, basic criteria, but there'll be disciplinary specifics about how you kind of do that in practice. Um, so, I mean, I think he could appeal to that as well. Um, but under Swinburne's view of freedom, right, what are supposed to be like the psychological laws? <laughs> you know, it kind yes, of well, I think he does mention that at, at one point. Um, it's not, uh, yep, coming. Okay. It's um, it's not clear that there are really, uh, it's not clear that there are exactly such things. But remember, he also says that any such regularities would be, would impinge on freedom. <laughs> um and right. so exactly it's a bit so tricky right it's, it's like there could be you know it's like how braxton talks about like your brain running on determinism <laughs> yeah, <laughs> when you're not yeah. really thinking about it it's almost like that it seems it's like that there's yeah that there are like psychological or sociological laws that are like probabilistic but then there's free will which kind of like yeah which is like spanner in the world <laughs> yeah and <laughs> chancy swerving of atoms <laughs> none of that but yeah i mean like what i said before it doesn't really make a lot of sense to me because when it's like it's like there can't be anything that causally affects your free will. So the only time when you're truly free is when there's no causal effects on what you do, even though we can, like, it, it, it seems that in the actual world, there always are, like the incentives that we face and the consequences that we expect and things like that. Somehow those aren't how it, it's just so different to how I think about freedom. Freedom is acting in those situations, considering those factors. Whereas for, for, for people who believe in this sort of view, it's like those things are all kind of... Uh, opposing free will or diminishing it yeah it's only in in this idealized absence of any of that stuff that you can just sort of choose in the absence of any causal effects or like co context or whatever and, and then yeah. i think that would say you choose on the basis of what you have the most reason to do but then it seems that you actually don't have choice because you kind of actually you would choose the same thing in the same situation so yeah. i don't know where the freedom even comes from there but then it seems like i, I think I would it's choose to i choose to sustain myself without food or just like fly to the other side of the planet right but yeah i mean what, so what would what, what basis would you have for choosing well you might say well just for maximizing goodness i think is what swinburne would say um but then fr you're maximally free when you have no constraints on your choices causally or psychologically or desires or anything else and when you would always then choose to do the thing that is that you have the most reason to do, which is always the same, and therefore you would always choose the same thing. So there's no counterfactual worlds in which you choose a different thing. So where's the freedom gone? I don't know. I think it's all a bit confusing. I, I think that you actually need determinism to... I mean, this is like the opposite. You, I think you need determinism to have meaningful freedom. <laughs> I don't think you can yeah. have it without... I guess that's going to be contentious, right? But it, it's at least a bit... I think a bit of a... Presents a bit of a muddle here for Swinburne. But by... Yeah. The, in, in how he wants to talk about like psychological laws, but then those impinge on freedoms. And so then how can you explain someone's free action? It seems that you, you want to explain it by appealing to reasons. Um, but, but then... Um, how, how do reasons actually shape someone's choice? Well, they, they kind of don't, right? And then it feels like they don't actually have a choice because they always do what their reasons say. I I just don't know how it quite fits together. Anyway, are you going to have your dinner? Yeah, anyway, so we'll talk more about that when we get to the chapter on this. So we're on chapter three Two. now. <laughs> Two. Three, no, we're three. We're just finished. Are we in three? three? Wait, scroll down. Oh, no, sorry. There's one more page. Yeah. But yeah, yeah, there's nothing really, yeah, there's nothing really on that that I want to talk about, so... He's just yeah. going to talk about non-embodied persons later, but we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll get to that. Yeah, there's a chapter on that, so we don't need to mention it here. And that's the end of that chapter. So um, so then he starts, I'll just sort of say where he's going with this, and then I'll see how far I get. But yeah, yeah so he, here he's going to be talking about um, why God is good as an ultimate explanation and um, why it, it's sort of better than naturalism. And he will talk a bit about laws of nature here and... Um, I, I sort of mentioned a bit that he seems to be making some assumptions about that, which uh, I guess we can talk about. But um, yeah, I'll um, I'll leave that to you. I'll be back in uh, in a little bit and uh, see how we go. Yeah, enjoy your dinner. See you. No time. worries. <laughs> okay. Um, so chapter three: the simplicity of God and ultimate explanation. I'll try and comment on James's comments as well. So here, um, inanimate and personal causation interact. Inanimate factors help to form our choices. Uh, our choices help to form the inanimate world. Right. So James is asking, how does that actually work? Because 
here Swinburne seems to have again embedded in his theory a type of complexity that might not be there for a rival naturalist hypothesis so that's going to be interaction between the inanimate um, and bit between the animate and the inanimate so how do um, persons which are these kind of like immaterial agentic things actually causally interact with anything physical and then saying you know they just do is going to be brute and not explain anything it just does happen it doesn't explain anything and you can say it just does happen but it's physical it, but it but it's it, it's all um physical right um it, if it just does it is is taken to be a good explanation if that's the kind of standard um the human quest for explanation inevitably and rightly seeks for the ultimate explanation of everything observable. Now, I don't know if that's correct. I don't know if it's inevitable um, or whether it might be the product of a, either a kind of like bias or a kind of um, asking of confused questions sans any context, right? Um, so what do I mean by that? I mean, a question like what's north of the North pole then right it's like oh so i've asked all these questions about what's north of this location what's north of this location but now i just want to know in general i've got to the north pole what's north of the north pole and i might just be asking a kind of confused question in search of some ultimate answer or something and i might just be confused in the first place um so and, and I, th I think that this actual 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 way of thinking about explanations is quite um, endemic in philosophy. Now, obviously, I, I don't know if James would, would agree with me exactly on this, but this is, so I, I'm just talking for um, my own view here. But, um, you know, I, th I think going all the way back to Plato, where Socrates in Plato's dialogues would ask these questions of, you know, what is justice or something like that. And someone would provide a series of, uh, of answers that were all distinct. And Socrates would sort of not accept these, right? And say, no, but what, you know, what really is X? You know, what really is justice? So you've told me about a number of things that are just, but what really is it? Essentially, give me a kind of essentialist characterization of the essence of how we use this, this kind of word. And that might be what's meant by a kind of ultimate explanation. And I actually think that there, there may just be no such thing in the case of lots of our ordinary uses of words and lots of our words right are like like maybe persons or reasons or um causes and so forth forth where where these are like highly highly polysemous words that have just lots of uses in different domains um maybe they get precisified in some specific domains of maybe scientific inquiry or something or or maybe maybe like legal cases right uh, the city defines a person as da 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 da, da. So, so there's very clear cut cases of what's legal and what's illegal given certain purposes. But just in general, for every case, there might be no essentializing, characterizing explanation and no ultimate explanation of, some, uh, 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 of something. And But we might be prone to ask those sort of questions um, just because it seems like a well-formed question, like why is there something north of the North Pole? So I don't know that we might rightly seek for an ultimate explanation of everything we might wrongly do so because we're kind of like led astray by our cognitive capacities or um you know being able to form a question in the first place like what gives rise to consciousness sounds like a very good question but if consciousness isn't like one particular thing like this cup where i can i can ask the question what gives rise to this cup right where i've got the phrase what gives rise to and this cup is there at the end of the sentence, and I can tell you a story about some material process, some some um, you know material processes giving rise to this cup because this cup is a particular distinguished thing that there's a process for. Whereas in the case of um, consciousness, there I'm assuming that there is some thing that can be labeled consciousness that isn't like this highly variegated word that just applies in a whole bunch of different cases. And some think that there's a process for which gives rise to it, right? Such that the question, what gives rise to, to consciousness needs, you know, this kind of ultimate explanation. of, uh, uh, And that might just be mistaken. It might just be because I have this kind of murky, low resolution word that I think there is such a question to be asked in the first place. So 
and and I think you know these big questions about what's the most fundamental thing about like contingency type arguments also take this type of form, right? That these big metaphysical questions are often um, often very muddled, and maybe we're maybe it's not right that we're seeking an explanation of things, and we should instead go back to kind of gathering more data and looking more carefully at our use of the words that we're seeking an explanation for. Um, okay. Let's see what's... Okay, there seem to be three possible ultimate explanations available. Um, so again, I mean, this might just be an artifact of Swinburne trying to like simplify his case, but I don't think maybe... I mean, that's one way you can classify this, right, in terms of three, but it doesn't seem to me like there are simply three... You can classify it as three. You could classify it as two if you wanted to. Um, you could classify it as four, but I just I just think there are, are a number of other alternative rival hypotheses that probably should be considered, and I'll talk about those maybe more specifically when we get into, I think particularly Swinburne's arguing against the other two rival hypotheses, where I'll be saying, well, look, there's a secret third thing, right, that there could be um, instead, instead of these two that are false. Um, that isn't theism. So, okay, here's, here's his characterization of materialism. Let me just have a look at the chat as well. Thank you for your super chats, by the way, people in the chat. If I'm not responding to them, this is because I just saw this one, uh, Joe Quaz. It's because I have the other tab open, so I can't see them. But thank you. Um, it is appreciated. Okay, so what Swinburne means by materialism is the view that the existence and operation of all the factors involved in personal explanation have a full inanimate explanation. So I guess, I mean, that's one, I, it seems like that's an entailment of materialism. I'm sort of not sure, I'm not sure that I would take it as fundamental that there is personal and inanimate explanation, and then we need to define materialism and competing hypotheses in terms of that. But I would say that, that that certainly seems to be something that's um, entailed by materialism. So I can sort of sign up to that. Um, the existence of persons and their having the purposes, powers, and beliefs they do has a full inanimate explanation in terms of the powers and liabilities of such material objects as nerve cells. So as James has commented here, that sounds specifically like a kind of um, reductive materialism. But there are also... Oh, it depends. It depends what you mean by full explanation. Okay, but there are types of materialism which might say that there are um, like emergentist, for example. So that would be to say that there are there are kind of like new laws which come into play when there are. This is not what I believe. James and I are both uh, reductive materialists. Um, but what some people believe is that when you have certain systems, there are certain um, new phenomena or properties or whatever that emerge. And then those properties have new kind of like causal laws and causal powers and laws which govern them that none of the constituent parts had. Um, so, so certainly what Swinburne's describing here doesn't include such emergentist um, type views of physicalism and there are of course, um, of materialism and there are of course other, other views that, that one could have. Um, one alternative to materialism is mixed theory, that the existence and operation of the factors involved in personal explanation can be explained fully in inanimate terms, and conversely, that the existence and operation of the factors involved in inanimate explanation cannot be explained fully in personal terms. Let's call this theory humanism. I sort of found that a bit odd because, you know, humanism is historically at least a project about going back to the kind of source documents of the West, as it were. Um, I've forgotten what the Latin is, but the the catchphrase of the humanists in the Renaissance was back to the sources, right? Um, where they meant rather than sort of simply just reading the Bible, um, people like Petrarch and others are saying, you know, let's go back and kind of read the classics. Um, people like Cicero, Greek authors, Aristotle, Plato, and so on, um, and and let that inform our theology alongside reading the Bible and church tradition and stuff. And then humanism in a more contemporary 
context, I suppose, is supposed to be a kind of, you know, rival to religion in terms of offering people a collective identity, a sense of morality and stuff. So I do find this use of humanism a little odd and idiosyncratic. But anyway, so humanism, according to Swinburne, is the view that the existence and operation of the factors involved in, in personal explanation cannot be explained fully in inanimate terms. And conversely, that the existence and operation of the factors involved in inanimate explanation cannot be explained fully in personal terms. Yeah, I'm just, okay, anyway. Third possibility is that the existence and operation of the factors involved in inanimate explanations are themselves to be explained in personal terms, where persons include not just human persons, but a, a personal being of a quite different kind, God. And that's the claim of theism. Now, what I don't like about this is that Swimper basically just assumes that that only opens the door up to um, his particular theism that he's trying to argue for. But what about like, you know, Terence McKenna, the DMT psychonaut guy and his machine elves, would they not, would, would the machine elves not be like um, weird alien personal beings? Why not different types of theisms um, other than the kind that Swinburne is arguing for? Why just his particular theism, right? Um, or what about like, vegetable plantisms where rather than rather than so it could be some kind of mental um thing but a mental thing that just isn't in any sense free and rather like a like a plant just like has mechanisms that it does and maybe one of those is like generating universe like why can't there be a thing like that um and why is that not being considered as a as a possible explanation so basically it's uh, what i'm saying here is that this is a sort of false trichotomy it, do, it doesn't seem it doesn't seem that these three categories um are prudent for theory comparison and i'm not convinced that they're also actually exhaustive of the of the possibility space that we should be considering um what's this god this keeps the laws of nature operative so yeah, this is Swinburne claiming that the physical depends on the personal. So in his view, the laws of nature remain what they do in virtue of God continually keeping them as what they are um, and keeping, you know, like things having the natures that they do rather than those natures just kind of being self-sustaining. God has to sort of continually keep them operative as a basic action. Um when you're trying to explain everything observable, there are no neighboring fields about which you can have knowledge. So this, this follows from, remember what Swinburne said earlier about one, one of his criteria about background knowledge was including things from adjacent fields. But he's saying there's no neighboring fields which are adjacent to you know the attempt to explain everything. But I just don't think that that's true. Um, and neither does James as well, actually. Um, what we should do is include in our background knowledge pretty much everything that we know about everything else. So whether that be um, statistics, physics, biology, um, sociology, psychology, and so on, it's all very relevant to explaining these things, um, to, 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 to explaining and comparing our, our theories and our attempts to explain data um, with which your theory needs to fit. So the application of the four, four criteria boils down to this that theory of ultimate explanation is most likely to be the true one, which is the simplest theory, which predicts the observable phenomena when we would not otherwise expect to find them. Okay, so, so this depends, whether or not you think this depends on you first accepting Swinburne's criteria, which we, I, I, I guess we sort of do, but also thinking that there's no relevant background knowledge. Um, well, I guess we'd reject the criteria about adjacent fields, right? Um, so anyway, that theory of ultimate explanation is most likely to be the true one, which is the simplest theory which predicts the observable phenomena when we would not expect to find them. So Swinburne is obviously himself going to argue that we would 
um, expect the phenomena given his hypothesis of theism. But I, I think that um, I'm, I, I mean, I disagree with that in the, the cases that he's going to give. I actually think that it's highly unexpected given theism that we would see the data that we do. And I think that this is because what Swinburne's kind of doing is this hindsight, the, this post-diction explanation where he's got the, he's got the data that he knows to explain. He, he, sorry, he's got the data that he knows he's going to have to explain. And he knows what his conclusion is, that is to say the hypothesis that he's arguing for. And he's engaging in this kind of post-diction where he'll offer various just so stories in order to make the hypothesis predict the data through, via this just so story. However, I think that, that a better way to think about these things um, without, without um, to try and avoid that sort of hindsight bias is to just think specifically about the hypothesis for a moment before we think about the data and try and do as much as possible to avoid the hindsight bias of knowing which we can't we can't avoid this completely because of course we know the kinds of data that we're going to have to try and explain but we have to make our best effort to actually avoid this if we're going to um, engage in this this method of um, theory comparison so we have to think just about the hypotheses on their own first and specify in as much detail as possible in as unbiased a way as we can what follows explicitly from those hypotheses. And I think given bare theism, I'm I'm not even sure how much of the possibility space would be like physical worlds like ours, for example, as opposed to just purely unsolved worlds, or even worlds where God never creates anything and just sort of contemplates himself or whatever. Um, so I don't think that when we think about theism in this sort of unbiased way, we actually do end up with it predicting the observable phenomena very well. The thesis of this book is that theism provides by far the simplest explanation of the phenomena. And again, that use of simplest, when remember, recall that what Swinburne is doing is introducing additional new entities and, and mechanisms of God's desires and basic actions and things which are different to anything that we're already familiar with um, in order to, to um, to get his explanation off the ground. So that, that actually cuts against his definition of, of simplicity that he's offered. Oh, hey V, just coming back. Uh, hey Peter, cheers from Spain. V is also in Spain. Okay. So, so we continue. I need to get water soon. I hope, I hope James is scoffing down his tea because my throat is getting dry. His uh, his dinner, sorry, not tea, because of English colloquialisms. Okay. Ultimate explanation of this piece of copper expanding when heated lies in the powers and liabilities of this bit of copper. According to materialism, ultimate explanation stops at innumerable different stopping points. Many of them, according to materialism, coincidentally having exactly the same powers and liabilities as many other. Yeah, so so I think what, what Swinburne is saying here, right, is that a kind of a materialist explanation of why it is that copper expands when heated just stops at the fact that copper is a type of substance which does expand when heated and has this type of disposition. Now, this is, of course, not the only view available to the materialist. So, for example, someone who is a reduc reductionist, like James or I, might, in fact, say that it's not like there's some causal power that um, the copper has over and above any of its constituent parts. But, in fact, what happens is when you reduce, um, when you reduce what the copper is made up of ontologically um, into whatever fundamental particles it is that exists, it's just the sum of all of the combination of the causal powers of all of its parts, which grant the copper that causal power. And so that's actually going to be a limited number uh, of, of brute causal dispositions, right, which might bottom out wherever the hell physicists tell us that it does. Maybe it bottoms out. I mean, maybe it bottoms out with our current kind of standard model. Um, if James were here, he'd have a bit more to say, I suppose, about the physics. Maybe it bottoms out with some quantum weird things or whatever. But the point is that whatever it is, whatever distinct types of things and their causal powers that it bottoms out for in a reductionist view, 
is at least probably going to be a finite number, right? It seems we seem to have some indicative evidence that it's going to be a finite number of these brute causal powers and dispositions um, for a reductionist. Uh, let's see. The, pre the present power of object may have been... So, so here, here we're going to get into the kind of dependence thing, right? So the present powers of objects may have been brought about by a past cause, but their present continuing in existence is, on the materialist hypothesis, an ultimate brute fact. Okay, so why is it... Firstly, on, on theism, is it not an ultimate brute fact, okay? Because given the theistic hypothesis... What is the reason that um, their present continuing in existence obtains? Well, given theism, their present continuing in existence obtains just because at each moment God chooses to bring about their continuing existence. Why does God choose to bring about their continuing existence? He just does. There's no further fact of the matter, right? So that's brute. However, Brute, it, even if the uh, materialist's hypothesis here was incredibly Brute, the hypothesis of the theist is at least as Brute. It just pushes that Bruteness back into God's actions and desires. Um, but there's something more to say about that. So let me go to um, this screen. Young Joe Schmid, um, in this excellent blog article, which is very large, called So You Think You Understand Existential Inertia by Joe Schmid, published um, just over a year ago, actually. And Joe has a, a big video on this as well, if you're interested. But this is broadly going to touch on what uh, what is being said. So where were we? I think it was two that we wanted. Let me go back uh, to the... He didn't put the links in? What are you doing, Joe? You put all this effort in and you don't put the links in. Okay, the basics of existential inertia. Here's the simplest way to articulate um, existential inertia thesis. Temporal concrete objects or some subset thereof persist in the absence of both, first, sustenance or conservation from without, and secondly, sufficiently destructive factors operative. An object that inertially persists then is one that persists in the absence of both external sustenance and sufficiently destructive factors. So that's to say an object that is um, existential, existentially inert is one that once it exists, it doesn't need to be continuously sustained. It just would continue existing unless there was a destructive force acting on it, right? So, Joe says, reality isn't simple, complications arrive, different authors characterize the thesis differently. Um, in simple terms, EIT is the claim that at least some temporal concrete objects persist in the absence of both sustenance or conservation from without and sufficiently destructive act, uh, factors acting on objects. EIT does not claim to answer that in virtue of which objects persist. Instead, it purports merely to describe the way they persist. So, so he's just saying that by um, offering this thesis of existential inertia, he's not answering why it is that this is true, right? He's just describing something that is true, that they do persist in this way. Um, so yeah, here, here's a slightly, uh, formalized, formalized version. I don't know that that's actually going to be useful to mention here, unless you really care, you can go and read this. Um, he talks about positively destroying objects and what that means. Ontological dependence is a hierarchical uh, or concurrent dependence of a less fundamental ob object on the existence or activity of another more fundamental object. Um, blah, 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 blah. Something, 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 something. Uncover a series of questions to clarify and taxonomize the initial scope. What kinds of items persist? Relativity theory. Let's just keep going. Scroll, 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 scroll. Modal register. 
dependence and destruction. I'm sort of uninterested in these things for now. Metaphysical accounts. Uh, Dan Linford. Again, I'm not going to get into that for now. Mm -mm -mm. Tendency disposition accounts. As you can see, there's like just a ton of stuff included here. Um, transtemporal accounts, Minkowski's, blah, 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 blah. I want to get into motivations, law based accounts. Uh, I do not care. I just want to get into motivations, necessity accounts. <sighs> because I want to talk about the arguments that Joe offers, just to briefly show that there are some good motivations for thinking existential inertia might be true over the thesis that, uh, over the thesis Swinburne is offering that it just is the case, right? So here we go, motivating EIT. Before considering EIT's theoretical virtues, let's consider the hypothesis in its dialectical context. So the rival hypothesis is what's called classical theist, or what Joe calls classical theistic sustenance. All temporal concrete objects, and this is, this is what Swinburne seems to be arguing for as well, all temporal concrete objects would immediately annihilate absent sustenance or conservation from without. So what did Swinburne just say? Um, basically just that, right? The present powers of objects may have been uh, brought about by a past cause, but their present continuing in existence is on the materialist hypothesis, just a brute fact. They they kind of can't explain it, so they just postulate that it's brute, whereas given theism, uh, theism, I shall argue, can do a lot better. Um, the simplest hypothesis, blah, 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 blah. So Joe says, I think EIT, or more accurately, various metaphysical accounts of EIT enjoys a number of theoretical virtues, at least in relation to classical theistic sustenance. I suppose you'd have to change classical theistic sustenance because uh, Swinburne isn't a classical theist, right? But open theistic sustenance, whatever Swinburne's sustenance thesis is. Before considering the first virtue of EIT, however, let's consider the follow following question. Why does anything exist at all? Why isn't reality just blank? Here's a simple answer. Something exists rather than nothing because it is metaphysically necessary that something exists. The answer nicely explains why there is something rather than nothing. It is simply metaphysically impossible for there to be nothing. A similar question arises with respect to the persistence of objects. Why do objects once in existence persist in existence instead of being instantly annihilated or annihilated at random arbitrary points during their existence? Uh, if one affixes a necessity operator in front of EIT, EIT provides a simple answer. Objects assist rather than succumb to instant or random annihilation because it is metaphysically necessary that they do so, absent causally destructive powers. If one, Even if one doesn't affix a necessity op operator certain metaphysical counts, uh, blah, blah, blah. This answer analogous to the one concerning existence simpliciter nicely explains why objects persist rather than chaotic, chaotically I think there's a kind of grammatical error there, rather than chaotically um, being annihilated. No, there isn't. It's just my brain being funny. The latter is simply metaphysically impossible. And uh, note that Joe is here seeking to explain a contrastic fact. Why do objects once in existence persist in existence instead of being instantly annihilated or annihilated at seemingly random arbitrary points during their existence? What explains why objects persist rather than chaotically being annihilated? Um, we're thus contrasting two situations, one in which things uniformly and reliably persist absent sufficiently destructive causal factors, and another in which things annihilate at seemingly chaotic or random points in their lives. Um, Okay, let's get to some arguments. Uh, I think there was one that was just kind of 
or Joe's offered vet Maureen arguments. Uh, okay. Anyway, that's enough of that because we'll get back to what Swinburne's doing and has to say. The point just being that Swinburne doesn't engage at all with anything like this, right? His claim is just that it must just be brute. But if something like existential inertia is true, now we have a deeper, metaphysical, profound explanation of uh, of uh, of why things persist given materialism, right? Theism claims that every other object which exists is caused to exist and kept in existence by just one substance, God. Ooh, it sort of depends. So one substance, it seems, in the sense that... Uh, in the sense that Swinburne said he isn't using substance. But in the sense that Swinburne is using substance to mean individual things it seems like god's will is distinct from god's beliefs from god's desires from god's reasons you know and other things because swinburne hasn't committed himself to anything like divine simplicity thus far um and so in that case there would be lots of different substances in god using the other definition but um anyway and it claims that every property, which every substance has, is due to God causing or permitting it to exist. But then we have to have an account, right, of how it is that given theism, God does, in fact, cause or permit each thing to exist. And again, according to Swinburne, he's going to say it's a basic a basic act. But that, but the, the language of it being a basic act is just a mask. And what's behind that mask when we take it off is bruteness, right? What is it for something to be a basic act? It's for an agent just to do something. There's no further explanation or fact of the matter. Why does P obtain? Because P. So then in the case of theism, we have this extra mysterious entity which can cause things to, to sustain natures, which isn't a kind of basic action that I have because all of my basic actions are mediated by um, you know, physical processes and mechanisms and things. And I can't like cause things to have a particular nature that they do. And I can't cause things to have causal powers or to have different causal powers. I can't cause copper to shrink when heated, for example, when supposedly God could by, by willing it, um, I think, on Swinburne's view, as long as that doesn't imply some sort of contradiction, which perhaps it does, and he could deny that. So... Um, so why why is it that given th Swinburne's view we have that that um, copper continues to always and everywhere expand when heated? Well, just because God does in each case sustain that causal power of of, of heat and co to to copper, right? Um, so that's not simple because God has to make a choice in every single case. There's actually a ton of complexity built into that. And Swinburne says here, it's a hallmark of a simple explanation to postulate few causes. But in fact, Swinburne has a unique cause. Um, well, he has several types of causes, you could say, but there's at least a unique token cause in the case of every single nature being what it is. So yeah, then... then Swinburne says later on, God acts only insofar as he sees reason for acting. So that's just a concession of that. Okay, so this this is the interesting thing that Swinburne says about simplicity, right? Where he he's going to now argue about limits. And I think that this is where Joshua Moosen gets some of his stuff about limits from. Let me just switch back to the chat to see what's happening and see if James has returned. James has not yet returned but welcome all the people who have joined recently. <clears throat> the, hypothesis that, the hypothesis that there is an infinitely powerful, knowledgeable, and free person is the hypothesis that there is a person with zero limits, apart from those of logic, of course. I mean, why? But, but aren't those 
arbitrary limits, um, to use Josh's language. Why why impose those arbitrary limits? I am back. Hey, welcome. We're Sorry just about that. I had a clashing family commitment. What what, oh, what page are we up to? Uh, we are on <laughs> page fifty five of the PDF or oh, forty four of the thingy. So we just talked just talked thingy. about um, the simplicity <laughs> of theism. <laughs> Zero and infinity opposites. Yes, that was one of my yeah. favorite statements. <laughs> right, go ahead. So so we just talked about. Um, the simplicity of theism and how there's an ind independent desire, uh, sorry, an independent causal basic action of God for every like nature that he's sustaining or whatever. And I also talked through um, a bit of Joe Schmid's existential inertia thing and how he, um, how he argues that there is a kind of deeper expl explanation than bruteness essentially of why natures persist given existential inertia and that's just not something that Swinburne engages with um and now we're coming on to um simplicity and theism and like zero slash infinity right so why why think that um an infinitely powerful knowledgeable and free person is a simple hypothesis so Swinburne says scientists have always seen postulating infinite degrees of some quantity is simpler than postulating some very large finite degrees of that quantity um, and have always done the former when when it predicted observations equally well. So he gives a couple of examples. Newton's theory of gravity postulated that the gravitational force traveled with infinite velocity rather than with a very large finite velocity. Um, and then only when Einstein's general, uh, general theory of relativity, I can't talk anymore, general theory of relativity concerned with electromagnetism as well as gravity was adopted as the simplest theory covering a vast range of data. Did scientists accept as a consequence of that theory that the gravitational force traveled with finite velocity? Likewise, that in the middle ages... That doesn't sound right to me at all. The finite velocity of the speed of light was known before general relativity because that was part of the... Uh at least part of the Michelson-Morley experiment, right? Which was in the 19th century. Look, this is not really important. I just really sort of noticed What, the speed of light was part of the Michelson-Morley experiment? I thought the Michel wasn't the yes, Michelson-Morley, were... the spraying of uh, oil between charged plates, or have I got the wrong one? Was no, that, that's, that's That was the it. ether no, no, no. mirrors, right? Ether mirrors. Michelson-Morley, yeah, they were, they were shining yeah, light. Uh, ah, that one, was... yeah, yeah. Uh, was supposed to be along the direction of Earth's uh, orbit about the sun, and then uh, yes, it right. it, and they were trying to detect a difference in the um, the ether speed. Yeah, the speed through the ether, effectively. Yeah, but I'm I'm pretty sure that required measuring difference uh, times of passage of the, of light between mirrors or something. Look, I, yeah, I might that have, is right. Might that that, that is right, true. I I don't think that it was. Yeah, because the idea was like 1920s, and I I don't think it was. I think the was idea was that, before that. I think the idea was that measuring. Um, the speed of light between the mirrors in one of those directions, right, would have had to be less because of the ether being taken into account or whatever. Um, yeah, yeah. And the point is that that's, that's reliant on the finite speed of light. Um, yeah, exactly. Of course, you can calculate the sign. Yeah, rock steady. You can calculate it from Maxwell's equations. Of course, I, I did this. Yes. And so that was no, you can predict it. It's like one over the square root of the permittivity of the, vac of the vacuum times the permittivity of the vacuum or permeability comes from it. Anyway, yeah, you can write from Maxwell's <laughs> equation. So that's like the 1860s or something. So I don't know what he's saying here about general relativity. Anyway, it doesn't it's not really that important. I just thought it was odd. Yeah. Um and then and then he gives a second example of in the Middle Ages, um people believed that light traveled with an infinite velocity rather than with some large finite velocity. Um and then only with observations um was it accepted that it had a finite velocity. <laughs> um, so I just I just want to say, I mean, perhaps I, I honestly am just not sure about this, right? There might be cases where, you know, there's adequate motivation for postulating like zero or infinity, right? Or, or maybe in like highly idealized situations, you might assume, you might assume, for example, that like friction is zero or something like that, right? Just for, for some, some particular problem. But it just seems very unfortunate that in the case, in a case where we're not trying to just like model something or whatever, um, it, it seems very unfortunate that the, in, in a case where we're trying to actually get at what's true precisely, <laughs> the, the two examples given would be ones that turned out to be false, right, as well, because then it's like there's like a kind of 
pessimistic in, inductive argument against what Swinburne seems to be doing here, at least from these two cases. Uh, yes, so uh, sorry, uh, just yeah. reading over this again, I realized that we, we misread the first one. So the, the first one he's talking about is is the propagation of gravitational force, not yeah. the speed oh, right. of light. Yeah, and yeah, I think yeah. that does date to general relativity when that was realized. Yeah, the speed of light was known much earlier, yeah. So you could calculate it from the uh, from Maxwell's equations, but the finite speed apparently was 17th century, which I don't know the specifics right. of that. But yeah, okay. But in so the Middle that, Ages, they didn't have the speed of light. That was infinite. Well, this is the thing. Okay, <laughs> so that's what I say is that's supposed to be an argument. So his argument is that scientists have always uh, postulated infinite as as simpler than finite, and he gives two examples. Yeah. Uh, one of which is medieval, <laughs> and the other is Newton in like the 17th century. Um, yeah. Is that supposed to convince us that they always do this? I, would, I mean, the medieval one, I don't even count as, I would call that pre-scientific. Only the Newton sure. one would I acknowledge as really a scientific postulate. And I mean, okay, so Newton thought something was infinite and it wasn't. Like, that is sufficient, apparently, to establish this universal generalization that scientists just always... I, I, don't, I, just, I don't think this is true. You can't measure infinite quantities uh, scientifically anyway. So usually infinities are seen as problematic from a scientific point of view. Um, be, uh, they can be perhaps a limit or an idealization, but because they're unmeasurable, like that's the idea of a singularity, for example, as, as having like a, an infinite density, that, that's often seen as sort of problematic. And then you want to construct a theory to avoid singularities. So I, I I don't really know of any other examples where scientists postulate infinities like this, and and yeah. also the point is that both of these were false. <laughs> so, I mean I don't know that the idea that this proves that this provides much good evidence for thinking that it's good to postulate infinities. Yeah, that's right. And and I think, I mean like like I said, I I I can sort of understand you know like in the case of Newton, or or perhaps the speed of light, right? Why someone might think that it was infinite just because it's like imperceptible, right? That there is any, so you might just go, well, yeah, I'm going to call it infinite. And whatever I'm working on is essentially it's such a, a I mean, not to denigrate Newton because he's better at physics than me for sure. But I mean, like what essentially what's being established then is it's such a low level of resolution that perhaps those differences don't matter for the types of things that they're, they're at least talking about, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, because he, you know, he didn't know that special relativity either. It's because the, the speeds he was dealing with were far too low. For the speed of light or relativistic effects to be important, but then, but then there are there are these other cases that there seem to be a whole host of other cases in the sciences that we might be talking about, where this would just clearly be inappropriate, right? So suppose we're we're looking at a star and for some reason we want to know its mass, and we're like, well, clearly that's a discrete amount, <laughs> because I can see that it's a finite thing. It's not, but I'm not just going to assume that it's like zero or infinite. Um, maybe I'm not going to make any assumption, right? I'm going to be like, I need to actually figure out a way of calculating this. And maybe the way that I'll calculate it is by something to do with its effects, right? By looking at its effects and inferring, inferring some kind of, um, I don't know, what kind of mass of hydrogen would I actually require to be undergoing fusion to give off the type of light that I see? That oh, I, I don't know if that's exactly how it's done, but something like that to actually infer, you know, the, the mass of the star or something. But what I'm not going to do is just assume that it's um, infinite or zero, and it's and it's like, well, if we were, if that would be a, a valid way of inferring something scientifically, which it seems it would, right? Then why would we not also do that in the case of God, where we'd go, well, what we're, what can we actually infer from the effects about the cause? Um, well, we would just infer what's that it has sufficient powers to produce what we see, rather than that it's infinite or something, right? Because exactly. that's always you should always postulate what's minimally necessary to account for the effects, which is why it makes no sense to postulate that God is infinite in any respect, like omnipotent or whatever, because that is not necessary to explain any of the effects that we observe. And it it, it does seem to me like in so in the case of the speed of light, right? Um, saying that the speed of light is infinite also doesn't give you infinite degrees of freedom in your model for accommodating data, right? Whereas postulating that God yes, is exactly. infinite in power and uh, right and perfectly free does give you infinite degrees of freedom in a model. So it's disanalogous to the cases being discussed as well, where this is just one particular uh, magnitude, right, which is being described, whereas, whereas power covers like everything and and desires and so it literally just that that gives you just a free pass to accommodate any observation whatsoever right that any possible observation yep. and that's really that yeah, because to say bad. that god has all power is to say one way to uh, in uh swinburne's language to articulate this would be to say think about all of the possible causal 
what is it, is that primitive causal powers that God could have or a simple? I don't know whatever. if he said primitive, but yeah, something like primitive, that. Primitive, yeah, whatever it was that he said. Imagine all of those that God could, or that someone could have or an entity could have. Uh, now you have to quantify or, or, and restrict it to the logically possible ones. Now quantify over all of those and, and stipulate that God has all of those. So for all possible like primitive powers that are logically consistent or whatever that is, um, God has all of these. Um, so, so this is very different from saying that the speed of light has one velocity and it's infinite. Effectively, it it it, it takes no time to travel a, yeah. any distance, right? That is a very different type of claim. That that's, it, it, To say that God has all power is actually a universal quantification of all causal powers that you could have. And I don't accept that you can just bundle that into and say, well, it's infinite. It's not one scale that you're measuring along. It's actually a universal quantification, which yeah. is completely different from the case of the, the speed of light. And it also, I, I don't understand. So in, infinity is obviously you know, not, not a number, but it's, be, it's being used to um, ascribe like a magnitude to something. But I mean, it seems like we're even using this talk of like um, a kind of magnitude in God's powers analogously. Cause like, what would it say? Like James has a causal power of 10, but God has a causal power of infinity. You know, like what <laughs> it, we're just talking loosely about what even like a power is. And, uh, uh, and there's no real well-defined way of actually like determining what you know the numbers are to ascribe to any power right well so when we're saying infinite in this case it's analogous to begin with so it's not it's nothing like the case of the speed of light where that is something that's well defined it, you know we understand what it would mean to have uh for light to have a speed of 10 miles per hour so we understand what it means for to say light has you know a speed of infinite miles per hour it means that that there's no time for it to move between the distances, right, essentially. Whereas to say that um, someone has a, a power of 10, like what even units would it be, versus someone has a power of infinite, it, it's not even, it just isn't clear to me what we're actually even saying there, whether that's a coherent um, thing that's being said. Yeah, he talks, and he talks about this on the next page as well, about power as if it is a quantifiable uh, scale of, a Single quantifiable thing. scale of quantity. Because he talks about infinity versus very large power. That just doesn't make any sense. The way that he's described it, power refers to a particular uh, causal capability with respect to uh, exercising a, t a particular type of causal power. And there are, well, I guess infinitely many possible of those that you could have. Um, but it, it, comparing the powers of two entities is not just going to be like counting the number of simple or primitive acts that they could take. It's going to be because some of those are presumably going to be, well, they're different in type and some of them are probably going to be like more significant than others or whatever. So, uh, you know, you could have one being that has these powers and another that has these powers and you can't simply compare how powerful one is like, because, well, then how do you assess the, the relative strength of those? I'm uh, laughing at what? your uh, comment. <laughs> Zero and infinity are opposites. Oh, yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> I just, oh, like, okay. So he says there that light travels with infinite velocities to postulate take zero time. Yes, but that, that's not opposites, right? I don't, in what sense are they opposites? I don't really understand. I mean, I guess you could say infinity is maximal and zero They're is... They're different. Minimal, but zero is not minimal, right? Negative infinity is is minimal. Yeah, um, right. Yeah. Uh, so they're not on opposite sides of the number line. Infinity is not even a number, whereas zero is. So I, they're just very different. <laughs> zero and infinity. Maybe you could are say they're different. kind of like inverses because if you divide by zero, that take the well divided by zero isn't yeah. defined. But if you take the limit of one over x as x approaches infinity, then you uh, uh, then you get right. zero. That's the closest I can think of, but th th that would be to say that they're inverses, sort of. Well, it's like we're but talking metaphorical either. So th this is this is a classic case of. I think the, this sort of thing that happens in philosophy, right, where we talk about these things as though what we're doing is the same as what the scientists are doing, but really we're just constructing a whole bunch of metaphors which which bear yeah. a resemblance to what's done in the sciences, right? And it can pull the wool over your eyes because it sounds scientific, like, oh, zero infinity, like that's complicated mathsy stuff. Um, but really what's being said is actually pretty much meaningless. It's not clear it, what it, because it's it, not, it is, because it's meaningless. Like you, you, I've, I, I have not done a lot of pure maths, but I did do real analysis and you do talk, you do talk about the construction of real numbers and limits and things like that. And a statement like this is just so nonsensical. Yeah. Uh, there's not even a sense in which like opposite doesn't really mean anything for numbers, right? You want to make that more precise. Like you could say they're inverse operations or, or something like that, but and, and that's the closest I can come to making sense of this. But that's only true with respect to like multiplication that they're kind of inverses under, not exactly, but sort of, but infinity is not even a number. So it's not even really appropriate to compare it to zero. 
But that doesn't even seem to be what he's saying here. He just seems to be saying in some sort of loose analogical sense, zero yeah. is like the smallest amount you could have and infinity is like the biggest amount. But th that's he's making it seem like it's more, I don't know, fundamental or um, encompassing or... Like it's know, just this obvious truth that zero and infinity yeah. are opposites, right? And it's But but when you, you just think about that for a it's second... It's kind of meaningless. <laughs> yeah. It, it, but it's the, same, it's the same thing that... Like this was what I took issue with uh, John Verveke with, right? When he's saying... Um, the problem of perception is combinatorially explosive. And I'm like, for a lot of people, they're like, damn, combinatorial explosion, that's like a crazy mathematical thing. And then I'm saying, but what actually is, because you would never see, I mean, in the types of things that I would read, maybe like, um, you know, algorithm designs or something, you would never see someone actually talk about combinatorial explosion unless they had a well-defined algorithm, right? Which actually was in, for some bounds, um and factorial right so whether that's like an upper bound or a lower bound or something and factorial and there would be an actual problem which is well like mathematically defined in that way and stuff so so it would be meaningful to use that language of n factorial but instead but then in, in in this kind of analogous context it's just being said to sound scientific and but but it's like what problem are we actually talking about here and how does it make any sense to apply those con those terms and concepts and this is the same thing as i think is basically happening here with swinburne where it's it's just metaphorically it's meant metaphorically that zero and infinity are opposites yeah. or that that god has infinite power is just can only be metaphorical but it doesn't like mean because there isn't like some number infinity that and god has the infinity number of powers or something it's like, yeah. Okay. Let's. I move think the on. claim that scientists prefer zero to very small is better substantiated than infinity because zero is a measurable quantity. Like you can measure a quantity to be zero right. as opposed to infinity. So I yeah, think God that has that no cause of that. Um, <laughs> but. Um, so actually, Swinburne is making the case that naturalism is very simple because it postulates that God has zero causal powers, <laughs> which is an incredibly simple. <laughs> yes. Well, that's that's what so before we get to this can we just jump back to uh, sure. page 43 because there is a i mean i sort of said this but I, it bears repeating yeah, uh, yeah simplicity of theism page 43 that section there yes um you may have already sort of mentioned this right but i yeah. again i think this is super important uh so theism claims that every property that every substance has is due to god causing or permitting it to exist and then he says it is a hallmark of a simple explanation to postulate few causes um so that is not what swinburne said before so if you recall before, he said that a simple explanation you should prefer, well, he did say, I think fewer causes, but he, he said fewer entities, fewer uh, objects, fewer uh, properties and, and things like that. So he mentioned a number of different things. Um, and it was also, I, I don't think that was supposed to be exhaustive. So I think that you might include other things like processes there as well. Now, the issue here is that, let's think about this for a moment. The claim is that God sustains everything that exists, causes it, but also sustains it. So for every different thing, God exerts some sort of causal power to sustain that thing. How is that not ma like maximally ad hoc, right? Because you have to postulate a separate cause for yeah. each and sustaining, initiating and sustaining cause for each thing that exists in the universe. I well, it's because this... Swinburne has invented a label, basic action, and you say that same word in every case. So it must be the same thing, right? Yeah, so but it's, it's, just... it's not the same thing by his by his conception, right? Because each action is a different one. I mean, you know, maybe I don't know how it's supposed to work. Maybe God can sustain different electrons by like using the same power and he just like times it by 10. But certainly if he's sustaining different types of things or different processes or entities or whatever then that I, that's going to be a different causal power because that's a different that's a different action right that's a different effect that you're bringing about so i don't see how this is i don't see how this is simple it is extremely complex because you have to postulate many many causes i don't understand how he says that it's few it's it's, it's not i think few. it's There's this slight of hand each. because of the word I, I think it's just a slight of hand because of the word it's like when theists often say I have a simple explanation because my explanation is God. Now, how do you explain everything, right? It's like, well, yeah, you said one word, but there's a ton of content there. And I think that that um, basic action is basically it is basically just doing that same thing, right? Where it can it can be said, but it's actually doing tons of work explaining like various disparate phenomena. Um, and you've got to be careful that you're not just like giving it this free pass. <laughs> Why did I write literally right here on that comment? That makes I think I because <laughs> no, I think it what was that in sense. response to? <laughs> I think it was in response to um, <laughs> God acts only insofar as He sees reason for acting, where you, where Swinburne is basically conceding right that that God has an individual reason for acting, 
um, and an individual action for every like causal disposition and law or whatever that he's maintaining. Oh yeah, I think yeah. yes, that's that seems right. Yeah, God acts only insofar as he sees a reason for acting. So there's like a reason that you have to postulate, yeah, for, for each of those things. The other thing is that this is consistent with what I was saying before, that um, he has infinite freedom, so no external cause influences what uh, God's God's purposes. And and God only acts insofar as he has reasons for acting. So that means that God always does what he has the most interest to do, which is to do the best thing. Um, or if there's multiple equally good things, then he just sort of chooses arbitrarily. So uh, th this is just an extra little bit that adds on to what I was saying before, that, that God acts in accordance with reasons um, and is not kind of causally affected by anything else. And those reasons are going to be related to bringing about good. Yeah, but that's um, also relevant to the simplicity point. Anyway, we can, we can okay. keep going. So here we have, um, it's a simpler hypothesis to postulate that his power is infinite rather than just very large. Now I'm trying yeah, to think... No. Well, I'm trying to think what would, so that maybe there are some things about God which could be infinite and that would be very simple, but I think they would have to be like individual magnitudes. So maybe in terms of like, suppose that we independently motivated that there had to be a God and we were discussing um, God's action or something like that, right? So it's, so it's already established that we need a God to explain miracles or something. And then we're going to discuss how does God act to perform miracles? And we might say, well, God's causal powers um, have like infinite velocity or something, right? Like God's causal powers have an infinite, but maybe something like that I would be able to sign up to because that might be simpler than saying it's some specific value that like the velocity of God's causal powers, whatever I even mean when I say, but um, but just we say, said before, that's an equivocation about infinite because that's a specific yeah. scalar value that yeah. has no finite number. Right? Yeah, velocity. Whereas that's not what he's saying here. You can't, yeah. power is not a scalar. It's having specific causal yeah. powers or basic actions or whatever. Um, and uh, that's but like a, a number of, of ones that you could have yeah. an infinite. It's set. different types of things. So he's saying yes. there's an infinite number of different types of things here rather than that there's a, a, a particularly infinite magnitude of one type of thing right which is yes it's, it's a very different conception of infinite and and that's one of the reasons that i think the word is unhelpful but the other thing is it, it just isn't simpler right let's think about this right we're trying to explain let's say the existence of laws of nature in the universe as a whole right that's what we're trying to explain um and let's say we think we need to postulate a, a, a non-spatial um entity like a, a non-spatial person a, a non-physical person to to explain that we then ask the question well how much power do we think this being has the simplest explanation is to postulate only those powers necessary to account for or to explain the effects that we're trying to uh, that we're trying to explain, Swinburne wants to say it's simpler to just say that he has all of these other ones as well, all of these extra causal powers that aren't necessary to explain the existence and say fine tuning of the universe. Uh, but it's simpler to add those in. Why? Well, because infinity is simpler than zero. But but that's that's not an argument, right? Why is it simpler to add in these extra things that? you don't need to explain the effect. I think it's completely inconsistent with Occam's razor, even the way that Swinburne described it. Because again, it's not just a scalar that you're setting at a point. It's specifying, does he have this causal power? Yes. Does he have yes. this causal power? Yes. And what you're going to say is you're going to keep saying yes, even though these causal powers are not necessary to explain the effect. That is not simple. You are going beyond what is necessary yeah. minimally to account for the effects. We don't normally do this. You don't normally find a new particle or a new, I don't know, uh, any any kind of thing in science, <laughs> whether it's a particle or like a process or, or new material and just sort of, well, you know, it, it uh, what what powers or causal effects can it have? Well, it must have like all of them or every possible yeah. one. No one would assume that. That's that's ridiculous. You only infer that it has those powers that are necessary to sort of explain the experimental effects or whatever that that you measure from it. You don't just extrapolate to saying that it has all of them unless you've got background knowledge that gives you reason to do that, of course. But but the argument here is just based on simplicity, and I just don't like the, the argument. Is simply it seems to just be that um, well, infinity is simpler than any finite number, which I. I is both irrelevant and I don't think it's even true. The other thing is the argument from limits, which I think is coming up, right? Because he says that any limit's going to be arbitrary. When, when does that come up? I think that comes soon. Uh, I actually can't remember it in this because I'm thinking more, because I've got nah, it, he definitely mentioned it somewhere with Josh Rasmussen's thing. Yeah, that's but, right. But I know I saw it here. Anyway, maybe yeah, it's it, might, it, might, it might be here somewhere. Um, but just to comment on that about the way that the kind of dialectical context on this point has gone, right, is that theists who accept this tend to think that they actually have this this move here right to say well when you do that when you only postulate a cause sufficient to explain the effect well you're placing these limits 
but those limits are arbitrary, right? But arbitrary is just not what they are because they're motivated by explaining the effect. That's what motivates exactly. postulating the, those limits. So they're, they're anything but arbitrary, right? If I said, if I said it was what's sufficient to explain the effect plus 10, then that would be arbitrary because <laughs> why am I including plus 10? Or if I said it was what's sufficient to explain the effect plus infinity, that would be arbitrary because <laughs> why am I including the extra infinity? It's literally um, it. It's literally God has all the powers necessary to explain the effects plus all of the others as well. <laughs> that is completely arbitrary. Why did you just add in all of the others? That's not necessary to explain the effects. Okay. Um... Yeah, it's simplest. Same, it's same simplest with his suppose, knowledge of yeah. things. Yeah, it's same, the same thing. argument. Uh, there would have to be some. Oh, yeah, this is if he came into existence. It's simpler to suppose that God exists eternally. If he came into existence at a certain uh, past moment in time, there would have to be some earlier period of time. Um, at which, uh, what at which would, what would, happened would have. Hang on. At which, at which what, what happened, happened would have had nothing to do with God. I don't know why. Depends on you. So if it, and that's, that's if wrong. causation is only forward or something, right? No, you don't. Well, I mean, oh. yeah, I suppose if causation was could go in loops, then that would change that. But as well, but you don't have to assume that at all. So I mean, I think this is where Swinburne has, hasn't really thought this through in terms of philosophy of time, because um, if God, I mean, Craig. I think is right about this, right? God could have come into being, like, sorry, God's temporal mode of existence could have begun a finite time in the past without it being the case that there was any time before that. It it, it doesn't follow that God um, must have existed eternally in the past because God could have had some sort of a temporal mode of existence and there would have just been nothing before he, um, he, he gained a temporal mode of existence. It's not like there has to be events before that. That would have just been at the start of time. That's what Craig thinks. God came into time at the same time as bringing time into existence. There wasn't anything before that. It's just that he had an atemporal mode of existence. So, so I think Craig is right there, at least potentially, right? God could have done that if he wanted to. Um, and so I just don't think this is true. It doesn't mean that there had to, he says, this woman here says, there would have been some earlier period of time. That just isn't true. Why does it follow that there would have had to have been time before God yeah. came into time? God just came into time at the start of time. Yeah, I, I see what you're saying. It doesn't have to have um, been time before that. So if he, well, I think, I think what, yeah, I think what Swinburne is assuming here is in, in the antecedent is I think when he says he came into existence at a certain past moment, I think Swinburne means by that at a past moment when there's time before that, right? Yeah. So, rather so maybe than, that's yeah. what he means by eternally yeah. that there was no time before which he came into being. Maybe he could have been clearer on that because he doesn't, I don't think, explain that very clearly, but. There's another issue here, which is just that, um, uh, hang on, which I think we need to look at the next bit to app uh, appreciate. Where's the window I have this in? Uh, other forces would have been at work and it would have depended on them whether God came into. That doesn't follow because it doesn't mean whatever forces existed. Let's say the universe existed without God uh, being in time, right? But God still exists. He's just not not in time. At least I guess that would be the presupposition. Right. Yeah. So, and and so then here's... those forces won't necessarily yeah. have been the things that brought God into existence. So this is, I suppose, the question, right? Can God create like a naturalistic world that he's um, not in and causally separated from or something like that? I guess that would be the question. So can God well, why create not? a world? I, mean, I don't see the issue. Yeah, There's which, no contradiction which, that I see there. Yeah, exactly. And, and, and that's that's precisely what Swinburne's denying. Isn't that the right? incarnation? Like he, he, at least the way some people see it, God existed outside yeah. of the universe. And then at some point during it, he comes yeah, yeah, into yeah. it. <laughs> Maybe it's a little bit different, well, but like in a different sense. I, yeah, well, I, I in get a different, what you're saying, yeah, though. but you know, yeah, yeah. I, I don't see that there's any problem there. I mean, he's saying that this follows like logically, but I'm just not seeing how it follows at all. Yeah, it, it, uh, one one possible, um, at least epistemically possible way things could have been right is that God could create um, a universe where the natures of things just kind of maintain themselves and continue, and God is just has nothing to do with that world, right? Really. And doesn't sustain the natures of things and doesn't isn't in that world or anything he just kind of leaves it alone well see i i probably swinburne wouldn't agree with this because he seems to think that for god to exert a causal power at a place he needs to exist at that location which again he didn't defend but it seems to me perfectly coherent to say that god sustains reality without uh, sorry god sustains physical reality whilst being himself 
outside mm, of space time. and time. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think you could have that. But I was yeah. saying God could create. A, I was saying God could also create a world where the natures just sustain themselves without. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that's also conceivable. Yeah, conceivable. Um. Okay. It seems to me that it is simpler to postulate not merely that God is eternally, infinitely powerful, knowledgeable, and free, but that He is so essentially. Um, and I just essential again, yeah, yeah, and and so so the essentially is doing something there, but also I think that that it seems to me, and Swinburne will talk, uh, especially more particularly more, I think, in his work about Jesus as well about what seemings kind of do for him. But I, th I think it's so... Everything. <laughs> yeah. we. I, I mean, I, I think there's sort of something useful, like there's a useful kind of heuristic to um, like something like the principle of credulity, right? But the problem is that people just always conveniently ignore the absent any defeaters. And I think that when we have what philosophers call like ramified seeming, so that's to say like when someone says something seems to them a certain way and there's a ton of very specific theoretical content to that seeming right it's like well that's a bit <laughs> suspicious that it seems that way to you you know like that's very S somehow um, there always is very specific theoretical yeah. content to these seemings oh, and i there, criticize and craig for that <laughs> and there's quite and, and then there are quite strong defeaters to that because it's like well where's that coming from it's probably not from <laughs> just like pure introspection right this isn't what someone who was just raised the other side of africa or whatever would think um or, or the other side of china it's in in, in fact because you know you're committed to your conclusions and things that your seemings are this way they seem to be informed by yeah but your you're forgetting that they have a defeated defeater an intrinsic yeah defeater that defeats defeater. all defeaters yeah <laughs> defeated, and then we defeated, get into defeated. that um okay uh so funny it would need to be explained why god has not already limited his powers or committed suicide oh now this i think this is an offhand comment but i think this is very very interesting here and problematic so so what he's saying is that god can't go out of existence because then you would have to say well why why hasn't that sort of already happened um but but think about this here so this is saying that there would need to be an explanation as to why god had not exercised his powers in a certain way that seems to be saying that god's choices require an explanation am i misinterpreting that i mean he, he's saying He's talking specifically about God exercising his powers in a particular way. And he's right. saying that would need explanation. Now, yeah, he's never... Would make it much less foundational brute fact. Oh, God is the source of all that. Yeah, I think that's right. Because if that's true, then all of other all of God's other uh, exercises of power or choices would require an explanation too. And that's going to be a massive problem because Swinburne is grounding everything in terms of God's choices. Um and, and I guess some of those he's going to grant out in terms of reasons. Others he's just going to say, well, God, remember that like, there's an infinite number of good things he could have chosen. He just sort of chose one. Well, that's going to need an explanation as well. Why he chose that over the others? So I, I think that's a problem if he's going to say that God's choices need an explanation. Okay. Uh, da, 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 da. At the bottom explanatory level, things are what they are, partly in virtue of their powers. Yeah, so if you think that you can, ex if you think that there are such things as like powers or dispositions, then um, you m you might think that that kind of bottoms out at some point. Like, for example, why does matter behave a certain way? Well, because of the properties of electrons of having a certain mass and charge and spin and whatever. And those are just intrinsic properties that yeah. maybe don't have a further explanation. I, I agree, but is it, I, I sort of think that that's in tension with some of the things that Swinburne seems to be saying about God sustaining the nature of things or sustaining the laws right mm. that they need this continual sustenance because if if it's a perfectly legitimate move to bottom out explanations at some points and if he's doing that in some cases in terms of the the powers of some things i mean has he does he really make an attempt to to see if that can be sufficient to explain everything that's required right um that's a good point actually and it comes back to this idea of existential uh inertia which i i haven't read up specifically in a philosophical context but in terms of conservation laws so conservation laws are part of physics right we, we don't think that electrons can just sort of disappear uh, without uh, i mean they can be created and destroyed in certain types of reactions but they can't just sort of pop out of existence um for, for no reason at all because that would violate conservation laws and conservation laws in turn are justified in terms of certain symmetries across time and space so it's not arbitrary to think that say electrons have certain properties and continue to have those and have those in different parts of the universe as well. It actually fits in a, 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 the way we understand essentially quantum field theory, right? Um, now that doesn't that doesn't explain all of the properties. Right? I'm not saying we can derive all those like all of the constants, for example, we can't derive. But certain things like conservation laws can be derived from sort of fundamental um, uh, symmetries. And um, 
I think that it's strange to kind of, and that's kind of what he's almost saying here. It's like, well, in certain, you can explain, say, the persistence of uh, electrons over time and, and maybe the fact that electrons in different parts of the universe obey similar laws, which will become relevant later. You can explain that in terms of their underlying properties and powers, um, which can be described in terms of like qu quantum mechanics and symmetries and things like that. And if that's so, there doesn't seem to be any need for God to do any sustaining or, or any 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 creation of laws that will ensure that there's there's like consistencies across time because it's part of their nature that they're like that. So I, I think that there is a tension here because he, he seems to be saying that you can ground these sorts of things in the nature or like powers and properties of certain types of entities. But then he wants to say, but that's not you enough can't. for physical yeah. entities. God has to also do something. So what... Um... I, I kind of said this a bit when you were gone, but um, just, I suppose, for your benefit and anyone who's joined that Joe's existential inertia thesis, he put a necessarily operator in front of it because he's saying, you know, you can you can make it a kind of like necessary metaphysical truth when you ask, why is it this way rather than that? Um, and there's like two parts to it. The first part being that um, concrete objects persist in existence once in existence without requiring a continuously concurrent sustaining cause of their existence. And then the second part of it is that um, these concrete objects cease to exist only if caused to do so, or that would be to say acted on by something sufficient to destroy them. And uh, and then the idea is that, you know, you can postulate this as a sort of necessary metaphysical truth, or whatever, and then you've got your um, deeper explanation, right, of why um, things happen that way, I suppose, rather than them just popping out of existence given naturalism or materialism. Or, or changing their dispositions. Yeah, and I, I think that, that that seems plausible to me. And I think that you can also bolster that by reference to why we, I mean, why physicists think that there are, say, consistency in properties and, and, and conservation laws by, by reference to symmetries. You can actually derive conservation laws by assuming uh, symmetries of space and time and things like that. Okay. So that it's not just ad hoc, right? Is is the point? Like yeah. you can grant a lot of this yeah. stuff in fairly basic properties. And I, I don't think that appealing to God is a better explanation there. It would also seem to be in, like justified by, well, I, I suppose actually that I, I don't want to commit myself to that because it would be just as c consistent, um, empirically adequate, right, to say that God is sustaining the natures of things. So, um, yeah. Anyway, um, a person could not be a person if he had zero degrees of power, knowledge, and freedom. So notice here he says... Uh, my experience he... on social media indicates against that, by the way, but that, that's another discussion. <laughs> Zero degree. Th this notion of like degrees of power, knowledge, and freedom, though, is like yeah, I mean, what, you know, what does that even mean? It, does degrees mean like different types of? Does it mean like uh, you know, as you said, a kind of like scalar value where these are one type of thing? Um, yeah, just he doesn't say. So what? <laughs> uh, to suppose a finite limit to these qualities is less simple. Yeah, I to told you he talks about limits. It's here. Yeah, he doesn't talk about it a lot, but he mentions it. And we've already gone over that, that. it's not a scale it just of seems to hasn't depend... established it's a scale of quantity that just seems to depend on the context right it's not like that's true sans any context but in 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 certain contexts it's true that supposing a finite limit is less simple than supposing no limit but um you know those are just going to be in in the very specific cases where we have an infinite effect or something Yes, and it's not simpler to just arbitrarily postulate additional causal powers that aren't needed to explain the effect. That, that, that just isn't simple. You're just adding more things that he's capable of doing that are not necessary to account for the effect. I don't know how one can... It's almost just like the number... You just keep saying that it's simpler and it sort of becomes so. The, yeah. It just isn't simpler. It, Swinburne's own definition was adding in more like powers and properties and stuff. It, it makes it less simple. Well, that's literally what he does here. He adds more in than is necessary to account for the effect. So it just isn't simpler. Uh, theism provides the simplest kind of personal explanation of the universe there could be. I mean, I don't know about that. Yeah, see, 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 look at this. God chooses for reasons or between reasons and brings about the universe because it is one of the many good things that he could bring about. So, But then if there are equally good things that God could bring about, then he has no rational basis for preferring one or the other, so he chooses arbitrarily. Yeah. Now, that and the fact that they don't exist. Before. The fact that they so don't what, exist. So what is the explanation for why God chose A instead of C? Or, or, or why he didn't whatever. actualize those other things, though, like right? Because if, yes, exactly. if they're equally predicted by the hypothesis, if if Swinburne commits himself to them not existing, that should be evidence against the hypothesis. Yeah, this is what I'm saying. Swinburne claims that God explains the existence of the universe, but it doesn't, and it's clear here because he is telling us, in combination with what he said before, that 
uh, there are there are, well an infinite number of possible universes that God could have created. He had no reasons to prefer one of the other, but he just created one. What is the explanation for this? There isn't any. How is that not ad hoc? He's going to criticize the naturalists for the for the same thing in a bit by saying that well they're just saying that these laws are necessary or that they're just brute facts or something. But apparently it's just a brute fact that God just chose this option out of yeah. all of the other possibilities. And it's worse for the theists because God has more options than the naturalist has because the naturalist is going to exclude supernatural states of affairs as as part of a core part of their hypothesis. But God has those open to him. So there's I mean I guess they're infinite in both cases, so you could argue about that. But at least there are there are many states that God could actualize and therefore are options that are not options for or the naturalists because they don't fit into any naturalist conception of the universe. So uh, if that's an issue, then it's even more of an issue for the theists. Um, so Swinford said, God has reason to bring, uh, that does not guarantee that he will bring it about, but it makes it quite likely. And um, what's the that there? Sorry, God being omnipotent could bring about anything. And so showing that what we observe is to be expected, if there is a God, will consist in showing that what we observe belongs to a kind of universe that, oh, in pe- in virtue of his goodness, God has reason to bring it about. So that doesn't guarantee that he will bring it about, but it makes it quite likely. That seems sort of bizarre, given... I think it's just wrong. Well, given given that Swinburne says that God's perfectly free, I, I, I'm sort of not sure how you'd make a... Pro- a, a even if it's not an entailment, how you'd even make a probabilistic assessment, right? Because God would just always be free not to choose um, to do something and there's sort of no probabilistic fact of the matter because the probabilistic fact would be grounded in God's libertarian free will, which is just perfectly but, free, right? And but God remember how he it. defines perfectly free. He defines perfectly free as always acting in accordance with what you have. Well, yeah, the best that's true as well. So it would entail it then. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, but 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 remember, he then also says that God, there's no maximally best universe. So God is free to pick between any of the sort of really good candidates, right? Of which he says there are infinitely many. So what we have is a situation where right. God has no, yeah, one there's of no cause of God choosing. And furthermore, there's no reasons for preferring one over the other. So God apparently just creates one universe. He will pick one. He doesn't create any of the others. Yeah. And there's no there's no explanation for why he creates that. Um, so that doesn't make what we see likely. That, 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 yeah. that makes it very unlikely. Why did he create this one? He could have created all these other ones. Yeah. That yeah. makes it very unlikely that we number of other universe. ones. It makes it yes, he says it's infinite. He said it earlier that there, there was infinitely many. So he, yeah. I think he's just wrong here. The way he's articulated this, um, it, it's true that the probability of God creating our universe, if we assume, like, how do you even assess probabilities, as you said? Let's assume a principle of indifference across the infinite many that he would have a reason to create, right? Now, I don't know why you would assume that given libertarian agency, but let's just, because I don't know how else you assess it. Let's assume that we give them equal probability, right? Which is also problematic because you, uh, because a distribution that is flat across yep. an infinite domain is Maybe supported. God doing nothing should be. Like, <laughs> but let's forget God that not- as well. Let's just sort of try to talk about something here, right? I, I guess there's improper distributions. But anyway, the point is that, so the world that we live in would have, under the, under the assumption here, it would have positive probability of God creating it, but so would infinite and many other worlds. Now, there are lots of other worlds that would have zero probability, let's say because they have really bad worlds and God would never create those, right? So Swinburne is only a little bit correct. He's a little bit correct in saying that his hypothesis explains why um, we have like this type of universe instead of all of these other types of universes, because God wouldn't have a reason to create those like really nasty ones. Seems how this is pretty nasty to begin with, but as we'll see later, I guess it could get nasty, right? So God doesn't create those. The problem is that there's still infinitely many universes over here that he does have reason to create. And so although the, the probability that y- your explanation has raised the, um, uh, the probability that your explanation gives towards the our outcome is still extremely low. It doesn't give a very high probability to this being the outcome because there's infinitely many that you could still create. So it, it's just not true that it, it gives it, it, it makes it quite likely. It barely yeah. makes it more likely at all because there's, you've excluded infinitely many, but there's infinitely many still left. And it, it, there's okay. no explanation for why he does one over the other. So thus we end the simplicity of theism. <laughs> Chapter four. How the existence of God explains the world and its order. So this is this is the first of the two chapters that's sort of going into why theism is a good explanation of various things. So first data point: the universe and its natural laws. Um, always be skeptical whenever you see "surely" at the start of the sentence. But I, I I think I mean this is an interesting one, right? He says the most natural state of affairs is nothing, no universe, no God, nothing. I would then wonder natural. why we need to. Ex- well, yeah, let's put that aside for the moment because he could mean all sorts of things by that. But 
it, look, if that's true, then why do we need to explain limits, right? I've never understood this notion of a, uh, what do I call it? A, a, a metaphysics of, um, a metaphysics of like negation or something like that, where you need to explain oh, the absences okay. of something. And then physics of absences, yeah. that's what I call it. I don't think you need to explain absences. I think you need to explain presences. Like the number of things that don't exist that theoretically could is so much more well, than that. Well, I think probably, this is confusing our realist. conceptual landscape with like the way that reality probably is from the things that science sort of tells us, right? Because if you just think about things in terms of pure reason, you might think, you know, this is where like people give tons of credence to sort of epistemic possibilities and stuff because it's like mm. i can con here's all the ways i can conceive of things and so i i have like explanatory questions to satisfy me like epistemic explanations why aren't those why do those things not obtain right um yeah, yeah. i think that's why that happens like for epistemic reasons like psychological yeah i i guess you yeah i mean i think there are times when we need to explain absences right but that's when we have an another reason for expecting something you know someone says they put something there and then i don't find it i want to explain why isn't it there but i think in general we we don't need to give like grounding type explanations um for things that don't exist <laughs> only for things that do exist right um and i i mean you know you could debate that but i i think that's kind of reasonable right there's so many things that could exist but don't uh i think so i don't i don't buy this that we need to explain a limit um because a limit is an absence. Like suppose that we say that God has a hundred units of power, whatever the hell that means. Um, I don't think we need to explain why he, he doesn't <laughs> have all of the others because, well, no, you just need to explain the ones that he does have. And the point is that this seems to be kind of supporting that. If the most natural state of affairs is nothing or like something not to exist, then shouldn't that be our default? Shouldn't it be the default to say that God doesn't have any powers except the ones we have reason to give him? Not that the default is to say that he has all of the powers, unless there's a reason to say that he doesn't have specific ones. So I, I, I think that this is not a direct contradiction, but I think that it, it mitigates in favor of my view that you need to, the metaphysics of presence or existence, not a metaphysics of absence, that you need to explain why things don't exist. Anyway, that's a bit yeah. of a side point, but I just noticed that here. And it seems, you know, like, it seems if Swinburne is genuinely co committed to his theism, right, it isn't actually extraordinary that anything well i think given theism it is extraordinary that anything should well, yes. exist at all. but that but that just seems inconsistent with what he's actually saying elsewhere right um maybe he so maybe he should caveat that with like given naturalism so it it has to be given some assumption right it's not just like simpliciter and it, well maybe it is I, I don't know um but then surely the most natural state of affairs is simply nothing no universe no god nothing it's like why just i mean why think that right like what uh, Firstly, what's surely doing? It's just supposed to kind of like convince you, I guess. And what's natural yeah. doing? Well, at least on my, my conception of what natural means is how nature is and everywhere. No, I that's find clearly it. not what he was talking about here, yeah. I think. I think by natural, he means most epistemically probable or something like that. At yeah, least that's how okay, I interpret yeah. it. Sure. <laughs> which is the sense in which I would agree with it, because I think that sort of there's more things that don't exist than do exist. There's so many things that right. could have, maybe could have is a better way to say it. Well, epistemically, I, I, I guess I can kind of buy that in terms of epistemic, but but it's like how much credence do I actually give to my epistemic pro probabil uh, possibility spaces and things, right? Pro pro probability yeah, yeah, assessments. Yeah. Well, not very much given I just think that's basically an artifact of my imagination pretty much, you know, and not and not really a guide to much of reality. And that's so true. I do think, I do think the reason natural is being used here than like, um, the most natural way of conceiving of things is something, you know, like using that that adjective is because that would kind of deflate the use of natural. Whereas I think this use of natural is to be like, no, really like in the world, you know, like the most natural way things mm. might be in the world rather than just like in our ways of thinking about them would be nothing. But uh, I think the way I think about epistemic um, possibility here is that humans being creative can think of lots of things that could exist or be true. And most of them aren't, right? Um, at least in a sort of general sense. Um, and so you kind of need to give me extra reasons to think that this particular one we've come up with it actually pertains, right? And so, so by some sort of default, I'm just going to assume that it, it sort of doesn't, absent giving me reasons for thinking that it does. Um, it, I mean, I think that's basically a version of Occam's razor, uh, effectively, that we're appealing to here. But that's sort of how I think about it. Well, there's sort of more ways you can be wrong than you can be right, might be a crude way to put it. Anyway. Uh, so this is j just a, a re-emphasis. Not everything will have an explanation, yeah. but as we have seen, the whole progress of science and all other intellectual inquiry demands that we postulate the smallest number of brute facts. And as we've seen in Swinburne's explanation, there are like numerous brute facts for everything. Reasoned. Well, there are infinitely many brute facts of God's creative choices to create or to not create certain things. And he, I, as far as I tell, he never addresses this in this book. 
except for that sort of incidental comment that I had mentioned before. I'm like, well, doesn't this imply that God's create? Because he, remember, he said that, well, God couldn't have couldn't have the power to go out of existence because then, well, like, why hasn't he already exercised that? Like, well, that seems to be saying that God's creative, cho like God's choices do require an explanation. But then we've got an infinite number of unexplained brute facts. Not a good theory in my view. So, so the data point here is like basically regularity in nature. Um, laws of nature govern the say the distant ga galaxies we observe as the sort of ones that we're in. One single galaxy, we've not um, collided with any others yet. If there is no cause of this, it would be a most extraordinary coincidence, too extraordinary for any rational person to believe. Well, the thing is, it does just seem to be, you know, there's no cause of God's choosing, right? So that just seems to be an extraordinary coincidence. And then here we go with the too extraordinary for any rational person to believe. <laughs> you know, like I was saying earlier about the, the kind of like, you know, like it's clear we're not just having a conversation at this point about what's true, but instead it, we come out with all of this kind of um, sort of ad hominem, right, against those who disagree with us. But science cannot explain why every object has the same powers and liabilities. It can explain why an object has one power in virtue of it having some wider power, why this local law of nature operates in virtue of some more general law of nature operating, but it could not conceivably explain why each object has the most general powers it does. But so, so you've put um, agreed, and, and I think perhaps this is true because it's basically it depends agreed what you take Swinburne to be. Yeah, yeah it, it sort of depends what you take Swinburne to be saying here. I think, and if you take him to be saying, "Well, I want a kind of metaphysical explanation of these things," then he's certainly right. But then you can't just like rule out um, naturalist metaphysics, right? Like someone yeah, can yeah. be like, yeah, I'm basically informed by what the scientists say as much as possible. Um, but I have to do a little bit of philosophy to have like a, a complete worldview. And I, th I think that's perfectly fine for a naturalist to do. And they can, you know, and you can just postulate like necessity for these things, which Swinburne does for whenever he needs it for God and God's existence. Yeah, I think that, I say agreed for the first part, although I think that the reason I said that is because he seems to be saying, why is it that the same objects that are separated in time and space have the same causal powers as each other? Like an right. electron that's an interesting an question. <laughs> yeah, I, mean, I think that that's basically answered, at least to the first step of it is answered. You can always ask, but why that? And, and I, I just mentioned this, it's about symmetries. Um, assuming a symmetry of space and a symmetry of time, which just involves that there's no like preferred direction and things like that, or preferred location, uh, you, you get conservation of momentum and energy just out of that. Um, and um, so I, I think that there are very reasonable basic assumptions you can make where you get this out of it. And then there's further questions about like, why do all electrons have the same uh, charge, for example, I think you can explain that in terms of them participating in interactions with the same underlying quantum field, which sort of perf sort of perfuses the universe. That's an interpretation. But um, so the, the point is, though, that I, it depends whether you call those causal explanations or not. You might call them nominological explanations or metaphysical explanations. I think you need an explanation. Otherwise, it is sort of rather bizarre that there's this sort of things here and things there that behave the same way. Um, that would seem a, like kind of a weird coincidence. So that's the sense in which I agree, you know, that invites an explanation. I think that the, the sort of what you were saying, there are options available, both kind of within science and then without science, but in, in sort of nat naturalist metaphysics to explain this. And, and as I mentioned before, Swinburne doesn't really bother himself to actually, you know, interact with these possible explanations. He just sort of says that naturalists don't have any as if they've never thought about this issue before. And it's also it, it's also not even clear to me that what is being said here does require a kind of metaphysical explanation that uh, and that you know like more advanced sciences couldn't kind of get it you know get get at what Swinburne wants to be explained here. It just depends what you take explanation to be doing, right? And there's various different types of things people think explanations mm -hmm. are doing, but I can at least foresee you know in the future people with um, a better version of physics than what we currently have telling me some story about, um, you know, various kind of ways that things reduce to fundamental particles or whatever, or, or, or a completed version of quantum mechanics or something. Someone telling me some story that then in light of that, I'm kind of cognitively satisfied or something about these questions. And I think, oh yeah, the sciences did explain that. I just couldn't quite see it from this angle. Um, and so, so, you know, it's, it, it just isn't clear to me that, that this isn't something that the sciences um, can't can't kind of touch, as it were. Well, yeah, that's what I was saying. Swinburne yeah. seems to think that if you ask a physicist, why does do electrons have the same properties across time and space, that he just won't have anything to say. <laughs> that it is just, true. It's just he, will to, he will appeal to 
yeah, he will appeal to, to conservation laws, which can be derived from very basic symmetries. Um, and then you can ask about the status of those symmetries, of course, but there are, it's Noether's theorem, if people are interested about the connection between conservation and symmetries. Um, it, it's very interesting, right? And obviously that there's it sort of gets deeper if you want to push that. It depends what you think of an explanation of bottom out. But it's just wrong that there's nothing to say about this. There's also the fact that all electrons we know of have a causal not the individual electrons, but like electron fields and that all have a causal history that goes back to the, the, the same big bang. So they are causally connected to each other as far as we know. Um, so it's not really a grand conspiracy that they're all, that they're all uh, sort of similar in that sense. You can ask where they got the properties from in the first place, of course, but that they, but he's specifically, he's talking about that the fact that they have the same properties. I just, I just don't think there's a mystery about this. I don't even think you have to invent much to metaphysics to, to understand this. It's because they're actually all the same electron. I remember this from my 13-year-old yeah, yeah. well, bro science. <laughs> that's kind of one way to think about it. It, it, it. One way to think about it is that they're all ex like kind of localized excitations in the electron field that permeates the universe. And I think this is a handy way to think about it. It's not, yeah, it's a little more complicated than that. And it's yeah, just because no one knows how to interpret quantum <laughs> mechanics, right? But, you know, I, I, that's, a, I think, a helpful way to think about it. Okay, um, moving on then. Okay, grand unified theories. Um, wherever we stop, the same general point applies. Suppose we stop with grand unified theory, then every atom and every electron in the universe has just the same powers and liabilities, those described by grand unified theory. And that, if you allow yourself only scientific explanations, is where you stop. That, says the materialist, is just how things are. Okay. He seems to be equating a materialist with someone who won't invoke anything except a scientific explanation. Yeah, that's... Which so, I wouldn't make that equation. So that's certainly true. And it's also not clear that, again, completed scientific explanations... Well, you know, you, I'm obviously using completed here as a bit of a blank check, right? But, yeah. but science seems to be consistently progressing. It doesn't seem to have stagnated at all. <laughs> and it seems that we're, we're continuously... Um, getting like deeper and deeper understanding of, of the way that reality hangs together as it were with no signs of that stopping anytime soon so why it, it just seems weird to me to think that that is actually the way that the sciences are going that that it's just going to say like oh no there's just these like this aristotelian conception of substances and that's what like electrons and protons and whatever are and um you know they just are that way um i mean maybe there's just some some stuff you haven't thought about right and you should talk to some physicists I, I just think it's really confusing what he's actually asking about uh, talking about here because on the one level you could be talking about okay suppose we have a grand unified theory but why that theory why the constants have the values they have in that theory yes, so right. and, and yeah you may ask that question right now i don't think the theist has any better explanation but okay sure maybe there's something lacking from a completed science in that sense but if you look at the next paragraph that doesn't seem to be what he's talking about at all but he says, okay, this stopping place, that that's just how things are, is no where, where no rational inquiry will stop. If all the coins found on an archaeological site have the same markings uh, or, or documents in a, in a room are written in the same handwriting, we look for an explanation in terms of a common source. The apparently coincidental cries out for an explanation. But he just said that if we had a grand unified theory, that, that would still be lacking. But a grand unified theory would obviously yeah. provide that sort of explanation. Yeah, yeah, I've yeah. said here, the common what, source is the origin of the universe. It's the Big Bang. Like... It, what, what yeah. is the mystery here? Well, it depends what, so it depends what cries out for an explanation means. And, it's and the this is something... It's the common markings that he's talking about, which is like the different well, electrons no, I, having the same properties. So I, un I understand, I interpret this. I understand that, but I'm just, I, I think that often this is basically said, this is what's basically meant, I think, by cries out for an explanation is that there's something where I'm not cognitively satisfied by the kind of answer, by the kind of stories that someone's telling me, right? But the thing is that your cognitive satisfaction can actually be either the, the product of various intellectual vices, like having not actually investigated adequately the type of explanations that are on offer from the different side, or maybe of just being motivated not to accept them or not to listen to what's being said and things like that. And that's a, that's a problem with this cries out for an explanation talk, because, you know, the fact that it cries out is really a property of, of you know, your your mind and your kind of psychological state rather than a pro like some sort of objective fact about the world and i think i think that you know in the case of um lots of these things but yeah firstly and the hypothet because we're just talking about a hypothetical grand unified theory and no specific grand unified theory it seems to be an entailment of you know the hypothetical grand unified theory that it would in fact be cognitively satisfying to any you know impartial inquirer that just seems to be what a good explanation here 
would in fact entail, right? So then it's just inconsistent to say that it would still cry out for an explanation. I think that's what you were just saying, right? Yeah, the difference between cognitively satisfying and actually a good explanation is, as I think, easy, most easy to, to demonstrate in the case of mathematical proofs where you sort of know that it's logically uh, d deductive. I don't. Anyone who's done even sort of moderate mathematics may have experienced this as, as I have, where you, you work through the proof, you, you kind of understand yeah. it. Right? Maybe you don't fully grok everything, but you, you understand the steps and it kind of it fits together, but, yeah, but it still doesn't feel satisfied. You still don't really feel like you get it, right? But I mean, that's it. Like you've just gone through the whole steps. There's nothing else there. Maybe you can think about it more and try to like internalize it a bit better or whatever, get used to it or something. But um, I, yeah, I, I think it's easy possible for us to have a full complete explanation not be satisfied with it and of course the inverse is possible as well to be satisfied with something that's a terrible explanation um yeah so we have to I, be very careful there about equating explanatory power with um feelings of satisfaction or curiosity stopping and i, and I, I think, think that's kind of what is 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 happening here you can you can so a good example of what you talk about is even like a basic proof of the pythagorean theorem right where you can have a proof into like a geometric proof where you can actually look at you know like the squares on the side of a right angle triangle and see see what they add up to uh, on the square of the hypotenuse right um and you're like oh yeah that just makes sense as, as a proof i can like see it right but then all of a sudden when represented algebraically and making the correct logical inferences it's like it because we're talking in terms of abstractions i think for most people it's like well that's a bit weird like why does that work like you want to know some further fact in order to be satisfied there and i think that there's a similar sort of thing taking place with a lot of these like philosophical explanations where i think people basically get um socialized into the discourse in such a way I, I, that it's like but there's there's some further you know, there's some further thing, like don't be cognitively satisfied. I think people are basically socialized to not be cognitively satisfied by naturalist explanations and then to instead expect or desire some further like intentional or teleological type explanation, right? And it's it's because people get conditioned into that expectation for that, that then they're no longer cognitively satisfied when a naturalist does in fact provide a sufficient explanation of everything. And I think, I think that that's just something that happens in philosophy really frequently. Yeah, I agree. And that's where the uh, the notion of seemings comes into the issue of uh, pre-theoretic commitments, because, I mean, you know, it, 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 sorry, not pre-theoretic, uh, theory-based commitments, because even if your your seemings go one way or the other in terms of whether an explanation is good, if you've, in, in addition to that, yeah, you well, also have sort of point. habituated yourself to, to think that there are theoretical reasons why this can't be a good explanation, then that's going to sort of affect the seemings as well about, well, this just doesn't seem satisfying or just cries out for further explanation. But um, so as I've said, we've talked about the general issue there about assessing that. But I also just think that if what he is specifically talking about here is why is it that electrons have the same properties in different times of space, we basically have a scientific answer for that. And it's grounded in terms of conservation laws, uh, the, the common origin of uh, electrons and other particles in the Big Bang and, and symmetries. Um, now, you can still ask further questions about, you know, like, why do they have these fundamental properties and, and why these laws and not others? Um, but that doesn't seem to be what Swinburne was actually talking about there. Uh, and I think it's clearest when he talks about the different coins with the same markings. That sounds like he's exactly talking about what he mentioned earlier, which is electrons having different, you know, uh, the same properties in different times of space. So it's just very odd that he kind of doesn't seem to know anything about this or just, I don't know, refuses to interact with what even a scientist, I don't, you don't need to talk to a, like a philosopher about that. That's just, a, I think, a fairly basic thing that I learned in. I'm not saying that that resolves every possible metaphysical issue there, right? But what Swinburne is specifically talking about seems like pretty simple stuff that I think just is explained in current science, let alone like a grand unified theory that he says even then wouldn't be sufficient. So I just, the argument seems really weak to me. Um, okay. Maybe one day rocks would fall apart and on another day they would float in the air, but mere unscientific observation would not lead us to have the slightest idea which would happen when. But fortunately, our world is not like that. Yeah, um, well, I say it, it kind of is, though. I mean, maybe not specifically about rocks floating in the air, obviously, but there are so many un systems that are in principle unpredictable. I mentioned weather and stock markets. Maybe people are kind of like that as well in some respects. Um, uh, and oh, evolution might be another example uh, that we can't really predict where God, it goes. <laughs> God's choices to maintain <laughs> yeah, yeah. the universe. The, the point is, though, he loves to talk about another thing is to do the regularities of nature. And somehow it's like always Newtonian physics, even though that's been superseded, right? Um, 
and but, but most of nature is not. Yes, there are some regularities, right? But there's so many things that are statistical or chaotic, or we we don't know what the regularities are. They're so complicated that it's very hard at a high level uh, to, uh, to to predict anything. So, it, I mean, it, it's a bit like glass half full, glass half empty. I mean, yes, the universe is somewhat predictable, obviously, but there are so many things that aren't as well. And, and we'll come to this a bit later on where he starts talking about what type of universe God would be likely to create. And it's just entirely unspecified because it's like, well, you'd expect God to create a universe with some amount of order. Well, yeah, but how much? How much order do we have relative to the space of possible universes with different orders? And what would you expect under naturalism? What would you expect under theism? And he just doesn't have anything to say about that. And I also don't like, because I can actually conceive of a God who just takes great pleasure in chaos, you know, like why would God not just enjoy a chaotic universe. Again, like, we will, we will get to that where he says yeah. order is beautiful. And I think I can dispute that. But we, yeah, we'll yeah, come to that. Yeah, chaos is okay. beautiful too. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Like a, uh, okay. What was this? But only if objects behave in regular ways, sufficiently simple to be understood by humans, will we be able to uh, acquire those beliefs. Oh, okay. So this, see, well. It, it, He's explaining why order is important. Yeah. He's he's explaining why, but it, this depends on like God having to create humans, right? Whereas it seems like the commitment, that at least the more plausible commitment perhaps, is that God wants to create um, moral agents, right? With free, That's at least yeah. like the, the sort of the loosest version of, of what God might be trying to do that I, th I think is plausible. So humans specifically being embodied and carbon-based and having five fingers, and that, that all seems to be sort of, accidental to to what god's actual goals might be um so then when we have this larger kind of um possibility space of gods could actualize his goals by creating you know like purely unsold beings uh electron in love beings and all these sorts of things um i mean there's just all these kind of conceivable ways that god god could um god could create realities right which didn't have to be regular in the same ways ours are, where God can create like non-physical, psychophysical laws or, or, or beings with, you know, cognitive faculties that can access reality in certain ways to form true beliefs about them, where it doesn't require regular physical interaction, right? Presumably God's cognitive faculties are like that because he could create a, a sort of chaotic world and still have perfect knowledge of, of everything going on. And so, so God could create beings with faculties like that, right? Unless there's some sort of contradiction in him doing so. Of course, there don't need to be any regularities in nature for uh, us to have beliefs about what will um, happen in the future, because God could just create us such that we spontaneously form those beliefs or that we're just better yes. at predicting with complicated conditions, or he just gives give those, us them through the give, Holy give Spirit. Them directly. Yeah, yeah. Like there's also, he could do anything he freaking wants. Like why? <laughs> It just drives me insane. It's like, well, yeah, we'd basically expect the world that we see, not even talking about all the options that God has available to us. Remember that Swinburne said earlier that God has two ways of actualizing any state of affairs. He can do it indirectly through like natural processes that he sets up, or he can do it directly just by kind of actualizing our state of affairs directly. So, and, and God sustains the whole, you know, physical uh, world anyway. So as part of his sustaining action, he could just imprint the knowledge or pass it to us through the spirit or, or whatever, sustain a certain type of power that we would have to know enough about our environment to, to take um, actions that are sort of purposive, right? God could has so many options available there, but somehow Swimmer just never talks about them. And, and this is the issue. Like, okay, so certain types of worlds may be off the table, but there's still a huge range that are on the table. And I need you to tell me why it, you would expect God to create one that's like ours as opposed to all of these other ones that aren't like ours. Otherwise, you don't have a good explanation. I wonder if as well you would be able to say that something like you know, the, I suppose it depends what you mean by regularity and irregular, because um, once again, he doesn't really explain that very well. You, you could say, you know, things that decay having particular half-lives, for example, is a type of regularity. But, yeah, you sure. know, the actual, you know, but, but, but decay of like plutonium or something could also seemingly be described as irregular, I think, as well. And it'd be like, well, well is that it's, evidence? It's stochastic, right? You can't predict a single yeah. atom, but you can predict an aggregate. Yeah, so that, so that's but why I'm not question. Quite How sure much regularity do you expect? Like, yeah, <laughs> but but that's why I'm saying. So, so would something like that, because something you know, we we seemingly have to know about radiation in order to avoid harm and to do certain goods like um, combat Chernobyl or whatever, right? Um, but is so so is the fact that these things are stochastic in some sense then evidence against theism? The fact that there are stochastic things, I don't know. Um, 
you know, it's like it's like what what could possibly be evidence against, right? Yes. So I said this at the start. What he should, what Swinburne should do, is say, okay, we're trying to explain this, the amount of order that there is in the universe, and maybe say a bit about what that means, right, and the types of things that he's talking about. And then he could say, okay, what options do the naturalists have, uh, and and what what options do the do the theists have, and then assess those. So what what would we predict on the basis of some type of naturalistic explanation about how much order we'd have? I don't know that the naturalist does have a, a good uh, expectation about how much order. I assume that maybe not maximal and not minimal, whatever that might mean, right? Somewhere in the middle. You know, I don't think naturalism has a good prediction there. Um, but what does the theist have to say? Well, um, it's basically the same, right? Swinburne says that you would expect some amount of order so that agents can predict uh, some, to some extent what's going to happen, but not maximal amount of order uh, because, uh, well, I, I don't know if he talks about that, but I think it would include things later about like the, um, uh, 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 that it's important for people to overcome obstacles and things like that and to learn about things and, and build science and so forth. So he's, he's going to want to say that it's not maximal because it's good for us to overcome those things. Okay, so it seems that actually both predict kind of vaguely the same thing, like some middle amount, but there's no specific prediction in either case about what type of world we would expect. And again, the problem is more on the theist in my view when there's that case because they have more options available. God has so many more options available than the naturalists will ever have available because they are restricted to naturalistically possible universes, whereas God can create electrons in love and other things like that. He can tell us by the Holy Spirit, you know, what, what will happen even if the world doesn't have laws of physics. So that's what you should do. I think you should look, you should stipulate the theories and then see what would follow from those, what you would expect, what's the distribution of like probability across uh, possible outcomes in each of those. And he doesn't do that. What he does is he, he takes the universe we already know that we have more or less and gives a just so story about why we would expect that without seeing how, without seeing. Uh, so, so the issue here is what he doesn't do is say, could I give an equally plausible just so story for a different universe with my explanation? And that's the problem. Right. If you can do yes. that for any possible outcome, you have no explanation, or at least not of that thing. Yeah. That's yeah. what he's missing. Just, just because you can give a just so story doesn't, that's the problem with the pseudoscience, right? They can always give a just so story about whatever outcome happens on the basis of their principles. And so that's why it's not explanatory, because it doesn't pick out particular outcomes as probabilistically preferred over others. I think Swinburne might say somewhere, or maybe I've, I'm just misremembering something like, um, you know, if the world was such that people were just going straight into hell or something, well, then that would be like incompatible with God. But I don't, I honestly don't even know if I actually, I, I mean, th this could just be a fault on my behalf, right? I honestly don't even know if I believe him though, because it seems that <laughs> it, ju it, it just does seem like he's kind of, when we have things like basically um, justifying the Holocaust, right, in terms of soul building and stuff, it's like, you know, really, like, is there anything, let's say just given the physical constraints of the world we know we're in, Right. Is there anything that could happen in this world, like any amount of horrific suffering that people could just permanently be inflicting on it? Not if you believe in an afterlife, I think. I think you could justify well, any yeah. amount, uh, given what Swinburne says later, as yeah. we get to. So just even even just people problem. even just people on conveyor belts going into sulfur pits, right? You could always say, Well, there's this place <laughs> they go to after they melt in the sulfur. That's all good if they believed in God. So so actually yeah. it's like, so really, why would that um for, you know, because there's all that they can learn about themselves by overcoming the fear of falling towards the pit as the heat starts to burn their skin off. And, you know, like by remaining stoic, they can exhibit the... Ver you Burning can sulfur is beautiful, Nathan. And yeah. Got, <laughs> and right, it's shiny. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Have you seen the poetic beauty of melting flesh? Is it... Okay. <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll see this later, but when, when yeah, almost makes But you can happen. always do that, right? And this is, this is the point. <laughs> yeah, and, exactly. I, and I think that this is... I think that this is actually Infinite degrees of freedom. <laughs> well, <laughs> this is something that I think the verificationists were concerned about, right? Which is where if if you're saying a whole bunch of things um, where in your models and stuff, you include these unverifiable entities like may, like a, like heaven or hell, unfalsifiable, like heaven or hell or whatever, you basically have the have this weapon in the discourse where you can just say anything to manipulate and convince people. And there's no... like. There's nothing anyone can do. I mean, they can maybe parody what you're doing and get you to agree that that's not an acceptable way of having the discourse right because they can start just cashing these blank checks too about afterlives and special access to knowledge and stuff that you don't have. But I, th I think that, um, you know, these kind of unverifiable claims are, are just like really, really dangerous in the discourse because they, they permit anything. They can justify anything. Yes, there's another, there's a sort of interesting aspect here, which doesn't get talked about as much as it should, which is that the naturalist actually has at their disposal a parody argument, at least one, of the theist, not for quite everything, not for the ultimate origin of 
everything. But for many other types of arguments, including like a fine tuning argument and um, uh, others, is that the universe is actually a simulation made by aliens in some sort of hyper reality beyond ours, right? We're in a simulated right. universe. Yeah. And so you could say it's fine tuned and you could say, well, it was created for a particular purpose. Um, and, and you could even be some kind of dualist, right? In the simulation, there could be like different types of substances or whatever. Um, I, maybe they wouldn't like that type of dualism. I don't know, but I think you could appeal to a lot of, you could make a lot of parallels there. Um, and, but just say that the, the, the God of our case is, is just like a designer in some other physical reality. Um, and so, I, I mean, I don't think that's a good explanation, but I think it does parody quite a number of aspects of, of what the theist is saying with respect to, um, their alleged explanatory power. There's even the uh, psychedelic experience argument because loads of people take psychedelics and experience, you know, um, experience what they describe as like alien beings, you know. The, mm -hmm. <laughs> so there, so so we have so just as Swinburne has the religious experience argument, there's there's evidential support on psychedelics that he no, can't phenomenal conservatism. If it seems yeah. like there's aliens, you know, you should uh, absent defeat. Exactly. Anyway, we'll, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, so hang on, let's just take stock of where we are at the moment. So what? Where he's kind of, um, Swinburne here is talking about regularities in the world, like laws of nature and things like that. We've talked a bit about uh, electrons having same properties over time and things like that. And 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 now Swinburne is is here giving us uh, his explanation as to why that's expected under theism. Um, so he is saying that God has a reason to create a, an orderly world uh, because an orderly world is necessary for uh, free creatures to make decisions about what they're going to do so they can predict the outcomes of their actions. And as he says here, um, a world containing human persons is a good thing. Um, so, so, so that's why he's going to say God would create an orderly world because he has a reason to create that world. What's the reason? Because uh, it's good to have a world with persons in it, but persons couldn't be in a non-orderly world. Now we've already critiqued one aspect of that, which is, well, why couldn't there be persons in a non-orderly world that even made choices? Because God has these other options of allowing them to make choices that don't require laws of nature. And but especially a... given Swinburne's dualism himself, right? Where a person, yeah. I think, according to Swinburne, is going to be the soul rather than the body. But... Yes, that is what he says. Uh, that's the essential part of him or something. He says that. But so a further question then is, why is it good to... So he says a world containing human persons is a good thing. Now, it depends what you mean by world there. But if he means physical world, the question is, why is that good? Okay, let's just assume yeah. that it's good to have like human persons or something but why is it a physical world containing them is a good thing swimber never really addresses this he basically seems to be saying that you need to have a physical world for them to be persons or for them to exercise freedom or something like that but he doesn't explain why i mean why couldn't god just create look look god is supposed to be an immaterial agent who does not exist in the physical world uh in nothing like the same way humans do at least and has freedom right and has knowledge and so forth so why can't he just make lesser versions of himself um, or variations on that theme, right? Why do they then need to become physical? I think this is one of the strongest arguments. Or against... duplicates. Why would he not create well, yeah. duplicates of himself? More gods, right? But I think this is one of the strongest arguments actually against at least a traditional considered theism, which is just that God is an immaterial agent. Why would you expect anything physical to come out of that? Like he has everything he needs being non-physical. Why does he need to make a physical yeah. thing? I think that the, the physicality of, of reality is extremely unexpected under traditional understandings of theism. And why are there not other types of substances that are not mental, right, but are, are, are similarly different to the mental as physical substance is different to mental substance such that, yeah, I mean, you know, couldn't God create all sorts of different types of substances if he wanted to, unless they're, as long as they're not logically impossible, but somehow it has to be physical. What just, again, it's, it just seems like it's a, a retro diction to fit what we observe that I don't see how you get that out of, okay, it's good to create human persons. You know, like agent, agentic persons, right? But but where's this physical? Like, why do we need this stuff? God doesn't have this stuff. Why do we need it? And it again, it just, um, including this as like um, an explanandum is just gonna. It's not going to be convincing to many naturalists who are just going to reject that, right? That a, wo a world containing human beings is a good thing. Yes. Now, of course, well, yeah, lots of theists can just well. stereotype and point to that and say, well, yeah, that's because you're all like antinatalist virgins, whatever that, you know, like, and, and theism, Chad, like, <laughs> get married at 16 and whatever. But like, I mean, <laughs> you're all virgins who just want to have sex all the time. <laughs> <laughs> you're all promiscuous but, <laughs> in cells <laughs> <laughs> but the but the point is if, if we're engaged in the in the process of trying to convince our interlocutor right just just assuming certain data you, you have to 
it, when engaging in theory comparison, you have to use the data points that both sides actually agree to. So for example, if I'm engaging in theory comparison with a flat earther, it's not going to do for me to just appeal to the fact that the earth is round or something. The data point I have to appeal to is going to have to be that um, lots of scientists say that the earth is round, right? So that's something we both agree to. And then we offer different explanations of that. My explanation is going to be um, because it's true, right? Or they have because they have some some true beliefs about the world. Their explanation might be some sort of conspiracy theory or something. And then we can com can compare those explanations. But what I can't do is take as a data point something that the other side doesn't believe. And so I think that um, Swinburne, including you know highly controversial things in his data, point, and he does the same thing I think with with like libertarian free will and stuff. It's just not good for the project because what the project should do is try to agree upon those things which are as non-controversial as possible and then compare theories right and that's what's going to be yeah exactly and it depends what his goals are but that's what that's what should be done in the well he states that his goal is to convince people that god exists yeah. including people who don't already believe that so if that's the stated goal i think just as i mentioned at the start asserting all of these highly controversial things or implicitly assuming them without without so much as a a, a, a note most of the times that this is controversial let alone an attempt to convince people or start from at least a plausibly neutral starting point yeah i think it's just an extremely ineffective way of going about it Okay, so we've talked a little bit about embodiment and stuff. Um, said yeah, like pure and sold world. Oh yeah, Plato's doctrine of remembering, right? So, which is something that many Christians have believed as well, um, including like Origin, for example. The, the the idea being, well, it's not clear if like Plato's exactly committed to this or if he thinks it's just a myth, right? But the point is that there's there's this kind of myth from antiquity of when we learn things, we're actually in fact remembering. And before we became kind of um, physically embodied, that we were kind of souls in a pure state with access to perfect knowledge and that we've forgotten. And it's like, well, that's at least something that's been fairly convincing to to people in different cultures throughout history. So what, we can't just like rule out worlds like this, especially when it's something that even many Christians have believed, right? So then that's got to be included in the possibility space of any assessments about worlds that God could create if it's if it's a possible, if it's a possible one. Um, yeah, why, why uh, is this an intrinsic good you've put as well? Um, uh, which one specifically is that commented on? For God, well, um, it being up to us whether we choose to learn and uh, extend control. Oh, yeah. L like a good parent, a generous God has reason for not forcing us a certain fixed knowledge. Uh, I don't yeah, know. Yeah, I, I don't know why that's it. So this is what I was saying about the proliferation of intrinsic goods. And this is sort of starting here. So what have we seen so far? We've seen that creating uh, free agents like human persons is an intrinsic good. Now, that one I can kind of buy, although I would add extra caveats. Like it's not good to create them if they're going to experience torture for all of eternity. <laughs> uh, but... In general, I, I'm kind of on board with that. I think that that is a plausible view. But now we're going to add to that. We're going to say that it's also good intrinsically for God to, um, what is it, not foist on us particular knowledge of control, but giving us a choice in how to grow in knowledge of control. Now, yeah, uh, that seems to be something additional beyond just sort of having agency. It's like also having, it's a bit vague as to exactly what he's talking about here, but he talks about like a parent allowing I guess I just to... don't know why that's good though. Cause, cause suppose... That's what I'm saying. Well, what's intrinsically good about that? So Suppose there are... Um... There's so there's one example where there are two ways I can learn about something, right? One of them's like a really good way, and one of them's a really bad way of learning about something. Um, and that's in one world. And then there's this other world, and I and I have the choice to choose between the two in that world. Another world, I only have the one option to learn about things, and it's the really good way. Why would I say I, I honestly for myself cannot see why I would say that that first world is a better world because of the possibility that I could choose the bad way of learning about the thing. I mean, the world surely where I would only be able to choose the good way of learning about things would be a better world, right? Like it, it just, because well, or even where be God just helps us yeah. along. Cause he, yeah. he's not even saying here that he has to Yeah, remember, especially when he talks about choice, he's always talking about libertarian choice, which I think is critical yeah. here because I, I think that it is kind of intuitive that you don't want to take away people's autonomy, but he doesn't just mean that in a sense of like a compatibilist sense. Um, he means that in a libertarian sense, and that's a much stronger sense to mean that, because obviously God could create us in, in a compatible sense where we like exercise our, our, our choices and powers, but that's ultimately like determined. But he would say, he might say that's a good thing to an extent, um, because he thinks, for example, that 
yeah, later he talks about other things that are intrinsically good that don't have free will. So I think that he would accept that. But but in addition to that, he thinks that this sort of exercise of libertarian agency, like in these different contexts, like here, it's particularly about knowledge and control, not just existing, but specifically about building knowledge and control in a libertarian sense is intrinsically valuable. And I, I just don't have that intuition. I'm not sure what the argument is supposed to be. I don't know why, if you compare two worlds in which one set of people are just sort of doing their thing and God's helping them out to know things and whatever, and the other way that they have to kind of like muddle around like we actually have to do in the real world and it's really difficult. I don't know why the latter is better, intrinsically at least, like by in and of itself. He just sort of says that yeah, it is. Yeah, that's what I thought. Yeah, and, that, and that's what I thought. And, and I was like, it it seems to me when I consider that world where the only way is like the good way, so I'm either going to I'm either going to libertarianly choose to do that good way and so is everyone else or I'm just not going to make a choice at all and not learn that thing right but it still seems to me like that's a better world because you only ever have the good way happening you don't have like the bad way that might involve like killing people and harming them and stuff like that so I don't, I just can't see how that makes it better that people libertarianly choose but there's the option of like bad things as well why can't I just libertarianly choose but have my options restricted of what I can libertarianly choose. I... Yeah. Cause God does that. Right. It's like, it. Um, so God, God, well, it depends, I, I, I guess, cause God's libertarianly free, but only ever does choose the good. So that's a kind of like example, right. Of like, like you can have worlds or beings who are like that. Yeah. We'll see that a bit more later as well. <clears throat> um. Okay. Clearly it's, Clearly, it's the sort of thing that there's some significant probability. Uh, total chaos is ugly. The ah, medieval, yes. Yeah. The Go movements ahead. of the stars in accord with regular laws is a beautiful dance. The medievals thought of the planets as carried by spheres through the sky and their regular movements producing the music of the spheres, whose beauty humans casually ignored, although it was one of the most beautiful things there is. God has reason to make an orderly world. Because beauty is a good thing, in my view, whether or not anyone observes it, but certainly if only one person ever observes it. So I thought in <laughs> circles are more beautiful than ellipses. Well, yeah, there's so many points here. I thought I thought that this is weird because it actually seems like he constructs an argument against his hypothesis here. Okay, so it's like what my hypothesis of theism predicts um, beauty circles are more beautiful than ellipses um and in the actual world we have ellipses and not circles because it's you know the medieval view is false that, that we don't have the earth at the center and the heavenly spheres rotating around so then that actually constitutes evidence against the form of theism that he's just put up right because if we saw it it would be evidence for so the fact that we don't see it has to be evidence again i just it just is very odd to me i yeah, absolutely. So, oh, so th yeah, th this one was difficult for me, this little section here. So, okay, first, let's start with total chaos is ugly. What is total chaos? What is he talking about here? Yeah, I'm not what, sure. I think he just wants what us is to that? imagine like a hurricane or something. But I don't actually know. There's a lot of water yeah. to a hurricane. <laughs> yeah. But I don't, I don't know what just just total chaos is. Because like, there's different types of like non-orderliness. The two main ones that I could articulate would be randomness and chaos and those are very different phenomena now the interesting thing is that both of those can ex can exhibit can be beautiful order within them like think about the normal distribution yeah. there's actually a lot of order to that right in fact most probability distributions have an order to them amidst the chaos likewise uh, sorry amidst the st stochasticity amidst the randomness i should have said likewise chaos um many things are chaotic but also exhibit regularities and structure to them so think of for example think of um um, think of strange attractors like the Lorentz attractor, which shows a, re a recurrence. Um, and so, uh, first of all, not sure what he means by total chaos. Um, I think that's really underspecified here, since that's but it's ugly, important to and this. that's what that's what the you get but, with atheism. <laughs> but then there's the second point. Let's okay, let's whatever total chaos is, it's ugly. Is it? I mean, fractals. Many people find fractals beautiful. Many and and they exhibit a chaotic structure. Likewise, the Lorentz attractor. Also, you might say that symmetry can be boring, and it's nice to have. God likes it when there's as much randomness as possible. I don't know if that's what he means by by total chaos, but uh, you know, it's interesting to him to look at all of the random pixels on the screen because it's there's more information. There's the highest information content when you have the, the most randomness, right? And that's interesting to him. Whereas sameness and symmetry is boring, right? Like you could just say whatever because I don't know what the constraints are on this. Why? 
why should we expect our sense of beauty to map to God's? And even within humans, people find all sorts of things beautiful. So I, I just have no idea of what he's talking about here with total chaos or what it means for it to be ugly or why we should accept that claim. And then, okay, so there's that. And then there's this medieval thing. He, he keeps appealing to medievals. Uh, as if we think that the medievals got everything right. Like in general, an atheist type person, when you say the medievals thought this in, some, in an intellectual type of claim, they're probably going to be suspicious about that because the medievals had a lot of things wrong. And a lot of that was influenced by church dogma as well. So and an example is given here. Like you mentioned, the medievals precisely thought that the planets uh, orbited around the earth in, in crystalline spheres because the sphere was, of course, the most beautiful, uh, aesthetically pleasing shape. And that's what God would create. Well, they were wrong about that. So appealing to beauty here actually led them astray. Circles, everyone agreed were more beautiful than ellipses, but in fact, it's ellipses. It's not. It's not circles. It's not even um, perfect ellipses, but it's it's pretty close to that, right? Um, so, um, and then there's the claim at the end of this that beauty is a good thing, even if no one ever observes it. So beauty is intrinsically then, valuable, yeah. not people enjoying it, but just itself, right? Now that's a very controversial claim as well, which I don't accept, right? Remember, I said I'm happy with some types of like objective value, but I don't agree that beauty has a, a objective value intrinsically. It's, I think it has value insofar as people enjoy it, but not in and of itself. Right. So there's another controversial claim that he's just put But then there. doesn't that generate a reason for God to create infinite number of worlds that are unobserved, but very beautiful, right? Well, so then the fact yeah, that you we're think... observers in a beautiful world would be evidence against the existence of a God because he'd have an obligation to... <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, well, I mean, why would you expect? Yeah, exactly. So if it's if it's good to, for God to create a beautiful universe, why would you expect there to be life in that universe? Because you've already established a reason for him creating it that has nothing to do with life. So there seems to be kind of a coincidence here, right? That there's both. And maybe maybe Swinburne would say, yeah, he's getting his he's, he's getting both, like two birds with one stone. Kind yeah, of thing. It's, it's even but more. Then it yeah. seems, <laughs> but then it seems to be, pre well, I think there's other problems with that. First of all, it's not clear why God can only do one, right? <laughs> why can't he create all sorts of causally disconnected universes? By the way, I think that the theists should say this, but this is just a total guess. Could be wrong here. I think that theists don't want to say this because it raises questions about the atonement, right? If the atonement is supposed to be universal and applies across multiverses, I think that 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 means that our one universe was one in, of million of like infinitely many in which like God incarnated. Um, now, maybe you could say, well, actually, God incarnated in all of the universes that have life in them, but I don't know if theologically they want to say that. Anyway, that's pure speculation here, but I just I wonder why they don't kind of go down this road because it, they seem to run into problems by saying that God has all these reasons to create, but then he does it once. It's like, well, what was he doing? <laughs> why not more? Um, but then there's this issue about, okay, so God created the universe because it's beautiful. Let's just suppose that's true. What is beautiful about our universe? Most of it's empty space. <laughs> What's beautiful about that? Like if you were trying to make a really beautiful universe, you'd, you'd fill it with like empty space, black holes and dark matter. What's with that? Like, yeah, but I know what's coming, James, is a picture of a galaxy or, you know, like the James Webb telescope images. And look, here's a, here's where atheism gets you. James Fodor saying this isn't beautiful. <laughs> yeah, but most of the universe isn't that. Most of the universe is full of nothing or black holes or dark matter. That, that's what I like. It's not what you'd expect yeah. if God really and what about in a billion years the universe. Well, yeah, that's the other thing. It changes over time as well. Yeah. Eventually it's going to be even more nothing. Of course you can, you can ad hoc that by just saying, well, God likes it that way. Like, but that's the problem. Like there's no, <laughs> there's no constraints on, on what God would find beautiful. I mean, who even knows, right? Well, that's and, why it makes perfect how much of that is going to be in there. Christ is returning and first he'll fight the black holes and then he'll set things <laughs> right on earth. But honestly, if you could, if you had a principled theological argument as to why God would have a reason to create black holes, that would be so much more convincing because there are so many of those in the universe, right? And, and they seem so, sort of easily created, right? You get enough matter together and it compresses. Um, and a lot of things will end up as black holes in the longer term. Well, eventually, I guess they'll evaporate. But so the point is that if you could give that argument, that might hold some merit because the universe is full of those. But but the thing is, they never provide a coherent reason, a, a, a plausible explanation for why that would be the case. In, in, instead, they appeal to things that the universe is not full of, like life or beauty, <laughs> which I think is much less plausible. Okay, so the heavenly spheres cry out for an explanation. Um, on the materialist hypothesis, it is a mere coincidence that material objects have the same power. So we, I think we've already had... Yeah, we're back on... The, this is what I said. It's a bit repetitive because we talked about this already. This yeah. is just false. Like, it's just not, this is why I say he just doesn't address what, what any naturalist would say about this or even what physicists say about this. Like I mentioned conservation laws and symmetries. It's not a coincidence. No one thinks that. Well, um, so no we have thing. human and animal bodies. Um, uh, so yeah, hang on. God's reasons, but 
this is um why we're embodied i think humans and animals why, why uh, humans yeah animals yeah i think yeah okay uh, do you want to talk about this point i'm just going to quickly nip to the toilet yeah hang on what page are we on um page six, 68 in the pdf right uh see i don't oh yes found it okay so um so we're talking here about human and animal bodies. So we've talked about the order, orderliness of nature and the laws of nature and why apparently God had reason to create that. But now we're talking about uh, us being embodied. Uh, yeah, so God created human bodies. Um, God has reason for creating embodied persons and animals. And so for creating human and animal bodies. With such bodies, we can choose whether to grow in knowledge and control of the world, given that it is orderly. So a couple of points here, which we've kind of already mentioned. First of all, why is it that God needs to create human bodies in order for there to be humans or persons, right? We know that there can be disembodied persons because God is one of them. So where does the bodies come from? I, again, I think that the explanation just based on what he says is has to be that, well, you need a body to exist in a physical world and, and then to be able to interact with it and have a regular kind of predictability of, of your actions. But as we've, as Nathan and I've discussed, that's just false, right? Cause God has so many other options available. He could create an immaterial world that is predictable and regular, but just not, not physical. He could create a physical world that is not predictable, but give us some special cognitive faculties to enable us to know what's going to happen anyway, at least to some extent, or he could give us knowledge through the Holy spirit, or he could just, uh, as part of his causal sustaining of, of matter uh, of reality, he could just sort of give us those abilities. So there's all sorts of options on the table that God could, uh, ways that God could create persons that didn't require bodies or at least anything like the bodies that we have certainly. Um, and then there's the point about with such bodies, we can choose to, whether to grow in control and knowledge of the world. I don't know why that's intrinsically good um, to grow in knowledge and control. Uh, different people have different views about what the ground of sort of goodness is. And, and there's different theories about that, like whether it's hedonism or whether it's preference satisfaction or whether it's a bunch of different things like a, a ideal, um, sorry, what's it called? Um, objective list theory. But I mean, Swinburne doesn't talk about any of those. And and then he, what he does instead is just sort of keep asserting these extra things that are all intrinsically good. So, so far we've had like uh, libertarian agents existing kind of at all. And we've had um, uh, beauty just by itself. And, and now we're saying, we sort of said this before, growing in knowledge and control of the world kind of by ourselves to some extent is also an intrinsically good thing. It doesn't explain why. Um, so I think that neither of the things here are really established by anything that he said. It's just more things that he's asserting. I saw Richard Dawkins has got a mention, but um, okay. Yeah, I found that kind of boring. Uh, Darwinian explanation of why the complex animal and human bodies there are today is that once upon a time there were certain chemicals on Earth, and given the laws of evolution, um, it was probable that complex organisms would emerge. This explanation of the existence of complex organisms is surely correct, but it's not an ultimate, it's not a God explanation of that fact. For a God explanation, we need an explanation at the God level of why those laws rather than any other ones operated. So, I mean, meta metaphysical necessity, of course, would just be another viable um, explanation, right, for why the laws are the way they are. Um, Swinburne's just going to say God's choice, which we've talked about several yeah, times. And, and there's no explanation as to why he chose to create this set of laws instead of all of the others that he could have created. So it's not a good explanation. Uh, the theist claims that God has a reason for bringing about those laws because those laws have the consequence that eventually animals and humans evolve. Um, we've talked about how there's actually tension between this and uh, God is an explanation because God's supposed to be doing what's good and there's lots of like suffering and evil and imperfection and stuff in the way that the laws do operate for humans and animals. Um, and also how God has multiple ways of realizing humans and animals without it being physical or using these laws. There's a big possibility space of possible laws that God could have used. And so we still have a question, right, of why God chooses these ones rather than those. And then we just get bruteness. Uh, it will have to leave as a brute fact that the universe began in such a state and had natural laws as to be life evolving. This is a fine tuning type argument, but somehow it's not a brute fact that God created this universe as opposed to a, an infinite range of possibilities that he could have also actualized. 
Uh, the, the materialist will have to leave it as an ultimate brute fact that an everlasting universe and its laws had those characteristics. Whereas the theist has a simple ultimate explanation of why things are thus, following from his basic hypothesis, which also leads him to expect the other phenomena we have been describing. Again, um, metaphysical necessity, while you might say it has a low prior if the things that you say are necessary are going to be like very specific things, it has at least a, as low a prior as theism where God's desires and causal actions are specified as the ones that do in fact obtain. Um, so there's that. Uh, God has reason to bring about animals. Yeah, you've put why. I mean, maybe he just means for humans to use animals a conscious being but then but like why would no he doesn't be... mean that yeah he doesn't mean that okay well he sort of explains but i don't think he does explain so you can see here uh, animals are conscious beings who enjoy much life and perform intentional actions even if they do not choose freely which ones to do uh, so this is weird because this is going to be like well why why not gi give them free will as well like isn't their existence evidence against considering the fact that god's supposed to be bringing it's about so it's so freaking ad hoc like god created the universe because it's good to have uh law like uh, it's good to have regular regularities and life living in that except most of the universe is devoid of life as far as we know okay but what about those parts of the universe that do have life like earth and maybe maybe there's some other planets with life in it right well on those, most of the life also doesn't have free will, according to Swinburne. Why did he create that as well? Because it's also good to create those types of life. But then there's also types of life that he talks about that he doesn't think have any consciousness as well. Well, why did he create those? Like beetles. Well, because they're there. good. <laughs> like, yeah, there's just anything. There's a different type of good that's satisfied by that. This is why I said at the start, this is how he this is how he plays everything that God does. Is he just creates a new type of good that is actualized or, or uh, improved by God uh, creating a certain type of thing. And I mean, you can get anywhere with doing that. You just sort of <laughs> you sort of postulate whatever you need to account. And of course, there's no attempt to say, well, what would we expect if that's true? Like, what's the what's the type of universes that we most expected under the hypothesis? He never does that. All he does is then give a a post hoc um, just so story so, about, well, if we ex assume this, then you know we could God would have a reason to create what we see. So of course, it explains it. Um. Okay. So some more stuff about Darwin. Of course, Darwin always has to be okay. And now we have um, Hawking being evil. Yeah, I felt that the stuff on Darwin and Hawking could have been mostly cut. I don't think it was really that important given the other stuff that he. It might discussed. be. It might be important given the apologetic context of the book. So, because you know, Darwinism is always seen as having this like shaking the foundations of the theistic worldview in the sense that humanity was in this special place in the world, right? And Darwin kind of. Um, reduced that to a sort of very ordinary place amongst other things and then i guess the same similarly with hawking being like a revered intelligent scientist who was an atheist and so it's like well you've got to kind of sneak in addressing them but then i i don't know i guess you can say it makes sense but at least from my point of view this makes far more sense under atheism right where it, 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 what's going on with religion here is just a whole bunch of like sociological factors and human factors where we're trying to you know where people are trying to like argue for their particular in-group and stuff and there isn't actually a god involved like i, I or, or, that's what all of this stuff does for me rather than um it being person but someone else could i guess say that um no it's important that that stuff be in there because he's got to convince people you know it, it makes sense given theism because these are the people leading christians to hell and so so maybe it doesn't do much they have to be addressed Okay, through his choice at each moment that it exists at that moment and the laws of nature are as they are then. So uh, yeah, this is like a really bad thing to confess because it just makes it clear how bad the theory is, right? At each moment, not, not only does God have to make the choice for each thing, but at each moment he has to make the choice again <laughs> to continue to sustain it in that way. Um, yep, that's that's <laughs> multiplying causes a lot, <laughs> I would say. Uh, there is a great deal more order in the world than is necessary for the existence of humans. Yeah, so so now he's going to say that God has... Re the, the reason that the world has it's order is because, it's because God wanted to put humans in it who could kind of predict 
uh, who could exist and then also could predict to some extent that their consequences of their actions. But now he's saying here that there's actually more order than is needed, in fact, much more order than is needed in order for humans to exist. So I say, well, is that expected? I mean, that seems unexpected under the theism that you'd expect God to put the amount of order that's necessary to achieve his purposes and not just sort of put more in for some reason. Well, what does he say about that? Um, the argument fails for the reason uh, that comes out from analogy. Uh, hang on. I feel like the analogy is kind of annoying. What, what page are you on here? I want to try to find it again. Uh, 77 PDF. Because uh, I think I the analogy was annoying, but he sort of says it more clearly, I think, afterwards. Uh, da, 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 da. Yeah, it's, it's kind of like an anthropic argument, which doesn't seem critical here i just remember he talks about this oh i remember yeah it, it, this later. is like the thing that always happens with fine tuning where you get all these like labored analogies about like decks of cards yeah and rolls i know of dice I, and that's why i don't if Wait, you, you rolled the dice 15 times in a row and won a million pounds you'd be like i'm so lucky so why don't you say that about god and our universe <laughs> Okay, I think he maybe comes back to this because I remember him saying something about why there's more order than is necessary for humans, but he seems to then move on to a different point here, so maybe he mentions it later. Uh, he In 77, the bit that you've highlighted is there is a great deal more order in the world than is necessary for the existence of humans. Yeah, so the question is why, right, under the theist right. view. But I think he does mention, it does talk about that, but I don't think... Oh, okay, he, right. I can't I find it on the next page, so maybe it's later. Okay. Anyway, so okay. The, he, he talks about like anthropic arguments and so on, which I don't really want to hear. Yeah, every arrangement of matter is equally improbable a priori. Uh, that is, if chance alone, if chance alone dictates what is drawn. But again, given materialism, is it chance alone that dictates what is drawn? Um, if a person is arranging things, he has reason to produce some arrangements rather than others, right? And if it's metaphysically necessary, then it couldn't have been some arrangements rather than others, even if that has a very low prior. But then God choosing this one when there's a large possibility space rather than others, same thing we've said. So we he just makes probabilistic mistakes here, in my view, because what he says is that if a person is arranging things, he has reason to produce some arrangements rather than others. Okay, we accept that. God has reason to prefer some arrangements of the world rather than others. But then he says, if we find such arrangements, like ones, those that are more expected, there that is a reason for supposing that a person is doing the arranging. That's not true because it depends how likely those are relative to how likely these arrangements are under the person did it hypothesis relative to the chance hypothesis and as i said before if god even if we rule out an infinite number of, of arrangements or like worlds which we think god wouldn't create um there's still an infinite number left as swinburne himself said before so the probability that god would create any one particular of them has barely changed i mean we're talking about infinity here so i don't even know how you how you quantify this but it, it seems that we haven't actually changed the likelihood very much given um like basically what's the probability of a world like this under theism um, given a, a world like this under not theism, it seems that there's yeah. essentially no difference because One theism over hasn't, it hasn't ruled out enough possible worlds for it to really increase the probability of us seeing this one. And that's what Swinburne doesn't seem to appreciate. Just because you can rule out some, it, it's not enough to rule out some. You have to rule out enough worlds for it to render this particular world quite likely under that hypothesis. But it doesn't because there's still an infinitely many that that are not ruled out by these considerations. So it's still a bad explanation. It doesn't have much explanatory power. And there's this, um, to postulate a trillion trillion other universes rather than one god in order to explain the orderliness of our universe seems the height of irrationality. So I here he's say... responding to the multiverse hypothesis that the reason that the constants seem fine-tuned for life is because there's many different worlds that all exist and we find ourselves in the one that would sustain our life. But this also, do, this does come down to, um, you know, postulating more of the same thing versus new types of things right and yes. i'm honestly not sure if because i think i think it would always so i'm trying to think of a good, a good example um and one is not coming to me off the top of my head one from like um, science or something where it would be pretty clear but there are there are certainly examples in science where um you can basically postulate more of the same type of thing or perhaps like one new sort of highly mysterious and very different thing mm -hmm. to explain stuff like I, I don't know invisible gremlins or something that have or, or shy intuitive fairies that just want to make something happen um 
I don't know what would be a good example. Maybe something to do with with like stuff being made up of millions of atoms or something. It's like so. What's better, you know, postulating millions and millions of little atoms in stuff that is why this is happening, or you know, shy intuitive fairies that conveniently explain all of the magic that we want. It just seems the height of irrationality to me. And it's like it it, it isn't actually clear that postulating a lot of the same type of thing rather than a new mysterious thing is necessarily um, that bad. Um, I honestly don't know. Yeah, I think it's difficult. I, I say in the comment there that people who believe in the multiverse typically don't just sort of postulate a bunch of other worlds. What they typically postulate is a mechanism for generating many other worlds. And so it's not really like when you have a universe printer, you don't need to explain each universe. You need to explain the printer and, and you kind of get the universes for free, right? Um, and so you could question how plausible is the existence of a universe generator, right? But I don't think it's appropriate to just count the number of universes that, that it would spawn because they're basically, you might say, copies of the same thing or like variants right. on, on a theme effectively. And so I, I don't think that's entirely fair. I don't I don't favor a, a multiverse explanation personally. Yeah. I think there are issues about comparing simplicity of like something that can generate all com combinations. Now, you don't have to say that with a universe a multiverse theory because it doesn't necessarily have to be one that has like all combinations it could just be there's a, a whole lot of them right so I, I i don't think it's easy to distinguish what is the better and worse explanation there but i certainly don't think that it's fair to just say well there's lots and lots of them so therefore it has to be complicated yeah it's going to depend on how you think they came into being and how you assess the universe generator versus god remember that god has all powers right so couldn't we make an argument here well it's more reasonable to say that there's no limits to the number of universes that are generated rather than there's any particular limits like yeah. so that that's the argument that Swinburne gives right. to why God has all power. So you could like mirror that. Yeah, it's um, a very simple that. theory because there's just exactly. unlimited number. It, it of postulates people. all of them, right? So yeah. I think you're going to run into the same problem there. For some reason, that's the height of rationality here to say that there's lots and lots of others, but it's not the height yeah. of rationality to say that God has all powers, wh yeah. which I think is just inconsistent yeah. there. Or alternatively, um, you could sort of be unfair to the multiverse proponent in the same way that Swinburne. Um, sorry, you could be unfair to sort of Swinburne's hypothesis in the same way that he's seemingly being unfair to the multiverse proponent by saying that, well, it just follows from theism and all the different types of worlds that God has reasons to create, that there are trillions and trillions of other universes <laughs> that follow from the theistic hypothesis that are actual. And that's just the height of irrationality to believe such a thing. I like that just seems as well, if, if you know, conveniently what he's not doing is looking at the multi, looking at the data and then providing these just so stories about just how plausible um, multiverse is for these various data points, right? Instead, he's working from the hypothesis and saying that the entailments are just really radical and weird. But he doesn't do that in the case of theism. He doesn't start from the yep. hypothesis and then talk about the entailments and then say, oh, these are really weird and implausible and it would be irrational. Instead, he engages in this kind of like plausibility storytelling um, about the, the, the various likelihoods and things, right? And that's just unfair. It's like, Instead, what he should be doing is, is applying his method consistently, do the same with his theism and say, yeah, there's trillions and trillions of other universes rather than just our one that are entailed by this. And it's actually on a par then with this multiverse hypothesis in that case. Because presumably there's some beauty and good in all of those, right? And God is going to do that then. God's going to bring about those worlds that exhibit beauty, even if even ones that don't contain minds or to appreciate them. Yeah, I mean, that's honestly what I would expect. But anyway, yeah, don't worry about that comment there. I think we've kind of discussed that already. Okay. Yeah, and same with this one. Deeper, a deeper cause of the order. I just, I just find right. it interesting, like, when philosophers use, you know, like, these terms, like, deeper and stuff. I, I think he means more fundamental. Yeah, but... yeah, I I agree. Yeah. But I, I just find it interesting that we sort of think that way because I think the talk of fundamentality actually – might be like parasitic on some kind of notion of reductionism in the first place, you know, to talk about like mm. a deeper explanation. But I yeah, maybe need to flesh that out. Reductionism is hard to fully articulate. Anyway, okay. how so, the existence of God explains the existence of humans? Is this one about minds here? We're talking. Yeah. Okay. Ooh, yes. Yeah. Mostly, but it's it's kind of similar to the previous one, I suppose. But um, in, in some ways, more... yes, because he is he does discuss some similar issues. But this is the one I think that, at least from my point of view. Um, presents the most uh, how, to, how to say this the most sort of conventional philosophical analysis because basically he gives two reasons here for thinking that consciousness is immaterial and there's essentially he doesn't 
call them this, but they're essentially the knowledge argument and the continuity of self argument. Um, and these are well worn out arguments. Right? I mean, which is fine. I'm not saying it's bad that they're well worn out. It's just that I sort of noticed that he's sort of, whereas some of the other things he says are a bit less conventional. But so that's kind of what he's doing here. Um, so I, <laughs> consciousness, we shall be arguing, cannot be a property of a mere body. What about um, a non mere body? Be... <laughs> yeah, the mirror often does the work there, and I, I dislike that. But uh, at some point in evolutionary history, bodies of complex animals became connected to souls. <laughs> I just, I don't understand how a modern educated person can say that without laughing. Yeah. It just sounds and the it, most ridiculous thing. It's like this. This should be evident. The fact that this is embedded in his hypothesis should be evidence against his hypothesis, right? Because it's so wildly implausible. Like, why, why think that? If so, so if if uh, if consciousness is like strongly supervenient on or grounded in whatever certain physical states, well, then it makes perfect sense that um, that consciousness would arise with certain physical complexity and biological yes. organisms, right? It's just perfectly predicted by that hypothesis. Whereas why do souls become attached at the stage where brains, you know, where, where, where like certain neurological... Oh, he has no explanation for that. He basically says, well, God made it that way, which is the nice guy. Yeah, God just chooses card. those ones. What, what does he just choose? Like, uh, I, I forget what the first type, but, you know, like whatever undersea creatures have light slips or whatever that are the first set of eyes and goes, right, you get souls now. Yeah, so you can I process mean, he, those he could, right? I, I don't know why. <laughs> this is so silly, right? That we have this huge brain that takes like a quarter of the energy that we that we consume. I mean, what's it all doing? I, I guess what, what Swinburne <laughs> would say is that it's necessary for like, information processing and computing muscle movements or something but it's not necessary <laughs> it, for yeah. consciousness or free will I, I don't know exactly i don't but that's not exactly right because you gonna... just do move your you know like your, as it, so you just do move your hand right like what what parts of the biological well, organism well, are actually required he, or do... so he's yeah so so he says that when you just like just move your hand he, he still says that that's mediated through like nerve impulses and things yeah like the that. cns and the muscles but what's the brain yeah. doing there like what well, the brain has to compute those movements right and that's actually very complicated now we're not aware of that which i think is what he would say that's not part of an, our intentional action the basic act is the part that we're aware of which is why i critiqued it because what you're aware of is contextually dependent and can change right and so I don't know that there's a clean distinction there. But so I, I, it seems to me that what he's going to say is that the things that we're not aware of and that are not like conscious is what the brain does. And the other bits is what the soul does. But that that distinction, again, is not known to neuroscience or psychology and is, I think, pretty ad hoc and, and doesn't really work if you try to pin it down with any specifics. If you hand wave, then maybe. But like that's all that substantialists have is hand waving and there's a fair bit of that in this chapter, but but the fundamental problem with souls, and and it's not just me because Swinburne says this explicitly later. Souls are binary. You have a soul or you don't. Now there can be different types of souls, like he says, animals have animal souls, but but you still either you have one or you don't, right? This just is utterly foreign to evolution, right? Uh, throughout evolution, you see the gradual development of traits bit by bit. I mean, you know, I'm not saying it's gradualism it can be punctuated by equilibrium, but it's still it's still gradual in an overall sense, right? And so what we would expect is that intelligence is gradual. Um, ability to plan and, and make choices is gradual, develops increasingly. Consciousness gradually develops. We don't know exactly when, but we would expect that to be gradual and, and graded. Um, all of these things uh, uh, develop gradually, right? But that, that won't work if you have souls. There has to be a moment. There was like a specific point in time when the first whatever had now had a soul. Two creatures that were indistinguishable in almost all senses. One had a soul and the other didn't. That, that has to have been the case, unless there's special creation that he just popped god just sort of popped a creature in there but i don't think that the theists can say that because then they would be saying that god is like fooling us into thinking that they had evolved uh, when actually he's special created so i think that they're going to have to say that like maybe god guided the process but there's still going to be a point where there's like you know there's one i don't know fishy thing and another one that's almost exactly the same but one has a soul and the other doesn't because it just changed that ever so slightly that it ticks over the soul point like this is absurd the naturalist doesn't have to postulate any such thing it just gr gradually but you can't have gradual souls right um and likewise, like if, okay, let's say there are different types of souls in different types of animals, which I think he says, right? Well, w in the speciation process, when do you go from one species to another? There's no, there's no point when that happens. It's a gradual process. Like, so again, there's going to have to be a point where like, uh, uh, all emerge from some sort of ancestor, uh, of, of cats and dogs and like other, other carnivores, right? Like how does any of this work? You can't, <laughs> it's so silly. Um, 
and, and there's no way to make sense of this other than, well, it just sort of happened that way and, and God did it. And yeah, there just was a time when there was like literally the first soul in a cat or in a fish or whatever. Yeah. And yeah, deal with it. Like It's so well, ad hoc. How about, but let's see if that is a good explanation, right? Because he says, so at some time in the evolutionary history of uh, uh, history, bodies of complex animals became connected to souls. And this, I shall be arguing, is something utterly beyond the, the power of science to explain. But yeah. theism <laughs> can explain this, for God has the power and reason to join souls to bodies. Well, why can't I just say, well, naturalism can explain this, because nature has the powers and laws to connect souls to bodies. Yeah, you I could. Mean, you could. It's <laughs> going to be a bad explanation, but I don't think it's worse than, bad, than what he yeah. said. Yeah, exactly. It's yeah, as yeah. good as the, al yeah. the alternative, right? It's, ju it's just this empty claim. <laughs> that is the conclusion. Well, let, let's see what reason he gives for God to connect um, souls to bodies. Okay. Um, yeah, so, the essential yeah, part of each one of here. us is yep. soul. Okay. Immaterial Properties substance. of an event may be physical or mental. I shall understand uh, by a physical event, one such that no person is necessarily better placed to know that it has happened than is any person. Um, As you rightly so say, this is question begging. Yeah, it's quite it's question begging against um, certain types of physicalism about mind, right? Because it, it suppose that there are like certain identities or, or um, functional realizations or whatever that are in some sense identical to or, or, or mental states supervene on. Well, then knowing those those correct connections would, in principle, allow anyone to know um, the. Or, or they could stimulate themselves to be in that state or whatever. That basically, there's a story that can be told for different versions of physicalism um, where yeah. it is knowable, right? What happened? I've them. mentioned a, di a slightly different take, which is the, the notion of a phenomenal concept, which is essentially saying that there are certain types of physical states which, um, uh, well, let me, re let me phrase that differently. There are certain types of physical facts that are unknowable to observers who are not in a particular type of physical state. So to know what it is like to be a bat, you have to be a bat. We yes. can know certain things about what uh, about bats, but we can't know what it's like to be one without being in that physical state ourselves, right? That's kind of the notion of a phenomenal concept, if you're interested. Um, and so physicalists have a lot of options available to them for explaining this, um, the relationship between the physical and the mental. And of course, there's disagreement there. But his def but the problem with Swinburne's definition is that it kind of rules those out in a sense, because he wants to say that there, there are these first person private states uh, which are not fully determined by the physical states of affairs. Um, yeah, physical. And they're essentially that, private. They, yeah. yeah, yeah. No one person is necessarily better placed to know what has happened than as another person. So that's what he know says. Know what has happened. It, that's again, a physical. Like know event. what has happened, right? So, so if if the if the essential characterization of a physical event is that anyone could know what has happened. Yeah. So physical events physical are public. Event. He literally says that. But but in the but in the case of a of a mental um, event someone is better placed, namely the experiencer. But yeah, then that's exactly. going to be wrong. That's going to be that's, wrong if... That's what the theory know, of phenomenal concepts says. There are physical yeah. states that are non-public. Essentially, that's the claim. But but that's going to be incorrect if, um, you know, you well, can put someone in an MRI, in an fMRI machine, right, and go, oh, yeah, they're having like a red experience now or something like that by looking at which regions of the brain are activating well, the, or whatever. So yeah, not, so it depends what specific yeah. facts you're talking about, right? You may actually be able to read their mind. Now, the idea about phenomenal concepts is that it's more than just that. It's what it it's what it feels like to be in that state. Yeah. And the idea is you wouldn't get that from just looking at an MRI image. Now, perhaps you could reproduce that state with, an, with a sufficiently detailed brain scan plus like a visual... Um, yeah, a, a machine a, that a, puts you VR, in the physical a, Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but... but um, but so the point is, this is question begging because there are physicalists who think that there are private physical states or that there are no purely private states that at least in principle, any physical state would be accessible exactly. to others. It depends on how you want to articulate that. Right. Okay. Um, if others could find out about them by some method, I could find out about them by the same method. And so he he's saying this as if it's some kind of like reductio, right? I take it when I'm when I'm reading it, but I'm like, yeah, so that's it, just it should give some context here about what he's talking about here. He's talking about like being in pain or seeing yeah. red, like so called qualia, um, conscious yeah. experiences. Yeah. So so he's saying like, is it the the way I'm reading this is basically it's just ridiculous to think that someone could find out about my being in pain in the same way that I know about it by being in pain, but I'm saying actually. You know that basically you just need to know the correct according to my view the the correct like physical states that are what it is to be in pain or whatever 
Um, and then you'd need to some kind of mechanism to put yourself in that physical state. And then you could know exactly what it's like um, if, if you could do that. So all you'd need to do is have the correct um, power to put yourself in that physical configuration or state um, and to know what the physical state is that the other person's in. And so it's not the kind of reductio that he thinks it is. It would just be very inconvenient to do that. <laughs> Yeah, or it may even be physically impossible, but it's not like metaphysically impossible in, in the sense yeah. that I think he's claiming. Sure. That's that's a good way of making precise the kind of philosophical disagreement. Um, so he says, I have a way of knowing about pains, thoughts, and so. Oh, I also what what I also wanted to say is I I think the way that he is talking about like pains and things here as if there's like one single internal um like sample of a pain or something like that is just not accurate as is borne out by you know like various attempts for example in like artificial intelligence and stuff to or machine learning to to learn what people are talking about when they talk about pain to categorize and diagnose pain or to create language models which talk about pain in the same sort of way that we do or even like from uh developmental psychology right where people teach children about how to describe their pains or how to understand them where uh, and these like weird cases like um being tickled or something right where it's like well that's like a pleasant but it can also be a pain and it it's like pain isn't just um it's not like there is an essential sample of pain and the word just attaches to that sample and everyone kind of shares that sample there's sort of weird different phenomena and the way that we use the language around pain is kind of like you know, it attaches to some things that surely we have in common, but it's not clear that there's like one essential thing that we all have in common as well. And it seems that it can be used kind of functionally, right? Like pain being used to um, describe states that we want to avoid or something like that, or, 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 or dispositions to, um, to, to, to not behave in certain ways and things like that. So pain is like a very complicated thing. And I yeah, think absolutely it is. It, and, and I think that that's partly, uh, again, I, can't, I like to say a phenomenal concept, so I, I keep appealing to it. Part of the idea there is that you can, you acquire the concept of pain is, is a bit too broad, but let, let's think about a specific type of pain that's localized in a specific way, right? So the idea is that you, you acquire a, a concept of what that is like to experience by experiencing it. And then I may attach a label to that. I may say it's like a stinging pain in my elbow or whatever, like a throbbing pain in the back of my head, right? And I try to articulate, I use that language to articulate that concept to someone else who hopefully has experienced something similar. Maybe they can imagine it if they haven't experienced it exactly. Um, but so, so the idea is that I have a, I have some kind of uh, direct perceptual knowledge of what it feels like to be in a certain state. But the question is to whether I know that I have a certain type of pain depends on the reference of that, of that. So for example, I could say I experience a pain in my arm, even if I don't have an arm because it's like phantom limb syndrome. And so you, you can, you can't be wrong. At least many people would say about like the experience of what it feels like to have a certain phenomenal experience, but you can be wrong about your um, beliefs about it. Like you could describe it in terms of a pain in your arm. Like I feel it's a pain in my arm, but you don't actually have an arm, right? So it, it feels a certain way, sure. Um, but but your sort of sort of um, beliefs about it aren't necessarily true. And and the beliefs about it come as soon as you start to articulate it. Maybe even in storage of your memory, but certainly when you're articulating it to other people. So so when we talk about knowing about pains, thoughts, and so forth, it, it sort of depends on what you mean by that. If you just mean the sort of immediate experience as it presents itself to you as being a particular type of thing, right? Um, that's one thing. Uh, but then as soon as you try to present uh, uh, story in memory, but and, and then articulate it to others as well, then there becomes an issue is, um, uh, are you correct in, in the way that you're ascribing, like in the way that you're describing? Because like you can mistake a, a sensation as pain. You're like, you, you describe it as pain, but like it actually was something else. It was a different type of receptor that you just sort of thought was a pain um, or, you know, the phantom limb situation. So you have to be careful about what the reference is. Is it the raw experience itself as it just immediately presents itself to you? Or is it kind of your... Uh, your conceptual apparatus kind of describing that or remembering that. And that may, may be quite yeah. different between different people, right? And I think what I'm what I'm trying to get at as well is that, you know, in, in our, we ascribe, we talk about pain um, as like a single sort of noun, right? That points to like an inner thing. But I'm saying that like actually what's going on is a highly like varied 
set yeah, yeah. of... Uh, uh, of yeah, like, that's what I'm saying. It's the same label, but many different experiences. And we sort of hope that they're sufficiently similar, but it's it's sort of quite hard to tell. And we should be, I guess the, the other side of this is we should be cautious about trying to reify that notion that yes. there's like a pain thing. But, yeah. but I mean, I don't know that just, that's essential to his argument because he could just say it's some type of phenomenal experiences, right? Even if those are kind of different. But, um, but, but the way he talks about it here, I have a way of knowing about pain, <laughs> thoughts, and such like behavior other than this, those available to the best student of my behavior. Like not necessarily because it depends what you mean by knowing about pains. But, the, but this you can have of, a lot of false belief about yeah. your pains, right? The, well, this, this is what I mean. And so I th there's a lot of cases, right, in, in developmental psychology of like children being taught how to correctly use the term like you use language around pains yeah. where the children themselves aren't like quite sure how to actually use the words properly or, you know, properly as agreed upon by adults, basically. Right. So where they might have like a new experience or something that's like someone tickling them or something. Um, and then that is pain, but then they're like, I'm laughing. So I don't know what I do about that. Or, um, you know, like there's, there's all sorts of weird examples where it's not clear that you do know that you're in pain because you sort of have to learn you have to kind of learn the practice of pain to be able to correctly apply it, if that makes sense. Now, um, yeah, and that would be different between yeah. the phenomenal concept that you acquire when you have a certain experience and okay. the concept of pain, yeah, which, right, which has right. to be learned. Yes, yeah, that's true. And we shouldn't reify it and assume that there's like a one-to-one -one mapping or, or the others or, or, yeah. or anything of the sort. Yeah. Um, so so it's just when Swinburne's saying a neurophysiologist um, you know, cannot like observe this, but potentially, you know, like there are disorders, right, where neurophysiologists can actually be in a better decision, um, a better position to help someone understand some kind of like bizarre or atypical um, phenomenology that they are undergoing um, with regard to like color experience or synesthesia. Synesthesia. Or, yeah. oh, read your mind. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That's a good <laughs> example. Is People have that experience, but they don't really understand it. So I think, yeah, it, it depends what he means by by this. I think that he's going to press it. And, and I don't think he mentions like Mary, but I think that that's what he's appealing to is the idea that there's something lacking, just knowing like the intellectual side, of, you have to experience it, right? I think that's probably what he's talking about here when he says that you have a way of knowing about it. But we I, we should be careful to not conflate that with all aspects of knowledge of, of what yeah. you're experiencing, because many of those are not accessible first person. Yeah. It's not that you're not experiencing what you're experiencing, right? But it's like the, even our talk of like knowledge of these inner states is sort of conditioned by our ways of talking about them and understanding. Yes, exactly. The way you experience it is yeah. dependent on um, your expectations and what you think it is. And, and pain is very much like that. That's part of the pain phenomena. Like it, it, pain is shaped obviously by external things and, and internal uh, like memories and things, but it's also by expectations. Like if you think, oh, I'm feeling pain, like that can exacerbate the pain or, or maybe make it uh, actually... Um, that help mitigate it depending on the person right so it's like yeah thinking that you're in pain can like can shape the way that you experience that very state so it's it's not it's not a simple thing about just sort of getting sort of some sort of direct access to to the way it is that there's yeah. like a lot of and the content back is to you like like in the in the yeah it's, it's not theory independent i guess is the point even these sort of phenomenal concepts are not theory independent and i, th I think though because of that so so maybe here's an example to illustrate what i'm saying right is um I think there's a there's a case that presented to Antonio Damasio, the the neuroscientist, of someone who had had some kind of brain injury or something, and um, they were kind of acting a little bit weird in certain cases. And then, and one of the one of the things he noticed actually was that she had a tendency to stand like too close to people. And then it turned out after investigation that I think she had like a a bunch of like lesions and uh, and damage on her on a particular area of her, of her brain and then the sort of conclusion that they ended up coming to which she hadn't just introspected herself but in fact had to be helped to by the investigation of neuroscientists was that um she sort of didn't understand fear correctly because of the type of damage that she had to her brain right but then once she understood that in those terms she was then able to so i think she'd been in like various abusive relationships for example right, because she hadn't right. seen she hadn't seen like any of the red flags with her boyfriend because she didn't understand the fear or she'd been a, in a mugging once where someone had like held a knife to her throat. And um, she instead said like, like, uh, go on, do it um, like uh, expletive, you know, to, to the guy, and just, <laughs> but just didn't fit for anything. The guy was like freaked out and did it. Did she have damage but, um, to her amygdala? 
Um, I can't remember exactly. I think it was something like that, but I don't, I don't know exactly what it was. It's, I can't it's often it's, it's involved in fear processing. So I just wondered. Right. Yeah. There can there can be other areas. As I well. think it's a relatively famous case, though. Where yeah, I yeah, think she might have been called like HM familiar. or something. Like that. Well, it's I not HM. It's, that's a memory know, case. But yeah, there are okay. others as well. It's it's one of those like uh, you know one of those where the name is like um, just the just the initial fake initials. initials or yeah, whatever, yeah. I people. definitely heard of it. I don't remember the initials. Uh, and the the point is though in this case that she couldn't just introspect the experience to figure out oh I'm like missing fear right she had to actually have like people look at her behaviors yeah. from the outside and look at the the brain that was going on in order to understand the experience that she was having that was atypical, um, and and yeah so so I I just think that Swinburne is is wrong here when he's like you know that you kind of just introspect and it comes to you I th I think actually the fact that cases like this are strong evidence in favor of those sort of identities or if not identities like you know supervenience relations between the mental and the physical and that's why we need you know these fruitful areas like neurophysiology which help people understand these sorts of conditions yeah a different way to i think express that would be to say that this sort of strict dichotomy between the uh, the externally knowable and the kind of internally first person knowable it just isn't isn't that strict right that they kind of blur into each other in, right. in, in different yeah. ways. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, let's keep going. Uh, I, I think we've probably covered yeah, that. That's the same. Uh, the point is that just as ignition. Oh, yeah. Don't worry about, about that comment. Version. I think we've sort of talked okay. about that. Substance monism as an alternative. Uh, so the view that there are only substances of one kind, material substances. If mon monism were correct, then there would be nothing more to the history of the world than the succession of those events, which involve material substances, they're coming into existence or ceasing to exist and having properties and relations, physical or mental. Yeah, so that's that's a sort of materialist view, physicalist monism. Then the, re the, redu the reductio of that, according to Swinburne, is that if you knew all of that, or if you knew all of the physical um, states and events that had happened, you still would not know one of the important things or not uh, things of all most one of the most important things of all whether you or any other human continued over time to live a conscious life so I this say, is a knowledge argument i actually i think this is a bad formulation of a knowledge argument though because i actually think that if you knew all of the um physical facts right you would know the physical states that it was to be conscious and so if you knew all of the um historic physical states that existed then you would know whether any of them were the subset of them which are what it's like to be conscious and yes. so then you would in fact know whether anyone i think was i think this is a that's a good point i think this is a misstatement so the normal phrase is that mary learns something when she experiences seeing red that she didn't know before yeah when she was just reading about the neurophysiological correlates right so that would be to say that there is some types of knowledge that you can't acquire just by like a third person investigation and and the physicalist can understand this as just saying that certain types of um, physical facts can only be uh, acquired by being in a certain type of physical state right. um, and that's sometimes expressed as acquiring a phenomenal concept which i, I think is a quite a powerful way to articulate that yeah the way swinburne says is actually wrong because you you wouldn't know what states were conscious and which weren't you yeah, just wouldn't exactly. know what it is like to be that state to be those you states. Had been in it. yeah exactly. yeah which is a difference but Either way, I think that the physicalist has a res response to this, and obviously one can discuss that further. But Swimmer just doesn't present it as if the, the, any physicalist has like thought about this at all, which I think is yeah. a bit disappointing. Um, okay. Okay. Then he starts talking about brain transplants, which I think is kind of a different point actually, because this is more about like continuity oh, yeah. of self rather. Yeah. Than now that now there's like a argument. kind of puzzle, a puzzle about continuity, and it's like. I mean, you can sort of always, I, I think you can kind of always create these puzzles, right? And my, my view, and it doesn't have to, it, perhaps it's not the correct one, is just that, you know, who the person would be would just depend upon who people talked about. As Maybe the we should explain the, the setup so, so yeah. the people can follow. So the setup is um, you have like a, bra a, a brain hand the transplant, which consists of, so the brain consists of two um, hemispheres and a brainstem. There's good evidence that humans can survive and behave as conscious beings if much of one of one hemisphere is destroyed. Uh, so he says, imagine his brain divided into two and each half is taken out of his skull and transplanted into the empty skull of a body from which a brain has just been removed uh, um, and there to be added to each half brain from some other brain. Um, for example, the brain of my identical twin, 
whatever other parts, um, for example, more brainstem, are necessary in order for the transplant to take and for there to be two living persons with lives of conscious experiences. Uh, now, I am very well aware that an operation of this delicacy is not practically possible and perhaps never will be, um, but I cannot see that there are any insuperable theoretical difficulties standing in the way of such an operation. Um, we are therefore entitled to ask the further question, if this operation were done, and we then had two living persons, both with lives of conscious experiences, which would be me? Um, probably both would, to some extent, behave like me and claim to be me and to remember having done what I did, for behaviour and speech depend in large part on brain states, and there are very considerable overlaps between the information carried by the two hemispheres, which give rise to behaviour and speech. But both persons would not be me, for if they were both identical with me, they would be the same person as each other. If A is the same as B, and B is the same as C, then A is the same as C by transitivity, and they are not. Um, so basically, phys physicalism false, right? We can't we can't be certain which holds. It follows that mere knowledge of what happens to brains or bodies or anything else material does not tell you what happens to persons. Um, I'm also not sure how knowledge of souls would exactly help here. I mean, I'm not even sure what would allegedly happen to the souls. And uh, I'm he also discusses not sure, that. But I, I'm also not sure how introspection would help, given that both people... Um, claim from a first person perspective to be the same person as well um yeah again i think that the argument's misstated here i don't think it has anything to do with knowledge of what happens to brains doesn't tell you what happens to persons because it doesn't seem that knowledge of um it, it doesn't seem it's a question about knowledge it seems that a question it, it's a question that it, uh, swinburne maintains that there is a fact of the matter about which is you and that can't be grounded on uh, on on identity of bodies or brains because they both have half of your brain right so there's no uh if, if one is identical to you in virtue of having half the brain then the other would be as well um i guess you could just say something like well the left hemisphere is you because that's where language is based but i, I think that that sort of misses the point of what he's saying here if you if you somehow divided your brain in a way that put half of yourself into two bodies and then you know rebuilt the rest of it which one would be you um, and what he, the assumption here is that there's a fact of the matter about which is identical to you. And I think that the physicalist should just deny this. At least that's yeah, my preference. I, there's no well, fact my, of the matter. I was going to say, not, uh, okay, it, this is to deny that there's a fact of the matter, but it's to say, I think that our criteria of continuity is just going to be grounded in our like practice of ascribing the personhood to whichever person, right? So if we all just said, oh yeah, you're the person who had that operation. Well, then, yeah, we'd say it's the same person, and we'd have a criteria of identity that we applied in this case. Well, so so both of the people ar arising from the operation would be the same under that view. And um, that's just Is how we would use. In my, in my view, it wouldn't be that there's like a fact of the matter in like in the world about um about uh, about the personhood continuing in both of the and you creating two new people, but it would be that there's a fact of the matter about our discourse around persons. <laughs> That would um, so both both of the people could be like legally the same person, for example, or um, socially the yeah. same person. Well, so it depends on the metaphysics of personhood, right? So if you think a person exactly. is in in a sense like a sociological construct, then there aren't going to be any facts of the matter that determine which is the same person outside of exactly. sociological factors. And I think that that's a reasonable view. I, I would take a slightly different view, but I don't think it's dramatically different. I, I lean towards a psychological continuity theory of the self. So basically, a person is a um a sort of a worm through space time of sufficient psychological continuity and we can maybe argue about the exact boundaries of that but it follows that um the it, it's i mean not currently but theoretically it would be possible for these worms to fork to split into two and and other life forms do this like bacteria split into two and and i think maybe i mentioned this but like we don't get went up in knots about which is identical to, to its yeah. parent like well well they they just they both have equal claim to being identical because they're genetically identical well because right? no one mutations. no one really cares because no there's <laughs> nothing anyone's doing that you know depends upon identifying the correct one right yeah <laughs> I, and i would just say there's no fact of the matter about which is identical to the what you would say is they're both daughter cells that are genetically identical and they're produced by this process and that's all the facts of the matter there are there's no further factors to which is like identical and i would say it's the same thing with persons now we don't normally encounter this obviously, because persons don't normally split. But I think that once you think about those possibilities, well, yeah, persons could split. And then you would have two that are psychologically, eventually, once they diverge, there would be two persons that are psychologically continuous with a previous, um, I don't know what you call it, ancestor of some sort, 
Um, maybe we need a new word for it, I suppose. Um, and, but neither would be strictly identical with it, nor would they be identical with each other because identity would not be the correct relation. So I think what Swinburne needs to assume is that there is some sort of identity that grounds this, which he's going to say is a soul, right? Um, but I would just say, well, there's no fact of the matter. And and he he sort of preempts that here in this in this highlight. He says, whether my future life will be happy or painful. So, so by the way, after the operation, he imagines that one of the persons will be like treated like a prince and the other will be tortured, right? So they have very different lives. So then he asks, which life will you have? Like the pre-operation version. Will you have a happy life or a horrible life? Both. <laughs> and then he says, my future life will be ha happy or painful or whether I survive the operation all are clearly factual questions. And then in brackets here, yeah. only someone under the grip of some very strong philosophical dogma would deny that. Come on, bro. Like that. It's such a lame. I mean, come on. It's like, so firstly, dumb. he's, con he's constructed such a, a labored and bizarre hypothetical thought experiment. Right. Um, that he's, he, he's asking us to, to imagine this very weird edge case that, as he conceives himself, might never even be physically possible to perform in reality. And then he's asking us about who um, Dere, so not, not, not he's not just asking us questions about like what would the legal implications be or something specified yeah. like that. He's asking us, what is the actual fact of the matter about who is the person, assuming that it can only be one of them? And then he's saying, you know, only someone under the grip of a very strong philosophical dogma would disagree with me. But this is this is like a really weird philosophical puzzle. So it seems like pretty much anything is on the table in terms of metaphysics for answering this. I mean, philosophers yeah. have all sorts Why is it so unreasonable of... to say there's no fact of the matter about which is identical to you? I, I don't understand why that's so weird. It's a weird scenario. So yeah, the answer sounds a bit weird. It doesn't yeah. normally happen. But I, I just don't understand why it's so unreasonable. Uh, the the yeah. view is that there's a continuity which determines personhood. Is it and more then weird? If that can be split, then yeah, you've got two people who like emerge from the, the first one, just like a bacteria does. I don't see is it the, more the weird with or that. less weird to go with any of the following, right? So the soul attaches to the left person, to the left hemisphere, <laughs> but doesn't attach to the right. And that's the person. Or the soul splits in two. And they're both the, like, what, you know, like, what really, how, how is the soul theory any better, any less weird? Yeah, think. well, he doesn't really explain that. He just kind of says, well, we don't know. But I think the idea is at least you can ground one being identical. And that's what he's Yeah, but, that, wants, but right? that's weird. Isn't that, like, really? Well, yeah, it, it is. Like, but at least you can why say did which the soul one is identical, right? That's like, what is, it seems to matter to him. Is the soul, why is the soul connected to the left hemisphere or the right hemisphere, right, exclusively? And not the other. Like that's weird. Like that's a, there's a <laughs> the weird left soul connected to the left hemisphere, <laughs> the right <laughs> hemisphere. <laughs> soul. It's just a, it's just as much of a reductio, right? For for me at least, uh, as that I can't produce these conditions of identity. And why can't I just create conditions of identity? Why can't they be like socially constructed, dependent upon? what philosophers are doing and what, what the goals of philosophy yeah, are. Yeah, you discussion. can also ground identity. So I don't think there is a fact of the matter, but you could also just ground identity in different ways. Um, I, I think that ultimately those are probably going to be less plausible than some kind of psychological continuity view, which denies identity conditions. Um, and this is sort of Parfit sort of thinks this as well, which I think is sort of plausible, right? But you could ground it in something else, right? You don't have to ground it in a soul. I think I mentioned this in yeah. one of the comments, right? He just sort of thing. ignores this idea. Uh, I think maybe it's later... Um, yeah, yeah, it's on the next page. But also, I'll just okay. comment here that th this issue about identity of a composite is not just a problem for persons. It's a problem for all material, composite material objects. This is a criticism that I gave to Braxton when he presents this argument as an argument for substance dualism is that any type of composite object has this issue. When you change its parts, is it identical to the, like it's changed its parts, right? So what are the identity conditions? It's just the ship of Theseus all over again, right? So it's the same problem here. Which ship is identical to the initial ship of Theseus? Unless you want to say that there are ship souls, souls cannot answer that, that issue, right? And so I don't understand why this is supposedly only a problem for for persons and somehow it's not a problem for other composite objects i think it's a problem in both cases and it's better to have an answer that is applies to both of them and i think a continuity type argument maybe it's not psychological in that case it's a functional continuity or something like that um, gives you a, a um a, an ability to ascribe boundaries to particular objects without necessarily needing to say that there's a fact of the matter about the identity conditions but um it may be one way around this would be to say that you're like uh, basically, this is what Van Inwagen says, right? But Van Inwagen says that there are no composite objects. There are only uh, simples. Um, sorry, there are no composite objects. And the only types of simples that exist are like fundamental particles and persons, because he thinks that he exists as a person, like a, a sort of an identity over, over time. And so you, the only things that you have to worry about this for 
uh, like fundamental particles and then person. So you could go down that road as a way of avoiding like ship of Theseus. But I think no one apart from Van Inwagen <laughs> thinks that. Most people think that there are also other composite objects. And then you need to assess their identity conditions as well. And souls aren't going to work there. So then you need to appeal to something else. Why not just take that and, and apply it to the person's case as well? I think that that's a more parsimonious explanation than having to say souls into the question. I, I'm trying to think of a kind of um, parody argument to kind of illustrate the the point that I want to get at, right? And it's something like, you know, imagine you have a kind of uh, it's Australian dollars, right? In Australia, so you you just use dollars for because the dollar is a more universal currency, um, like like word for currency. If you have like um, a one dollar note and a one hundred dollar note or something, and obviously you know they're different in value. But it's like knowing all of the physical facts. You you know you might you might get away with telling some kind of story where someone knows all all of the facts about the various atoms of the and the chemical composition of the ink dyes and things like that, right? That compose and go. But that's not going to tell you which of these has more value to human societies. Um, yeah, yeah. But the, but the but the point is that which has which has more value to human societies then is based on this story about what people actually do with those types of notes, right? And I think that um, criteria, this is, this is according to my view, of course, criteria of identity are some, could be something similar to that, where what we consider to be criteria of identity is basically dependent upon our various, our linguistic practices, right? And so we accommodate talk of identity to the actual examples that we deal with, and we become familiar with, you know, like correct ways of talking about identity in incorrect ways. Um, maybe lots of these are from mathematics and from other examples. And if there were such cases consistently where persons were being split in such ways and we had to solve problems and use language about identity, we would just come up with some criteria that we would apply. And that would yeah, be yeah. correct. Whatever whatever we did would be the correct criteria, according to my view. It's not like there's some fact of the matter in the world that we would have to like get to the bottom yeah, so of. So, so here in this paragraph here, what what, what Swinburne is saying is that re reflection on this thought of experiment shows that um, whatever happens to your brain and all the material that's in it, uh, we don't know what's happened to like you. And again, I, I don't think it, I think it's a mistake to talk about what we know. I think that what he's going to say is that the fact of the matter about your uh, personhood is not grounded on facts about what happens to your brain or the material of your brain. I, I think it's a grounding question rather than an epistemic question, right? Um, and so, um, so then he concludes from that, that, um, there must be more than the matter of your body. There must be more to you rather as a person than the matter of your body and brain, a further essential immaterial part whose continuing existence makes the brain connected to your body. And, and that's your soul effectively. Now, I think what you're saying is, is similar to what I say in the comment here. Uh, this doesn't follow, right? Because if you want to say that there's, um, we, we have to have an explanation as to what grounds, the identity conditions about which which half is like which version is you and which is not. Um, Swinburne seems to be assuming that those that there are such conditions and that they are intrinsic to the uh, to to you as a as a person. And that's and that's and that's what you're denying, right? And that's sort of what I say here. They could be facts about well, I say the body, like outside of the brain, or about social relations, or about what happens in the future to you. Um, so, so these facts that are external to the matter in your brain could determine the identity conditions of you as a person. Um, and so that's consistent with what Swinburne has said, because basically you could know all the facts about the matter in your brain, but still not know which was the same as, like which was the identical person as before. That's fine. It, we can, the physicalist can appeal to other physical facts that are outside of your brain to ground identity, like social relations, for example, or, your, or, your, or the rest of your body, right? And that's sort of what you're saying, that there are other types of facts that you would appeal to to ground that notion. Exactly. Um, so so okay. he can't just leap from saying that it's not intrinsic to the physical matter of your brain to therefore yeah. it has to be immaterial. It doesn't follow. It, yeah. it, it just has to be some, even if you buy that, which I yeah. don't because I don't buy the identity conditions, but even if you did, all it follows is you have to ground the identity in something external to like yes. the physical matter of the brain. But exactly. there's like all the, all, everything else that you could still appeal to. Right. Exactly. So in my case, I'm just saying like the discourse about identity, right, which would be grounded in. Yeah. And in, there's probably going to be a bunch of social yeah. facts that we sort of would appeal to in sort of justifying a particular conception. Like, well, this is why we use it this way, right? Yeah. So that would ground in virtue of which... What yeah, and they might be, and and I think when I think, you know, like when when you actually specify a particular question, kind of like Swinburne did, right? When he's saying, "Well, which one is going to experience?"
pain, for example, right? Well, I think that probably the way you'd end up, uh, the way I think at least, maybe I'd need, I'd, I'd change dependent on evidence and, and I'd answer a question like that, is I'd say, well, actually part of you will experience pain, right? And part of you won't and we'll have a great life. And so that, that, you know, there I'm committing myself to how I would construct these conditions yeah. of identity. That's I think, that's yeah. another possibility. You could you could just say that. But again, he just sort of, I mean, you scroll down and I, I sort of mentioned this. He just insists that there's a truth of the matter about like whether you're going to experience pain or whether you're going to experience pleasure. And one of you will be identical to like the, the pre-operation you and one will not be. Um, and yeah, he just doesn't address the point that, but what what if that's not how it works? Like what if there's yeah. no identity <laughs> conditions? Or what if like both exactly. of you experience some of it or... Exactly. Other possibilities there, and that, and that's why, and that, but that's why I think it's important to to not ask the like really abstract question about who is me, but instead to ask these like yeah. well specified questions about like you know like who will experience pain or will I experience pain, right? And then you can actually like think about it from how would a medical person who is going to provide this procedure say, well, there's a part of you that's going to experience in this different way that will experience pain, right? And then, and now we can start to try and build our, our metaphysics off of how we answer those well-informed or better better formulated questions would be how I'd yeah, I would. Yeah, the way I would express it is you are uh, following this operation, you'll be split into two persons which will progressively diverge. Right. <laughs> that is counterintuitive, but there's nothing yeah. impossible. It's a weird case. Yeah. yeah, it's weird, but... Why wouldn't it be weird? <laughs> yeah. Okay. So maybe should we skip through this? This. I example? think we've covered all of this now. Uh, hang on. What's the teleological thing? Uh, I find these arguments of an entirely non oh, theological not popular, yeah. kind. Uh, Inescapable. Inescapable. Well, okay. Well, that's just ridiculous language for any argument. Yeah. I think about a highly um, disagreed upon amongst the relevant experts topic, right? You know, yeah, I wouldn't. I mean, I find some arguments quite convincing, but inescapable is a very strong word. I don't think I can well, use that about many arguments. I'd, I'd only say that maybe about some like mathematical proof to something, but then I don't even know. I, I mean, I'd say inescapable just as long as you're concerned and doing maths in the way everyone else does it or something. You know, like maybe you yeah. can just reject that whole thing and become pretty weird. Well, there are certain but, axioms that are like the axiom of choice yeah. that are sort of can be contested, but. Yeah, anyway. Yeah, that's what I like. But but you can get into territory, I think, of rejecting anything. But then I'd be like, well, you do it. It's inescapable, but not in the sense that you can't possibly reject it. Like, just yeah. that. Like, well, I, I would say it's, it, it's certain things may be rationally inescapable. I, I wouldn't really okay. put any sort of yeah. contested philosophical arguments in there. Yes, yeah. I would like, say that may be much more reasonable than not. But inescapable is just so strong. And I just, it, it just maybe it's a red flag to me when I see people say things like that in these sort of, I'm like, well, how I'm, objective I'm very are you trying convinced. to be here? Yeah, I'm very convinced of atheism and materialism, but I would never actually say that about the arguments that they're inescapable. Inescapable, that's yeah, that's things. very strong. Um, okay, so we must postulate a cat soul. Which yeah, so he, like so he, talk, he mentioned this here. Um, he, he says animals also have uh, a souls, so cat souls, for example, and I talked about how this <laughs> more ad hocness, so there's not just one type of soul, but there's a bunch of different types of souls which all adhere to particular types of bodies somehow. I think God's doing mm -hmm. that behind the scenes, you know, the behind the curtain sort of thing. More and, and stuff which, that he's and adding. Are there souls that don't have libertarian free will then as well? Uh, so yeah, like yeah. Where, so he says yeah. this animal cell animals don't have they may have a very limited form of freedom, but not full like libertarian free will. And then so there are so there are like three types of 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 life, right? I guess there's humans who have full libertarian agency. There's animals, I think he says vertebrates, he thinks, have souls and what does the spine freedom. have to do with it? <laughs> Uh, maybe limited freedom, uh, but not full libertarian freedom. And then there are some types of animals, like he mentions beetles and uh, insects or whatever, um, which don't have souls. So I don't know why God makes that yeah. or why it works that way, but okay. It, yeah. why it's just more ad hoc as so far as I'm odd. concerned. Isn't that, there's a book I want to read about like bee intelligence as well. Like insect intelligence is very interesting in the ways that they- Yeah, but they... he's talking about souls and I don't know yeah. how it relates to intelligence. No, well, 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 sorry. Yeah, and I, I'm, I'm speaking loosely there when I say intelligence. I, I'm talking about th these words that I think are poorly defined of um, thought or feeling, right? Where <laughs> what exactly does thought or feeling mean? I mean, I think there might be something, if, if, if it means, if it's meant in the most liberal loose sense of something it's like, you know, I think there might be something it's yeah. like to be um, a bee, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, but I'm not exactly sure. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I don't think we could be uh, very um, confident about this. I, I think that Swinburne might agree with that. I, I think he he mentions like vertebrates as a, as a sort of vague sense of what he thinks, although it's 
unclear what that's based on. Because I mean, at least I would want to try to base any any description on on some sort of scientific understanding of, you know, pain or consciousness or, or intelligence, or whatever else. Um, whereas I don't know that he's basing it on that other than intuition. I, I guess it's hard to say because he doesn't really explain. But anyway, I mean, so I was fine. actually I was slightly offended by um, the omission of. Um, uh the the octopus which i think very yeah, likely right. has a thing that it's like to be even though it's not a vertebrate so i oh yeah it, right, right. Appeals to and species its brain it. is all throughout very its body, sophisticated right? isn't its uh, brain well, like all throughout its body not quite it has a central ner what well, has a central nervous system but it does have um it, it does have kind of like separate i think they're sometimes called brains but the separate um oh, control right, okay. centers i guess for its arms if i recall correctly yeah. but anyway yeah very sophisticated creatures um okay just as I do not wish to deny that brain events cause mental events, I events in the soul and vice versa, uh, so I do not necessarily wish to deny that events in the brain play a role in causing the existence of souls. Um, so is an interactionist dualist. Yeah. But then the question is, how does that work? Um, ah, well, guess what comes to the rescue? <laughs> it's it's yeah. your favorite. Uh, your your favorite um, infinite degrees of freedom postulate. Um, <laughs> Yeah, well, not just that. I'm just. I'm not sure where he mentions it. Well, we'll see. It, it, it comes up. It's events yeah. in this particular brain which cause events. Oh, yeah, and this is another thing as well. Um, events in this particular brain cause events in this particular soul. Why? Why not millions of souls to one yeah, brain? Yeah. What, what's this called? It's like the attachment uh, problem. The pa pairing problem. Pairing problem. That's the one. because yeah, it's yeah. it's e because it's easy to understand. You know why there's like a one-to-one -one mapping when there are spatial relations involved, but there aren't in the case of these souls, and so. It becomes very, very, you know, odd to understand why there's this one-to-one -one kind of attachment um, to to one brain, to one soul in particular, or why it isn't just one soul that is connected to all brains and has like dissociated schizophrenic processing or whatever. I don't know. Um, I guess God wanted to do it that way, right? <laughs> you know, like a kind of a kind of dualism Brahman thing, right? Where it's like God, <laughs> God dissociated or something. Events in this particular soul which cause events in this particular brain. This is what the connection between the brain and the soul amounts to. Well, that's just saying it is like that, right? But, I mean, why think that rather than something else? I, mean, I think he's probably going to say that it's part of God's sustaining process that he sustains this connection. Right, but I'm, I'm I mean, saying I think why, think it, why think it's like that rather than postulate this, like, one soul that's connected or, like, different souls at different points in people's lives or, like, what, why, you know, like... Like, I don't feel like I'm the same person I was as a teenager. So why didn't I have like a teenage soul then that then left and I got like an adult soul as I matured or something and it's like a different person. I mean, that's one way of speculating about what's going on, I guess. And how does he rule that out as opposed yeah, to... Yeah, he doesn't talk about it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, the reluctance yeah, so he talks so many... a bit about, sorry, the types of animals yeah. that he thinks feel pain and so forth. I guess we already kind of discussed that. Yeah. 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 Here it is. Um, sorry. If you just scroll Where back a bit, because you were kind of asking about this 79 on the document. Um, uh, here? Yeah. Yeah. So my view is that all vertebrates have a mental life uh, because they all have a brain similar to the human brain. Uh, which we know causes mental life in us, blah, blah, blah. Dogs and birds and fish all feel pain, but there's no reason to attribute mental life to viruses and bacteria, nor in my view to ants and beetles. They do not have the kind of brain we do, nor do we attribute the feelings to them. Yeah, See, this right. is very strange, right? Because <laughs> because if God wanted to give them experience, why couldn't he? Like, they don't need that brain, right? I mean, I, yeah, I, I yeah. guess they could have a brain that, that helps, but, but God doesn't need them to do that. So I don't know why yeah. he would... I guess maybe he's going to say, look, God is going to be consistent. And if he wants humans to have a brain that is plays a big role, then he's going to do that consistently for other animals as well. So that means if they don't have that type of brain, then they're not going to have that type of experience. Feels a bit ad hoc to me, but maybe that's what he'd say. Also, isn't it a good to be an experiencing thing? So wouldn't God have reason to create well, things? Well, yeah, I mean, work yeah, you would think so, right? Isn't, isn't happy beetles better than like zombie beetles? <laughs> you would think. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, it follows that at some one particular moment, blah, 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 um, we've had that. Yeah, so just read out this paragraph. This is an interesting one. The reluctance of so many philosophers and scientists to admit that at a particular moment of evolutionary history, there came into existence connected to animal bodies, souls with mental properties, seems to me to be due in part to the fact that if such a thing happened, they are utterly lost for an explanation how it came to happen. Nature did it, bro. Um, but it is highly irrational to say that something is not there just because you cannot explain how it came to be there. 
we should accept the evident fact that if we cannot explain it, we must just be humble and acknowledge that we are not omniscient. But I am going on. I, I'm going on to suggest that although there cannot be an inanimate explanation of the of the kind characteristic of the natural sciences of the occurrence of souls and their mental life, the theist does have an explanation, which is, well, hopefully we get there. <laughs> <laughs> you could probably guess what it's going to be. What I say is, I think this is nonsense, right? So it is completely rational to say that. Um, if you cannot explain how something came to be or, or could exist, that that's a reason to be skeptical or, or a reason to doubt that it does in fact exist or is there. Well, Obviously, that's, that's what he does with logically defeasible. impossible things. He does that with logically impossible <laughs> that's things. That's a good point, right? yes. Yeah. That's defeasible, obviously. If you have overwhelming evidence that it does exist despite the fact that you can't explain it, well, then that overcomes it. But I think that it's completely reasonable to appeal to uh, the seeming impossibility of something or the inability to account for it um, as a reason to uh, to be suspicious of it. I mean... Isn't that just why if someone randomly said to you, uh, or even someone you knew moderately well, they said to you, oh, um, someone I knew just came back from the dead, or I don't know, I took a pill and and grew an extra arm or something. You'd be like, I don't believe that because <laughs> there's no way to explain that. Uh, to, uh, no, There's no way to explain it actually happening. There's other ways to explain the reports, right? And that's what you do. You, you explain the reports or the apparent evidence for it in different ways that don't require the phenomena actually existing because you think that it's so implausible that the phenomena could actually exist. Unless you have as sort of Hume says, you sort of reject the greater miracle, right? So until the evidence becomes so overwhelming that you cannot explain it away without appealing to the phenomena, um, you'll find other ways to explain the apparent evidence that don't require the phenomena being real. Um, and that's entirely reasonable. It's all about background knowledge and prior plausibility based on what you think, right? I, I just, I mean, we do this in science all the time. If you get like, for, <laughs> if we uh, conduct an experiment which shows that telepathy is real or homeopathy works, we don't just say, well, we can't explain it, but it must be true because the experiment showed that. We're like, well, maybe there was a bias in the experiment or you got lucky or you did p-hacking or like, you know, we, we, uh, we, we come up with other explanations because we think that the phenomena is so implausible. And what we would require to overcome that implausibility is a very, very high standard of evidence. Uh, which we don't have. But this idea that you're basically just saying the prior plausibility or the background knowledge of, of the mechanisms or, or the, the, me the methods by which something could occur is irrelevant to assessing uh, whether you believe it or not. And I just think that's entirely wrong. I don't know why he says that. It just seems clear to me that that isn't how science works. It's not how everyday life works. If someone makes an absurd claim, you don't just believe them because like, well, just because I don't know how it could have happened doesn't mean that it can't have. Yeah. I guess maybe he thinks he's warranted as well in saying that there are souls, right, given the sort of argument that he's just offered. But presumably, um, you know, the people who disagree with him don't think that there are such things that need to be explained, not because they can't explain them, right, but because they disagree with the arguments that he's offered or... Yeah, but I think he's trying to say, I think he's trying to avoid the criticism that, well, yeah, but this idea of souls just coming into being at some point and attaching yeah, themselves, yeah. Can't, we can't explain that. There's no mechanism. And he's basically saying, no, oh, it doesn't matter. Like, yeah, no, it kind yeah. of matters. <laughs> yeah, it does, it does Why doesn't it matter? It matters in everywhere else in science or in other types of explanations as well. Yeah, yeah. So so maybe this would be like, uh, it, what, what this might be like is saying, um, okay, all planets are perfectly, all, all heavenly bodies are perfectly spherical. And then when someone looks through like, um, so, you know, there are people like looking through telescopes and seeing things that are various different shapes that are non-spherical, have craters and things, and just saying, well, look, they are spherical, but just because you can't explain why you see those things as non-spherical when you look through, just because you can't explain that, right, doesn't mean that you can rule out my hypothesis that they are, in fact, all spherical. I mean, there's tons of ways I could, I could, I could get away with that. Like, um, I could have completely transparent bits that you know make them spherical and you just see the you see the shapes is wrong because you, you can do something like that right yeah um so what's his preferred explanation then well i think i, I think why does the formation the of a brain of complexity as great or greater than that of a certain animal give rise to consciousness that is to a soul with mental states yeah, also that's his that, question here it seems like that talk of giving rise to, I mean, I object to this talk from naturalists because I think it's misleading, but um, I, th I think it can create like a misleading metaphor, right? But I think he should object to it because he doesn't think that it gives rise to a soul. He thinks the soul like is attached from somewhere else, right? He doesn't yeah. think it's like, because so, that, that makes you think it's kind of like dependent in some sense, right? Sort of like the steam coming out of an engine or something. Isn't it? Well, he thinks the brain and the soul interact. So I, it seems that he thinks you need a certain type of brain to like sustain a certain type of soul. Well, it's unclear right. why, because God could 
wouldn't require that, right? But maybe he just likes to do it that way, I, I guess. Well, perhaps you require it to interact, but I don't think on Swinburne's view, there's any kind of dependence between the soul and the brain in order, in, in terms of like for the soul to exist. There has to yeah, be, he's not clear about it, that. He's not clear about that, actually. I don't know. I don't know what the status of the soul is. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. For it to function properly, there might have to be a brain. Theists don't need to explain it. these things. They're just hand wave. And it's like, oh, God. Yeah. It's only naturalists who need to actually give detailed explanations, it seems. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, hang on. I, I think I think we kind of skipped something important there. Okay. Uh, but, um, oh, oh, what was it? So that's his question. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he just sort of. Oh, yeah, sorry. I was going to say, in, in terms of giving rise to consciousness, yes, I, I I don't like that language either, because it seems to imply that consciousness is like something else outside of the brain state, which kind of appears mysteriously. Um, and I don't know that it... it I don't think it's, um, it's assuming epiphenomenalism, but it's language that fits epiphenomenalism very well. Right. Like epiphenomenalism being the idea that the brain causes consciousness, but consciousness yeah. doesn't do anything there. It just kind of hangs around as something separate and yes, and exactly. kind of weird. Um, and and that's often, I mean, there are epiphenomenalists, but that's often considered rather unsatisfying because of, of this sort of, it's just hanging around, not doing anything created. Like that. Yeah. that's, I, I, I don't know that he's literally saying that that entails it, but I think that if you have other views about the relationship between mind and brain or consciousness and the brain, you're not going to say the brain gives rise to consciousness as such. Uh, that there's different language that you would use. Um, anyway, that's not necessarily crucial, but it, you've got to be careful I think, about. I think how it's important. Intuitions here. I think people often ask this question, like, how does physical stuff give rise to consciousness? And when they frame yeah. the question that way, they've got like a picture almost in their head of like a black box, right? And then this thing called consciousness, which exists separately. And then any... well, I imagine it is a gas that they think is like exuded in certain brain states. It's just like the gas or. <laughs> That, that feels then, like how they're talking about it to me. Where's this coming from? Where's the... <laughs> because then any any kind of uh, any kind of a explanation in order to be... This comes back to like the cognitively satisfying expectation for an explanation to that question, right? Is like something that fills in that black box of what's producing this extra thing. Yeah. But if that's, if that's a kind of mislabel... A, a, a misapprehended question in the first place, because some other theory is true when there are alternative theories that don't think about it in this pro production way... Well, then you're just going to be stuck with that question if you're wrong, right? Because you're not going to accept other theories which are on the table and potentially explain it because you've accepted this kind of misframed way of thinking about the problem in the first place. So yeah, there's a lot of discussion about this, about the, the idea of reduction and how to understand the relation. But I, I think it's best understood through uh, uh, comparisons to other things. Like you wouldn't say, for example, that the kinetic energy, uh, you, you wouldn't ask, how does the average kinetic energy right. of, say, Produce. Gas <laughs> give rise to temperature? Often you would understand that as an identity relation, although not necessarily, but I think that's common to understand that as an identity. Now, there's other examples, like, for example, how does the motion of air particles in the atmosphere give rise to weather? Now, that's the sort of thing that you might say, but at the same time, you wouldn't think of weather as something existing somehow separate from or outside of yeah, the motion yeah. of the of the gas particles. It's yeah. a type of behavior that they they have. And so you might explain that in terms of a grounding relation, um, that the, the um, or reduction relation, that the weather phenomenon in the atmosphere is grounded in or reduced to the motions of particles in the atmosphere. And that, that's how I would say is the relationship, what I would say is the relationship between mind and brain, that the mind is, um, uh, that the mind is reducible to and explainable in terms of uh, the underlying grounding, which is the, um, the, the physical state. And so technically that's a type of token identity theory, but not a type identity right. theory if you want to get nerdy about it. But, um, but the point is that you have, to, you do have to be careful about the language there because it is easy to get, get confused here and think that things yeah. are kind of separate when, when they're not. Um, yeah. But yeah, it, the discussion is even philosophers sort of push the debate this back and forth. But because well, um, of the framing of the questions often. Yeah. Right? That, I think people exactly. It, it makes it hard. Yeah. yeah. Now, yeah. coming to us, <laughs> I'm a bit rude. <laughs> he just says the darndest thing sometimes. So he's going to say that um, in order for science to postulate laws, we need some sort of measurable things, um, like uh, quantities that you can measure. And then he says, but uh, but that, so what's he saying? What's that here? Like a general formula and laws he's talking about. Laws can only hold uh, if mass can be measured on a scale, for example, grams or pounds, and likewise with velocity. Um, and then he says... Um, a little bit down here, but thoughts do not differ from each other along measurable scales. One thought does not have twice as much of some sort of meaning as another one. A desire for roast, I'm skipping down, a desire for roast beef is not distinguished from a desire for chocolate by having twice as much of something. And then Ooh, he's going to sort of the, kind of question because right? you, you can ask people. Hang on. <laughs> the conclusion from this is that, therefore, that there's no physical laws that determine like 
thoughts or uh, that's sufficient for like consciousness and things like that. Okay, go ahead. I was just going to say, see, it just seems uh, obvious to me that you can, I, I mean, at least in my experience, right, I have stronger desires for chocolate than I do for like brown rice, for example. And, uh, you know, I could describe the, I, I could like quantify my experience or, you know, in like, in like mental health questionnaires and things, it's very frequent to ask people to well, put yeah, I've, the intensity I've noted that here as well. <laughs> Oh, okay, you can sorry. absolutely quantify <laughs> psychological concepts. That's in fact what you could say. That's my job in some sense. Yeah, right. Because I, I work on quantifying concepts. It's, it's certainly not easy. But he's claiming that it, it, there is no fact of the matter about this. But just starting at the top here, the idea that you can kind of only describe laws of nature if if you can if put them on scales. Mass, <laughs> that mass can be measured on a scale. That, that's just not how science freaking works. Like most scientific laws are not even quantitative in that way. Uh, unless you think that the only true like scientific laws are the fundamental laws of physics, which uh, some people might say, but I wouldn't expect Swinburne to say that. M most scientific laws are laws in the special sciences, which is basically everything but fundamental physics. And, and, and many of those are not quantifiable or not at least rigorously quantifiable in, in the same way that that like mass and, and charge are um and and so the notion that you need to have that sort of quantif simple quantification to do science or to have scientific laws is i think just nonsense he doesn't explain why that why you should think that um the fact that some scientific laws are like that doesn't imply that all need to be furthermore psychologists can absolutely quantify many aspects of belief and desire and so forth and sure we're still fairly crude but it's still early days right i think that there's no reason to think that these sort of things aren't quantifiable and furthermore the idea that uh, this is so dumb like a desire for roast beef is not distinguished from a different desire by having twice as much of something it, Okay, yes, maybe there's not twice as much as one thing, but why does it have to be twice as much of just one thing? Like a hur I say a hurricane is not distinguished from a tornado by having twice as much, twice as much of something. Like what, what the hell is this? Like a rooster is not distinguished from a turtle by having twice as much of something. But that doesn't mean there isn't a difference that's grounded in physical differences. It just means it's more complicated than one thing. Like uh, how dumb can a point be? This is the, the silliest thing. All you need is there to be facts of the matter that distinguishes well, one thought from another based on the physical substrate. It doesn't have to be one one thing that's double well i think that this is because swinburne's thinking of thoughts as these just like pure internal samples right and it's like well there's one thought and there's another thought and there's one thing that changes in the one yeah, case which is it's bigger. chocolate and the one case <laughs> yeah in the one case it's chocolate and in the other case it's roast beef that's the thing that changes but they're the same like size or something like that but i think it's the, it's this misleading view of there being this internal world of like samples and that's how thoughts work that is perhaps intuitive but i think i think it's just too loose to draw any conclusions the more i read about things like this like swinburne and other apologists the more it seems that some of them at least they, they they haven't progressed much in science the way they think about science from the 17th century they still think that science is all about describing mathematical relationships of billiard balls hitting each other yeah, and that's yeah. all that it is and that's what the physicalist thinks and yeah i mean if if, if that's what you think physicalism is then it is a pretty ridiculous world view of this but like who the hell thinks that anymore like we've moved on from that there's so many other things going on i, I just yeah like your thoughts aren't like different sized billiard balls hitting each other that one is like twice the size <laughs> yeah. of the other what what the What's, but if I'm thinking of the chocolate, where is the chocolate in my brain? <laughs> like, I, I feel like this is a straw man, but he's literally saying this. Like, what? Well, it's yeah. such a stupid argument. It was the 90s, James. So maybe we can, uh, we can cut him some. <laughs> the some 1690s, maybe. Like, <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I, it's such a, a silly argument there. Um, okay. But, Having a soul so, is all or nothing. Yes, this, this is what I was saying before. Extreme. Okay, I guess the creature either does or doesn't have a soul. Though it's it does seem kind of like it could be described as being degreed in the way he's sort of talked about different types of well, souls. Well, there are kinds, but they're yeah. not degreed. And that's you, yeah, you either have one distinct, or you don't. Right? Yeah. 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 Which means um, that there was, it follows that there was a first yeah, creature right. of a certain type that had yeah. a specific type of soul. I suppose there could have been multiple firsts, but at the very least, there were two otherwise indistinguishable, barely distinguishable ones. One that had a soul and one that didn't. And at what point that's, that's an interesting own... view to have. Let me just put it that way. But another interesting question, not just about the evolution thing, is in its own development, at what point does it become ensouled, right? So is it like at some particular yes. fetal stage or whatever? And like why does that happen as well? Because well, it's the, gonna be if God, the soul Well, yeah, because the soul isn't um dependent upon it. If the soul isn't dependent upon anything physical, then you can't appeal to facts about the development of the organism to marry it to the soul. Yeah. So uh, why does God put souls in particular creatures at particular times evolutionarily and in terms of development? Why not slightly earlier or slightly later or a different type of soul? 
none of these are going to have explanations, right? They're all just going to be brute facts, more brute facts for everyone. Yeah, yeah. And then he has the goal to say that the physicalist is going to, is not going to be able to explain any type of soul or brain <laughs> or like mind-brain connection, merely a list of inexplicable causal connections. But that's literally what his view is. There's all these inexplicable yeah. causal connections that are maintained by God, but no explanations to why. He just does it that way. Yeah. Yeah, like, and, and why does God choose to do it at that point in evolution or then or what? Yeah, it, yeah. He just, it just does. Um, all of the reductions of one science to yeah. another and integration. Uh, hang on, so yeah. where are we at here? 85 on the page. 96 in the PDF. Yeah, so I'm trying to... Why is he talking about this? Uh, secondary co qualities. No, he, I think he's just saying... For that. So the history of science is punctuated with many reductions of one branch of science to another. And I think he's, he's saying that yeah, does not science surprise us with new discoveries? So maybe he's, I think he's, what he's trying to say here is that, well, maybe we could have a reduction of like yeah, uh, psychology to theoretically reducible. Yeah, I think he's trying to say yeah, that yeah. the theories aren't reducible to one another for Yeah, reasons. that there's an in-principle difference here. So let's see what his, what but, his but then I, th I think it's going to be this, because so I've got to midway on 96 in the PDF and he said, the felt hotness is qualitatively distinct from particle velocities and collisions. So this is, you know, the billiard balls hitting each other, I think. Um, yeah, so the felt hotness would be a secondary quality, which I think he mentions. And that's really a, a qualia, right? Uh, he talks about this a bit more later, but I'm not actually sure how that... Like felt hotness. That's Felt hotness isn't temperature in the way that scientists understand. And I think that's the point he's making here. Particle velocities and... Well, particle velocities right, is, right. is temperature. Yeah, because temperature is... Our yeah, perception yeah, of felt hotness is not temperature, right? Yes. That's a different thing. Right. The reduction to statistical mechanics was achieved by distinguishing between the underlying cause of the hotness, the motion of the molecules, and the sensations. So, so there is obviously a connection between what's going on in the sciences and our experience of the hotness. But I think that that's because in physics, right, we have got an operational definition of heat based off of based in our experiences, of course, initially, and um, which is basically, you know, the temperature is. Uh, well, I'm talking about physics at a particular point. It's obviously different in modern physics. Temperature being, you know, what moves this particular measuring instrument in this way by this amount, right? That's what it gets defined as, um, which is then not exactly the same thing as being having this direct mapping to the qualia, though you can sort of like make that inference, I suppose. Um, well, he says that at the end here, the reduction was achieved at the price of siphoning off the felt hotness from its causes and only explaining the latter. So what he seems to be saying here is that initially we started with this essentially qualitative notion of temperature as like felt hotness. And what we yeah. did is we explained that ultimately in terms of like uh, the velocity of particles. But he he uh, describes that as a siphoning off of the secondary quality of it, like what it feels like. And all we explained, in fact, was the uh, was the cause of that. But we didn't actually explain temperature per se, like all that felt hotness per se. Well, so that's a different that question. This, yeah. Well, that's what I would say. <laughs> felt <but>. hotness. <laughs> well, that's what I would say. But in terms of what he says here, bringing that together, all other reductions of one science to another and integrations of separate sciences dealing with apparently different from another have been achieved by this device of denying that the apparent properties, so secondary qualities of color, heat, taste, and sound and so forth, that one science dealt with belong to the physical world at all. It siphoned them off to the world of the mental. So it separated them by explaining the physical causes of them, but not actually dealing with the secondary quality itself. That's his claim right. there. But then you come to face the problem so, of well, the mental. Hang on, but I, I think that, so. First of all, he loves making these claims like all reductions are like this. When he gives like two examples, <laughs> he's done this yeah. before. But anyway, I say this is wrong, right? So reduction of like I give an example: a reduction of biological properties, or like genetic properties and metabolism, to biochemistry yeah, was right. achieved was not achieved by making anything part it's of the mental world. That there's no secondary yeah. qualities there that are relevant. So I just think he's well, wrong. Well, hang on. <laughs> I think I think he is wrong and you're and you're correct. But I think what he can there's a weasel out of this, right? He's gonna say, Well, look, people are making observations and feeling things and do it. So that you know, the person who's making this line of argument, it's always gonna be available to them to appeal to the fact that we have to have some first person experience yeah. to be engaging in any of the activities that we typically call the sciences. Um, That's true. But how does that work with a siphoning off argument? Because what he seems to be saying about temperature is that there was a secondary quality component of it that's yeah. not explained by science. Only the physical yeah. cause of it is siphoned off. But how does that apply to like metabolism and it's explained right. by chemistry? What's the secondary well, think... quality there? It doesn't seem... Yeah, yeah Obviously, we need to have it... uh, perceptual access to it, but... 
Well, it depends. It's like it a depends. concept that seems to have a secondary quality associated with it, like felt hotness does with temperature. Well, it depends on my view what he's going to go on to like diagnose as the problem, right? Because, um, I well, mean, well, that's the, in the next thing in the I case have highlighted of, on the next page. Yeah, because I was going to say in the in the case of like if you're asking what is felt temperature, that's just a separate question to me than you know what is the relationship between molecules and the thermometer moving up and down or whatever right like like these yeah. are just different questions that have different answers felt temperature is yeah, pretty a much phenomenon I think it's just equivocating human. essentially yeah um and, and so okay. the reason he's talking about this is what i have highlighted here the evidence from the history of science well two examples which i don't think are exhaustive but shows that the way to achieve integration between the sciences is to ignore the mental so ignore the felt hotness of temperature, only explain the causal well, It just depends on the questions, factor. right? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's just, a different question. <laughs> <laughs> the questions become operationally defined. So it's kind of like, yeah. you know, it, it, it's no longer prudent to say, how hot do you feel if you're like using some kind of temperature gauge to somehow measure the surface temperature of the sun or something, right? It's not like... Yeah. And by the way, there, there is a branch of science that studies the relationships between objective quantities like lightness... Like, like brightness of lights and and temperature and and um, weight and other things like that and the perceived intensity of a stimulus is called psychophysics. Uh, sorry, um, is that right? Yeah, psychophysics. Uh, got confused for a second. Um, and and it, it does this. It, it, it you haven't heard? Yeah. Well, I mean, the experiments are a little boring, right? Because they just give you like different stimuli and they say like, when is the light twice as bright? Or, or and okay. then they just keep going, right? And and they map out like the curves that uh, uh, the psych psychometric curves between the objective stimuli and the perceived stimulus, and they're quite consistent across people, not one hundred percent, of course. But this is not ignoring the mental. <laughs> this is precisely reducing aspects of the mental to to the perceptions. And, and then when you can look at that in terms of like the uh, the, the nerves that are, that are, and and the trans the transducer. And the, and the nerves that are sending those impulses to the brain and the parts of the brain that process that. We don't have a full understanding of that, but there's no ignoring the mental here. It's all fitting together in a picture that's gradually more integrated and developed as we go on. So I don't know what he's talking about. He just seems to be saying that to explain temperature, you have to explain the, the perception of it. Well, no, it's a different question. And then we do study the perception of it. It's called psychophysics. So what like what are you talking about? So I, th I think he, he is correct that um, I think our, our maybe use of words like temperature sort of grows to expand more it becomes more precise just as we as yeah. our understanding because, develops we, we and, apply it in more specific ways yeah and, that, and that's tied into our practice of science and how that grows and the kind of instruments that we develop and so forth but what i don't think isn't the case what sorry what i don't think is the case is that temperature ever just becomes like um you know like essentially a cognate of color or something like that right and then it's like we're always sort of tracking the same thing that we mean by felt experience such that if it was possible for me to um put my hand on things that science says are hot you know according to the operational definition in science which might be slightly different from my ordinary use well then i would experience them as hot and there's this kind of mapping right and so they do all it does all link up in that way and then there might just be these more precise operational definitions given a more precise technical question that might be asked by a science. Yes, exactly. So it changes, science ch does change our usage of terms, and I think appropriately so. Um, but what it doesn't do is ignore the mental. <laughs> it just helps us to understand the relationships between the physical and the mental. And different science, branches of science will, you know, uh, approach, diff will ask different questions and approach that differently. I just, I just don't, don't get it all. Like, yeah, psych you're talking about psychophysics. Like, I don't know. You're saying absolute zero is zero Kelvin, but what does that feel like? I want to put my hand on it. Like, <laughs> well, good luck with that. <laughs> what is the felt hotness of absolute zero? Um, Actually, very cold temperatures can often feel hot, which is which is a funny thing. Like, they, yeah, they right, feel like right. a burning. It's yeah. interesting. And there are interesting phenomena, I think, with pressure as well. Um, you know, like where where our nerves begin to like dampen the the um, you know the. Ha ha how much they're kind of propagating stimulus yes, we, over time. We, we sense it, changes yeah. for certain things a lot better than absolute level. So that so it's um it's sort of um uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It's kind of uh, d diminishes over time, and then if you change right. it, there will be noticed more. So there's a lot of these interesting different things that are in fact investigated and are not ignored. Yeah, <laughs> ignore the mental arc. Just anyway, <laughs> let, let's keep going. Okay, so Darwinian know, theory a, might be able scientist, to show. You know, that upsets me. Darwinian theory might be able to show that conscious organisms have some advantage in the struggle for survival of a non-conscious orgasm. Or orgasm. 
<laughs> a non-conscious <laughs> orgasm. Oof. Now that's an interesting <laughs> thought. <laughs> non- <Or> non-conscious <laughs> organisms programmed to react to their environment in similar ways. It's difficult to see what that could be, um, but maybe there is an advantage. So firstly, this is actually an interesting question in evolutionary science, right, about yeah. what exactly is the adaptive um the adapted adaptive advantage that consciousness actually aims and there are various um attempts at creating like evolutionary explanations that do actually provide an answer to this right about what what exactly it is that's adaptive about maybe being able to like internally represent one's environment or to, yeah, to yeah. think about it in various ways and stuff and remember we need to be careful here because if you think about consciousness as epiphenomenal um it, it's pro- it's, it doesn't have a function and so it won't yes, okay. be adaptable, yeah, which is yeah. one big argument against it. But you shouldn't think of it that way. You shouldn't think of it somehow. Well, I don't think one should think of it that way as a physicalist. You should think of it as um, having, uh, as in some way being grounded in or identical to or, or something like that, yeah. um, some type of brain state. Um, so I, I like to think of consciousness in terms of as um, having a, represented, a representational function. It represents certain um, external states or, or even internal states, right. Um, in a kind of a first person way. So to be conscious of something is just to, to kind of be conscious of the, uh, is to experience from a, um, from your point of view, like as a certain physical system, a certain representation of a pain or an external stimuli or whatever. Um, so there's no, it's not like, I mean, it, it comes down to arguments about P zombies. It's like, well, couldn't you have the representation without the qualia? And the, the physicalist is generally going to say, no, no, it's metaphysically necessary that they go together. Um, you know, it's like you can't have, um, I don't know, you can't have a neck and a head without like having a chin. It's like, it's, yeah. just, it's part and parcel. They go together. It's probably not the greatest example, but yeah. you, you get the idea. And you get, um, um, and you get like the evolutionary arguments against naturalism coming in as well. But then that, you know, that's an attempt to fully divorce the two again, where there's a kind of like representation, right? That, that doesn't actually represent what's going on in the world. Yeah, evolutionary arguments against naturalism typically try to say that there's no necessary connection between, or uh, sometimes they say there's no, uh, epistemically, there could be no relationship. As far as we know, there could be no relationship between like brain states and uh, mental states. And there's the fact that there's a congruence is somehow something you need to explain or it's unexpected under naturalism, which I just think is nonsense. Uh, But anyway, we could, that's another, that's another topic. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so what's uh, Swinburne driving at here? Animals with beliefs are more likely to survive if their beliefs are largely true. Yeah, I I think that's actually kind of fine. Um, So I don't have much issue to talk about there. Again, I I think this this section could have been cut because I don't know why he's talking about Darwinism so much. I don't know that anything really hinges on this. I I think it's because of the fear within theism, probably in the apologetic purpose, but that's me uh, psychologizing. Oh yeah. I found this weird when he talked about male thoughts and female thoughts as well. I wonder if Swinburne would ever would be, would commit himself ever to like there be to like trans a male thought. Yeah, I mean, not a thought that you are a male. I don't think that's what he means, but no, no, I don't think so. It's like, um, you know, like I'm going to do some investment banking instead of selling (laughs) something. (laughs) But this is we've lived for And this is this is what I wondered about. And I did think I wonder if Swinburne would actually if this would end up committing Swinburne to some kind of like trans essentialism, where trans people could genuinely claim that they had like female souls attached to like male bodies or something. Wow, the metaphysics of transgender is yeah, difficult, <laughs> I think, and I have issues there. But I mean, he he now does he say this here? Yeah, he says this that, that this is yeah. gender is like an intrinsic part of your yeah of your soul yeah connected to a male brain i i begin to have male thoughts now that's now that's an interesting thought right so how far does that go oh, the like male connected brain. to a connected to a white male brain? brain i have white oh thoughts. like no. is that you know like <laughs> like there's just how far do you go with that like it's, but there's I'm an extra i'm not saying he's committed to that but i mean I, what, yeah, yeah what is he committed to like that doesn't seem upper class upper class brain <laughs> yeah like yeah. i don't know i don't know what the constraint is there like it's one thing to say that I mean, obviously, if there are differences between types of people, then there's differences in their brains. I would think that that even the jewelers kind of agrees with that, right? Um, yeah. And but then there's the further question about, well, if you think they have souls, does that mean that there's some fundamental intrinsic difference in their souls? And I think that yeah. becomes quite problematic if you hold that view. But well, I, I think I misspoke. He... I think he's saying souls are agendered, and the gender of the brain it's connected <sighs> to is in fact what dictates the type of gendered thoughts it begins to have. However, I wonder if he would commit himself to there being female brains 
in male bodies and then that can like misgender the soul uh, uh, in a body that would present yeah he, I, the male thoughts thing is weird i just like what types of yeah. thoughts are there and what does that mean <laughs> even but like, whatever he, i begin to but, have male but, thoughts <laughs> but but that has no relevance to the question of why the eye of unformed character was fitted to a male rather than a female brain here science simply stops what is he talking about here like what question <laughs> i don't i what, 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 when I think I, it doesn't have any gender, right? And maybe maybe for some people, when they think I, it does come with some sort of gender. But I don't know. It's just like a word. I, it's like a, re a reflexive but way does, I can refer to it. Does he have an answer to this question? I'm not sure I understand what the question is. But like, why was the I, without a soul attached to it, fitted to a male rather than a female brain? Here he says science has no answer. Well, I kind of agree because there's no souls. So I can address that. But um, like, what's his answer? But he doesn't seem to well, have one. He just starts talking about something else. Well, I, okay, again, well, I he does say fears can provide an explanation, but he doesn't directly. He starts talking about something else. Yeah, and I and I think again, you know, like sort of sociological, sociologically inclined views of gender and the way that people represent themselves, right? Given the binary of like male, female, um, has a lot of explanatory power here, right? Because it can it can talk yeah. about exactly why it is that people represent themselves as particular genders to themselves, and it can also include like trans people in the explanation as well, why why they might have um, different representations that don't match up with their biological sex and things like that. Whereas yeah. you're going to have trouble including those data points, I think, given the sort of god matching souls to brains views. Um, so there's that. Okay, but how how does he think? Oh, hang on, I scroll back too far. So, okay. so he thinks that. Where do you want? So, sorry, uh, I just want to try to summarize. Which page are you on? Sorry, just so I can put the viewport to the correct one. Well, we should be on ninety, I think, because we're on. Okay, the start of explanation, 90? but yeah, that's right. Uh, I just yeah. wanted to clarify what the because the previous section was quite long, so I think I kind of lost the train of thought that he was. So he's just saying basically that there, there are souls. <laughs> there can't be a scientific explanation of uh, souls. I think the question is, why does the formation of a brain that has complexity that we have give rise to consciousness? I think that's the question. So why consciousness yeah. if we're just brains? And, science and personal identity. That. Yeah, so it's personal identity and it's like, you know... They, Conscious they're... experience itself because knowledge argument and... Yeah, uh... and there's thoughts that can't be twice as big as other thoughts and so that doesn't work in the physicalism, <laughs> you know, that sort of thing. And there's something about Darwinism that I didn't fully understand how that connected. Anyway, so that's what we've just well, I think I think he's just saying that you might be kind of tempted as a materialist to say that evolution explains it, but here's how it doesn't. I think it's like a... Yeah, well, he says it partly explains things, but then there's other things that, yeah, I, I think yeah. we can just leave that. But anyway, so... Now he's going to say, here's how theism explains it. Um, okay, so um, so we've got souls. And he okay, says, God does it because he has good reasons. Okay, yeah, he ma uh. God makes the souls and chooses which brain each soul is put in. So when the fetal brain events acquire, require a soul to be connected, hang on, each soul is to be connected when fetal brain events require a soul to be connected to the brain, whatever that means. Fetal brain events require a soul to be connected to the brain. What? What do they mean require it? Well, what would happen if God didn't put the soul in? <laughs> require it. It's like you know, he, he can do this. soul needed. Insert soul here. <laughs> he can do this by causing molecules when formed into brains to have powers to produce mental events in souls to which they are connected. What does the connection consist in? Is it like God I mean, watching? Have to and then explain any of this. This is just all hand waving. When the physicalists try to explain things like this, which they probably shouldn't, right? Um, they're accused of, oh, you can't justify that. What's the scientific evidence for it? There's no evidence for this. But then we get God causes molecules in brains to have powers to produce mental events in <laughs> souls to which they're like, what the hell? Where's the evidence for any of that? <laughs> this is literally, you know, like the parody of metaphysics where um, it's like, <laughs> Well, why does the medicine put you to sleep? Well, it's got a dormitive virtue, right? It's, it's like, why God does the brain conscious? molecules in your brain, that is that should be detectable, by the way, at least in principle. Now, you can yeah, always say true. it's not detectable given current science, but this is a falsifiable claim, which I kind of like. Um, and um, that, that's Giving them new causal powers, but they're, but they're special causal powers, James, because they're not physical causal powers, they're mental causal well, powers. But, so. but he says he causes molecules in the physical brain to have the powers necessary to like link up to the soul, essentially. Yeah, yeah but that's non-physical, you see, so it's completely unfalsified. <laughs> How are you, what are you going to measure the change of? <laughs> the molecules, right? <laughs> no, no, because anyway. you can't, because it's not a physical change in the molecules. It's a non-physical molecule. It's a non-physical change in the molecules. It's like when the bread turns into the body of Jesus, right? The bread, well, it just looks yeah. and appears exactly the same. But it has, in, a, in an important metaphysical sense, changed. And that's like the causal, yes. the causal powers of the molecule. 
So, okay, why does he do this? God has good reason to cause the existence of souls and join them to bodies. Because he has good reason to do The so. goodness of the existence of embodied animals and human beings who can have enjoyable sensations, satisfy desires, and have their beliefs about the world and, and the form world their own purposes. Like. So it's basically, yeah, because it's good, right? Now, as I say, why are any of these things good and why do they require a body? Now, right, even, if it agree, doesn't work. <laughs> even if we agree that it's good for there to be, say, people or beings or something, why do they need a body? <laughs> What, I don't, where does the body come yeah. from? Well, the regularity, I think, is his point from the previous points. He's like, you have to be a spatially extended being in order for there to be regularity because a non-spatially be extended. Yeah. Yeah. But but like I can conceive of unsold worlds that are sort of like predictable and we can learn in well, them in the same way. You just have to create you just have to create um, it could be like a virtual of... reality like just imagine yeah, a yeah. video game right where you can where there's sort of a world right but it's not really physical like you don't have to you can just teleport to another space or you can have distal causal interactions and things like that i mean that could that could be or the it case could, it could just be like pure ratiocination and kind of like feeling and stuff and you sort of learn and stuff like that i don't understand yeah why. it's like you have telepathic yeah. connections between different persons that'd be kind of cool actually and then i just wouldn't have a need for like all of our language that it reflects you know when we talk about rep spatial representation or picturing the way the world is and, you know, correspondence and stuff. So I sort of wouldn't have need for maybe that sort of talk because there wouldn't be spatial stuff, but, um, but it'd be different. It's, it's sort of conceivable. So the um, embodied is doing almost all the work here, right? But he doesn't explain why bodies are good. The closest that we get is the regularities, which he, he kind of mentions here. This involves the existence of regular causal connections, but he doesn't explain why they need to be physical connections or, yeah. or why that's the only way of achieving regularity when, I mean, we can just free associate and come up with other ways as well. Presumably God could come up with way more than we could being omniscient. Yeah, yeah. Well, the, the minimal constraints I would say on this are, are what can you tell a coherent story about? And that's kind of the point that Neil Simbabu in his Electrons in Love paper is exploring when he's like, well, look, I can tell you a story about electrons building their souls as they pull, you know, other subatomic particles into their orbits and so on. And uh, yep. and how how this is like a great good for the society. of Like, like you can just tell a story, basically, that's at least conceivable about these things. Um, so then it's in the, the realm of possibility. For so, God yeah, his done. explanation isn't very good. Um, God has reason to set up all these connections. So it's the same point. Yeah. But, oh, yeah, this is what I wanted to say, though, about the um, join them to bodies. What does that mean? Like, Causally honestly, connect what, them, I guess. Well, <laughs> oh, yeah, but that's just that's just like to relabel the problem. I'm like, I, I, I do not understand what it means to, you know, for, for a soul to be joined to a body. Like, what does it does it, it, it other than to repackage the phenomena to be described that where the phenomena to be described is that brain stuff is happening and I'm experiencing things, right? That's what everyone agrees to. But then just to say, well, they just are. My, you know, like I've got these two theoretical entities I've created. How are they connected? Well, they just are. Is like, that doesn't I mean, help me. Yeah, it's it's a special type of causal connection that God is capable of doing. It's one of his like basic actions or whatever. I think that's all he yeah. would say. Like, yeah, I mean, he connects them up so that they causally interact. Exactly. And that's and that's <laughs> now ad hoc bloat in the theory. And yeah. A new type uh, of causation. Yeah, and on page 91 here, he says, a perfectly good God will love creatures and love creatures of varying natures, including creatures with narrow range of purposes and beliefs, such as rats and dogs. Uh, but he has a special reason for producing human beings uh, because we have, you know, more types of purposes and we can do higher stuff and so forth. So, you know, it's like God has reason for creating all sorts of things. Now, it, it does raise the question, well, why hasn't God created many other types of animals as right. well? Like mythological yeah. creatures that we've imagined. I mean, there's like telepathic beings. There's... Um, all sorts of things that can be imagined in fiction and fantasy and, and sci-fi and whatever else and mythology. He doesn't create any of those things. Or well, maybe he creates aliens. angels, right? But for the most part, he doesn't, or like hive minds. Like, what, what, why not these things? It's just like, well, I guess he decided not to. <laughs> but, but if we do find they exist, then God would have Well, then it's, pretty, it's explained, right? Because God has a reason to create those things. <laughs> That's what I mean. It, it explains everything and therefore explains nothing. Yeah, yeah. Um... We come to have a particular belief about the Romans, blah, blah, blah. Ah, now, quantum there's the, the good old quantum theory to the rescue. So here he's discussing the interaction problem. So how is it that the brain and the mind interact? I don't think he describes it in quite this way, but it's essentially the point yet. Like, how, how can an immaterial object have a physical <laughs> causal effect on the brain? And he says, well, quantum theory quantum so stuff's weird, the right? world is not fully deterministic, and there's a amount of unpredictability. 
Um, yeah. And so then he basically says, if we scroll down a bit here, the next yeah. page. Um, <laughs> so it, so the brain is an intricate machine that magnifies small changes, and it might be like this. The unpredictable small changes in the brain are the ones which cause our thought and observable behavior. In that case, when humans form their purposes to think of this or that, uh, in the soul that would be, they thereby cause those small changes uh, unpredictable by science in the brain, which in turn causes the thought and behavior. So humans can exercise free will without there being any violation of physical laws that govern the brain. I don't understand. So it's, 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 the, it's the famous advent to, to quantum mechanics. Um, yeah. So this argument, I think, doesn't work for a number of reasons. One is that um, so the functioning of the brain is governed by firing of action potentials, which requires movement of very large numbers of um, ions across membranes. Um, which is a way that um, electrical voltages are propagated uh, across the brain, which is the, the basis of the electrochemical machine that is uh, that is the brain, right? Um, so to do that, you don't just need a few quantum events here and there. You, you need very large change. Like to fire one action potential, you, you, need, you would need to have the neurotransmitters opening up a whole bunch of, uh, like interacting with the ion channels and opening those up and have a whole bunch of ions moving through. I don't know how you get that with just, you know, the odd quantum decay here or there. You need a very large amount of those in order to like, I don't know, push the neurotransmitter the right way or like, I don't even know how you would do that. Like if you actually, this is why the only way you can get away with this nonsense is to describe it in the vaguest possible terms. If you actually make it specific at the cellular level of how this works, it just completely bonkers because it doesn't work that way. Like well, where's the voltage coming from? How, how did all of these yeah. ion channels open? They don't just open for no reason. And the point is it, it might be theoretically possible to have enough decays in just the right way, but in order to like, Spontane I mean, the, the, the brain does spontaneously fire, right? But but that's not going to give you a thought. You need you need um, coordinated activity patterns of just the right type in, in order to have a, a meaningful thought, right? Like, instead of a seizure or whatever. And so, in order for that to happen, what you're going to have is to have a very precise pattern of like um, changes to to trigger this thought or that thought. And and for that to happen, you're going to have to have major violations of the uh, of the probabilities of quantum mechanics. Um, and quantum mechanics provides you with very specific probabilities of different types of events happening. And if you violate those, you violated the laws of quantum mechanics. And so you can't get around this just by saying it's indeterminate. The probabilities are absolutely determinate. You violate those probabilities, you violate the laws of quantum mechanics. You might be able to get away with a handful of like decays being different here and there that doesn't sort of violate the probabilities to any extent. But as, as soon as you go beyond that, you violated quantum mechanics. So this is why people sort of don't understand that they just say, oh, it's stochastic. So then you can like just somehow weave anything you wanted here. No, quantum mechanics is in is in, in a sense deterministic. The non-deterministic part is like the collapse part. Um, but the probabilities are determined deterministically. Um, and, and, and those are, they're, they're fixed, right? You, you can't violate those without violating quantum mechanics. And I, I don't see how you can, how you can possibly get any significant change in a in a brain state that would matter from like making a thought or a decision or whatever um without having very substantial changes uh, across parts of the brain um which would require you know huge um violations of the probability of quantum mechanics moving ions here and there and changing protein complexes different conformations so the thing doesn't work in in my view and i think in the mainstream view of neuroscientists if you were to actually articulate this in a specific form you know there are people like uh, what's his face who thinks that the microtubules uh, like have some sort of penrose yeah penrose and there's other guy hammer hammer off or hammer off or whatever um who but th these arguments are not widely accepted and i, I don't think they're very plausible but anyway th the point is that just hand waving and saying, "Well, quantum is random, and therefore we'll just sort of sneak in free will or cause causal effects of the soul." There, it, it doesn't work. Uh, this is this is fringe. It doesn't it doesn't fit with our, our, our what we know in neuroscience or, or physics. And and theoretically, this is the other point. Theoretically, this would be detectable. Now, I don't know if we'd be able to detect it with current technology because our interventions are limited. We might be able to detect this in animals, but then, I don't know, do they have free will or souls or whatever? Um, if you just had these sort of arbitrary changes in, in like the, um, the potential of a cell or something like that, I guess the, the trick is you'd need to determine what all the inputs to that were. So it might be tricky to do in practice, but in principle, this would be detectable. And um, I, I just, it really annoys me when people who don't seem to really understand the science or care about it will just hand wave in this sort of way as if you can just solve these issues by by quantum mechanics somehow because it's like random or something. I, I just think it doesn't work at all if you actually try to articulate it specifically. Yeah. Well, remember when we need free will and all this stuff that we've got to explain, we can just appeal to the chancy swerving of atoms as well as billions. Yeah, I mean, that's theories. basically the little of explanation. Like, oh, there's a mysterious disposition the universe has to bring this about through the, you know, chance encounters of atoms and the, you know, the complexity of, of you know, 
complex physical systems. <laughs> like it, that, that's basically the level here. But if um if we remember that quantum mechanics is like very small and weird, then we can imagine sort of like little Zeus's with batteries maybe <laughs> like running running out every time that something quantum happens and kind of like attaching the batteries and causing uh, this is basically maxwell's demon right that there's this little <laughs> person who who opens up the gates between two um two two rooms to allow right, the, to the particle to move over yeah. yeah essentially so that it allows heat to move from uh cold to Entropy. hot without any energy yeah. input did i get that right yeah cold to hot um uh, yeah hypothetically if you could have an immaterial demon i think that that would be possible but the idea is that um well, there don't seem to be any such immaterial demons because we don't observe that happening. Well, there are, there are these sort of questions. I, I think that these are interesting questions, right, about how theists think about um, the soul, right? So maybe one falsifiability criteria would be that supposing that the soul is immaterial and interacts with the brain in some way, then potentially we should be able to come up with like solutions that defeat the laws of thermodynamics, you know, in the physical world yep. by overcoming decay due to entropy or whatever. Um, because that would just be coming from this non-physical place, right, into the physical world, and we should be able to come up with those solutions by accessing them in the forms or whatever, and and bringing them down here. Like that's what life would do. And I think some people do sort of think this way in sort of pseudo sciency kind of circles, right? And that's why they often talk about those thought experiments with the demons and things. Um, but I, but but then you do actually create these falsifiable criteria, which I don't think you can show because when you look at you know, like the, the entire system of like human beings over their lifetime and stuff, you see that they don't in fact, you know, en engage in the physical system of the world such that they're able to kind of overcome what we know about entropy and so forth. So. Okay. Yeah. So finally, why God allows evil. Um, so that was, that was human souls and things. This world is a clearly providential world in this sense, that we humans can have a great influence on our own destiny and on the destiny of our world and its other inhabitants, and it is very good for us that it is like that. I guess that's not how I think of providence, because I think of providence as having God having something to do with things, but maybe I've just not kind of got the use of providence down correctly. Um, well, regardless, this is going to be the key point that he makes here kind of throughout the, the next pages, which is basically like it's intrinsically good for humans to be able to have an effect on uh, on the development of the world and, and other people. Um, he right. says this clearly on page. Uh, uh, I've lost the page now. Uh, 95 is this one or are you thinking of another one? 98. OK, I mean, I guess he kind of says it throughout these pages here. Um, yeah, so God creates yeah. things that are good is basically what he's saying there. And in terms of moral evil, so 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 this chapter is about the problem of evil. He discusses moral evil, which is evil that comes about from human decisions, and natural evil, which which doesn't, like hurricanes and stuff and disease. Um, right. So here he's talking about moral evil. And um, on, um, on on page ninety eight of the of the file, he um, of the like down the bottom ninety eight, he. Yeah. Um, he talks about the free will defense, which is essentially his response to moral evil. And he says here that free and responsible choice is free will, um, like libertarian free will, to make significant choices between good and evil, which make a big difference to the agent, to others, and to the world. And he says that that is um, a good thing for, for God to make us that way. Um, he says that on the next page, it is good that the free choices of humans should include genuine responsibility for other humans, and that involves the opportunity to benefit or harm them. I mean, so do here's we another actually thing that's intrinsically agree good. to this? <laughs> I the, don't the think so, that, no. What, I don't well, think that it's is, good for, that you have an ability to harm someone. That's not a good thing. Not well, by itself. So so I think I think this this kind of gets a bit of a free pass for people, but I think that there are some uh there are some reflections that you can kind of get people to think about where they might realize there's some internal tension, right, in in their commitment to this and other things they might believe. One of those tensions would be the commitment to locking up violent offenders in prison, right? Yeah. Where, for example, we presumably don't think that them being able to um, being able to act upon their free will to genuinely harm people should they desire is such a good that we shouldn't, in fact, restrict their free will by putting them in a prison where they can't do such a thing, right? Um, now, maybe there are ways of responding to that where you say, well, you're not really like taking away their free will. Um, it's freedom in this, you're not taking away their libertarian free will, so the good still exists because they could possibly do it. But the point is that you're taking away the possibility by constricting um, 
conscripting what it's like physically possible for them to do by putting them in the prison and so forth. And so if you agree with taking that action, it's sort of weird that you would think that it's better. That that seems at least to be in tension with the idea that it's better for there to be beings who genuinely can harm people than um, than, than, than not. Yeah, I just again, I'd like to know what the defense of this is. I think that it that it's valuable for people to have autonomy, right? But again, I understand that in a compatibilist way. But I, I would not say that it's intrinsically valuable in itself to have the opportunity to harm or benefit other people. I think it's actually better if you have a situation where people have autonomy to choose what they want for themselves and others, but not an opportunity to harm others. Certainly not any significant harm. You might say maybe it's good that people can um, harm others in, in quite modest ways, but not not very significant. For, maybe you could debate that, but certainly not right. significant. Is it that much harm. better to include murders? And like, <laughs> is, is the is the solving of murders so much like, you know, like people enjoy the occasional crime TV show or whatever, but is that so good that it justifies the actual murders that occur? Like... Yeah, I, I just don't get this at all. I think that a good type of society would be one in which you, you actually were protected from uh, the harm that others could do to you. You could still interact with other people, but there would be much better limits. I mean, that's what we try to do. We try to limit the ability of people to harm others. Obviously, we are imperfect yeah. at that, and there are there are trade offs that we have to make in our society. And this isn't to say, you know, this isn't to say well we should go to a police state to avoid people harming others because that has its own costs. But the thing is, God God isn't subject to that. He's omnipotent, right? Even if he can't take away libertarian agency or whatever, he, he could still set up the world differently so that it didn't work this way, right? He could give us different intrinsic desires. Oh, we'll get to that, by the way. <laughs> oh boy. Um, but yeah, yeah, I just whether maybe maybe some people That's find true. this more intuitive than I do. But at the very least, you would say this is an important part of why, sorry, of Swinburne's defense of moral evil, that it's good for humans to have the ability and opportunity to harm others, that that's intrinsically good. And he doesn't defend that. He just asserts it. And that's at least, I think, highly questionable. Uh, God would have reserved for himself the all-important choice of the kind of world it was to be, while simply allowing humans the minor choice Hang on, so the there's a context That's... here. So he's saying that God who gave agents limited, limited responsibilities wouldn't have given them very much. So he's saying that a God like that would only be giving them ability to fill in minor details. Uh, but it's better that humans, uh, as he says here, a, a good God, li like a good father, will delegate responsibility in order to allow creatures to share in creation. He will allow them the choice of hurting and maiming and frustrating the divine plan. So it's good for humans to participate in creation now as well. It's sort of weird to me that the boundaries are drawn where they're drawn um, with these sorts of claims, right? Because then it makes me think, well, why can I, I not just will myself to fly, for example, right? Why can I not just will myself to like whiz around the globe flying? Because then I have the possibility that maybe I get it wrong and crash into a tree and harm myself. Or maybe I, you know, maybe I'm evil and I kamikaze myself into the 9-11 buildings or something. And, you know, like, so I can I can tell this story about these powers that God hasn't given me to like libertar that i can like libertarianly perform where he has yeah well what about if it's good me. if it's good to people to have the power to harm others why, why can't i like cause someone to have a stroke by just like thinking about them <laughs> if i like, really just like them you know like well you can you can kill a goat don't you know <laughs> <laughs> manage their goats yeah. yeah but like i guess when people say well that's too far right like that's too much power to hurt us but th yeah. this is why it's all ad hoc like, what, <laughs> yeah. what would you expect yeah How why is it here why, why, yeah. what's the optimal of it? it's so dumb like there's, there's clearly no theory here it's clearly all just post hoc yeah like okay maybe it's good to be a, maybe it's good to have the ability to cause a minor inconvenience to other people like maybe that's good right i'm not saying necessarily but let's suppose that but but we're so far away from that right <laughs> there's so much worse that you could do and and there's still worse that you could imagine like the example i gave yeah. about being able to cause someone to a stroke just by thinking about them, right like why is it that we're on this particular grounds of ability to harm others that's less than it could be but more than it could be yeah apparently yeah. that's like the goldilocks point the, the, the god had the most recently great or or he arbitrarily like it's it's so ad hoc i just don't understand yeah. how someone can think this is convincing yeah with the evils and the goods that is both well yeah and it keeps going right but so but okay but, but this point here about about participating in creation again i don't think that it is intrinsically good that that humans would that for, for humans to participate in creation again intrinsically good to have some degree of autonomy understood in a compatibilist way yes but that's not the same as participating in creation like the the, the child he, he mentions like father and parents here a child is not asked by the parent to have any real substantive role in like building the house 
or, or something like that. Yeah. You, a parent may involve them in some appropriate way, but normally that's not going to be a substantive way. It's more just to help engage them and teach them things that they need to know. But really, they don't call any of the shots. They don't have any significant say, nor should they. And, and our, the gap between a, a child and a parent is so much less than the gap between us and God, if God exists, right? So I would expect an all-loving God to set things up properly in our own interest. And then, you know, he can give us certain roles in certain appropriate ways, but I wouldn't expect us to have any substantive role in that. I would expect God to do that properly because <laughs> he's so much more capable than us. Why would he delegate that to such pathetically incompetent people and limited as we are compared to him? Like yeah. only an incompetent idiot would do that, it seems to me. Why, why would you delegate to people who are so inept as we are compared to God, right? It doesn't make sense. And it's, it, it does seem that... Um... God could also give us only the desires to to follow and support the divine plan. Well, that's the right? other thing, right? But but he he has an answer to that, right? Which we will get to. Which okay. I think, <laughs> oh boy, that's fun. Um, not even God could give us this choice without the possibility, without the possibility of, of resulting evil. evil. Well, yeah, we we bring about significant talk evil. About that. Yeah. Well, it just depends on you know talking about free in this sort of. Strange. Yeah, the thing is, there's actually no contradiction between. Uh, uh, there's no contradiction of a free agent who never chooses evil, right? So yes. So uh, exactly. given, well, God given does what, that. <laughs> well, yes, of course. Given what, and maybe angels in heaven do that or whatever. But but given what uh, Swinburne says about God's knowledge of the future, it may not be possible for God to create just those ones if he doesn't have knowledge of what they will choose, even in the future. Right? But I, it I don't depends, know. though, because he get again because of the desires, right? Or even I don't know. It, it it's strange to me. Would he could be find bad? out though, right? Couldn't couldn't he put us in a box and like see how we would act without affecting any other people, and then like what create about, a real version? I'm trying to think about causal powers as well. I'm, I'm I'm sort of trying to think about why it would become worse if you took if you you know suppose that every time someone was actually about to do something bad, they just kind of fainted and fell. You know, like those fainting goats, right? Where when they get spooked, they just faint. Um, uh, no, I do not, but I can imagine. Oh, yeah. Imagine. <laughs> so th th there's, some, there's some goats where it's pretty funny. Like whenever whenever they get spooked, so pe people like to do this with these goats, they go boo, and it causes them to just faint. And apparently this was adaptive in wherever they were huh. because it meant like that they didn't get eaten by whatever the predators were. So just, um, just for chat, just for chat's interest. So no noticeable um, non sequitur aside that we've had from Nathan, goats a couple of times and <laughs> orgasms instead of organisms. You do... <laughs> <laughs> you you do your own inferences there. <laughs> <laughs> so that these goats, um, and the men who stare at goats, that's maybe that's why it, why it came up in my mind. I don't know. Um so so the but why could why couldn't God create us something like these goats, right? Where every time we were about to do genuine harm to someone, we just fainted on the spot like these goats do. I'm almost tempted ju just for a bit of comic relief to just show a quick video of the uh goats. Yeah, so I'm not sure that God couldn't give us the choice without the possibility of resulting evil. Uh, I feel like God could set up reality in all sorts of ways that would would ensure that, or at least minimize that a lot more than it really is. Even if He doesn't, even if God doesn't know what our choices will be, like He could set up reality so that even if we did choose bad, it wouldn't. Yeah, people would faint, or or something else would happen. That there was a causal process that kind of prevented too much harm from ha coming to other people. Anyway, it's, I just. I'll probably turn the music off just in case. How many views does this video have? 13 million. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that tells you something. But look, like, why couldn't we just be like that? Look, he's about to do something evil. He was going to go and... Uh... <laughs> why couldn't we be like that? You know, would it, would it honestly be worse if people were like that? You know, every time we were about to do something evil? Yeah, because everyone would look over and you're like, oh, you did a naughty. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Exactly. Surely that would be it. Like, would the world be that much worse? Okay, I'll stop that. <laughs> okay, but not even God could do this without the possibility. Apparently. Um, okay. 
where are we? If an agent uh, does not do the same action which he regards as over all the best, he must have allowed factors other than reason to exert some influence on him. Um, yeah, so we've kind of talked about this already, which is his very, in my opinion, strange understanding of the relation between like reasons and and, and free will. And um, desires, though, I think as well, because yeah, I think if you, if you have different, if, if you have a different goal in mind, right, suppose you have your goal is to like, um, you know, like you're the, you're Sam Harris's famous AI paperclip maximizer or whatever. Well, your reasons for doing things are just going to be very different, given that your goal is to maximize the amount of paperclips produced in the universe, whatever. Um, so, you know, you just you just would have reasons to just do to do various things that just wouldn't be reasons for me, because what's a reason for maximizing paperclips is dependent upon you having that goal. Right. And so, so but obviously, Swinburne would reject that. Um, yes, but, but I, I think we have bigger more. problems here. Let, let's look at what okay. let's look at what he says here. So if an agent does not do the action which he regards as overall the best, he must have allowed factors other than reason to exert an influence on him. So what he seems to be saying here is that reason is kind of, it determines your actions. And if you do something yes, other than right. the thing you have most reason for, then you've, you've sort of failed to be maximally free in some sense. Uh, but that's odd, but not let's... freedom in the libertarian sense, surely, because you're think like it is either, causally let's determined keep, by Let's the keep reason. going, because we, we've already talked about that. And I, well, it's determined, but maybe not causally, but whatever. Uh, in other words, he must have allowed desires for what he regards as good only in a certain respect, but not overall to influence his conduct. So we saw this before desires somehow somehow being free is not uh, based on doing what you want but it's actually desires reduce your freedom somehow yeah uh, but uh, this is this is the real interesting part it in my view in order to have a choice between good and evil agents need already a certain depravity in the sense of a system of desires for what they correctly believe to be evil i need to want to overeat to get more than my fair share and so forth if i am to have a choice between good and evil the depravity is itself an evil, which is a necessary condition of a greater good. It makes it possible for me to choose seriously, deliberately. Does this make any sense to anyone? This would mean that God doesn't have free will, presumably, because he doesn't have depravity. Yeah. So we never. This is like, clearly, how does this make any sense? It's well, bizarre. clear as day, this is this is an ad hoc modification, right? Of course, Again, it's ad the hoc. This is the most ridiculous thing. Uh, so, a, a perfectly good agent wouldn't have wouldn't have free will. You only have free will when you're like corrupted by your desires to do something that is actually not what you have the most interest to do. This is the opposite of what so you have. I say you have more freedom the more you're sort of clear sighted and, and and can think carefully about the reasons you have for acting in a certain way. The, the, the freedom is enhanced by your ability to perceive reasons and to think carefully about it and so forth. But Swinburne thinks it's the opposite. Swinburne thinks that um, that the that does that the sort of the corruption of desires that like cloud your judgment is necessary to have free will that otherwise there's no reason why you would have an ability to choose between two different things because you would just always choose the right thing so so someone who's like good and clear sighted couldn't have free will because there would be nothing to pull <laughs> yeah. them into the wrong direction so here's what i want to yeah. ask if this is what why free will uh, if this is how free will works why the hell would you want free will it just seems like it's, yeah. it's always bad, it's bad it just always pulls you to something <laughs> bad that's like afraid or whatever it just seems like it's an absolutely bad thing to have yeah why would you want this i don't it seems that god yeah. wouldn't have it and why would yeah, so anyone? either god god doesn't have it and it's not something that you would actually create if you were choosing the best as well um for for your being i just think it's so strange Okay. Um, like if you need to be depraved in order to have free will, why would you want to have free will? Let, let's just not have the depravity. And okay, <laughs> we'll we'll just we'll just settle with having a world where people just like choose the right thing. Like, <laughs> why is that bad? I don't I don't get it. Okay. So so we've already noted the great good of freely choosing and influencing our future. Um, why not just have like an, a sort of atemporal perfectness that is eternally experienced by yeah, how about god sets it up right the first time and doesn't delegate it to people who are not capable of, of running <laughs> things i don't get that why would a good god delegate to people who are monstrously incapable as we well are because right? you're yeah. you're genuine genuine because that makes it a bit a bit more profound participation in in bringing about that process alongside god is better than it just being maximally good in the first place you know like ice cream with a little bit of shit sprinkled in <laughs> is better than just ice cream <laughs> um apparently well, yeah because then you could choose then the ice cream like has a choice between whether it wants to be good or bad whereas if it's just good like then it would just always choose the good thing and therefore it has no choice <laughs> i mean one, way, one of the I'm... ways people talk about this is like a world where there's like an increasing goodness you know over time is like a better world where it's just flat 
But I do think it depends on, you know, if if that if that just flat line is like at the maximum level of goodness and pleasure all the time, I don't know that that's worse than like it going from freaking Auschwitz towards like maybe as having some human Yeah, so rights. the fact that you'd want variation in affect doesn't mean that it needs to go down to very low levels. That's a completely different point. Yeah. Also, you can have variation without, because without, it's not just valence. There's variation in other things as well. Like I can be excited. I can be scared, but in a fun way, like watching a horror film, um, I, I can... Um, you know, read something like Lord of the Rings where I'm enjoying all of the high concepts or I can be engaged in a social activity. There's all different ways that you can have experiences which are good, but in different ways that aren't just like high or low, right? And so variation might be good, but that doesn't mean like, well, it's good to have the old Auschwitz in there to like spice things up. It No, no, it's not. <laughs> it's, it's not good. I'm just going to well, turn my light off. This, this is, yeah, no problem. Um, I was going to say just that this phrase is like some weird kinky shit. Like... <laughs> which phrase <laughs> being allowed to oh, suffer yeah. to make possible a great good is a privilege even if the privilege is forced upon you this is like this sounds like someone in an abusive relationship like yeah god um, <laughs> you know if this is what god you does know, when when he beats me it shows me how much he cares look when uh, <laughs> look he get he gets angry at me sometimes but the reason that he shouts and hits me occasionally is because he cares so much. If he didn't, it's a great privilege to be slapped around because he really cares about my well being and wants what's best for me. And so I should, yeah, and, I should and look it's good on for it him to it. hit you, right? Be yeah. Because it's a privilege for him it's to. A privilege hit. that's forced upon me. Like that, when in any other, I mean, imagine, I mean, literally the other day in a, in a job interview, someone said the CEO occasionally shouts at people and stuff. And the justification <laughs> was um, it's because he cares so much about the company. And I was like, you know, that just sounds like abuse. That's not a good, that's a red flag. I don't want to. But look, and, uh, look how he tries to justify this. So as the reason he's talking about this is because the, the criticism is, well, uh, even if it's good for us to like participate in, in creative activity or whatever, is it is it appropriate for God to inflict suffering on people or allow suffering to be inflicted? Yeah, we can um, create without suffering. Without their permission, right? So, so he says, well, actually, uh, well, I'll just go back a bit. Just as it is a great good freely to choose to do the good, so it is also a good to be used by someone else for a worthy purpose, oh as long as they God. have the authority to do that. <laughs> Those who are allowed to die for their country and thereby save their country from foreign oppression are privileged. Okay, I might agree with that if they volunteer to do it. But look what he says. Cultures yeah. less obsessed on our own by the evil of purely physical pain have always recognized that. I don't know where he gets that from. It'd be nice for a citation. And it? they have recognized that it is still a blessing, even if the one who died had been conscripted to fight. What an It's earth. a blessing for you to be forced to suffer for, for someone else's grief. Right, so all these Russian conscripts from the, uh, you know, from the rural areas that, that are being uh, pressed Some into the Russian military. Die, but yeah. it's a sacrifice they're not being given any really armor, do. weapons or training, and they're just being sent to the front to be slaughtered by highly trained Ukrainian troops. Well, that's just a blessing, really, that they get to serve um, the motherland in that way. I love it when some theists like this want to make a point that they know is countercultural and and it seems kind of gross. They appeal to some weird cultural relativism. It's like, well, other cultures have known this truth, which we in the West yeah. have lost. Like you see this elsewhere as well. Yeah. Um, and it's just like, what are you talking about? No, there's actually been moral progress, and we realize that this is actually horrible. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was a saying from Sparta where a mother would say to her son, "Come oh, back. Right. What was it? Come back with, with your, your shield, with your shield, or on it." And, and basically that means because if you flee in battle, you would drop your shield, right? Because you try to run faster and it's big and bulky. So coming back with your shield basically means you've, you've, um, Won. you haven't run away in battle and on it means you've been killed, right? So it, it's a, it's an honor and a privilege to, to serve and, and fight for Sparta, right? And, you know, don't try to run away to save your life or anything like that. Cause then you'd just be shameful and your mother would like want to disown you or whatever. Oh, look, free girls in my city. <laughs> <laughs> nice well I, I need the corruption to be able to perfectly free <laughs> <laughs> yeah and it, it, it just this the, is the, just the way that it reads is, is so awful. like um you know so like narcissistic and strange as well like use you for a worthy purpose like some kind of you know like some kind of um 18th century <laughs> lord or something who just is gonna like you know, step on your back as they get out of the carriage or whatever the hell. It's a word because I am Lord of Salisbury and, you know, I'm governing, I'm governing the British Empire. So for me to step on your back is a worthy purpose for us. You know, it's, it's just such a weird way of you can justify any abuse with this, I think, given. Well, as know, long as they have the narcissist. right authority, of course, yeah, you know, one yeah. can justify that in all sorts of ways, as people did in the past, which, yeah. you know, is how they justified slavery and serfdom and, uh, 
oppression of uh, men over women and all sorts of these things. Not to say that there's no such thing as legitimate authority, by rape. the way, but this is going far beyond that. This, well, yeah, I mean, it wasn't rape, was it? It's well, a no, privilege well, that's what I'm saying, <laughs> to be used as the vessel to carry the child that will further the Aryan race, the Labensborn, right? If, to be used as the vessel that will carry the Labensborn, even though, you know, you may have cried throughout the sex, but that is a good thing because it's a privilege. In fact, like you can, it's horrible, this line of thinking. Uh, yeah, this was. <laughs> This was just, oh my gosh, uh, this was something else. And yeah, I mean, what kind, of century, man. <laughs> what kind of morality countenance is this? Like if you're a Kantian, right? And you don't think it's a, that it's ever appropriate to use people as means to an end. Like this is just not going to be on, right? <laughs> and um, and I think that it's interesting that I sort of said this, Paul, that theists are often aghast at like hardcore utilitarians. And then they say something like this. <laughs> it's just like, oh. What is I this thought, bit? This bit is very strange. Even 20th century man can begin to see that sometimes uh, yeah. when he seeks to help prisoners, not by giving them more comfortable quarters, but by letting them help the handicapped, or when he pities rather than envies the poor little rich girl who has everything and does nothing for anyone else. I I'm, think I'm just what not... he's saying there is that it's good, helping other people is good for that person. I think that's what he's saying. Yeah, but, but I, it's what well, comes after that that I have a problem with because, like, okay, helping handicapped people is good. Um, well, well, but... I don't disagree with that, but it's it's also not clear to me that either of the things he said are actually optimally what's best for either the prisoner or the poor well, little no. rich girl, right? In both in both cases, it seems like there are better ways of of um, engaging with that situation for better outcomes. Um, I mean, even for me, right? Never mind being God, who's who's omnipotent. Than, than sort of like either this, uh, either um, having them help the handicapped or um, pitying the poor little rich girl, right? There's better ways for me to engage in both of those situations than what Swinburne suggests, which just seems to be part of this this kind of toxic narrative that he's got about um, good and evil in the world. Look what he says after this, which is uh, links a little bit to the political side of things. And, and I think this has relevance to the state of the UK today, actually. <laughs> One phenomenon prevalent in end of century Britain that this draws attention to is the evil of unemployment. Because of our system of social security, the unemployed oh, no. on the whole have enough money to live without too much discomfort. Certainly they are a lot better off than many unemployed in Africa or Asia or Victorian Britain. Well, that's probably true. What, what is evil about unemployment is not so much resulting poverty, but the uselessness of the unemployed. They often report being filled undervalued by society of no use on the scrap heap. They they rightly think that it would be good for them to contribute, but they cannot. Many of them would, I mean, I, look, I think it, it, people unemployed do actually want to contribute, right? That's not yes. the issue. The, the issue here is really this last sentence here. Many of them would welcome a system where they were obliged to do useful work in preference <laughs> to one where society has no use for them. Right. <laughs> Okay, so, so firstly, get back into the workhouse. Well, firstly, as you've said, where's the where's the where's the evidence that many of them would welcome it? But I actually yeah, think I <laughs> now it, I I think a lot of the research that people have tried to do around, for example, um, like reduced hour work weeks, but also universal basic income as well, shows that there are lower rates of unemployment amongst those who receive universal basic income than amongst those who don't. And so it it seems like actually when people have it gives people the kind of like financial freedom. And I think it was um, around, uh, it, it was something around like 4% of people or something that are kind of like freeloaders and don't want to participate yeah. when they're given the opportunity or something. Um, but it but it was lower in something I read. So this is probably not actually citation needed again from me, but I, I recall reading something, I think it was in David Graeber's Bullshit Jobs about this, where he was talking about lower rates um, amongst those who received UBI than those who didn't. So there might, there might at least be some empirical evidence against what Swinburne is actually saying here um, that just doesn't make this the, the best course of action or correct. Like yeah, when people are looked just... after by welfare, by, by a kind of welfare state, they in fact, you know, <laughs> do better. They can, they can focus on flourishing more because they're not like worried about taking some shitty jobs and there aren't like psychological pressures about staying out of those jobs because they'll be trapped and very yes, I think a lot of people do want to contribute to society. Uh, but then what he says from that is that it would be good to force them to do something <laughs> instead of just being like useless. Like just yeah. what kind of view is that? Like, and apparently this follows from like the reason he's talking about this is because he's trying to emphasize the point that like it's a privilege to be <laughs> to do something that is a worthy purpose that, that serves some worthy purpose, even if you don't want to do it and you're being forced to do it. As long as someone yeah. has the authority to do that, and yeah, that's uh, an interesting. Well, people way are intrinsically valuable, right? Will. 
people are intrinsically valuable. Therefore, the state should force them against their will to work because it's what's good for you. Yeah, people like this vote, apparently. Uh, you know, <laughs> concerning. I mean, it's it's also just that the fact that he just says that without feeling the need to provide any evidence for that. Claim, like, <laughs> Oh, you've you've done a representative survey of the unemployed, have you? Uh, interesting. Yeah, yeah. I'd like to see those results. Yeah, it is funny. I, I do think that is reminiscent of um, you know, the the one of the one of the conservative parties that makes up the conservative party in the UK at the minute. Um, this sort of idea of um extreme free market, for ex ex extremely extreme kind of free markets that just exploit and force people to work <laughs> in horrible conditions with no rights or protections. Um yeah, pretty uh, interesting takes. Let's uh, yeah, let's say yeah. it follows from that fact that being of use is a benefit for him who is of use. And um, the the problem I think with this philosophy as well is that it's just going to justify all sorts of religious abuse, right? You know, well, not just someone religious who, abuse. Well, not just, but 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 I'm saying that in in you know we know for a fact that there are lots of high control religious communities. And this is grounded in the psychology of um, religion, where people making like costly commitments around like the type of moral lives that they're going to live, like high, having like high controls around um, ethics and uh, ethics, so like sex and things like that. These are <laughs> these are all used. Th these are all kind of mechanisms of psychological control amongst many religious communities. And so then people reading apologetics, where they get these like philosophical ideas that can like justify anything right this is just not let's hope that this falls to some nice liberal minded pastors uh, falls on some <laughs> nice liberal minded pastors ears and not like steven anderson or someone like that you know the, um, being of use to him and then he's gonna what like think well yeah it's, it's good for me now this justifies me turning up in the gays homes and splitting them up and putting them to work to some good because you know i've got a philosophical argument for it so, i mean that's kind of implausible but it's like it, it, it's just a sort of nonsense that this crap can can justify i think yeah, it's yeah, speechless. <laughs> okay, um, but those suffering may, in these ways, serve good purposes. Does God have a right to allow me to suffer for your benefit? Oh yeah, okay. So he talks about permission? this more here. <clears throat> yeah, no one has the right to allow one person A to suffer for the benefit of another one B without A's consent. Um. I don't know if I agree to that in general, but it it, it w I would say I'd agree to that if um if there's like an omnipotent person involved who can like radically alter the circumstances of the situation <laughs> completely, so as no one sort of like has to do any suffering at all. Um, yeah, well, so uh, the issue here is suffer because it, you you may suffer in, in 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 comparison to what, right? So. Like you might say, well, you're doing something that harms someone else and I'm going to stop you from doing that. Well, is that you suffering? Well, in a sense, right? But I don't think you had kind of the right to do that in the first place. So, um, but but I don't think that you, uh, so yeah, I think you're going to need to qualify this a bit more. But in general, I think this principle is more or less correct that um, it's not appropriate to just um, basically inflict suffering on one person to benefit someone else um, relative to some status quo where they're sort of not interacting in a significant way um, without that person's consent. So we don't inflict medical research on people without their consent, for example, uh, as, an, as an instance of this. Now, th there are some issues with children, of course, because they're not able to give full consent. But I think that if we focus on at least being agents who are able to give full consent, then I, I think that we do basically run society more or less by this principle. As long as we understand in terms of suffer as in relation to some sort of like situation where they're not interacting. Because if you if one person is exploiting the other, it's like, well, freeing their slaves is not like causing it's causing them to suffer in a sense, right? Because like inconvenience to them. But that's not the type of suffering that's sort of relevant here anyway so what, what does he have to say about this so what he's going to say is that there are crucial differences between god and the doctors right the example of doctors oh what's happening here oh, i'm just sorry i was just trying to see how much is left i think we're on 115 so yeah I'm, I'm gonna head off after we sort of finish this uh section here and okay. you can tackle miracles by yourself um right but yeah i, I think we should be uh, getting near there for here now i've lost where we were um uh, we were on 115 in the PDF up here, so I can. Oh, what the hell am I doing? Uh, it's because I zoomed in. It just changed pages, and I was like assuming it was on a different page. Okay. Uh, oh, gosh, I can't find it. Here we yes, go. okay. One, one right. of four of the files. Yeah, uh, got it. 
So the crucial difference between doctors, okay, so one is that God is the author of our being, has certain rights, a certain authority over us that we do not have over, over our fellow beings. He has the cause of our existence at each moment, our existence to sustain the laws that gives us our existence. To allow someone to suffer for his own good or that of others, one has to stand in some kind of parental relationship towards him. Whoa, what? Where did that come from? <laughs> that this highlight here. Yeah. I so see, to I allow see. someone to suffer for his own good or that of others, so like to impose suffering on, on the people in the way that was mentioned, one has to stand in some kind of parental relationship towards them. <laughs> really? Where did that go? Where, where, it's just another one of these things. It just sort of Well, because God's like there. a father, you see. So that would be very convenient if that were see, true. The, pro the problem with that parental analogy is that parents have certain rights with respect to their children. I actually think probably we give them too much in our society, but certain rights at least, or their caregivers, have certain rights with respect to them because... Children are not capable of giving informed consent about certain things, at least below a certain age. That that's definitely yeah. going to be true, right? Um, and and that's also the case for like certain people with severe disabilities and so forth, or people of a very advanced age of dementia and so forth. It's because they're not capable of exercising their own choice for their own self interest. So they need someone to assist them or or act in their stead, right? Now. That's not true with respect to us, right? We are the whole point is that God has given us freedom, right, and, and that we can choose. So God doesn't doesn't need to cause us to suffer because, <laughs> like, he, he he has to take that away. It doesn't make sense. Like, the whole point is he's given that to us, and if we're if we're a sound mind adults, yeah. we can decide for ourselves. He, we don't that the parental thing breaks as soon as you you say that the, as soon as the children grow up, so to speak, then the parent doesn't have those rights over them anymore. And, the, and, the justification and there seems very yeah. The weird. justification is they're not capable of choosing themselves but that ceases to be the case once they've grown up but we have grown up with respect to god in the sense that we're capable of exercising freedoms that's the whole point of, of planning as uh, sorry of swinburne's argument here so i don't I, the parental analogy just doesn't apply here but look, look at the justification of, god does not have any such right over us look, look at the justification he offers though when he says uh, i have this right because in small part i'm responsible for the younger son's existence, his beginning and continuance. Yeah, no, um, that's not why. <laughs> that doesn't give you a right over. Right. So this reminds me of a sketch in, I think it was it was actually some weird Australian TV show I was watching called uh, <laughs> Super Bro or something, where the guy's dad said something like, uh, like a, uh, I created you with my dick and I can take you out of it with it too. <laughs> Is that Super Wog that you're talking about? Yeah, yeah, that's it. That's, yeah, <laughs> yeah, oh, that's a really funny show. <laughs> I, I, mean to I created it. you with my dick and i can take you out of it with it too <laughs> 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 it just seems like this really kind of primitive uh, way of thinking about you know like you know it's it's like um what's it called say um piaget's stages of development and you know like yeah, like, yeah. like oh i i can beat you i brought you into the world i can beat you up oh i'm bigger um, so i can beat you yeah, up yeah. and then there's so the bigger guy who could beat him up and it's just like yeah. <laughs> I, I, um, I think this is complete nonsense, right? So uh, I, my comment here is that, uh, hang on, what do I say here? Um, it, so for example, you still have rights over someone if they're adopted, right? So you don't right. have to, it's not, it's obviously not necessary. And I don't think it's sort of sufficient either, right? Because once they grow up, you don't have that right over them anymore. Yes. And you still brought them into existence. So yeah, yeah. So so the, the reason he gives is neither necessary nor sufficient. I don't really think it has much to do with it. I guess it correlates with rights that we give for other reasons, right? But that's not the reason. You don't have rights over someone because you contributed to bringing them into existence. You, you have rights over them because of the way that we grant parental rights over their children because the children are not capable of exercising the decisions for themselves. And for various reasons, it's good for parents to do that in general. Although, as I said, we can ask about the boundaries of what it is appropriate for parents to decide on when the state can step in and things like that. But um, it's not because you had a role in creating them. I think that's nonsense. Right. Um, it's not logically possible for God to have asked B if he wants things thus. For if A is to be responsible for B's growth and freedom, knowledge and power, there will not be a B with an R. I honestly don't know so that the, I want What he's about talking it. about here is he, God can't ask someone. Yeah, the A's and B's don't help do that. God yeah. can't ask someone if they are willing to be subjected to this suffering before they exist. That's the point right. he's making here. Okay, so God see. can't ask them because, well, they haven't been brought into existence. Yet. Like you can't ask a child, would you like to be born before they're born? Well, right. Yeah. So then maybe um, the best thing to do, as you suggest, is just not, um, you know, not well, do it so, with the possibility of. Uh, yeah. So but the thing is that we are not like God. We don't have to just make the best of the situation we're in. God could just set things up differently so that this isn't an issue. And I'm sure God could figure out a way of, of uh, having it so that people don't have to be subject to suffering in order to benefit other people in this world that God wants to make to bring about all this goodness. Right. I mean, I don't even see why it's not possible. Why can't God create the soul, attach it to like um, 
a, like a, a special golem kind of body in this <laughs> bubble. And then he, he, he sort of prods it and asks, you know, would you like to be created in this scenario? <laughs> or maybe it's a simulation. I don't know. Like he does something, right? He's maybe that's God. what he this world is, James. Well, that's what this world is. <laughs> yes. Well, yeah. But the idea is that in this simulation or whatever, then you wouldn't actually affect other people, right? It would just be a way of eliciting your preferences. Ah, but and if then, he could okay. do that, then why not just create the actual world without harming people in the <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the point, right? Like, so can't God set yeah. things up a bit better so that He doesn't have to kind of do this nasty thing? And no, apparently, nah, no. He's doing the best He can, bro. It would be logically like, impossible. Too much paperwork. It comes back to this. It's always too much paperwork <laughs> to do it in a better way. God's a Vogon. Uh, he. he I, I like this point here. <laughs> Humans write Sesame, Sesame Street as a better, softer world. Why couldn't God? Yeah, like we can make things up in fiction that are better than what God has done. <laughs> Apparently, um, God has done. Okay, God has a right to allow humans to cause each other to suffer. Um, there must be a limit to the amount of suffering which he has the right to allow a human being to suffer for the sake of a great good. Huh. Why is there a limit? That's sort of, uh, well, maybe it has to be absorbed oh, by the great go too good. far, right? Yeah, but where where is that precisously? Like, I'd really like to know. I mean, obviously, well, it there turns are out it's exactly to... what this world is, right? That <laughs> exactly this world yeah. is where the balance is. <laughs> well, yeah, amazing. <laughs> yeah, I don't take that very seriously at all. It's like, well, God wouldn't have too much harm being eighty involved, years or so. He wouldn't have too little. So there we go. Know, we have it right. About eighty years or so. That's about right. You know, hurting. <laughs> In worst case scenario, you're going to just be tortured for 80 years or so, but then you get to die. Yeah, so oh, he thanks. says there, there are limits about God's rights to allow humans to hurt each other, um, and, and they're limited by the fact that we have limited lifespan in the world. Now, I think that this is silly because, as I pointed out, yes, you can only hurt a single human for a limited amount of time, but you can hurt many different humans yeah, yeah. indefinitely and, and as many of them, really, as, as, as possible. Like, there's no limit to the number of them that you could potentially hurt, right, if, if you were powerful enough. So... Um, <laughs> as she sucks has, I guess, let us know in an indirect kind of way, right? So um, so I don't think this argument really works. Like a single nasty person can do arbitrarily as much harm, I guess, until no. the second coming or whatever, to other people as they want. So I, I don't really understand how this is a, a response here. And also life inspection, life expectancy can change. Um, technology changes. People, If people could live for much longer periods of time, would that then falsify or, or con constitute evidence against what Swinburne's saying? Now, he if says here on the next page, unending, unchosen suffering would indeed, to my <laughs> mind, provide a very strong argument against the existence of God. But, that's but just that is what not he the human thinks. situation. <laughs> well, that's well, just what he it, thinks is the human situation. Yeah. <laughs> is if if Christianity is true, then that just is the human situation for, for many. And the gate is narrow, in fact. <sighs> yeah. Also, okay. unending, unchosen suffering is, I think, that the state of being well, that exists on Twitter. But... Uh, <laughs> yeah, unending, <laughs> maybe the unchosen is doing a lot there but i mean seriously well, the like, algorithm is chooses choosing it for me, isn't it <laughs> oh sorry I meant, I meant choosing to go to hell i was talking about he's saying you know well yeah I, he doesn't really talk about that in this book so I don't, no. he sort of mentions afterlife but doesn't say a lot about it okay so natural evil um it's basically the same story again it's good for bad things to happen because otherwise you couldn't choose the good is basically the story here i think it gets a little nastier as well doesn't it Oh, yeah, it's page 110 that there's some more nastiness. Okay. Uh, I think that there's a couple of things before that. Oh, yeah, so we, we have the point that... Oh, I hate this argument so much. 108 of the of the file. Yeah. Um, let's see. So why doesn't God whisper in our ears from time to time about the consequences <laughs> of different actions to, like, help us choose the right thing, right? Um, but anyone who believed that an action of this sort could have the same effect uh, because God told him uh, would, would then be under the all-watching eye of God, right? And then he would not merely believe that there was a God. He would know it with certainty. And that knowledge would greatly inhibit his freedom of choice and would make it very difficult for him to choose to do evil. So here's how it works. If God made his existence and desires and the consequences of things too obvious, then people would be too good. They would choose yeah, the good it... too often, and that would be bad. <laughs> yeah, it has to be just the right amount. They like would be good, is. and that's bad. <laughs> Yeah, isn't there? I feel like that I'm good and that's bad, <laughs> or I'm bad and that's good. That there's a there's some movie or something. Where there's no way of falsifying bad. this. <laughs> it's so <laughs> dumb. It's like they would choose the good too yeah. much, and that's but if bad. They did, it's like, what? But if they did choose the good too much, 
then that would be great evidence that we have an omni, uh, you know, an omni benevolent creator, wouldn't it? And also, why does giving someone more knowledge inhibit choice? This is literally never the way it works in the real world. In the real world, giving yeah. person inf yeah. information that's relevant to their decision and helping them understand it always improves their ability to exercise like genuine freedom and, and to exercise um, autonomy over over there. It's not bad to give them more information that that is relevant that to help them to understand it, right? Yeah, um, you have to choose. the The idea is that you have to choose what on like the the integrity of your character rather than the reasons that you have. Then why is yeah? Because ben remember the, he arguments. literally thinks that you can only have free freedom if you're like corrupted. Otherwise, you'll just always choose the good thing. And so to to be free, you have to have corruption. <laughs> but but why there. isn't it bad for Swinburne to? provide us with this argument then because then we might choose on the basis of the reasons he's provided us with rather than on the basis of our kind of like inner solely character well, i don't know shouldn't we be more corrupted like shouldn't we be <laughs> like promoting the corruption so that people can have more of a choice like it doesn't, it just doesn't we make should sense. be disseminating misinformation about theism <laughs> so people so people really choose on the basis of their character rather yeah, than so on the shouldn't, basis of reasons. shouldn't the christian apologists be turning to atheist apologists <laughs> to help muddy the waters even more and thereby promote people's free will and that which is a good because apparently it's literally good for people to be confused about what the good thing is and to be corrupted by their sinful nature like that, that's good somehow so why aren't we promoting that well no because apparently god's done it just the right amount so you don't want to make it any more right it's, it's just it's so any, any more or less than who than richard swinburne than some than ramuna uh, jan or whatever in you know the, the the indian guy who had like one mass textbook <sighs> So anyway, that that's interesting. And then, um, a particular natural evil such as physical pain gives gives to the sufferer a choice whether to endure it with patience or to bemoan his lot, or I don't know, to go to the doctor so and fix it. it. What the <laughs> choice that, that natural that natural evil has which to just we, uh, sit there in silence or to moan about yeah, it? So or what about why is more freedom good? It's like you have an extra freedom. You can suffer now. It's like <laughs> suffer I don't want silence. that. <laughs> Can I go without that, please? You like, can suffer why is that in good? silence or moan about it. How is it good? To, <laughs> how are either of those choices good? To, well, to yeah, be apparently silent it's, it's, a, it's it. good for you to be able to endure your suffering with patience. <laughs> this is just kids Instead in of just Africa. not having the suffering in the first place. <laughs> just the kids in Africa going, please, water, water. <laughs> oh, yes, this is such a better world. <laughs> what is this? <laughs> oh yes <laughs> it's so much yeah. better that they can artic that they can moan about their their, <laughs> their famine um okay we need those insidious processes of decay and dissolution which money and strength cannot ward off for long to give us the opportunities so easy otherwise to avoid to become heroes yeah so this is that <laughs> it's good for bad things to happen so that we can sh develop and show the virtues of overcoming them this is that it's argument, so narcissistic it? this though right it's like not thinking so this is at all in terms of like collectively looking after people and it's all so about that's why god is, god is a sick dude right because like holocaust are a good thing apparently according to this because otherwise you wouldn't have the righteous among yeah. the nations who fought back yeah how them. you wouldn't have yeah, that how, how could i be um what how could i escape from cold dits or tell my story about you know the great escape you know riding in the film riding the motorbike over the uh, barbed wire if it wasn't for the holocaust and the horrible persecution of the nazis in the concentration camps right it's all yeah. worth it so i can be the hero of my story that's literally the argument like let me just go back and read this imagine all the suffering of mind and body caused by disease earthquake and accident unprovable by humans were removed at a stroke from our society no sickness no bereavement in consequence of untimely death of the young Many of this would then have such an easy life that we simply would not have much opportunity to show courage or manifest much of any goodness at all. We need these insidious processes of decay and dissolution, which money and strength cannot ward off for uh, for long, to give us the opportunity so easy to otherwise avoid to become heroes. So, it, like, he paints this picture of, like, a utopia, or at least some aspects of it, and he's like, yeah, but it'd be a bit boring, wouldn't it? Like, he wouldn't be able to be a hero, so let's bring on the disease and the suffering and the death, because that's that's a good thing. Look, if if I get vaccinated, if I get vaccinated, if I get vaccinated, then how can I survive an endemic virus on the merit of my lifestyle choices about yeah, fitness? Yeah, vaccines are bad, right? Ways. Because they yeah. they reduce the disease burden. I mean, bring back the Black Death. Like that really gave people <laughs> an opportunity to be heroes, right? Jeez, <laughs> come on, let's have another one of those. <laughs> what? Yeah, yeah. And what, that is actually it, though, and wars as well, because then I can, you know, then I can be the hero. I can, uh, oh, man, who cares about all the 
you know the the women and innocent children who no get no no it's not who cares about them about right? it's good for them to to suffer <laughs> to be for NPCs a good cause, right it's, it's good for them to be NPCs in my story <laughs> <Yeah>. about... <laughs> no, but literally like that's what he says we yeah. just talked about that. <laughs> The the untold masses have to just like have the have these die. Oh, I'm in pain, but it's good Being for allowed them. to suffer to make <laughs> possible such a great good is a privilege, even if that privilege is forced upon you. Because I'm a main character. You <laughs> this see. is a privilege for you to <laughs> suffer from me. <laughs> oh my god. Uh... <laughs> There is, however, oh, no so reason good. to suppose that animals have free will. So what about their suffering? Well, they've been suffering for a long time. So, um, you know, might I just, as well, like I'm, I said, huh, might as well huh, throw why, those male why, chicks why into like, the grinder. Um, why, why would you not think they have free will? Like, I don't understand why. <laughs> well, because they have different just types given an argument of souls. Before, no, but he, before he said vertebrates have souls because their brains are similar to ours. But now yeah, he's saying different they don't have... Souls. He specified that in the free will section. James. Yeah, they're they souls, but they're different. Souls. But then why not free will? Like they're different in a way that means. Yeah, they're different in a way where they don't get free <laughs> okay, will. Sure. It's clear. It, it, it seems that way. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Seems that way. Um, yeah, vertebrates suffer. It is most unlikely that they suffer nearly as much as humans do. I mean, that it sort of depends. I guess I do think that having certain cognitive tools might enable you to sort of conceptualize like more twisted forms of suffering that maybe like can't be experienced but but in terms of like the raw affect of the suffering i'm not sure that that's true so i don't know um so it might be that there are like twisted forms of manipulation or whatever which if you could cognize them would come with some kind of suffering that you might just be oblivious to by being stupid or something but then i also think that in terms of the actual raw affect that can be experienced during the suffering process that animals have who are subjective to things that they are aware of well then i'm not sure that that affect is like mitigated by the fact that they can't conceptualize like different sophisticated forms of um being gaslit or something like that right and <laughs> the suffering that comes there with yeah well there's a, it gets more interesting i think so um uh, swinburne then starts talking about the good of animals so it, it, there's different types of good for animals um <clears throat> And what he says here is that inevitably the things that animals do, like building nests and looking for mates and so forth, involves dangers and, and pain and so forth. Um, and the animal can't avoid all of these things. Um, and so he says, the action of rescuing despite danger simply cannot be done unless the danger exists. The danger will not exist unless there is a significant possibility of being caught in a fire. So it's the same thing as we said before. You need to have the real possibility of overcoming bad in order for that type of good to exist. And somehow that means that, of course, that it's good to have that type of good instead of just like not having the bad thing in the first place. Prevention is not better than the cure. Actually, the cure is better than prevention, according to this, which interesting view. But with respect to animals, he then goes on to say, animals do not choose freely to do such actions because they don't have free will, but the actions are nonetheless worthwhile. It is great that animals feed their young, not just themselves, that animals explore when they know that to be dangerous, that animals save each other from predators and so on. These are the things that give the lives of animals their value, but they do often involve some suffering for to the creature. Why are these things valuable exactly? I don't, I don't understand. Like, he, he's not saying that animals' lives are valuable because they experience well-being or they have a nice life. That he's saying that it's good for animals to feed their young, like just intrinsically, it seems, or that it's good for them to like save each other from predators, like giving a call or, or whatever. I suppose. I just don't know why is that the things that give the lives of animals their value. I, I don't get that at all. Like, where does that come from? Remember, there's yet another thing that has intrinsic value that he just doesn't defend. I don't think that's what gives animals their value. I, I, I think it's whatever well-being they experience in their lives, whatever they're capable right. of. Maybe they get that from feeding their young, right? But I, I don't yeah, think they can get that your from these things. Intrinsically but there are better, valuable, yeah. right? But there are ways they could get those things with the dangers taken away. I think is that you know, like the the way, for example, we treat animals in zoos, right? Why why is nature not more like that? Why why are there why is there not? Um... Well, yes, and remember that some animals feed their young by ripping apart other animals and yes. feeding them to their young. Um, yeah, or by or pushing their uh, mates and things like this. Or, yeah, push, or like... pushing the young of other of others out of the nest, and or by oh, what was that? There's a YouTube channel V likes, which is like the horrors <laughs> of nature or something, um, and it talks about or you know you know it talks about like these various like reproductive cycles of animals and stuff and just how gross and horrible they are like there was one i'm trying i'm trying to think of it i think it was about ticks or something and it was just so gross the one about like like how ticks reproduce um i'm not i'm not going to remember it now that's really frustrating yeah, there, there's a lot of there's a lot of crazy stuff 
but <laughs> so the interesting thing about all this, and I think that's probably the, the last sort of point there uh, that he makes. Um, and oh, here yeah, he takes a fallback position to say, yeah, but there's also like maybe there's heaven as well. <laughs> he basically says, um, our but, world and the heaven of the blessed. Yeah, pretty much. Um, yeah, but why but, not just the heaven then? This is so weird. Why? Why both? Why not just heaven of the blessed and the blessed? So um, what what I tend to think here is that this is strange because at least what many Christians have told me is that the reason for all of these, at least many of these bad things in the world, the way that it works and animal suffering and natural evils and, and the way we can cause harm to others is because the world is fallen. The world was not initially created this way. Yes, God allowed it to fall, right? He has this greater purpose there, but there's still issues there. But the point is, it's not like this isn't the world as, as God sort of wants it to be in a sense. It, it's serving a purpose to go through this state, but it's not, it's not like this is the finely balanced, like ideal product that, that God is maximizing value kind of thing. But the, the thing is the way that Swinburne describes it, it's like kind of, now this isn't the fallen world. Like this is the good one. Like, this is it. Like, and maybe there's heaven afterwards, but he, he describes that as a fallback position. That's not actually necessary to make the argument here. So he's not, He's not hinging everything on that, actually. That's like an, an add-on here. He's he, do, he doesn't appeal to the world being like broken and fallen, and that explains much of, of what's bad about it. He seems to think that all of these things are what's good about <laughs> what's good about it. Like we just talked about how disease is like a feature, it's not a bug, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to overcome the disease and like heal people. And and wars and famine and being at harming people and all this other stuff. It's like it's good because you wouldn't have free will if you weren't corrupted by this. And then also it's good to be able to overcome this. And it's even good if you suffer by being forced to be forced to suffer to bring about a good for other people, as long as there's an authority that is, is forcing you to do that. So, like basically all of these things that I've heard are because of the fall, because the world has become corrupted and it's in some sense not meant to ultimately be this way. No, no, these are features. Like that's the way that God wants it, and it's good to be that way. But it's also bad because it doesn't exist in heaven, right? <laughs> well, he says <laughs> there are different types would. of good, I think is what he says here. Uh, okay. So there's yeah. one, there's some types of goods that can't exist in heaven, uh, like overcoming evil. Uh, uh, but then there's certain types of goods that can't exist, uh, uh, that, that can, only, can only exist in heaven. And then so he puts those there. Yeah, deep um, goods. These are the deep goods. Which is odd. Couldn't we just have like more heaven instead of all yeah. this other nasty stuff? But I, I don't know why... It, this is the choice that God has, but it lacks. Couldn't a few we just have like less, less continue. crappy stuff? But then it's, it seems like what um, Swinburne is saying here is that God has to create the different worlds because there's different kind of goods that can be exemplified in the different worlds. But then he does seem to commit himself, contrary to what he says earlier, to God actualizing different worlds, um, which he has reason to to create. Whereas it seems like he talks earlier, like God only actualizes, in fact, this one world. <laughs> You know, re referring back to the comment about um, believing in trillions and trillions of different created worlds being absurd and so yeah. on. Uh, there we go. How are we straw responding to random straw men when we're literally reading through the whole book and explaining, quoting so this, him? <laughs> like, that, how can this, that be a straw man? That comment was a response, I think, to me oh, saying okay. they, they said in the, in the chat. Um, th th here's the context: you're making nonsense inferences. <laughs> the Irenaean theology at uh, theodicy isn't all encompassing um and then i, I said, don't recall that being mentioned mm, in this book no it hasn't but it's it's the soul building essentially and then i said you mean irenaean not irenaean uh and no it doesn't cope <laughs> um and then they said irene irenaeus is fine um because it's spelt differently in the greek and oh yeah in I, English. I don't, I don't then, care about yeah. the, sp <laughs> the and then this is random straw man um, I, what's the straw? I just still don't know what the straw man is. I, anyway, that, like doesn't matter. The, the point is, I, I don't, I don't see how we can be straw manning here. Yeah, I, I, don't, I don't think we're straw manning. I really care about engaging this, like random, book. random Greek. Um, yeah, I, I don't know who that is, and I'm not really that interested because we're not responding to that guy. We're responding to Swinburne and what he said here. You don't know Irenaeus Contramundum? How can you agree? How can you? Even I've never claimed to be an expert in theology. <laughs> So, yes, I, I'm just a pleb who's read a book and is responding to it based on what I know about philosophy. So forgive me for that. But anyway, yeah. um, at this point, I am going to bow out and I'll let you deal with the last chapter. Um, Great. I think, yeah, there's probably not a whole lot that uh, I can <laughs> add that yeah, you don't yeah. already have. And you've got also my my comments there. Um, yeah, I kind of made a list of all of these things that sort of Swinburne's been assuming. Uh, <laughs> Do you want to go through them? There are, no, there are 21 items that I've listed on here. Now, maybe some of them you could weasel around. Maybe I'll post them in a comment or something. I don't know. But um, 
yeah, I, the point is that just in, in way of closing here, one of the main problems with this book, in my opinion, is that Swinburne makes all sorts of assumptions or, or like postulates that are necessary um, for his arguments to work. And he just doesn't acknowledge that these are very controversial. It doesn't really discuss different views very well at all. It doesn't develop any naturalist alternatives in any detail. And um, often doesn't even try to defend them. He just sort of asserts them. The most recent, which was like, it's just intrinsically good for like animals to feed their young and things like that. Well, like, is that intrinsically good in virtue of just, and so there are all sorts of things that he said are intrinsically good, like beauty and free choice and participating in God's creation, plus just existing as a free agent. We're all, all intrinsically good. So there's a whole host of different goods there. There's all types of divine actions and powers that God has and decisions that he makes about creation. There's just all these things that are just postulated, right? Connections between souls and, and minds. Um, which you talked about God's properties, which you talked about, like him being uh, immaterial and then existing at, at all different points in space, and the nature of God's freedom, and the, the you know the idea that you're maximally free when you like have no desires, which is bizarre. Like all of these really specific things that if you take away a few of these or, or a bunch of them, then then his view starts kind of coming apart, right? Because then he can't he can't defend claims that he wants to make. So the idea that his view is simpler, I just think isn't supported by the number of these postulates that he has to make, which is largely unsubstantiated. Um, and, and then on top of that, every particular divine action that God takes being uh, an independent choice that he has seems to me to be a brute fact that doesn't have explanation. And he never really addresses this, this issue here. Um, how do you explain why God acts in one way or, or the other it, it, when there's equal reasons it seems or comparable reasons for choosing the both well he just sort of picks one like he he rolls the dice or whatever phrase he used um yeah well, that's not an words, explanation why, why is it true why is it true that god chose um to actualize a world with this amount of suffering rather than that right because god chose to actualize a world with this amount of suffering rather than that yeah yeah and, and likewise with regularities in nature and, and everything else that he mentioned um so I, I think the project... And at different... every moment, again, God has to make uh, that choice again every single moment. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I think the project of this book is a failure in the sense that I, I don't... Th I think the method is sort of correct, but he hasn't applied it very well. What he should be doing, what I think he should do, is start with a, sort of a, the postulates that he wants to make about God and try to defend those as best he can by appealing to at least reasonable things that someone who disagrees with them could agree with instead of just asserting them and not trying to defend them at all. And then what he should do is see what type of worlds would we expect under those comparative uh, postulates and see how expected the actual world is um, under those competing explanations. He never does that, though. He never contrasts the state of the world that we see with others that God, it seems, could, has, could have as readily created or would have had reason to create. He essentially never mentions this um, and never really discusses it in depth. Um, and so I, I just don't think he actually follows through with with the promise of like comparing theories on their explanatory merits because you have to establish how, how what is the explanatory scope uh, of the theory with respect to the data. But he doesn't. He just gives a just so ad an ad hoc, a uh, post hoc, uh, just so story to say, well, it kind of fits if you make this assumption, right? Um, but but that's not what you should be doing. And so um, yeah, I think what we have is a whole bunch of uh, I mean, mostly um, post hoc justifications for for views that theists have held for largely none of the reasons presented here at least like traditionally they didn't originate from uh from the reasons that swinburne is saying um and that you, you in order to accept these you need to accept a whole bunch of really contentious viewpoints and i've listed like 20 and there's probably a few more in the last chapter as well um and that the naturalist has many other options available to them and, and those of other worldviews as well by the way has many other options available to them that swinburne basically just doesn't really discuss in this book here so he doesn't do a good job contrasting the explanations so i i, I found it quite disappointing especially because the promise of the book was um you know in following a a, a project that uh, sorry following a methodology that i think is fundamentally sound which is contrasting explanations on their explanatory merits but he just doesn't do a good job of that, I think. And I think we've tried to, I've tried to articulate the reasons why I think that he, he sort of fails to do that um, in a convincing way. Um, but um, yeah, so that's my final thoughts. Um, thanks, Nathan, uh, for having me on. And uh, yeah, thanks, no uh, chat and everyone who's, uh, I don't know if there's been anyone who's been here for the full eight hours uh, so far, but congrats if you have. And otherwise, <laughs> hope you found this interesting. Um, feel free to come along to my channel where we'll be doing more readings and discussion of the, um, what the hell is my book called? Unreasonable Faith. <laughs> um, <laughs> over the, uh, got, got to switch from Swinburne mode to Craig mode, right? They, they actually have quite different views about God and a bunch of things, which yeah, is interesting. Yeah. But anyway, um, yeah, so we'll be doing more readings of that in the coming, in the coming months. So um, come along there. And um, yeah, I think that's all from me. Um, take care of yourselves and I'll see you guys around.
Right, cheers. See you around, cheers. Yep. Okay, so chapter seven, how the existence of God explains miracles and religious experience. I'm going to just basically go through the highlighted points. Um, if there is a God who, being perfectly good, will love his creatures, one would expect him to interact with us occasionally, um, more directly on a personal basis. Um, yeah, so, so the question of, firstly, why would you expect that? Secondly, if there's an expectation, exactly how much expectation, right? Because presumably, presumably it's not going to be absolutely all the time. So I can just get direct revelation from God upon request whenever I want. And presumably it's not going to be never as well, right? It, so so where, what is just the right amount? And does just the right amount happen to be the exact amount we have in this world? And how is that not ad hoc if so? Um, okay. He will not, however, intervene in the natural order at all often. For if he did, we would not want we, we would not be able to predict the consequences of our, our actions. Though, according to Swinburne, God is in fact all the time intervening in the natural order by by sustaining the causal powers of things all the time. But then there's a sort of question about why do, do it at all? Yeah, and also his act, as, as James notes here, his, his interventions could be predictable in the sense that there were sort of like laws of prayer or something like that. So you know, if you if you pray, um, you know, if 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 you pray for um, bread, then you wouldn't get a stone or a scorpion or whatever the 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 thing is that the Bible says, right? Luke, it's Luke eleven eleven, right? Uh, Luke eleven eleven. Uh, which of you fathers, if your son asks for a fish, will give him a snake instead? Or if he asks for an egg, will give him a scorpion? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask them? So if it was the case that, you know, whenever people asked for a fish um, or asked for an egg, they would get, or, or bread, whatever the correct translation is, they got what they asked for in those situations which doesn't happen. People who fervently pray die in famines all the time, praying for, for God's intervention. Um, just as much as those who don't, then, then, then maybe that would actually be some evidence um, in support of this claim. Loving parents will rightly occasionally break their own rules in answer to special pleading. Uh, I don't know. The pious believer believes that God intervened, and the hard-headed atheist believes that only natural laws were at work. Um, I'm not sure why the atheist is, is hard-headed and pious is presented as sort of like good. Why is it not the gullible believer believes that God intervened, whereas the rational atheist believes, where, 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 whereas the rational and careful atheist believes that only natural laws were at work? Um It would be odd to suppose that God, concerned for our total well-being, confined his interventions to those areas, if any, um, if any, where natural laws leave it un undetermined what will happen. For example, confined his interventions to influencing the mental lives of human beings. Yeah, this is sort of strange. Again, why not more or less than what's being argued for? I'm so like tired at this point that I just sort of don't care. Um, that background knowledge must weigh heavily in comparison with the detailed historical evidence in assessing particular claims about the past uh, can be seen from innumerable, innumerable non-religious examples. So again, in the case of our background knowledge here, we have tons of background knowledge from uh, sociology of religion, anthropology of religion, um, cognitive science of religion about why people form the types of religious beliefs they do, about irrational belief persistence, about why people come to believe the claims that Swinburne would agree are false in various cases of other religions, like, for example, about Joseph Smith and the Golden Plate, about Muhammad and splitting the moon in half, um, about like various cults and, and, and reported phenomena to have happened that are miraculous, where we can explain these things in terms of um, socialization, in, into communities, that is to say, people adopt kind of schemas 
given by the community to to interpret their experiences theologically and then they come to understand their experiences through that lens so what an ordinary person might interpret as just kind of like a feeling of euphoria or something given that they were singing hymns uh, someone socialized into a group may come to understand their experiences the holy spirit that's just what the holy spirit is in fact right and we can't kind of read our metaphysics off of that seeming but the seeming comes from social it, it is explained fully in terms of the socialization of the person into the group rather than in terms of there actually being a holy spirit at work causing them to believe what they do or causing them to have the feeling that they do um various kind of biases memory distortions so people can People's memories are corrupted over time by by recall and often retelling amongst communities who have certain theological beliefs. And also there's cognitive dissonance, right? So we know from the psychology of religion that um, religious communities often make various predictions which don't come true. And then rather than abandon the belief in light of seemingly being falsified, people in fact become more fervent in their belief and introduce more theology to explain why the thing didn't come to pass. This can be observed in communities like, for example, the Watchtower with Jehovah's Witnesses and the multiple claims that they have made about um, prophecies that didn't come to pass over the past hundred years, and then various elements of the theology which have been introduced, but can also be seen in... Um, what's it called, the, the in the early Christian communities, for example, where there are predictions made about the return of Jesus in the end times immediately, which then become modified and so on over time. I also think that there are examples in the narrative of Jesus around the resurrection, which can be explained. For example, even Christians themselves will sign up to the idea that Jesus was um, an apocalyptic, well, not all of them will agree that he's an apocalyptic prophet, but they will agree that the followers of Jesus expected that his mission was a political one to um, build and restore the power of the Jewish state as the Messiah there on earth in Jerusalem, right? So if they had this belief and then Jesus was in fact crucified um, by the Romans, this, this kind of humiliating way of being killed, well, then this would in fact be discom strong disconfirmation of the belief that they had had. And you have to remember that these guys, guys had made various, very costly commitments in order to come and, and follow Jesus. They'd renounced old ways of life. Um, they'd, they'd abandoned and left behind their family and uh, left behind everything to come and follow him, right? So they were very heavily invested, which is another good predictor of cognitive dissonance being at play. And then he himself um, dies on the cross and is killed. Now you've got these people who ha who were radicalized in the first place that radical kind of religious zealots who have a hell of a lot of stuff at, stuff at stake um, who are now facing massive disconfirming evidence in the fact that Jesus has been killed on a cross, right? So they have they have the perfect motive to, to form um, new auxiliary beliefs, which enable them to maintain their, their commitment to Jesus being the Messiah and so on, and their, their kind of religious zealotry. Um, well, how do they do that? I don't know exactly how it happens, but maybe one person starts a, maybe one person has a bereavement hallucination, which we know happens all the time. And then maybe that spreads through various mechanisms to people who are desperate for it to be true. They begin retelling it in various ways. Um, it doesn't have to be that they're thinking this is false, but they in fact become genuinely convinced because of the desperation, which is something we again see all the time amongst, um, take for example, Pentecostal religious communities today. Um, where people are incredibly desperate for religious myths to be true, maybe they're alcoholics and so on, and religion is kind of their crutch. And then there are stories that proliferate amongst those communities of Jesus having appeared um, during a Sunday service or something like that. that that's just to say that, that we, we have tons of background knowledge about these things, which is sufficient to explain the miracles. It's all been done to death. Check out the specific... Um, the specific bad apologetics episode on miracles, if you're interested in any of that. Um, God able and having reason sometimes, but not necessarily on any one particular occasion to intervene to suspend the operation of the natural laws. Yeah, that gives you a low prior intervention. I don't really care. I think I'm just going to skip through a bunch of this. I didn't put many notes in here. I think I just put something on the end. It's a mark of rationality to take background knowledge or other evidence about whether there is a God. 
able and willing to intervene in history into account. Um, yeah, I think I think we've. I sort of James has put lol no, but I mean I I sort of agree with this, but I don't think it in fact actually helps because unless you um, so if you specify some specific theism where God has just the right desires and stuff to vindicate the life of Jesus through a resurrection, well then I think that gives you a super 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 low prior on that type of God existing because that's what's to be established right by by the, the 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 evidence contained in the miracle claim that's not what you establish unless maybe you can maybe you have some independent reason for um for, for establishing that but generally what's established is that some kind of bare theism right that's true but then some bare theism being true god has reasons to sort of like vindicate himself through signs or vindicate his theological message through signs in various occasions in perhaps all the claims of miracle claims of religions that do exist and are not the resurrection, for example, God presumably has just as much reason to do any of those things. I mean, it's not as though Jews who think that God exists thinks it's particularly likely that God would raise Jesus from the dead. In fact, Jews think precisely the opposite because of the revelations contained, the, the purported revelations contained in the Old Testament about what God would in fact do in his psychology and so on. So I actually don't think that this helps at all. Um, just basically saying, that there is magic, so it's a possibility that it happens. I mean, the 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 way that the probability goes, who knows what God's going to do still? And we've talked about this at length in other bad apologetics. Is 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 is, is. yeah, blah blah blah. Bunch of stuff. Bunch of stuff. So epilogue. So what? Um, so what? I reached the end of the book with some dissatisfaction. No, 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 no. Argument and counter-argument, qualification and amplification can go on forever. But religion is not exceptional in this respect. With respect to any subject, whatever, the discussion can go on forever. New experiments can all, always be done to test quantum theory. New interpretations can be proposed for old experiments forever. And the same goes for interpretations of history or theories of politics. But life is short and we have to act on the basis of what such evidence as we have we have had time to investigate shows on balance to be probably true. Um, so this is sort of right. And I think James and I have given reasons to reject theism in favor of actually like atheism and some form of naturalism, right? Because that's, of course, what we believe best explains the various data points that have been discussed in the book. But something that's left out is it, it, it's talked about as if people's, hand is, people's hands are forced to make some, but agnosticism is just being completely left out, right? Perhaps it would be prudent in many of these cases. And in many of these cases, we're in fact talking about highly contentious and metaphysical theses and explanations of the data to in fact just withhold our judgment where things are weird and when uh, and there's a vast amount of disagreement on both sides between uh, amongst epistemic peers and so on maybe it would be prudent to withhold judgment and i don't appreciate that um swimman sort of doesn't doesn't consider that he's saying we have to vote right we we, we have to vote in an election it's just not an option to withhold but i just don't think that's right um we can withhold. So yeah, there we go. There's the whole book. I'm done. Eight hours, 27. I want some food. Um, yeah, as Sves says, the, re the reason that I blocked um, some people in the chat is just because firstly, they can be um, very sort of like distracting and toxic in the chat when it when it's just like a, a a pure cope right when it's just like um oh you're wrong with no no actual good reasons given and when it's basically the way in which we're wrong is entirely personal so it's like you're wrong because you're like a little virgin nitpicker or something like oh yeah that's a great rebuttal um that's that's a good reason for me to change my mind that i'm a little virgin nitpicker um you know, it, clearly all that's going on in that case is that the person listening doesn't like what we're saying and is emoting, but it's not helpful for them to be trapped in the chat um, just emoting and getting angry. And it's not helpful um, either for us doing the stream who are discussing something extensively um, to, to be constantly derailed by engaging with someone in their objections, right? James and I both do 
provide extensive opportunity for people who disagree to to talk to us um if they wish as well in in, in other places so for example i do the open conversations all the time and james is open to email where he has agreed to talk to people um who disagree as well so i think i think it would be fine to disagree in the in the chat as we go along in a kind of respectful way right and all raise legitimate questions for us to ask how we would respond to them but just like being a douchebag about it is you know it's just it's just completely derailing the purpose of bad apologetics and everyone even the people who are banned have the opportunity to in fact disagree with us publicly by joining any of our streams and talking to us um that's perfectly fine we do it all the time we encourage it um and people like zeleni who who just got banned right have consistently been in the chat for for a few weeks saying various things and never joining when any of these opportunities present to in fact disagree and that's very disappointing if they in fact want to to discuss um that kind of disagreement right uh the link to the bad apologetics channel is here hopefully the next episode whenever we get around to doing it will be on that channel. I had some issues with um, verifying a phone number and stuff because I'm already using my phone number for this channel in setting up the new one. Um, so I wasn't able to. What will I eat? That's a good question. I'm sort of thinking of going to Lidl and getting some food. Of going to, going to Lidl and getting some... Uh, Oh, yeah, I want pasta. So maybe I get some cheese as well to go with the pasta. Uh, canned tomatoes, definitely. I think that'll do, like, a nice, nice, like, cheesy pasta dish. You know, melted cheese in the pasta with tomato-y vegetables in there. Um, I should probably go to the gym, but I think I'll go to the gym tomorrow instead because I did just go to the gym yesterday as well. Um, and I want to do a bit of maths today. And I've also got cleaning to do because I've just moved a bunch of my parents' things. And I have stuff lying everywhere. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Max, for your donation. And I think you sent a donation earlier, which I skipped. And sorry to anyone whose super chats I missed um, because I've had the other tab open and I didn't see. Um, yeah, that guy just thought everything was an attack on him, so not helpful. Uh, and don't forget a tablespoon of honey. No, Lidl is not closed. Lidl is open, or maybe is it Aldi? I always get confused whether it's a Lidl or an Aldi that I have nearby. Whatever the one is that I have nearby um, is open until 5 p.m., I think, or 4 p.m., and it's 2.30 p.m. now, just 6, 6 a.m. to 2.30 p.m., uh, oh, and also what Lidl do are these protein yogurts, which are like 20 grams of protein um, and no like fat and hardly any carbs, or whatever, like five grams of carbs. And they're so good. It's like a, there's like a caramel one and a chocolatey one and a vanilla one. Actually, I shouldn't share my secrets because people will. I, I've noticed that people are buying these things up and they're so good. Uh, hey, Lance. Jay Scott asks, what's this new background? As I was just saying, my parents have uh, got divorced, so I was helping them move, and I had to get all of the stuff from my old fr from uh, their house. And so I've, I've got these these boxes, right, which I've... So I used to be there on that table. I'm going to get rid of that table, actually. Um, this is a table from my, the old place, and then I have extra um, bookshelf beautiful look at that so yeah there we go thank you everyone thank you for watching i hope you enjoyed richard swinburne's is there a god a review um i think we pretty comprehensively covered everything in there really um obviously james shared his thoughts his final thoughts before he went yeah my closing thoughts would just be like i said i i overall agree that this is 
the correct sort of approach. But seriously, you know, theists, firstly, what I don't appreciate is when theists adopt this approach now, sort of picking up the work of, um, picking up the work of, of Swinburne, but then continuing with just a sort of cope. So what I, what I would say by a cope is just basically trying to make the argument as dense and impenetrable as possible so as it appears rational. I think what really has to be done um, by people who are theists, if they want to be convincing to people who are skeptical of these arguments, is to really endeavor to, rather than just build a bunch of new stuff in, ra rather than to build a bunch of new stuff in that just avoids um, the falsification potentially of the theory that James and I have presented, is to actually um, engage with the criticisms that we've raised, because these criticisms are gener generally become consistent, right, amongst new theories about about whether metaphysical necessity is in fact um, is it is in fact a genuine type of explanation, and if metaphysical necessity is a genuine type of explanation, why the naturalist isn't allowed to postulate it whenever they need. Um, questions about libertarian free will, questions about God's reasons and choices and what God has reason to create and the, the kind of possibility space and why the possibility space is what a theist might think it is, why God creates certain things rather than other things, all these concerns about the ad hocness of the theory that's built in, the kind of post-diction um, and clear theory modification just to avoid falsification, right? Like why everything is just right on the scale when that seems to not be what you'd expect given just making predictions from the theory itself rather than telling just so stories about how the theory fits the data. Um, and I think that I think that these are things that, that theists who want to convince people like James and I really have to do rather than just bouncing on to the, you know, the next way of, of, of telling a bunch of just so stories that we haven't sort of falsified. Uh, thanks, Duke Robinson, for being sorry about my parents' divorce, uh, saying it's hard. I think it's actually a good thing. They'd become fairly um, toxic towards one another, I think, and I think it'll be a good thing for both of them. And uh, I'm also adopted, so we have a bit of a weird dynamic anyway, and I think I can have a better relationship with both of them now they're separated, actually. I didn't really have a kind of, like, stable, great place that I felt I could go back to um, when they were together in the first place. Which is why I became a theist. In the <laughs> okay, so thank you, everyone. Um, hope you enjoyed today's stream. Of course, go and subscribe to James's channel, which is James Fodor. And also, seriously, check out his podcast, The Science of Everything podcast. He has some great episodes where he covers lots of the things that um, we talk about in, um, like, socialization effects, bi cognitive biases, um, psychology of religion, amongst other, th other things, right, about like physics, chemistry, and so on. There's so much stuff that he knows and has covered. The podcast is absolutely awesome, a great way to learn about science if you're interested. And the Bad Apologetics channel, um, which Svez has linked in the chat at the side. Uh, go and subscribe to that, and that's where the next BA will be. Thanks, everyone. Enjoy the rest of your weekend. Oh, and also, leave please leave timestamps if there are things that stood out to you. I'll try and get them in as soon as possible, but I'm going to need a bit of time away from the computer, to be honest, after this. <laughs> um, oh, yeah, if you're donating, re please remember, guys, um, I will try, when I get this month's um, money, people who have donated to me, I will um, figure that out and split it with James um, via PayPal. But remember, the links in the description on my channel and the payments that go to me are going to me, right? So if you want to donate to James separately, go to the links for his Science of Everything uh, patron and stuff, which are in his podcast, and we will get one set up. That's that's partly, well, it's not it's not because of money reasons, but that's partly why I want to do the new channel. So it's it, it makes more sense about like splitting revenue and stuff like that. Anyway, cool, everyone. Thank you for your time. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.